Miranda warned Damon to run while he still could. In the heyday of the Brokerton family, fear was a foreign concept to them. But alas, the Brokerton family had fallen from grace, succumbing to the influence of various powers, one of which was none other than Fernando Martinelli himself. Miranda couldn't bear the thought of Damon getting entangled in this mess as well. But Damon had a different perspective. Let's call Gwen and Fernando. I want to witness their capabilities firsthand. Unbeknownst to Miranda, Damon harbored a deep-seated hatred toward Fernando. In the past, Gwen had sought Fernando's assistance in dealing with Veronica. And had it not been for Damon's fortuitous encounter, Veronica would have met her demise. And as for Gwen, Damon had an even stronger motivation to seek her out. Stella was unable to contain her frustration. Fine, you're ruthless. But when we face Fernando and Director Staffro later, I hope you maintain the same level of resilience. Just as Stella finished her statement, a commotion erupted at the door. A voice cried out, Look, look, Director Staffro has arrived. As soon as she walked into the room, all eyes were on her. Damon's gaze was drawn to the door where he saw a stunning woman making her way through the crowd like a moon surrounded by stars. It could only be Gwen. As Gwen made her way through the room, arm in arm with the handsome man, the compliments flowed. Spencer Tailbot is getting more and handsome by the day, they gushed. He and the director Staffro are a perfect match. Damon noticed the shift in Gwen's status. He realized that her newfound power had nothing to do with Fernando, but rather the man named Spencer by her side. Gwen and Spencer's arrival felt like a breath of fresh air for Stella. Director Staffro, you're finally here. If you hadn't come, I would have been beaten to death by this jerk. Stella exclaimed. Spencer examined her bruised face. Who did this to you? Stella pointed at Damon. Spencer's eyes narrowed. Where did you crawl out from, you despicable creature? Gwen gasped. Damon? Fifi? Damon's smile was cold and calculated. It seems you've forgotten your old friends. Fifi remained silent, torn between her resentment towards Gwen for past hurts and her concern for what Gwen's newfound power might mean for her and Damon. Karen trembled in fear as she faced Gwen. Director Staffro, please understand there was a misunderstanding. My daughter didn't mean to offend you all. I... I sincerely apologize. Please show us some mercy. Stella let out a piercing scream. What's the point of being someone up and then apologizing? You wicked witch. Gwen crossed her arms. Damon, I didn't expect you to be alive. Spencer inquired. Who is he? Do you know this rat? Gwen replied. He's not just any rat. In the past, he was a prominent figure in the financial world. He's none other than the renowned founder of Astamar, Damon Walker. The crowd erupted in astonishment. Rumors of Damon's demise had caused quite a stir. So why had he suddenly returned to the scene alive and well? Spencer's face twisted in disbelief. Are you kidding me? This guy's the founder of Astamar. Astamar may have been impressive, but it's old news now. He's got nothing left, not even a penny of his shares. He's just a worthless piece of trash. Spencer's sense of superiority was palpable, and Damon couldn't help but comment. Gwen, it's been a while since we last met. You've come a long way. Gwen was quick to respond. And you've changed too, Damon. But let's be clear. Your era has ended. I'm like the sun in the sky, and you're not even qualified to shine my shoes. You've hit my assistant Stella, and now you'll pay the price. Damon waved his hand dismissively. Stop bloviating. Gwen scowled. Damon, don't push me. I have a hundred ways to make you regret crossing me. She turned to Fifi, and let me tell you, Fifi, when you were with Damon all those years ago, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy. I mean, what on earth did you see in him? But then, when he struck it rich, it all made sense. Now your husband has fallen from grace and returned to his humble roots. It was clear that his background only allowed for one shot at success, and he missed it. There won't be another chance for him, but me, oh, I'm different. My husband, Spencer, has a net worth of over five billion. Even if his company were to collapse, we'd still have plenty of money to spare. And let's not forget about our powerful family. We are thriving. She smirked. And you? Well, now that you've come full circle, even if you work your entire life, you'll never reach the heights I've reached. Even if it's because Damon offended someone he shouldn't have, it won't bode well for you to be caught in the crossfire. You see, from this moment on, our sons will be on completely different levels. Your son was born in a modest home, playing with dirty toys. He'll never amount to anything great. In the end, my dear, in this era of fixed hierarchies, the moment you chose Damon, you had already lost. It's as simple as that. From the moment Gwen stepped foot onto the Myerson University campus as a wide-eyed freshman, she couldn't help but compare herself to Fifi. 
It was like an unspoken competition, with Gwen constantly striving to outdo her in every aspect of life, from grades to fashion choices. But it was when it came to their boyfriends that Gwen's competitive spirit reached new heights. It seemed like no matter what Gwen did, she always fell short, leaving her with a bitter taste in her mouth. At one point, Gwen even felt a sense of despair, contemplating resorting to underhanded tactics to get what she wanted. She believed that her beauty, talent, and intelligence were a perfect match for Damon, but he proved her wrong. Instead of succumbing to Gwen's advances, Damon remained loyal to Fifi, deepening Gwen's jealousy and hatred toward the couple. Gwen, determined to change her fate, decided to rely on her own abilities. She sought out a man who could provide for her and her future child with a life of luxury and success, allowing her to look down on Fifi from a position of superiority. Meanwhile, Fifi paid a hefty price for her foolishness. Damon, stripped of his founder's glory, and ounced from Astromar, was destined to be ordinary. With a smug smile, Gwen continued, Fifi, let's face it, your taste is just not as refined as mine. She was convinced that her words would cut deep and make Fifi feel ashamed of her poor choice of men. But to Gwen's surprise, Fifi gazed lovingly at Damon. Even if Damon had nothing, even if he disappeared from this world, he would still be the best in my eyes. I will never leave him. Your man could own the entire continent, but he still wouldn't be as good as my Damon. Stop talking nonsense! Gwen scoffed, but Fifi simply shook her head and replied, I won't argue with you. Gwen couldn't believe it. She had always seen Fifi as a rival, but Fifi had never even considered her competition. Gwen felt defeated as Damon ignored her completely, not even bothering to look at her. It made her question everything she had worked for. She felt trapped in a cage of her own making, suffocating under the weight of her own insecurities. You guys think you're living in a fairy tale world? Well, it's time to get down to business, she spat. Damon, you hit my assistant. Now you have to apologize and slap yourself in the face, or else I'll show you what real power looks like. I'll crush you and give you no chance to turn the tables. Damon lit a cigarette. Don't you plan to leave some leeway? Gwen sneered. Leeway? After what you did five or six years ago? The manager chimed in, scolding Damon for smoking in public. But Damon wasn't in the mood for lectures. He kicked the manager in the stomach, sending him reeling. The crowd gasped in shock and disbelief. How can this hotel allow in a gangster like him? But Damon just laughed, relishing in the chaos he had caused. You call me a gangster? He bellowed. Today, I'll show you what a real gangster is. Suddenly, a man emerged from the shadows. He stood tall and imposing, blocking the manager's path like a towering mountain. With a swift motion, he raised his hand and delivered a resounding slap that echoed through the room. Pow! The sound was crisp and sharp, leaving the manager reeling and disoriented. As he struggled to regain his bearings, he found himself staring into the cold, unyielding eyes of a man called Roko. The onlookers are stunned, wondering why Roko hadn't intervened in the conflict between Damon and the manager. But Roko merely smiled coldly, his eyes flashing with a hint of malice. Despite the humiliation and the pain of the assault, the manager knew better than to retaliate. Roko's identity was one of the shareholders of the hotel and held immense power and influence. Challenging him would be a fool's errand, and the manager knew it. Unless he wanted to risk everything, he would have to swallow his pride and accept Roko's authority. Gwen's jaw dropped. Roko, what on earth do you think you're doing? Roko met Gwen's gaze. Oh, nothing much. I just thought I'd lend a hand in letting Mr. Walker blow off some steam. Gwen's expression shifted once again, this time tinged with a hint of apprehension. Roko was a force to be reckoned with in their circle, and Gwen knew better than to offend him too greatly. After all, her company had important business dealings with him. She glanced at Damon, despite Gwen's previous assumptions about his incompetence. It was hard to fathom that someone as skilled as Roko would stand up for him. Perhaps Damon wasn't as useless as she believed. Maybe he still had some viable connections up his sleeve. However, Gwen couldn't help but speculate that Roko's loyalty to Damon stemmed from their shared history. After all, Damon had once been the esteemed founder of Astromar. It made sense that Roko would still care about preserving Damon's reputation. In a low, commanding voice, Gwen questioned Roko's motives. Roko, why in the world would you go out of your way to help this lowly thief? Have you lost your mind? Gwen subtly hinted at the fact that Damon currently held no power or influence, while she and the influential Tailbot family stood firmly rooted in their positions. If Roko chose the side of Damon, who had nothing to offer, wouldn't it be a foolish move that would ultimately backfire? Roko's eyes filled with contempt. What kind of moral character do you possess? Just because you married into a wealthy family, do you think you're someone special? How dare you accuse Mr. Walker of being a thief? Gwen felt her cheeks burn with embarrassment as Roko's words hit her like a slap. But standing beside her, Spencer's anger ignited like a wildfire. 
Froko, this is my fiance. If you want to bully her, you'll have to go through me first, Spencer declared. While Roko may have held the upper hand when it came to Gwen, he found himself at a disadvantage when facing Spencer. Despite his power and influence in the business world, Roko paled in comparison to the Tailbot family, who had built their empire through generations of nepotism. Normally, Roko would have swallowed his pride and compromised to save face for the Tailbot family, but today was different. Today, he refused to back down. With a cold, steely tone, Roko warned, if you dare to insult Mr. Walker again, I'll make sure you learn your lesson. Spencer's rage erupted like a volcano. Roko, you're playing with fire. Today, I'll deal with this little jerk first, and then I'll take care of your precious business. Roko stood tall, his arms crossed in front of him, daring anyone to challenge him. I'd like to see you try. Stella wasn't about to let Roko have the last word. Who do you think you are? She spat. Spencer will break your teeth. Roko didn't take kindly to Stella's words and he lashed out, slapping her across the face. You witch, he growled. Do you think you can be taken seriously just because you're having an affair with Spencer? Gwen's face twisted in confusion. What did you just say? She asked, her voice trembling. You said that Stella had an affair with Spencer? Roko nodded, a smug smile on his face. Do you think I would lie to you? Don't you know that Spencer has 20 or so mistresses? Spencer's eyes narrowed as he glared at Roko. What the hell are you trying to do to my relationship with Gwen? He thundered, but Roko wasn't intimidated. Don't be afraid, Spencer, he sneered. Gwen is not much better than you. Her sights are also set elsewhere. Gwen's heart raced as she tried to make sense of what was happening. It was clear that Roko knew more than he was letting on. Spencer, don't listen to his nonsense, she pleaded, hoping that her words would be enough to convince him. Spencer clenched his teeth as he turned to Damon once again. I must admit I misjudged you. I never expected Roko to be your loyal companion. Damon stubbed out his cigarette with a saucer. Do you honestly believe you can challenge me with such feeble strength? You're far too naive. Manager, gather all the security guards here. Spencer barked. The security guards swiftly surrounded the hall, ready to take action at Spencer's command. Fifi anxiously clung to Damon's arm. Roko, there's still time for you to apologize, Spencer said. However, Roko didn't even spare him a glance. Gwen yelled. Quickly, apprehend these troublemakers. The security guards were eager to make a move, but Roko stepped in, blocking Damon. Don't touch him. Roko, having worked his way up from the bottom, was not just an ordinary person. As one of the hotel shareholders, no one dared to challenge him. Spencer's voice grew deeper with frustration. Damn it. Why won't anyone listen to me? Roko's voice dripped with disdain. Who do you think you are? You can't just attack whoever you please. Although Roko held a certain level of power, the Tailbot family, with their immense influence, clearly held the upper hand. The men glared at each other in an intense standoff. It wasn't just about them. It was a battle of the powers that backed them. Gwen was shocked. Despite Damon's desperate situation, it was as if he had an endless reservoir of strength within him. Gwen addressed the crowd. Given the circumstances, you have a choice. You can align yourselves with us or them. The guests slowly rose and stood behind Gwen and Spencer. Meanwhile, Damon and Fifi found themselves standing alone, with only Roko and Karen by their side. Gwen was pleased with the crowd's support. Damon, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Your time is over. What do you have left to fight me with? Who else would dare to support you? Damon smirked. Oh, you want to play with me? I'm just worried you won't be able to handle the stakes. Are you still living in a dream? If it wasn't for Roko's help, you would have been finished ages ago. She snarled. Damon snapped his fingers. Well then, let's bring a few more people into the mix. Gwen thought he was bluffing until an unexpected figure emerged from the crowd. Mr. Walker, I'll support you. The man turned out to be the CEO Dresden, the boss of a powerful investment company. While he may not have been as influential as Roko, he was certainly a force to be reckoned with. Gwen let out a sharp laugh. Oh, even a sinking ship has a few nails left. Damon, it's no surprise that you know a few big shots. She figured that beside these two individuals, no one else would pay attention to Damon. And yet, the fact that there was two were already involved was shocking enough. Who said that? I'm also standing on Mr. Walker's side. A voice rang out, capturing everyone's attention. The room fell into a stunned silence as another young man stepped forward. Gasp and exclamations filled the air. For this man was no ordinary guest. He was Chevy, a powerful gangster known to rule the underworld with an iron fist. With a trembling voice, Gwen managed to utter, Is, is there anyone else? And me, came a confident voice from the crowd. 
Count me in too. Another voice chimed in, followed by another. As these words floated through the room, it became clear that the number of people standing beside Damon far outnumbered those beside Gwen. It was a blow to her pride, a realization that she was not as influential as she believed. Was this just an illusion? Gwen wondered, or was Damon truly stronger than ever before? However, it was Karen who was truly taken aback. When Damon slapped Stella and the others, Karen thought it was the end of her. Little did she expect Damon to deliver such a monumental surprise. Spencer's expression grew increasingly sour. He had initially planned to help his fiance vent her anger, assuming that taking down Damon would be as effortless as squatching an ant. Feeling isolated and feeble, Spencer desperately resorted to invoking his family's name. He wanted to make it clear to those who supported Damon what problems they would face if they dared to become enemies with the Tailbot family. However, his attempt to assert dominance was met with a cold smile from CEO Dresden. Although the Tailbot family may hold power, they are nothing compared to Mr. Walker. CEO Dresden sneered. Spencer's face contorted with anger, growing uglier by the second. CEO Dresden, you better think long and hard about what you just said. You'll be held accountable for your words. Gwen was in complete disarray. Her world turned upside down in an instant. Just moments ago, she had been looking down on Damon and Fifi. She had thought that Damon had already fallen from his privileged status, but now she realized that his strength was even more formidable than before. She wanted to marry into the Tailbot family, thinking she had found her ticket to success. But now she discovered that the Tailbot family was nothing more than a laughingstock in the eyes of others. Her dreams of prestige shattered like fragile glass. Just as the tension reached its peak, a sudden sound of footsteps broke the silence. A man appeared. Spencer and Gwen, upon seeing the man, felt a wave of relief wash over them. It was as if they had found their savior amid the chaos. Spencer's voice echoed through the room as he called out to the man, pleading for his assistance. Fritz, help us! Damon leaned in and whispered, So who's this Fritz guy? Rocco replied in a hushed tone, Oh, he's the Martinelli family's right-hand man. Let me tell you, he's a real piece of work. He's got everyone under his thumb. No one dreams of defying him because of the Martinelli family's influence. Karen knew all too well the damage Fritz could do. She had the misfortune of crossing paths with him at a restaurant one evening. She and a friend were waiting for their food when Fritz's table was served first, even though they arrived late. Karen was understandably annoyed and called the manager to inquire about the delay. Before the manager could explain, Fritz overheard and decided to make a scene. He mocked Karen and demanded that she be kicked out of the restaurant. The manager obliged, leaving Karen fuming. She called the police, but they were unable to help. Little did she know this encounter would have a disastrous consequence for her company. In the following days, her business suffered a heavy blow and was on the brink of bankruptcy. So it's you who's been meddling with my company. What did I do to offend you so deeply? Karen's voice shook. Fritz arched an eyebrow. I'm simply teaching you a lesson, my dear, to remind you that there are people in different social statuses in this world. Karen's eyes welled up with tears. Is this really a small lesson? You're practically forcing me to my demise. We only had a minor disagreement at a restaurant. Is it necessary to take it this far? Fritz relished in his power over her. I could destroy your entire family with just one sentence. I want you to understand the consequences of offending me. However, I'll give you a chance to save yourself. If you're willing to come to my room tonight and apologize, I might consider letting you go. Karen's face flushed with anger. You despicable jerk! Fritz's face contorted with anger as he subtly signaled to a young man standing beside him. The young man lunged toward Karen, ready to make a move, but Rocco quickly extended his leg, causing the young man to trip and fall. Fritz frowned. Rocco, what on earth are you doing? Rocco's words were laced to contempt. I simply cannot tolerate your insufferable arrogance. Fritz was surprised. Rocco had always been respectful and submissive in his presence. You can't afford to talk to me like that. Apologize immediately. Think long and hard about the repercussions of offending the mighty Martinelli family. Rocco retorted. You're nothing more than a lapdog for the Martinellis. Are you truly qualified to speak those words? Fritz burst into furious laughter. Very well, Rocco. Consider this a warning. Remember every word you just spoke, for I promise you, I will subject you to a fate far worse than death. CEO Dresden rose to his feet, his eyes fixed on Fritz. Listen up, Fritz, he said firmly. You can't just throw around the Martinelli name to intimidate people. You're not a Martinelli and you don't have any real power, so cut it out. The words hit Fritz like a slap in the face. He had always acted like he was above everyone else, using his position as the Martinelli spokesman to bully and humiliate those around him. But now he was being put in his place by someone who actually had authority. 
Some of the guests were shocked by CEO Dresden's baldness, while others couldn't help but chuckle at the sight of Fritz being taken down a peg. But for many in the room, this was a long overdue reckoning. You're all a bunch of idiots, Fritz spat. Do you have any idea what you're getting yourselves into? The Martinelli family will make you pay for this. CEO Dresden just laughed in his face. Sorry, Fritz, but you still don't get it. You're not the Martinelli family, and you never will be. Stop acting like you're above everyone else. Start treating people with the respect they deserve. Don't be mad, Fritz, Gwen said. These guys are just Damon's lackeys. Following Gwen's pointed finger, Fritz gaze landed on Damon. He used to be the big shot at Astromar, Gwen explained. That's why these lackeys followed him, but he's a nobody now. A sinister smile crept across Fritz's face. So it was you. Well, today, you're going to pay for your actions. You'll learn the hard way how to respect others. With a quick glance, Damon signaled to Chevy, who immediately lunged toward Fritz. Panic surged through Fritz's veins. What are you doing? He exclaimed. The scene was like something out of a blockbuster action movie. Two bodyguards stepped in to protect Fritz. They didn't stand a chance. The sound of their bodies hitting the ground was drowned out by the gasp of the onlookers. But Chevy wasn't done yet. His eyes blazed with fury as he turned his attention to Fritz and punched him in the face. Blood mixed with broken teeth spilled from his mouth. As Fritz lay on the ground, Damon stepped forward. He placed his foot on Fritz's head, a symbol of dominance and power. Fritz struggled to speak through the pain, mustered his defiance. If you're so brave, release me and let me find Fernardo. Damon smirked, his confidence unwavering. There's no need to fetch Fernardo. I will personally teach him a lesson in the coming days. And as for you, Fritz, your life will become a living nightmare. Your arrogance has led you to commit callous acts of evil. Today, I'll make sure you pay for your sins. The tables had turned, and the once untouchable Fritz now found himself at the mercy of a force he never saw coming. Damon lifted his foot and brought it down with a thunderous stomp. The ground shook beneath him, and the air filled with Fritz's agonizing screams. Damon delivered another merciless kick, shattering one of Fritz's arms. Damon wasn't finished. He unleashed another brutal blow, this time targeting Fritz's other hand. The sickening sound of bones breaking reverberated through the room, and Fritz's scream reached a crescendo before he succumbed to the pain and fainted. Damon gestured to Chevy. Back him up. He'll prove useful when the time comes. Chevy and Rocco hastily dragged Fritz away. The onlookers were as silent cicadas in the dead of winter. No one had expected him to go this far, especially not in front of everyone. It was a declaration of war against the powerful Martinelli family. Gwen mustered the courage to speak up. D Damon, do you even realize the magnitude of trouble you've caused with this? Without a moment hesitation, Damon's hand shot out, delivering a resounding slap across Gwen's face. The force of the blow sent her sprawling to the ground, nearly unconscious. Please don't hit me, Spencer pleaded. I'll do anything you want, just let me go. But Damon wasn't interested in negotiating. With a swift kick, he sent Spencer flying. Get lost, he barked. Spencer scrambled to his feet, relieved to have escaped with his life. He didn't even look back as he ran away, pulling Gwen with him. The manager begged for mercy, but Damon was in no mood to waste time on him. With a single glance, he signaled for someone to take Stella and the manager away. As for what would happen to them, Damon didn't care. He had bigger fish to fry. Damon knelt down beside his cousin Miranda. Are you alright? Please, take me back to see the family. Miranda's face was streaked with tears. Cousin, our family's doing well. You don't need to worry about them. Damon could see the worry lurking in Miranda's eyes. He decided not to press her further and instead offered. Give me your contact details. I'll find you when I have the chance. Spencer returned home with a scowl on his face, his heart burning with anger from the humiliation he had endured at Damon's hands during the banquet. The Tailbot family had never expected to be so thoroughly defeated by Damon. No matter what, I must have my revenge. I need to reclaim my lost dignity. Spencer seethed. Absolutely. We can't let this slide. We must regain our honor. Gwen chimed in, fanning the flames of Spencer's fury. Gwen's anger and envy were deeply ingrained in her mind. Even though she had noticed Damon's newfound strength, she believed that with the Tailbot family's power, they could easily crush him. All right, I've already informed my mother about this. Tomorrow, my grandfather will seek vengeance for me, Spencer declared. Word of the previous night's events had spread, and the Tailbot family was in an uproar. Spencer's mother, Sheila, was causing quite a commotion in the living room, ranting and raving about her son's honor being besmirched. Spencer is the future of our family in the city. How dare that country bumpkin slap our family's face in front of everyone? Spencer's father, Clarence, puffed away at one of his cigarettes. We can't just let this slide. 
The Tailbot family has never been bullied like this before. But I heard that the guy who did this has some serious connections. He even beat up the Martinelli family's butler. Gwen chimed in. Clarence, I know that guy. He's just a nobody who happened to strike it rich. Gwen wasted no time in spilling all the juicy details she knew about Damon's past during his university days. According to Gwen, the key to surpassing Damon lay in the Tailbot family's ability to utilize their vast network of connections. It seemed to her that Damon was desperately clinging to the last shreds of his power, using it as a weapon in a final desperate struggle. Eventually, everyone was merely humoring Damon out of respect for his previous position with Astromar. But Gwen was convinced that the Tailbot family's full-blown attack would crush Damon without mercy. Damon had also managed to offend the formidable Martinelli family. Gwen saw this as nothing short of a death wish on his part. As Gwen unveiled Damon's dark secrets, Sheila Spencer's mother couldn't contain her outrage and exclaimed, Did you hear all that? This pathetic excuse for a human being actually had the audacity to bully our esteemed Tailbot family. If we don't seek revenge now, what kind of reputation will we have left to uphold in the city? The Tailbot family was deep in discussion about the incident involving Damon at the banquet. Spencer exclaimed, Dad, you have no idea how utterly despicable he is. He insulted our family. I refuse to let this slide. Gwen chimed in. That jerk even had the nerve to offend the Martinelli family. If we were to strike first, we could win their favor, couldn't we? Clarence, Spencer's father, glanced at Gwen with a cold stare and replied, I believe it's best to wait for the patriarch, my father, to address this matter. Sheila, unable to contain her frustration, jumped up and exclaimed, Gwen is right. We need to take swift action. Clarence reassured his wife, Don't worry, my love. With my father's fiery temper, if anyone dares to harm a single hair in our Talbot family's head, he will make them pay dearly. After a while, a dignified old man slowly entered the living room, surrounded by a group of people. It was none other than Alistair Talbot, the patriarch of the family. I am aware of what transpired yesterday. I have already dispatched my men to locate the person who dared to lay a hand on my grandson. Once I find him, he will pay the price in blood. Alistair's voice boomed with authority. As the tension in the Tailbot family home reached its peak, a sudden gust of wind blew open the grand doors revealing the figure of Damon, surrounded by a formidable entourage that included Rocco, Chevy, CEO Dresden, and a multitude of influential figures. Gwen's jaw dropped. Grandfather, that's him! Fate had delivered him right into her hands. Spencer leaped to his feet and pointed an accusing finger at Damon. This despicable scoundrel hit me at the banquet, and now he's barging in here like he owns the place! Gwen's fists clenched tightly, her anticipation growing. She yearned to witness the satisfying sight of Damon being pummeled by the Talbot family. However, the scene she had envisioned did not unfold as she expected. Alistair didn't immediately launch an attack. Instead, he stood there, his eyes wide surprised as he saw the familiar face behind Damon. Orson, what are you doing here? Orson Maklachan was the patriarch of a family known for their strength, capable of taking on Talbot family, or perhaps even surpassing them and there was an even deeper, more secretive connection between the two families. Normally, whenever something happened to Malkachan, and the Tailbot families would join forces, rarely ever opposing each other. So who would have imagined they would now be standing alongside Damon? Orson narrowed his eyes. Alistair, what are you waiting for? What did the Master tell you all those years ago? Now that the young Master is standing right in front of you, why aren't you welcoming him with open arms? Alistair's voice quivered. Tell me, you're saying that this is the young master? Orson nodded solemnly. Yes, indeed. This is the young master. Now hurry up and pay your respects. The ground beneath Alistair's feet felt unsteady as he struggled to comprehend the magnitude of what he had just heard. Damon locked eyes with Alistair. So you're the esteemed patriarch of the Tailbot family. Alistair's throat tightened and he slowly made his way to Damon's side, standing before Gwen and the entire Tailbot family. With a heavy thud, he dropped to his knees. Young master! Alistair cried. My grandson was foolish to provoke you. Forgive us! Gwen's eyes nearly popped out of her head in shock while Spencer's legs turned to jelly, barely keeping him upright. Clarence, unable to believe what he was witnessing, questioned his father's actions. Dad, what on earth are you doing? Have you lost your mind? Why are you addressing him as young master? Alistair ignored his family. He took a deep breath and addressed Damon once more. Young master, I humbly ask for your forgiveness. Furthermore, I did not know about the conflict between my grandson and you yesterday. 
Had I known, I would have personally visited to apologize and ensure my grandson did the same. But it is not too late to rectify this mistake. Please grant me the opportunity to provide a satisfactory explanation. Spencer, come here! Spencer timidly approaches grandfather. Alistair's hand shot up, delivering a sharp slap across Spencer's face. Tell him you're sorry! Grandfather, why are you doing this? He's my enemy! Spencer yelped, but Alistair was not one to tolerate any defiance. Without hesitation, he struck Spencer's face once again, this time with even more force. Gwen, witnessing the horrifying scene, couldn't contain her shock. Grandfather, how can he be the young master? He comes from South Rivertown with nothing to his name. Gwen's words were cut short by Alistair's hand come crashing down in her face. He boomed. How dare you slander the young master? Alistair's accusations continued, revealing his knowledge of Gwen's involvement in the disastrous events of the banquet. He knew of her past grudge against the young master, seeing it as a vengeful act of betrayal. My grandson may be detestable, but I won't shield him, Alistair declared. But you, you are even more despicable. Get on your knees, Gwen. No! Gwen screamed, but Alistair forced her to the ground. The room fell silent as Alistair humbled himself before Damon. It was then that they realized the truth. Damon was not some ordinary man. He had the backing of a force so complicated that it spun a web across the most powerful families in the nation. And now, with Alistair kneeling before him, Damon had shown just how far that power could reach. The Tailbot family realized that they were just small players in a much larger game. Alistair's unexpected submission caught Damon off guard. Besides punishing Spencer, Damon had no intention of harming the Tailbot family. However, Damon had no intention of letting Gwyn off the hook so easily. Not to mention that the conflict between him and the Tailbot family was sparked by her actions, but in the past, this woman had attacked Fifi out of jealousy and hatred. Even if they were once classmates, such actions can never be forgiven. With a nod of his head, Damon spoke to Alistair. Since that's the case, it is not your fault for being unaware. Upon hearing these words, Alistair was overwhelmed with gratitude. Thank you, young master. From now on, I'm willing to lay down my life for you. Damon then pointed at Gwen. However, the culprit must not be allowed to escape justice. Gwen's body shook uncontrollably. She couldn't believe what was happening. Damon, please, you can't do this to me! Damon's expression was cold and unfeeling. Do you want me to list all of the dirty things you've done? What do you want from me? Gwen whimpered. I won't kill you, but I want you to promise never to harm anyone again. Damon replied. He then turned his attention to Spencer. And you, you'll carry out my orders. Gwen was terrified, but Damon wasn't done yet. Don't blame me for being ruthless. I've done my research, and I know that while you were with Spencer, you were flirting with other men. And that's not all. Your family lost confidential documents, and they were all taken by you. You even gave information about the Tailbots to the Martinelli family. The Tailbot family was stunned. No wonder they had been losing control of their affairs lately. There was a spy in their midst. Spencer's infatuation with Gwen turned out to be a stroke of luck, as it meant that Gwen had access to a wealth of information about him. Thankfully, she hadn't uncovered the deepest secrets of the Tailbot family. Alistair crossed his arms. I'll deal with her. Gwen, realizing that Alistair wouldn't let her escape easily, felt a wave of fear wash over her. I belong to Fernando Martinelli. If you dare to lay a finger on me, he won't let you get away with it. Damon chuckled. Don't worry, Fernando's days are numbered. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the capital, in a worn-out room, Miranda was taking care of her brother Sawyer. Brother, come and have a bite to eat. Sawyer shook his head. You've been working so hard all day, sis. You should eat. Miranda insisted. I've already eaten, brother. I'm not hungry. Sawyer frowned. You've lost weight. I'm sorry for putting you through so much. Sawyer reached down and struggled with his wheelchair. Hey, bro, let me handle this. Despite her exhaustion, she refused to let her family down. Sawyer looked at his sister's tired face. Miranda, our family dragged you down. He said, tears welling up in his eyes. Instead of enjoying her youth, she was now burdened with the responsibility of taking care of her loved ones. It was a heavy load to bear, but Miranda refused to give up. Despite the challenges, Miranda's strength and resilience never ceased to amaze Sawyer. Their family had been through so much. Their grandfather and mother had passed away. Sawyer was left with a broken body, and their father was paralyzed. The only one left unscathed was Miranda but she had to carry the weight of their family on her shoulders. Every time Sawyer saw Miranda's forced smile, his heart ached. He knew how much she was sacrificing for their family. Tyson, their cousin, was on the brink of giving up, 
but Miranda's words gave them all hope. There will always be hope if one is still alive, she said, and they clung to that hope with all their might. Sawyer, feeling the weight of his sister's words, reached out with his intact hand to gently touch her hair. Miranda's eyes suddenly lit up. She couldn't contain herself any longer and blurted out, Oh, brother, guess who I ran into last night? Who'd you bump into? He asked. Damon, I saw him at the hotel. Miranda exclaimed. It suddenly dawned on Miranda that she had forgotten to invite Damon over as a guest when she had left in a hurry the day before. Thankfully, she had left her phone number, but she couldn't bring herself to call him. The current state of her family was a source of embarrassment, and calling Damon over might bring him into their troubles. She didn't want him to get hurt because of them. Sawyer's eyes widened. You saw Damon? How's that possible? Didn't he? I mean, wasn't it reported that he... He trailed off, unable to finish his sentence. Miranda wiped away her tears and mustered up the courage to speak. He's alive. And not only that, he's even more powerful than before, she revealed. The revelation left Sawyer speechless. As long as Damon was alive and strong, there was still hope for the Brokerton family to rise again. However, Sawyer knew that they couldn't reveal their family situation to Damon just yet. Miranda, don't contact Damon just yet. He could be in danger, Sawyer said seriously. We need to wait until he has enough strength to handle the truth. If Damon is killed, then the Brokerton family will truly be finished. As they were discussing their plan, a strange voice interrupted them. They turned to see a group of tall and fierce-looking people approaching them. The person in the lead was Fernando. Fernando, what do you want? Sawyer asked cautiously. Can I come just to see you without a reason? He replied, his eyes glinting with malice. Miranda and Sawyer weren't in the position to block his path. Fernando smirked. Well, well, well. If it isn't Miranda, you're blossoming into quite the beauty. You could even pass as a princess working as a mere hotel waiter. He reached out and stroked her arm. Fernando, what are you doing? Don't you dare lay a finger on me. Miranda instinctively stepped back. Meanwhile, Sawyer, though he was in a wheelchair, tried to intervene. Fernando, you promised that if I allowed you to break my legs, you'd release my sister. Fernando chuckled. Ah, yes, I did make that promise, didn't I? But have you forgotten? I'm the most untrustworthy person in the world. He inched closer to his prey. Fernando paid no heed to Sawyer's pleas. With a dismissive wave of his hand, he signaled to his henchmen to pounce on Miranda. In a selfish act of heroism, Sawyer risked his own life to shield his sister from harm. Fernando, I beg you, I beg you to release my sister. I'll do anything you ask. Please, just let her go. Sawyer's voice cracked with desperation. Fernando arched an eyebrow, reveling in his power. Is that so? Miranda couldn't bear to see her brother degraded any further. She rushed to his side and embraced him tightly. Please, brother, you don't need to risk it laughing me. A burly man stepped forward, forcefully separating Miranda and Sawyer. Fernando delivered a swift kick that sent Sawyer sprawling out of his wheelchair and onto the ground. I warned you, didn't I? I'm the most untrustworthy person in the world, but here's an offer for you. If you break your other hand, I'll let you go. Sawyer's face fell. Fernando, you heartless bastard! Why do you want to kill us all? Fernando relished his sadistic game. Yesterday, your cousin attacked my butler Fritz at the banquet hall. Did you really think I wouldn't find out? Fernando's laughter echoed through the room. With a wicked grin, he taunted the Brokerton family, mocking their misfortune. You literally have no legs to stand on. He turned his attention to Miranda. Lure your stupid cousin here. I want to have a little chat. But I, I don't have a phone. She stammered meekly. Fernando brandished a knife. Don't play dumb with me, Miranda. Miranda looked at her brother, unsure of what to do. The weight of the situation pressed down on her, suffocating her with fear. Sawyer, despite his disability, smiled bravely, willing to sacrifice himself for his sister. Life or death held little meaning for him now. All that mattered was protecting the last flicker of hope for the Brokerton family. My sister really doesn't know where he is. Please let her go, Sawyer said. Fernando's grip on the knife tightened. With a swift and brutal motion, he stabbed the blade into Sawyer's thigh, causing him to cry out in pain. Tell me, are you going to call him or not? Miranda sank to her knees. Bernardo, I implore you, please spare my brother from any more torment. I'll do anything you ask of me. With a twisted grin, he said, All I want is for you to call Damon. If you refuse, I'll unleash destruction upon your entire family today. But before the chaos and bloodshed could unfold, a group of individuals emerged from the pitch black passageway. Damon's gaze locked into Fernando. 
Fernando Martinelli, we meet at last. Fernando narrowed his eyes at Damon. I was just looking for you. I didn't expect you to deliver yourself to my door. Damon nodded at Chevy. In an instant, Chevy charged at Fernando, catching him off guard. Fernando's hands were forcibly twisted backward. Fernando's bodyguards were left dumbfounded, unable to comprehend the method used against their master. In agony, Fernando pleaded, Let me go! If you dare lay a finger on me, I will annihilate your entire family! Damon responded calmly, First, let's break one of your hands. With a sharp sound, Fernando's hand was brutally smashed. The pain overwhelmed him, causing him to lose consciousness. Damon pressed his pressure point, bringing him back to consciousness, only to subject him to more suffering. Fernando cried out, Damn you! Why aren't you coming to save me? His group of bodyguards finally reacted, lunging at Damon and his companions. However, their efforts were futile, as Damon's allies easily overwhelmed them. Fernando lay on the ground, his body pressed down, but his spirit remained unyielding. With a defiant glare, he mustered his final ounce of strength to speak. Are you not afraid of the wrath of the mighty Martinelli family? Your Brokerton family is nothing compared to us! Damon snapped his fingers, signaling Chevy to drag Fernando to a secluded corner and teach him a lesson he would never forget. Damon had bigger plans in mind, plans that would make Fernando regret ever being born into this world. He was determined to bring down the Martinelli family once and for all. Damon approached Miranda and Sawyer. His eyes fell upon Sawyer in his wheelchair, and Miranda, her tear-stained face lowered in sorrow. Suppressing his anger, Damon spoke softly. Cousin, tell me, what has happened in the five years I was away? Sawyer let out a heavy sigh. Damon, it's good to see you, but you need to leave before you get hurt. Miranda interjected. Sawyer, even if you try to hide it, we can't ignore the truth. There was no turning back now. The arrow had been released, and Damon had already unleashed his fury upon Fernando. Even if it meant his own demise, Damon was prepared to fight until the bitter end. And if there was no escape, Damon vowed to make the Martinelli family pay a heavy price. It was far better than being slowly tortured to death by their hands. Sawyer's voice was barely above a whisper. Damon, you have to listen to me. We need to get out of here. Take Miranda and run. I'll handle everything, I promise. The Brokerton family's done for. We can't afford to cross the Martinelli family. Not now. Damon shook his head. How do you expect Miranda and me to escape? Don't worry, Sawyer. We'll rise stronger than ever before. Sawyer began to cry. All these years, our Brokerton family has suffered. We've lived a wretched existence. It was true. Ever since their patriarch's passing, the Brokerton family had crumbled. They had the connections and resources to make a comeback, but the Martinelli family had stepped in and taken over. Fernando had crippled Sawyer. Sawyer's father, Arnie, had suffered the same fate, and Miranda lived in constant fear of being captured by Fernando. Sawyer had even contemplated ending his own life, but Miranda had always managed to intervene. Damon's fist clenched tightly. I swear, their blood will be the price they pay for your suffering. With those words hanging in the air, Damon stepped into the house, only to find Arnie, his lower body paralyzed, struggling to rise with his hands pressed against his back. Damon, is that really you? Without hesitation, Damon rushed to Arnie's side, extending a helping hand. Uncle, please, lie down, he urged. Tears streamed down Arnie's cheeks as he spoke. It pains me to hear you call me uncle. My child, listen to me. You're our last hope. Please take care of yourself. Damon could feel the depth of Arnie's love and concern for him. Uncle, rest assured and focus on your recovery. I'll handle the Martinelli's. Damon's hand gently rested on Arnie's broken spine, his fingers tracing the damaged vertebrae. With a deep breath, he activated the Hidden Mind Method, a secret technique passed down to him by his wise grandfather, Paul. The energy flowed through his fingertips like a river of healing power. Uncle, I just examined your body. Your spine is broken, but don't lose hope. I have a way to save you. Arnie's eyes widened, his voice trembling with anticipation. What do you mean? Can you really make me stand again? Damon nodded. I can't make any promises, but I will give it my all. And as for Sawyer's energy... I believe it won't be a major obstacle. Sawyer's eyes lit up. Really? Damon nodded once more, his voice filled with reassurance. Compared to your uncle, your chances of recovery are even greater. Sawyer had long given up on the idea of ever regaining his mobility. He never imagined that Damon would reignite the flame of hope within him. Damon tapped his finger on his chin. But before I begin treating all of you, I need to ensure that nothing goes wrong. I will contact some doctors for their expertise. Simultaneously, he had another mission in mind, to 
to bring down the entire Martinelli family, co-signing them with the depths of history where they belong. The patriarch of the Martinelli family, Salvatore, sat calmly on his rat chair. Fritz, his henchman, was begging Salvatore to save him from Damon's wrath. Master, you have no idea how arrogant Damon is. I told him I was the right-hand man of the Martinelli family, but that bastard didn't listen and broke my hands and legs. He didn't even respect our family and insulted Fernando. Salvatore's expression remained stoic. A girl spoke up from the corner. Grandpa, you have to help. We can't let anyone think the Martinelli family is easy to bully. Salvatore knew what he had to do to protect his family's honor. With a stern voice, he said, Fritz, you have brought shame to our family. You will have to face the consequences of your actions. As for Damon, he will learn that no one messes with the Martinelli family and gets away with it. Five years ago, the Brokerton family fell from grace and the Martinelli family saw their chance to rise up. With years of hard work, their family tree grew lush and their roots ran deep. No one dared to challenge them, not even the Talbot family. But then, out of nowhere, a small-town nobody named Damon dared to step up to the Martinelli family's toes. Everyone knew that Salvatore, the Martinelli family's protector, would not stand for this kind of disrespect. If they didn't take action against Damon, others would think they were weak. The Martinelli family had to show everyone who was boss. Salvatore's determination to confront Damon stemmed from a shocking revelation. Damon was none other than the Everett's grandson. While the truth behind Damon's peculiar surname, Walker, remained elusive, there was no doubt about his lineage. This knowledge that sent Salvatore's senses into overdrive, making him hypervigilant. In the past, when Salvatore was still under Everett's wings, he had received immense favor and recognition. However, after Everett's passing, Salvatore's true nature was exposed. Years of suppressed resentment toward Everett had finally reached its boiling point, causing Salvatore to unleash his fury. Not only did he force Damon's uncle to resign from his position, but he also plunged the entire Brokerton family into a dark abyss. Fernando, on the other hand, took his vengeance to a whole new level. He felt suffocated by the dominance of Sawyer and Tyson throughout the years, nurturing a deep-seated grudge. And so, he devised a sinister plan to enact revenge on the descendants of the Brokerton family. Arnie and Sawyer, the unfortunate victims of Fernando's malevolence, were paralyzed while the limbs of the other Brokerton family members were shattered beyond repair. This cruel act was nothing short of Fernando's twisted masterpiece. Salvatore felt a surge of pride when he witnessed his grandson's techniques. It was as if Fernando had mastered a power that could rival the forces of nature itself. Fernando had completely decimated the Brokerton family, leaving many of them permanently crippled, and now Damon had returned, taking the opportunity to teach Fritz a lesson. It was clear that Damon intended to challenge the Martinelli family. He knew that the only way to find peace of mind was to eliminate Damon once and for all. After listening to Fritz's report and receiving encouragement from his granddaughter, Salvatore nodded solemnly and asked in a deep voice, Where is he now? Fritz wiped away his tears and stammered, I, I don't know for sure, but this morning I think he went to find the Brokerton family. Salvatore rolled his eyes. Stop crying, Fritz. Fernando will handle all your affairs with utmost care. But remember, when you venture outside, it's best to keep a low profile. We wouldn't want you to endure another beating at your age. Even though I stand by you, I fear your body may not be able to withstand it. You're the face of the Martinelli family, representing our prestige. We cannot let that be tarnished. Fritz's heart swelled with gratitude. Thank you, Master. I would gladly die as a loyal servant of the Martinelli family. Salvatore waved his hand dismissively. All right, Ari, you may go now. As long as you remain loyal to the Martinelli family, I promise you fair treatment. After Fritz left, Salvatore took a sip of whiskey and turned to his son, Mario. When will Fernando return? Give him a call. Mario, Salvatore's son and Fernando's father, quickly dialed Fernando's number only to find that it wouldn't connect. Mario sighed. Father, I'm afraid Fernando's phone is unreachable. Mario's gut twisted with unease. Father, Mario finally spoke up, his voice trembling slightly. Why don't we go and find Fernando? My heart is pounding so hard I can't help but fear for his safety. Fernando's crimes were heinous, especially when it came to the Brokerton family. He had committed countless acts of violence and bloodshed, even now, with the notorious Damon on the loose, Mario couldn't help but worry about what might happen to Fernando. Enough! Salvatore's voice boomed with anger. Fernando possesses the same strength and resilience as I did in my prime. How can a useless person like you doubt his ability to protect himself? My grandson is blessed by the heavens, and no harm shall come to him. 
If you continue to speak such nonsense, I'll shut you up myself. Rosanna, Salvatore's granddaughter, chimed in. Grandfather's absolutely right. Anyone who dares to lay a finger on my brother will face the wrath of our entire family. We won't just seek revenge. We'll make sure their entire lineage is wiped out. Salvatore's laughter filled the room, a mix of pride and confidence. A true warrior, this granddaughter of mine. Mario fell silent, his words swallowed by the weight of Salvatore's authority. Salvatore was always the alpha in the family, and poor Mario suffered from his overbearing ways. But Fernando was a force to be reckoned with. With his grandfather's backing, he was fearless and unstoppable. As the Martinelli family's power grew, so did Fernando's lawlessness and tyranny. He bullied anyone and everyone, and who knows how many women he had destroyed in the process. One high school girl fell victim to his irresponsibility and ended up taking her own life. When her parents came looking for answers, Fernando didn't feel an ounce of guilt. Instead, he broke their legs and threw them out like trash. Fernando had done countless heinous things over the years, and Mario couldn't help but feel a sense of impending retribution. But Salvatore didn't see it that way. He believed in the law of the jungle, with a strong prey on the weak. Evil karma was just wishful thinking, and history had proven that the most praised and domineering figures were often covered in blood and slaughter. Fernando may have been overbearing, but he wasn't brainless. With the Martinelli family's protection, he was destined for greatness. Mario couldn't help but speak up. But, Father, we can't force the Brokerton family into a dead end, can we? Salvatore's hand connected with Mario's cheek, the sound echoing through the room. He spoke with coldness that sent shivers down Mario's spine. You're too weak to handle the Martinelli family's business. I wouldn't dare to entrust it to you. If you had even a fraction of Fernando's toughness, I could die in peace. Salvatore's eyes narrowed as he continued. And as for the Brokerton family, they're nothing but a dying pack of dogs. What's the harm in killing them all? With my iron fist technique, they'll never darken our doorstep again. But just as Salvatore finished speaking, a loud boom shook the room. The steel gate had been knocked open by an incredible force. Damon strode in, his head held high, flanked by a group of strong men. Who said the Brokerton family is a pack of dying dogs? Damon's voice was filled with confidence. I'm here to stand up for my family. Salvatore is furious. Who are you? How did you get in here? But Damon just smiled coldly. I've taken care of your staff already. There's no need to shout. Rosanna screamed for her men to arrest Damon and his group, but none of the workers showed up. Salvatore is incredulous. How could you have taken care of our logistics staff? But Damon just shrugged. I have my ways, and even if you have hidden sentries, they won't be enough to stop me. Rosanna's voice echoed throughout the empty halls, filled with desperation and fear. Someone come! Someone come! Is everyone dead? But her cries fell on deaf ears, and no one responded to her pleas. Salvatore, taken aback and confused, couldn't comprehend what was happening. How could Damon have managed to eliminate their secret sentries? These sentries were strategically placed throughout the entire district, known only to a select few. It was a breach of trust that left Salvatore questioning everything. Was there a traitor within the Martinelli family? The thought sent shivers down Salvatore's spine. Who was this man and what did he want? The air was thick with tension as Salvatore pondered the possibilities. Breaking the silence, Damon finally revealed his name. My name is Damon. You should know who I am by now, right? Today, I've come bearing a grand gift to you. His words dripped with malevolence, as if on cue a group of burly men approached carrying a gunny sack. With a forceful toss, they emptied its contents onto the ground, revealing Fernando, battered and helpless. He lay there, resembling nothing more than a discarded animal. Salvador's anger ignited as he laid eyes on Fernando, drenched in blood. Fernando, what the hell happened? Get up! Don't you dare scare Grandpa! With a sinister smile, Damon taunted. There's no need to shout anymore. He's not dead, but he'll be crippled for life. This is his punishment for all the wickedness he's done. Salvatore was furious. How dare you treat my grandson like this? Aren't you afraid I'll wipe out your entire damn family? Damon chuckled sarcastically. Kill my entire family. Do you think I came to your family's gathering just to exchange pleasantries, you scum? Ah, you pitiful scion of the Brokerton lineage. Are you seeking revenge? What's the status of your precious Brokerton family now? Salvatore jeered. Damon waved his hand. A hulking figure lunged towards Salvatore and seized Salvatore by his hair, delivering blow after blow with ruthless force. His bravado crumbled, replaced by agonized wails. 
When the rest of the Martinelli family witnessed this horrifying scene, the air felt like it had been sucked up out of the room. Salvatore, his voice trembling, mustered the courage to speak up. I won't let you get away with this. Damon's cold smile widened. Oh, you can still talk. It seems I haven't taught you and your grandson well enough. Damon lifted Fernando's body and drenched him with a bucket of icy water to revive him. There was no time for idle chatter as Damon swiftly delivered a brutal blow to Fernando's mouth, causing blood to fill his mouth and leaving him unable to utter a coherent word. But Damon wasn't finished. He proceeded to break Fernando's fingers one by one. Fernando, now fully awake and excruciating agony, writhed on the ground. Stop torturing my grandson! Salvatore screamed. We didn't do anything wrong! Damon beckoned Fritz, who was cowering in the corner. Fritz, my friend, please come forward and share with everyone all the dirty secrets that the Martinelli family has been hiding. Fritz wrung his hands and addressed his boss. I'm sorry, Mr. Martinelli, but the evidence is clear. You've been taking bribes and colluding with foreign thieves, and Fernando has been using your identity to commit crimes. I've already given copies of evidence to Mr. Walker and the relevant departments. It won't be long before they investigate you. Salvatore's eyes widened in shock. You betrayed me! Fritz remained silent, his expression pained. He had always been loyal to the Martinelli family, but at the banquet, he had witnessed Damon's ruthless tactics and felt his resolve crumble. When Damon threatened to kill Fritz's wife and daughter, he knew he had to do something to protect them. So he had secretly sold out the Martinelli family, hoping they would take revenge and restore their honor. Fritz, who had been a loyal member of the family since his teenage years, was well aware of their immoral actions. In fact, he had been directly involved in planning and executing many of these nefarious activities. However, when Fritz finally decided to betray Salvatore, it was a blow that struck the very heart of the Martinelli family. Salvatore's anger flared up like a raging fire. You ungrateful dog! I've treated you well, and this is how you repay me? Fritz, too, was consumed by fury. Salvador, don't pretend to be noble. You've committed countless heinous acts in recent years. Cheating, kidnapping, murder, arson, illegal bioengineering. And the list goes on. Your moral compass is shattered and your consciousness is lost. The Martinelli family's dark secrets are finally being brought to light, and the consequences would be severe. Salvatore roared, I'll kill you! Fritz had long been prepared for this. However, Fritz was still young and Salvatore had just received a serious injury. Fritz knocked Salvatore to the ground. Fritz had dedicated himself to serving the Martinelli family, but it hadn't come without its share of humiliation. He had been beaten by Salvatore and even suffered the consequences of Fernando's actions. Fritz's daughter, once a radiant beauty, had been ruined by Fernando, and the compensation she received for her medical expenses was mere penance. The pain and shame drove her to the brink of suicide. Fritz silently endured it all, for the allure of wealth and glory had clouded his judgment, but that didn't mean he had forgotten or forgiven. No, Fritz meticulously documented every hardship he endured, every ounce of suffering in a small notebook. He patiently waited for the day when he could exact his revenge. And that day had finally arrived, as Damon and his men stormed into the Martinelli's family domain. Hope for a turnaround vanished. Fritz's fist collided with Salvatore's face, and a culmination of years of suffering. The sound of the impact reverberated through the room, a satisfying symphony of vengeance. Salvatore's face was gruesome sight, drenched in his own blood. Fritz, please, stop this madness. Have you forgotten everything we did for you? Fritz's eyes filled the burning rage. Of course I have it! But I also remember how that despicable Fernando violated my daughter! Struggling to catch his breath, Salvatore uttered his next words to Damon. Are you concerned about Fernando exacting revenge on you once he's healed? Damon's voice was slow and deliberate. Fernando, don't worry, his days are numbered. Suddenly, the sound of approaching footsteps echoed outside. Uniformed officers flooded the room. A middle-aged man addressed Salvatore with a stern tone. Salvatore, we have received reports that your family has violated the law and conspired with foreign enemies. We will now take you in for questioning. Do you have any objections? Salvatore tried to come up with a defense, but before he could respond, Mario spoke up with conviction. We're innocent, and besides, my dad and son need medical attention right away. They can't be arrested and interrogated like this. The police captain looked down his nose at the Martinellis. Capture them all and bring them away from me. Some tried to resist, but they were quickly subdued by force. The Martinelli family had fallen, but Damon knew that Fernando would look for him later. When the time came, Damon would be ready. Damon was exhausted. At home, he took a moment for himself. 
He plopped on the couch and turned on the television, surprised to see Veronica in the news. After Quinn's death, Veronica set her sights on annexing Quinn's assets. Her determination and ambition were awe-inspiring. As a result, the value of SeaTech skyrocketed, making it the hottest topic in both the financial and technological circles. Veronica's unwavering commitment to founding SeaTech and competing with Quinn for global recognition stemmed from a promise she had made long ago. Even in Damon's absence, she was determined to restore Astomar's former glory. Watching Veronica's captivating presence on the television, Damon's heart raced. He wondered if he should contact her. The following day, Damon made his way back to Miranda's house. Arnie sat beside the bed, while Miranda attentively cared for him. Meanwhile, Sawyer was multitasking like a pro, pushing a wheelchair with one hand and working his magic in the kitchen with the other. When Damon appeared, Miranda's eyes lit up with surprise. Arnie welcomed Damon with open arms. Sawyer poked his head out of the kitchen. Damon, you made it! Damon nodded solemnly and replied, I paid a visit to the Martinelli family yesterday. Miranda couldn't help but voice her concern. Cousin, you willingly went to the Martinelli family? Why would you take such a risk? Don't you know how dangerous they are? Sawyer had suffered greatly, and Arnie wasn't faring any better. Damon was now the sole beacon of hope for the Barkerton family. Damon declared, The reign of the Martinelli family has come to an end. Salvatore has been apprehended, and Fernando has been reduced to a worthless piece of trash by my own hands. Every member of the Martinelli family has been imprisoned, their freedom stripped away. They have committed unspeakable acts, and now they shall face the full force of the law's retribution. Everyone's jaw dropped. Damon continued, Today, I have come to deliver the news of the Martinelli family's downfall, and also to assist you in treating your disabilities. Damon had made a promise before, and he intended on keeping it. Damon placed his hand on Sawyer's leg. He discovered that Sawyer's thigh had suffered permanent damage, and years of confinement to a wheelchair had caused muscle atrophy. Most doctors would be powerless to help, but for Damon, there was no challenge. Damon channeled energy into Sawyer's thigh. Damon's eyes were tightly shut, beads of sweat glistening on Sawyer's body. Miranda and Arnie stood by, their confusion evident as they dared not to utter a word. Time seemed to stretch on, the tension building until finally, Damon's eyes fluttered open. With a gentle pat on Sawyer's shoulder, Damon said, All right, now give it a try. How do your legs feel? Sawyer, his hand gripping the wheelchair for support, slowly rose to his feet. Miranda tried to help her brother, but Damon stopped her. Don't move. Let him do it himself. With determination, Sawyer stood up, defying the helplessness that had plagued him for far too long. He felt no pain, no limitations. The wheelchair had been his constant companion, but now it seemed like a distant memory. But doubt still lingered in Sawyer's mind. Could this truly be real? Had he truly regained his mobility? Let's take two steps, Damon suggested. Driven by an overwhelming impulse, Sawyer took the first step, cautiously at first, but then with increasing speed. As he grew accustomed to the newfound freedom, a surge of strength coursed through his legs. Unbeknownst to Sawyer, Damon's superhuman energy had left its mark on his thigh, leaving behind remnants of its power. As his leg was repaired, the remaining strength transformed into a force that propelled him forward. I can stand up, he exclaimed. Damon confirmed it. Yes, your legs are completely healed. He leaped into the air. It's done! I'm completely cured! My wheelchair days are over! Miranda and Arnie couldn't hold back their tears. Damon turned his attention to Arnie. Uncle, come here as well. Damon gently placed his hand on Arnie's waist, and a warm sensation slowly spread through his body. Within moments, Arnie felt warmth flowing through his limbs. I can feel it! I can actually feel it! Arnie shouted with childlike excitement. Don't move too quickly. We're not done yet. Damon warned him. Damon tirelessly worked to help Arnie. With every ounce of strength he possessed, Damon skillfully manipulated the energy within Arnie's body. Arnie's condition was far more severe than Sawyer's. While Sawyer's ailment was confined to his legs, Arnie's spine was shattered and his torso was plagued with complications. But Damon refused to be discouraged. He embarked on a mission to restore functionality to Arnie's lower limbs. Arnie closed his eyes and surrendered himself to Damon's expertise. After what seemed like an eternity, Damon finally ceased his ministrations. He turned to Arnie. All right, uncle, give it a try. See if you can stand up. Arnie, his eyes brimming with anticipation, opened them and nodded gratefully. I can feel it. I feel the strength returning. Damon, sensing Arnie's newfound confidence, posed a question. Do you think you're ready to take a few steps? Arnie gingerly rose and began to walk. He wept as he realized the magnitude of what had just occurred. 
Damon, thank you. I'm completely healed. Arnie choked out. Damon smiled and turned to Miranda. Cousin, I haven't forgotten you. You shouldn't be working as a hotel waiter. I happen to have a company in need of a CEO, and I think you'd be perfect for the role. And hey, if Sawyer's interested, you can come along and check it out too. Damon's connections had grown exponentially, with countless businesses now under their control. It was a breeze for him to find a company for Miranda and Sawyer to manage. They didn't hesitate to accept the offer. This was the best possible outcome for them, and they were confident that their past experiences and skills would ensure their success. After a delightful dinner with the family, Damon bid them farewell, but just as he was about to leave, someone came rushing in with news. They had finally located Fernando and Meyerson. Damon knew that the grudge between him and Fernando still needed to be settled, Determined to confront his nemesis, he decided to bring Fifi back to Meyerson the next day. Karen offered to drive Damon and Fifi to the airport. As they stood at the airport, Karen's face filled with remorse. Damon, I want to apologize for everything I've done to you in the past. I know I've let you down, and I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me, especially for Fifi's sake. She had no idea what he did after the banquet, but what followed was nothing short of miraculous. Karen's business flourished like never before with countless big-name companies lining up to work with her and offer unwavering support. The regret was palpable. Karen realized that she had been blind to Damon's true potential and almost ruined her daughter's chance at happiness. But now, after experiencing the ups and downs in life, she has gained a newfound perspective. She even toyed with the idea of remarrying her ex-husband. But Damon was rarely able to relax for long. Trouble always found him. He had just returned to Meyerson when he received a frantic call from his friend Frank. Damon, you have to find Emily! She's in danger! Damon was taken aback. What had happened to Emily? I heard she's getting married to a gangster, Frank continued, and she doesn't even know his name! You're the only one who can help her now! Damon was shocked. He had saved Emily when she was sick, but she had left without saying goodbye. How could she be getting married now? But how can I help? He asked Frank. Frank was furious. How can a man help a woman? You know what I mean, Damon. Take her away from that thug! Damon hesitated but I have a wife. Frank spat on Damon's face. You didn't seem to care about your wife when you were flirting with Emily. You caused this trouble, so now you have to fix it. Damon knew Frank was right. He had to save Emily from this dangerous situation. He took a deep breath and made a decision. Okay, I'll do it. I'll save her. Frank sighed in relief. Thank you, Damon. You're a true friend. Just be careful, okay? Damon nodded. He knew this wouldn't be easy, but he had to try. He had feelings for Emily, and he couldn't let her marry a gangster. He had to be bold and take action. He was determined to save her no matter what it took. Emily was in trouble. She was about to marry an audacious man and make a huge mistake. No matter what, Damon had to help her. Frank pleaded with Damon. Don't let her jump into the pit of fire, man. Be bold. I can't do this on my own. She hardly knows a single detail about this guy, but her mind is made up. Our family is against it, but there's nothing we can do. You know better than anyone how stubborn Emily can be. Damon nodded. Okay, I can't say no to that. Where and when is this wedding? Tomorrow, Frank replied. It's at a hotel downtown. I'll give you the address. Make sure you pin the location on your navigation app so you don't get lost. Frank gave Damon the details about the wedding. Before he hung up, he said, Please don't waste time, Damon. Let me know if you need help. Damon ended the call. Fifi walked into the room. Who was that? It was just Frank. Damon replied nonchalantly. He wants to get a drink with me tomorrow night. He was lying through his teeth, but tried to maintain his composure. He didn't want Fifi to find out he was interfering in Emily's wedding. The next afternoon, in the bridal suite of the hotel, Emily was sitting in front of the dressing table and putting on makeup. She looked out the window in a desolate manner, and there was a trace of despair in her eyes. She didn't have the blessing of her parents, nor did she have her family and friends to attend the wedding. She had spent her own money on the venue and catering, essentially paying out of pocket for her fiancé and his friends to drink themselves into oblivion. She had never felt more alone. Emily applied rouge with a blank expression. At that point, she didn't care who she married. She barely cared about herself. When she was finished with her makeup, she slowly walked downstairs. She looked around, confused. She expected to see her fiancé and his group of drunk buffoons clowning around. But there was no one in the lobby except a man sitting in a dark corner, puffing a cigarette. Emily narrowed her eyes. Damon, what the hell are you doing here? Damon extinguished the cigarette and stood up. Is that any way to greet an old friend? 
I'm surprised you didn't invite me to the wedding. Are you going to hide the birth of your first child too? Emily looked around the lobby and furrowed her brow. She clenched her fist tightly. Where are the guests and my fiancé? Where did they go? Damon shook his head. Don't look for them anymore. I chased them away. I met your fiancé, by the way. He doesn't seem to like your type. He has a neck tattoo for crying out loud. What, did you just find some random guy on the street and agree to marry him? Do you even know his full name? Emily was quiet. Damon wasn't far off base. Ever since she'd found Damon again, she'd been brokenhearted. She wanted him, but he was unavailable. Thus, she gave up on love and decided to marry whoever asked her next. She was ashamed to admit to Damon that he was right. She didn't know her fiancé's full name. Little did she know that before she went downstairs, Damon and his men had engaged in a brief fistfight with the fiancé and his groomsmen. Of course, Damon came out on top. He threw a wad of cash at Emily's fiancé and told him to scram. The fiancé, dollar signs in his eyes, eagerly took the money and obeyed. Money had all he'd been after in the first place. He only wanted to marry Emily to enjoy the fruits of her labor. Emily didn't intend to chase after the so-called husband. After all, in Emily's heart, he was just a passerby. But she was still angry with Damon's actions. She didn't want to give him the satisfaction of feeling like he'd saved her. Damon, I'm not some damsel in distress who always needs your help. You interfered at my wedding when I was marrying Diego, and now you're here to cause trouble for a second time. Why are you doing this? Damon smiled sadly. Don't you know? The last time I saw you left me a letter that said we'll meet again if fate permits it. Well, Frank called me, but it might as well have been fate itself on the phone. Emily scowled. I went all out for this wedding, sparing no expense, and now you show up and chase away my fiancé. What do you think I should do? Everything will go to waste. It was obvious that she didn't mind her fiancé running away. She only cared about the non-refundable deposit she put down on the wedding cost. You barely knew the guy, Damon exclaimed. He left you when I paid him off. Why would you want to go through the wedding? Emily stomped her foot. I don't care. I want a wedding. It doesn't matter if I marry that guy or some other guy I meet in a bar. I know I'm a strong and independent woman, but is it so wrong to dream of being a bride? Damon had a sudden realization. Wait a second. Do you want this to happen? Did you ask Frank to call me so that I could rush to your aid? Now it's only the two of us and you're determined to go through with the wedding. Are you trying to trick me into role-playing of being your groom? Emily, who had her little secret exposed, felt a little embarrassed. She had indeed asked Frank to call Damon. She understood Damon's soul and knew that he would come. She'd even customized the groom's tuxedo to fit Damon's measurements. Damon said, Then what do you think we should do? You should marry me, Emily whispered. Everything's all set up. She nodded toward the Grand Hall. There's a wedding officiant and a group of violinists in there. I spent a pretty penny for a florist to decorate. If you change into that tuxedo, we can go through the ceremony in 10 minutes. Seeing that Emily didn't seem to be joking, Damon helplessly spread his hands and said, Emily, I have a wife and child. Emily rolled her eyes. Yeah, in name only. You've cheated on her how many times? There was Avery, Vicky, Scarlet. What, do you think I don't know? I mean, come on, Damon, we slept together. Damon raised his eyebrows. How do you know all that? I didn't even know you knew Vicky's name. Emily waved her hand. Never mind how I know. Let me ask you something. The last time I saw you, you said you had feelings for me. Do you say that to every woman? Damon sighed. Emily, this is inappropriate. Emily took a deep breath. Do you remember when I told you I had two things to tell you? Damon nodded. Yeah, the first was that you're transferring your job to Meyerson, but you never told me the second thing. Emily rested her hand on her stomach. I'll tell you now, Damon. I'm pregnant. Damon opened his eyes wide and looked at Emily's stomach. Indeed, there was a small bump. He was so shocked that he couldn't speak. What is it? Do you feel that this child has become your burden? Damon's mind was a mess. Firstly, the sudden appearance of this child surprised him. He didn't know whether it was true or not. However, what was even more confusing was that he had only slept with Emily a few times. And it had been a while back. How could there be a baby? Emily was smart. How could she not know what Damon was thinking? Are you still thinking that this child of mine might be someone else's? It has nothing to do with you? Damon hesitated. Emily was so angry that she pinched him. You jerk. Do you think I'm that kind of a woman? I haven't slept with anyone else since I slept with you. I already took three pregnancy tests and went to the doctor. It's confirmed. Damon was in a dilemma. Emily's pretty face started to turn red. I don't want you to make a big fuss and let Fifi know, okay? Damon wiped the sweat from his brow. If Emily was pregnant with his child, 
it meant that they were irrevocably linked for the rest of their lives. If he abandoned Emily, the Francis family would never forgive him. Then what do you plan to do? Emily exhaled slowly. I'm keeping the baby. It's my choice and I've already decided. Look, Damon, I'm tired. I thought you might be more interested in marrying me, even if it wasn't official or legal. But today isn't going as planned. You ruined it. Let's just go back to my house. Damon was backed into a corner. He glanced at Emily's bulging stomach and nodded. Okay, I'll drive. They got into the car. As Damon drove, he asked, By the way, how do you know Vicky? Emily said quietly, She came to find you. Damon had long guessed that it was possible, but his heart still jumped. When? Emily frowned. You don't care about the baby in my belly. You only think about other women all day long. How many women are you fooling around with? You're such a playboy. She glared at him. Anyway, she was trying to find you the day before yesterday, but I don't think you were in town. I was at your old apartment looking for you, so I ran into her there. What do you plan to do with Vicky? Are you trying to rekindle your old friendship? Damon stared at the road. He hadn't seen Vicky in ages. Was she married? Did she have a child? Sometimes he couldn't believe that he had no idea what happened to the women he had known ever since he was a child. Don't think of lying to me anymore. If you roll your eyes once, I'll know what you're up to. Emily changed the subject. She patted her stomach and said, Damon, what would the name be of our little bundle of joy? I have a baby name book that I've been perusing. We can look at it when we get back to my house. Despite himself, Damon was interested. He hadn't been able to help Fifi choose a name for his first child. Maybe everything would be different with the second one. I've always liked the name Phoebe for a girl and Dexter for a boy. Dexter? Emily let out a chuckle. Your taste is so weird. Gotta help it's a girl so she won't be saddled with your weird name choices. Emily stared at the window for a moment, lost in thought, then turned to gaze at him. Who do you think the baby will look like? Damon played along. Hopefully it'll look like you, unless the universe has a sense of humor. Emily giggled. Damon was handsome but humble. Well, I hope it's smart like you and athletic like me. She continued to wax poetically about her hopes for the baby's looks and personality until they reached the house. Damon parked the car. Before they went inside, Emily said, Damon, I want you to stay here with me tonight. You can just call Fifi and find an excuse. Emily threatened him while giving him a pitiful look. This kind of combination of soft and hard was effective. Damon called Fifi and said that he wanted to talk business with Frank. Fifi didn't doubt him. She was glad that he wouldn't be driving after imbibing at the bar with a friend. Damon felt guilty. Fifi was so understanding. He was once again embroiled in a mess of his own creation. The next morning, Emily and Damon took a walk in a nearby park. It was the same park where Damon and Vicky had passed many leisurely afternoon together. They sat on a bench, Emily resting her head on his shoulder, one hand gently caressing her belly. Damon, are you going to be here for me and the baby? Damon nodded resolutely. I'll be the best father I can be under the circumstances. Emily smiled. That's what I want to hear. Don't worry. I won't disturb your family or mess things up with you and Fifi. I just need your support. I only hope that you can come and see me and the baby when you have time. Even if it's four or five days a month, it's fine. Is that okay? Emily knew Damon's difficulties. She only wanted to get a little love between the gaps of his complicated life. Damon stroked Emily's hair and said, I'll be good to you for the rest of my life. They rose and walked to a bridge. It was covered with love locks from hopeful couples, swearing their eternal romance. Many years before, Vicky had affixed a lock on the bridge, railing, promising to love Damon forever. Emily gazed out of the water. Damon, I'm a little hungry. This pregnancy is doing a number on my body. I'm going to the snack bar. I'll be right back, okay? Do you want me to go with you? Damon asked. Emily shook her head. No, it's okay. I need to go to the restroom and freshen up anyway. See you in a few minutes. Just don't stray too far. She walked away. Damon watched her go. She was lithe and athletic. From behind, he couldn't tell that she was pregnant. Damon's thoughts turned to Vicky. Their relationship had been convoluted. There had been hostility and hatred, but also an inevitable draw. Why was she looking for him? He looked down at the bridge. Hundreds of love locks adorned the railing. He began to look for the one Vicky had placed there. At this moment, he saw a woman with a graceful figure and dark hair standing quietly on the other end of the bridge. She was examining each lock, then frowning, as if she were looking for something she couldn't find. She reached out and tapped one of the park guards on the shoulder. 
Excuse me, sir. Do you know how to find a lock I placed here many moons ago? I donated money to the park, so I hope it wasn't removed. The park guard cocked his head to the side. If you're one of the generous benefactors, then I'm sure it's still here. Damon's jaw dropped. He couldn't see the other woman from the front, but he was positive he knew that voice. It was Vicky. Damon's heart pounded. He wanted to call it to Vicky, but his voice caught in his throat. Damon, what are you doing? Suddenly, Emily appeared beside him, a snow cone in her hand. Stop staring off into the distance. Come on, let's go shopping for supplies for the baby. Damon helplessly followed Emily, glancing behind him at Vicky as they left. Fifi was his wife, and now Emily is pregnant with his child. These two relationships were enough for Damon to worry about. Vicky didn't notice Damon. She was still searching for the love lock she'd affixed to the bridge all those years ago, but there were too many padlocks to sift through. Where is it? She mumbled to herself, shielding her eyes from the sun. She closed her eyes and tried to remember. Suddenly, she gasped. She ran to the far corner of the bridge. There, rusty and, and discolored, was the love lock. It had been six years. However, she could still see the words on it. Vicky and Damon Forever was scribbled in permanent marker. This meant their love was still there, even if Damon was dead. Six years had passed in the blink of an eye. She glanced around. The bridge was full of young, hopeful couples. Vicky felt as if she were looking at herself in the past. She wiped her eyes and wandered away from the bridge. She didn't know where she was going, but before long she found herself meandering toward Damon's former house. Tears streamed down Vicky's face, and the memories of when she was with Damon surfaced in her mind. From the moment the two of them were born, their fates were destined to be intertwined. The more she struggled against it, the more she fell in love with him. Everything had long been predestined. A curtain rustled in the upstairs window. Vicky gasped. Someone was inside. Was it a thief? Or could it have been Damon himself? Vicky's heart jumped to her throat when she thought of this, but she quickly pushed it out of her mind. Damon had already passed away. How could it be Damon? Vicky jumped behind a tree and cautiously peered out. Two people exited the house. The first person to walk out was Damon's little sister, Selena. She heard a man's voice. Vicky's heart was filled with hope. But the moment she saw the man's face, her face fell. The person who walked out was Selena's husband. Vicky was disappointed, but she had already guessed that this would be the result. Her fantasies were unrealistic. Discouraged, Vicky made her way to the airport. She'd book a first-class ticket back to Los Angeles. She arrived early and went to the VIP lounge, settling into a large armchair. The two men in the lounge were having a conversation. You won't believe what happened recently. The mighty Martinelli family has fallen. Even the notorious Salvatore, their patriarch, has been thrown behind bars. It's safe to say that the Martinelli family's reign in power has come to a miserable end. A bald man nearby replied, It's about time. Those Martinellis were nothing but troublemakers. The first man nodded. Oh, don't even get me started on that scoundrel Fernando. He's committed countless crimes, especially against innocent young girls. But it's not just Fernando, the bald man said. Even their lackeys were unsufferable. The middle-aged man agreed. Right, my friend. They were all so arrogant, especially their henchman Fritz. His ego was beyond words. But here's the kicker. The middle-aged man continued. His voice dropped to a whisper. Guess who handed over the incriminating evidence? It was none other than Fritz himself. The bald man smirked. After what Fernando did to his daughter, Fritz was a ticking time bomb. But what could someone like Fritz, a mere lapdog, have the strength to take on such powerful dynasty? He had someone backing him up. The middle-aged man frowned. Who could that be? The bald man leaned closer. Word on the street is that's Damon Walker, the founder of Astromar. Vicky, who had been dozing off, suddenly jolted awake at the mention of the name. Her body tensed, and her ears perked up. The other man shook his head. No, it can't be. Damon Walker drowned a long time ago. You must be mistaken. The bald man reached for a cigarette. He's alive. He's a descendant of the infamous Brokerton family. You know, the one that collapsed because of the Martinelli family? Vicky's eyes widened in shock, her heart pounding so hard that she thought it might burst out of her chest. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. The middle-aged man exclaimed, The whole world knew about his death. How could he possibly still be alive? With a hint of annoyance, the bald man replied, If I didn't have solid evidence, I wouldn't have mentioned it. Do you think I'd make something up like this? You see, I have my ways. I planted a maid within the Martinelli family. She's my informant. She recorded everything on her phone and reported it to me. The middle-aged man's curiosity was piqued. Tell me, what exactly happened? The bald man puffed in his cigarette. 
Well, let me start by saying that Salvatore was as arrogant as ever, but little did he know that Damon summoned Fritz to testify against the Martinelli family. And boy, did Fritz spill the beans. Fritz meticulously documented every crime committed by the Martinelli family, and before they knew it, the authorities stormed in and apprehended every family member. Even my poor maid friend wasn't spared. Though she was useful to me, Fritz's testimony was submitted first. The middle-aged man's jaw dropped. He provided such powerful evidence against the Martinelli family, even though he was involved in some of their crimes. That must have been a difficult decision, but I'm sure he was granted immunity. The bald man extinguished his cigarette. Do you want to see the video my informant sent me? After all, the Martinelli family's descendants crushed your company. You must have developed deep hatred for them. Vicky tapped the man on the shoulder. Sir, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation earlier. Did you mention someone named Damon who is supposedly still alive? The same Damon who used to be the boss of Astromar? The bald man nodded. Indeed, my dear. Vicky couldn't contain her excitement as she pressed on. But wait, isn't it wildly believed that he passed away ages ago? A knowing smile played on the middle-aged man's lips. I too believed he was gone, but the truth is Damon is very much alive and thriving. Curiosity got the better of her, and she couldn't resist asking. May I also watch the video? The bald man passed his phone to Vicky. She eagerly took hold of it, her eyes fixated on the screen. The footage was grainy, a clandestine recording that lacked clarity. But even through the distorted images, Vicky can make out Damon's furious outburst toward Salvatore. Beside him, Fernando crumpled to the ground. Damon summoned Fritz to confront Salvatore, and soon enough, authorities stormed in. Salvatore, defeated and resigned, was apprehended. But Vicky didn't care about the Martinelli family's capture. From the very first frame to the last, she couldn't tear her gaze away from Damon. It had been years since they last laid eyes on each other, and the image on the screen was blurry. But Vicky's heart knew without a doubt that it was him. His voice, his gait, his every movement, they were all so familiar. He wasn't dead after all. Vicky's eyes welled up with tears of joy and disbelief. Hey, miss, why are you crying? The bald man asked, assuming that Vicky's family had fallen victim to the deceitful Martinelli family. Trying to console her, the middle-aged man said, Don't be sad, dear. The Martinelli family has already faced the consequences of their actions. But Vicky paid no attention to his words. She returned the phone to the middle-aged man and stood up determined to find Damon and uncover the truth. Vicky emerged from the terminal to get a breath of fresh air. She wiped away her tears and took a moment to compose herself. Then she pulled out her phone and dialed Fifi's number. Before Damon disappeared, Vicky and Fifi had been good friends. It had been a while since they'd spoken. As soon as Fifi picked up, her voice was filled with excitement. Vicky, what's up? Vicky exhaled slowly. Fifi, I'm coming to Meyerson tomorrow morning. Can I come see you? I'd love that, Fifi replied. After chatting for a bit longer, the two hung up. Vicky clenched her fist and muttered, Damon Walker, just you wait. I'll show you who's boss. Damon and Fifi were knee-deep in the chaos of rearranging furniture in their old house. It was about time they bid farewell to the Walker family home now that Damon had returned. Thankfully, Selena and her husband lent a helping hand during the move. Fifi nonchalantly hung up the phone. Fifi, who was that on the phone? Damon inquired. Fifi smiled. Guess. Damon shook his head, a puzzled expression on his face. A friend of yours? Fifi nodded with a mischievous grin. That's right, but she's your friend too. It's Vicky. She's coming over to our place tomorrow. We better tidy up. Vicky. Could it be that she already knew he wasn't dead? Memories flooded back to Damon, reminding him of the time when Vicky and Fifi lived together in the house. Vicky was always up to some peculiar antics, often causing trouble for him. Although Damon missed Vicky dearly, the thought of her wrath of not informing her about his survival sent shivers down his spine. Fifi noticed Damon's discomfort. What's wrong? Don't you want to see Vicky? Damon tried to play it cool. Of course I do. As they finished cleaning the house, Damon's phone suddenly rang. He swiftly retrieved it from his pocket to see Wendy's name flashing across the screen. He quickly answered. Hey, Damon, where are you? Can you come find me? I have something incredibly important to tell you. Damon's brow furrowed. What is it? Wendy's voice trembled with urgency as she replied. It's something of the utmost importance. I fear you won't believe me, but trust me, it's crucial. The repetition of the word important in Wendy's plea concerned Damon. He agreed to meet her. Who was that? Fifi asked. It was just Wendy Flagstaff. Damon replied. Fifi is well aware of Wendy's existence and the promise Damon had made Wendy's brother. How did she find you? Fifi had only recently discovered Damon's whereabouts herself so she certainly didn't expect Wendy to know as well. 
Did Damon take the initiative to seek out Wendy? Although Damon's intentions were purely to fulfill his promise to Will, Fifi couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy. Wendy may not possess the same beauty as Fifi, but there was no denying her charm. Damon quickly explained how he coincidentally bumped into Wendy outside the office building, hoping to reassure Fifi that he had no intention of seeking her out. As Damon finished explaining, a wave of relief washed over Fifi. She had no intention of stopping Damon. After all, he had made a solemn promise to take care of Wendy, and going against that oath was simply out of the question. Damon made his way to Wendy's apartment. As he arrived downstairs, he caught sight of Wendy standing on her tiptoes, eagerly peering out the door. The moment Wendy spotted Damon, her face lit up with joy. She grabbed his hand and led him toward the house, unable to contain her excitement. Wendy, what's going on? Damon asked. Wendy's voice trembled. My brother came to see me last night. Damon was taken aback. Will? Wendy nodded. Yes, it was my brother Will. This revelation shocked Damon to his core. He recalled the intense battle he had fought with Will, a battle that had ultimately led to Will's self-destruction. Had Wendy seen a ghost? Wendy spoke softly. Last night, I was out shopping on the street. As I walked into an alley, a gangster tried to harm me. Just as fear began to consume me, a masked man suddenly appeared and saved me. Even though his face was covered, his body language reminded me of my brother. She took a deep breath. Then, just as he was about to leave, I grabbed hold of him tightly. I tore off his mask, fully expecting to see a stranger's face. And then, he pressed. He admitted it! She exclaimed. Can you believe it? All these years, he's been silently protecting me. He knew about us, Damon. He knew we had met. And now he's asking me to find you to make sure you pay attention to the Martinelli family. Damon's mind raced, trying to process the information. Could it be true? But doubts crept in. What if the Martinelli family had somehow discovered Wendy's connection to Will and were playing a cruel game, pretending to lie to her? No, Damon thought, shaking his head. There had to be more to it. This was a trap, a ploy to lure him in and Will's self-destruction, right under his nose, only added to the suspicion. If Will was still alive, it would be beyond belief. Though some members of the Martinelli family were in prison, surely they had spies, hidden in the shadows, operating behind closed doors. They were after Wendy, seeking to gain her trust and lead her into their trap. But then again, Damon pondered, was it really necessary for them to go through all this trouble? If it was truly Fernando who had sent them, they could have simply captured Wendy without all the elaborate schemes. But one thing was clear, Wendy was in danger. The fact that she had almost been attacked was a chilling reminder that her safety was at stake. Wendy looked at him with a knowing smile and said, Damon, I have a feeling that the person behind all this is my brother Will. Can you please stay here tonight? He wants to see you. Without a moment's hesitation, Damon agreed. Hiding and running away was not his style, especially now that he no longer feared the Martinellis. He excused himself to call Fifi and concocted a story about a business meeting. Damon could sense Fifi's reluctance on the other end of the line. Promise me that you won't get involved with that god sister of yours. Damon's response was firm and sincere. I promise you, my love. It's just a meeting. I would never jeopardize our relationship. Damon hung up the phone, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. He was determined to protect Wendy and bring an end to the danger that surrounded her. After Damon got off the phone with Fifi, Wendy suddenly let out a blood-curdling scream. She had accidentally cut her hand. Wendy's legs gave out and she collapsed into his arms. I'm covered in blood, she whimpered. Please hold me for a while. Damon felt a pang of confusion and guilt. Fifi's voice was still ringing in his ears and here he was holding another woman in his arms. But Wendy's soft breaths and the way she clung to him made it hard to resist. If you feel uncomfortable, go to bed for a while. I'll make dinner for you. Before he knew what was happening, Wendy left a trail of stolen kisses from his unsuspecting mouth. Damon was unable to dodge her advances, but as soon as he felt her lips, his instincts kicked in and forcefully pushed Wendy away. What the hell are you doing, Wendy? Damon exclaimed. I came here with Fifi's permission. I promised her I wouldn't make a mistake. Wendy scoffed. Oh, please, Damon. Can you honestly swear that you've never strayed outside of your marriage? Damon was left speechless. She had hit the nail on the head, exposing his hypocrisy. Wendy, with a mischievous smile, continued to play her game. It'll be our little secret. Damon shook his head, trying to regain control of the situation. Wendy, this is not how it works. Don't push me, or you'll see a side of me you don't like. But Wendy refused to let go, her body writhing with desperation. Am I not pretty enough for you? Why do you treat Fifi like a queen but show me nothing but coldness? Damon was both angry and amused at Wendy's audacity. Fifi is my wife, Wendy. It's a different relationship than the one I have with you. Frustrated, Wendy reached out to him 
but he shoved her away. Ow! Wendy shrieked. Damon sighed. I'm sorry, Wendy, but please don't pressure me, okay? Wendy's voice trembled. If you don't want to be with me, then you can leave. I won't stop you. Wendy stormed off into the balcony. She couldn't help but feel a deep sense of loneliness. It's heartbreaking that besides my mom, there's no one else in this world who loves me or cares for me. Why? Why is it like this? Please come inside. Damon said. It's dangerous out there on the balcony. I don't trust those rickety old railings. Wendy begrudgingly came inside. What's the point? You can't just keep watching over me for the rest of your life, can you? Damon's stern expression softened as he reached out to wipe away her tears. As Damon began to bandage her, Wendy's voice was barely audible. Damon, am I beautiful? Beautiful. He replied sincerely. But you should find your love. I can't be the man for you. Wendy tried to make eye contact with him. Why did you reject me? Damon couldn't bear to meet her gaze. I have a wife and a child. You know that. Undeterred, Wendy pressed on. Then do you have a lover outside of your marriage? Damon hesitated, his eyes betraying his uncertainty. No, he finally admitted. You're lying, Wendy accused. Damon, you promised to take care of me for the rest of my life. You can't go back on your word. Damon finished applying the bandage and solve. Then, as long as you promise not to give me any trouble, I'll come see you once a week. Will that be enough? Later that evening, a man strolled through the front door. Damon, long time no see. His voice was a little hoarse and a little stiff. Damon narrowed his eyes. Could it truly be Will? As Wendy had suggested, he couldn't recall ever meeting this man before. Yet there was something about him that stirred a sense of familiarity within him. Before Damon could say anything, the man swiftly launched into an attack. His speed was electrifying, catching Damon off guard. However, Damon had grown stronger since their last encounter. With ease, he evaded the man's lethal strike and swiftly retaliated. It became apparent that the middle-aged man did not intend to fight to the death. Eventually, the man was forced to retreat, coming to a halt as he uttered, Stop. Damon's eyes widened in disbelief as he stared at Will. Well, 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 Will said. You understand why I had to test you just now. I must say, Damon, you've exceeded my expectations. It's only been a few years, but you've become so much stronger. Stronger than even when I self-destructed all those years ago. Will's smile widened as he seemed to read Damon's thoughts. Surprised, are you? But you've been there for my sister and mother. Caring for them all these years. I appreciate it. Just as I expected, you didn't disappoint me. I never doubted you. Damon was astonished. It was as if Will had been watching him all along. Turning his attention to his sister, Will said, Wendy, didn't you promise me a spaghetti dinner? Wendy jumped into action. Please sit down. Damon, you too. I'll go and whip up something delicious for you guys. Damon settled into his seat as Will poured the wine. He was still flabbergasted and slightly trepidatious. Do you remember when we created the groundbreaking plugin and established KC Games? Will asked. When we encountered that major setback, we managed to pull our resources and find a solution together. Looking back, it's incredible how much we accomplished in such a short amount of time. Damon remained silent, waiting for Will's next revelation. Remember that day when I seemingly blew myself up? Well, since I'm sitting with you now, you just want to hear the story, right? Damon's eyebrows shot up. Will casually lit a cigarette and began to unravel the unbelievable truth. After the explosion, I thought I was a goner. Will began. I expected to wake up in the fiery depths of hell. But to my astonishment, I found myself in a container connected to a network of tubes. It was as if my body had been destroyed, and this new vessel was forcefully fused with my brain. I still can't fathom how I managed to survive. As it turns out, they were conducting another experiment. They discovered that with bioengineered humans, even after death, as long as the brain remains intact, it's possible to survive with a newfound strength and power beyond imagination. Damon listened intently. It was beyond anything he could have ever imagined. Will sipped his wine. The extended Martinelli family knows you're still alive, and they're coming for you. Fernando has recovered and is already scheming. You're in a dangerous situation and those lunatics won't hesitate to take you out. Don't even think about challenging them with your current strength. You can only do what you can to protect yourself. At that time, Wendy served the food. Will didn't want to worry Wendy any further, so he kept quiet about his dangerous encounters. Thanks for taking care of my sister all these years, Damon. I'll keep an eye on the organization and let you know if there are any movements. Wendy took a bite of spaghetti. Brother, what happened to you? Will just smiled and replied. I was rescued by a mysterious stranger when I was at death's door. It was a lie, of course. Will didn't want to drag Wendy into his bloody world. He knew the truth would be too shocking for her to handle. 
Oh, hey, do you know which hospital our mother is in? Will asked Wendy. Wendy nodded. She's at Hodgins Hospital. They have some of the best medical facilities in the country. Thanks to Damon's financial help, her mother had been able to receive top-notch treatment by moving to Meyerson from South Rivertown. Although her mother's condition was serious, the advanced treatment she received had stabilized her health for the time being. With her knowledge that her mother was in good hands, Wendy's mood had improved significantly. Let's go visit her, but remember, we can't let her know that I'm still alive, Will said. After finishing their meal, the three of them went to the hospital to see Wendy's mother. When Will caught sight of his mother, a tear trickled down his cheek. It had been so long since he had seen her. He wished he'd been able to tie up his loose ends before selling his soul to the devil and self-destructing. In the wake of her son's tragic death, Mrs. Flagstaff's hope had shattered into a million pieces. The toll of grief had aged her beyond recognition. Her once vibrant hair was now a sea of white, and her body stooped and weary. Once efficient and full of vigor, she now had lost her spark. But on this particular day, as they entered the hospital room, she was in better spirits. Wendy pushed open the door with determination. Let's go in. Wendy is here. Mrs. Flagstaff's face lit up with a smile she caught sight of her. And then her eyes landed on Damon, another familiar face from their past. She'd never heard the news of Damon's death. Damon is here too. Sit, sit. She beckoned them closer. Can I offer you a snack? There's a fruit basket on the table. She struggled to reach for the fruit, her frail hands trembling. Damon had already done so much for the mother and daughter, from the support he had provided in their hometown to the present moment, where his help had made their lives just a little bit easier. Without Damon, their journey would have been filled with even more hardships. Mrs. Flagstaff, you rest. I'll cut the fruit. Damon insisted, gently resting the fruit basket from her hands. Will, standing silently in the doorway, didn't utter a word. May I ask who you are? Mrs. Flagstaff inquired, her voice gentle and inviting. Will averted his gaze. I'm Wendy's friend, he replied. I heard from Wendy that her mother was seriously ill, so I came to see you. Mrs. Flagstaff's smile widened. Please, have a seat. What would you like to eat? We have an abundance of fresh fruits. I'll wash them for you, dear. Will shook his head gently, his hand resting on his mother's. I heard from Wendy that you need to take care of yourself. He said softly, I might have some ideas. Perhaps you can indulge in gardening. Let go of those unhappy thoughts and focus on nurturing flowers and plants. If you do that, I truly believe you can live at least another few decades in peace. Furthermore, Will continued. His voice filled with conviction. You shouldn't return to South Rivertown. Instead, buy a house in Meyerson. Money won't be an issue as Wendy will have more than enough. She'll take care of you. Will's words flowed effortlessly, as if a dam had burst, releasing all the suppressed thoughts and concerns he had carried for years. His mother felt the depth of his care and concern. Mrs. Flagstaff patted his hand. My child, you have a heart of gold. If it weren't for your appearance, I would have thought you were my long-lost son, but you look nothing like him. As she spoke of her son, tears streamed down her face. Each one a testament to the love she had for him. Will's heart was in turmoil, feeling the pain and sadness that his mother was experiencing. He knew that if he stayed any longer, he would lose control of his emotions. Ma'am, it was a pleasure to meet you. I have some matters to attend to, but I'll be back to visit soon. Will said, trying to keep his voice steady. The mother held onto Will's hand tightly. Child, can't you spend more time here? I enjoy your company. Will gently pulled his hand away, explaining that he had important things to take care of. As he walked toward the door, Wendy and Damon followed him out. Will handed Wendy a bank card with enough money to ensure that she and her mother would never have to worry about finances again. You don't need to see me off, Will said. Go back and chat with Mom. I can see that her mood is unstable. We'll catch up later. Will grabbed Damon's arm and pulled him outside to smoke a cigarette. Curiosity gained the better of him, Damon finally asked, Why didn't you just tell your mom who you are? Will stood by the window, gazing out into the world beyond. You know exactly why. I was meant to die, Damon, and yet here I am, brought back to life. But I'm well aware I'm just a pawn in this grand scheme, and my time will end. I can't hurt my mother again. Damon smoked. But Will, there's so much more to life than revenge. What about finding love, starting a family? Will smiled wistfully. I'm neither human nor ghost now, Damon. My chances at fatherhood or a normal life was taken away long ago. He puffed on his cigarette. It's always been the same, Damon. When I'm gone, I need you to promise me that you'll protect my family. I can see how much Wendy cares for you, Damon. I don't want to see your heart broken again. If there's a chance, just accept her love. Damon shook his head adamantly. She sees me as nothing more than a brother. Will tried to roll his eyes. 
Regardless, promise me that you won't let my sister suffer. In the hospital ward, Wendy was carefully peeling an apple for her mother. Wendy, who was that friend of yours just now? Her mother asked curiously. Wendy hesitated for a moment, but decided to keep the truth to herself. Oh, just an ordinary friend, she replied. But her mother wasn't convinced. Ordinary friend? Why do I feel like I know him from somewhere? Wendy's heart skipped a beat. She tried to play it cool. What do you mean, Mom? Her mother's eyes lit up with recognition. He reminds me of your brother Will, especially the way he looked at me. And why did he cry when he saw me just now? Mrs. Flagstaff bit her lip. Oh, how I wish he was still alive. He would have been married by now with children of his own. Wendy felt a lump form in her throat as she held back her tears. She wanted to tell her mother the truth, that the man who had just left the room was indeed her brother. But something held her back. Perhaps Will had his reasons for not revealing himself. The question that haunted Will's mother was why her beloved son had left this world so prematurely. With each word she uttered, tears streamed down her face, as the pain of losing him resurfaced once again. Take care of my sister, Will whispered, his voice filled with determination. With those words, Will transformed into a mysterious black shadow, blending seamlessly into the night sky. Wendy's concern was evident as she turned to Damon. Is my brother in trouble? Damon's voice is calm and steady. Your brother possesses the strength to overcome any peril that may come his way. Wendy silently trailed alongside Damon, her trust in him evident with every step they took. Once they reached her home, Damon prepared to bid her farewell, but Wendy stopped him. Wait. Damon turned to face Wendy, only to find her cheeks flushed with embarrassment. With a gentle touch, she wiped away a faint kiss mark from his cheek. Oh, Damon, you really should be more careful. Didn't you notice the mark on your cheek? It would be quite the scandal if Fifi were to see. Damon hurriedly glanced at his reflection in the mirror, and there it was. A faint but undeniable kiss mark. He couldn't recall when Wendy had planted it there, but now he realized he had been parading around with it all day long. To his dismay, Damon realized that Will had noticed it as well. It dawned on him that Will might have mistaken the innocent jester for something more. Damon's eyes burned with frustration as he glared at Wendy. Why in the world didn't you tell me that your lipstick was smeared all over my cheek this whole time? He hastily wiped it off with a crumpled piece of toilet paper. Before he could say anything else, Wendy rushed over and enveloped him in a tight hug. Damon, could you please come see me more often? Damon nodded, his heart softening at Wendy's plea. A wave of sweetness washed over Wendy as she stood on her tiptoes, ready to steal a kiss from Damon. However, just as their lips were about to meet, she hesitated and pulled back. Here, Wendy said, take this air freshener and spray it on yourself. Otherwise, you'll smell like my perfume. She let go of Damon as his figure disappeared, leaving her longing for more. When Damon returned to the house, Fifi was upset. The source of Fifi's distress was none other than their next door neighbors. The neighbors had let their garbage pile up right to the doorstep of Fifi's house. And when she went to confront them about it, they dared to claim squatter's rights. Fifi had tried to get property management involved, but they didn't have the authority to forcibly remove the garbage. All they could do was issue a warning to the neighbors, which they seemed to take well, until they returned and started humiliating Fifi all over again. These neighbors had money and power, and they weren't afraid to use it to get their way. Fifi was left angry and helpless, unable to do anything but temporarily get someone to take away the trash. Damon recalled when he and Avery first moved in and met their neighbors. They had been so arrogant and condescending, but once they found out that he was the founder of the Everbright Company and drove a Bentley, they quickly changed their tune. Could it be that these were the same neighbors causing all this trouble for Fifi? The next morning, Damon and Fifi wasted no time tidying up the house, ensuring everything was in order. Just as the clock struck 10, Vicky called Fifi and asked her to pick her up from the airport. Damon, I'm gonna go fetch Vicky. Make the pork ribs for lunch while I'm gone, okay? With those words, Fifi hurriedly dashed out the door. Meanwhile, Damon's emotions were in a state of contradiction. On one hand, he longed for Vicky's presence, just as he yearned for Veronica and Avery. The day he spotted Vicky at the park, his heart skipped a beat, yet he was apprehensive. He couldn't shake off the memories of the trouble Vicky had caused when they all lived under the same roof. Moreover, there was a deep connection between Damon and Vicky, one that he feared Fifi might discover. Lost in thought, Damon suddenly heard footsteps approaching from outside. The sweet voices of two women filled the air, and he watched as Fifi swung open the door and entered the house. Cupcake, could you lend Vicky a hand with her luggage? She's planning to stay with us for a few days. Despite her repeated warnings to herself about controlling her emotions, Vicky trembled when Damon finally stood before her. 
Her eyes glistened with moisture, but she fought back the tears, biting her lip and stubbornly swallowing her emotions. Luckily, Fifi, who was assisting Vicky, was too preoccupied to notice her unusual behavior. The two locked eyes. Damon, too, managed to regain his composure and greeted her with a calm demeanor. He politely gestured for her to enter. Hey, Vicky, please come in. Fifi swiftly stowed away the luggage and returned to Damon. Did you prepare lunch like I asked you to? Damon shook his head. You arrived too quickly. I didn't have time. Fifi made her way into the kitchen. The ribs were still marinating on the counter. She rolled her eyes, though her smile quickly returned. I'll take care of the ribs. I'm a better cook than you anyway. Fifi called out to Vicky, her voice carrying through the open door. Vicky, come and lend me a hand. Vicky nodded and eagerly joined Fifi in the kitchen. Before long, the harmonious sound of their laughter and chatter filled the air. As the trio sat down to enjoy their dinner, Fifi and Vicky were engrossed in their own world of conversation, leaving Damon feeling like a mere spectator. Later that night, Fifi and Vicky embarked on a late night shopping spree. When it was time to retire for the evening, Fifi boldly ushered Damon out of the room. She wanted to have a slumber party with Vicky. Those two were like teenagers when they got together. Left alone in another room, Damon longed to ask Vicky what her distant demeanor meant, if she missed him as much as he missed her. Yet, he held back, and he found solace in comforting himself. As the sun began to rise, Damon was still in a deep slumber. Suddenly, he felt a presence in the room. In the darkness, he could barely make out the silhouette of a person, but as their eyes adjusted, he saw that it was Vicky. Why did you come in? Damon asked, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Didn't you sleep with Fifi? Don't you want to see me? Vicky retorted. Damon sat up, trying to shake off the grogginess of sleep. He still felt slightly uneasy around Vicky, especially after all that had happened between them. How did you know I'm not dead? Damon asked, changing the subject. Vicky replied, You've caused quite a stir in the Martinelli family. How could anyone not know that you're still alive? Damon was at a loss for words. He had never seen Vicky like this before, so vulnerable and raw. He could feel her pain and confusion, and it broke his heart. Everyone in the world knows that you're not dead. Vicky continued, her tears blurring her vision. But I'm the only one who's been left out in the dark. I'm the fool who's been waiting for you all this time. As she spoke, the arrogance and coldness that Vicky had always put up as a shield disappeared, revealing a woman who was hurting and in need of comfort. Damon, the man she had longed to see for six agonizing years, had finally reappeared. But alongside the elation, a deep sense of despair settled in her soul. Damon had returned almost a year ago, yet he had never made an effort to seek her out. Did he truly not care about her at all? She couldn't contain her frustration. Tell me, Damon, have you not thought about me even once? His expression spoke volumes. In that instant, Vicky realized that she had never truly understood Damon's character. What's the matter? Are you afraid of losing Fifi? The charade was over, and Vicky saw right through him. She approached the bed. I searched for you everywhere. Please keep your voice down. Damon tried to shush her, but Vicky wasn't having it. The more you're afraid of me, the louder I'll be, she warned. Damon groaned, knowing that Vicky wasn't messing around. But as she crawled under the covers, he couldn't resist the temptation to hold her close. It had been years since they had seen each other, but the familiarity and tenderness between them was still there. Do you have any idea how much I've missed you? Vicky whispered. At that moment, their lips met in a passionate kiss. Damon swiftly pulled away. Fifi is next door. Damon reminded her, his voice strained. Vicky responded by sinking her teeth into his neck, her eyes brimming with mischief. Fifi is sound asleep. Come on, I can't bear it any longer. Before long, their bodies were intertwined in a frenzy of desire. Vicky fought to suppress her moans, fearful that Fifi might awaken to their indiscretions. Yet, like dry firewood meeting a flame, their passion burned uncontrollably, consuming them both. After an hour of ecstasy, Vicky reluctantly dressed herself and left. The next morning, Damon dragged himself out of bed around 9 o'clock, only to find Vicky and Fifi already up and about. To his surprise, the two girls were working together, cheerfully preparing at breakfast and engaging in lively conversation. As Damon rubbed his tired eyes, Vicky shot him a glance before proudly lifting her head, as if the excitement from the previous night had never happened. Meanwhile, Fifi couldn't help but notice something off about Damon's appearance. Why do you have those bags underneath your eyes? You look like you're still half asleep. Fifi inquired, generally concerned. Damon, not wanting to reveal the truth about Vicky's relentless demands that kept him up all night, simply replied, I was bored, so I stayed up gaming. How could he possibly confess to Fifi that Vicky had been the one to instigate? Damon glanced over at Vicky, who appeared perfectly put together, 
with no hint of craziness she had exhibited the night before. It was as if she had completely distanced herself from the whole ordeal. He cited how cunning women could be. Vicky had cleverly concealed her dark circles with makeup, making it seem like she had nothing to do with their sleepless night. It was a masterful move on her part. You must have stayed up really late. Vicky smirked, her words dripping with sarcasm. You look absolutely dreadful. Damon felt a surge of anger, almost causing him to jump up and confront Vicky. He couldn't believe how deceitful she was pretending to be innocent after seducing him the night before. Damon, however, was not one to be easily swayed. He confidently dismissed Vicky's attempts, assuring Fifi that it was all nonsense. Fifi, don't listen to her. I was just up late on my computer last night. He swore. Fifi, lacking any evidence to the contrary, could only helplessly believe his words. Dissatisfied, Vicky still wanted to sow discord between Damon and Fifi. With a sudden cry of alarm, she pointed at Damon's neck, causing Fifi to look closer. Fifi's pretty face turned into a mask of anger as she noticed something unusual. Confused, Damon nervously asked, What are you looking at? Fifi wasted no time questioning him. Why is there a mark on your neck? It looks like a hickey or something. Vicky, feeling triumphant, placed her hands on her hips and taunted. Go and take a look yourself. Humph, humph. You must have done something bad. Damon approached the mirror. To his horror, he saw a faint but obvious bite mark on his neck. It was clear to him now. Vicky had set him up in secret. First Wendy, now Vicky. He never expected her to stoop so low and be so despicable. Glaring at Vicky, Damon wondered how someone's conscience could be so twisted. Was she not afraid of exposing herself at well? It seemed like she wouldn't stop until she had completely destroyed his marriage. Vicky switched gears. Hey Fifi, didn't you mention that Damon saw Wendy yesterday? Maybe she's responsible for that hickey. Damon was fuming. How dare she attempt to pin the blame on someone else after dropping something so terrible? If there was a limit to the amount of bad behavior in the world, Vicky would have already exceeded her quota. Fifi narrowed her eyes. Damon, can I have a word with you in the bedroom? She looked furious. Vicky was sure that something big was about to go down, and she couldn't wait to see what it was. But as the morning wore on, she began to grow impatient. She checked her watch. Where was all the drama she had been expecting? Why hadn't Fifi and Damon started fighting yet? In the end, Vicky was left disappointed. There was no fireworks, no shouting match, no dramatic confrontations. After an hour of waiting, Vicky finally saw Fifi and Damon emerge from the bedroom. To her surprise, Damon was bursting with energy, and Fifi seemed a little unsteady on her feet. Vicky's jaw dropped. Had they slept together instead of quarreling? But Vicky wasn't ready to give up just yet. Fifi, how was it? Did you read him the riot act? She asked. Fifi looked shyly at Damon before responding. Let's not talk about that now. Are we ready to have breakfast? Let's eat. Vicky scowled. Her first plan had failed, but she still had plenty of other tricks up her sleeve. As they sat down to eat, Vicky couldn't resist the mischievous urge to kick Damon under the table playfully. With a quick dodge, Damon managed to avoid her first attempt, but Vicky was determined. She kicked again while maintaining a cheerful conversation with Fifi. Not one to back down, Damon decided to retaliate. He reached out his hand, ready to grab Vicky's foot and give her a taste of her own medicine. But just as he was about to make his move, Vicky surprised him by reaching over and grabbing his hand instead. Fifi was confused and questioned Vicky's strange behavior. Vicky, why aren't you eating breakfast? What are you doing underneath the table? She asked, unable to see what was happening due to the tablecloth hanging down. Thinking quickly, Vicky came up with a hasty excuse. Oh, I just had an itch, she replied, trying to brush off the situation. However, she glanced into Damon's worried and pleading eyes, and she felt a wicked rush of excitement. Reluctantly, Vicky let go of Damon's hand, but the thrill of their secret game still lingered. After finishing their delicious breakfast, Vicky and Fifi enthusiastically tackled the task of cleaning up the table. Their laughter and conversation filled the room, creating an atmosphere of sisterly camaraderie. Damon was unable to tear his eyes away from the scene and couldn't help but let his mind wander into a realm of fantasy. What if he could have both of them? Perhaps, he thought, he could even add Veronica into the mix. The more Damon entertained these thoughts, the more surreal they became. He felt as if he were floating in a cloud of desire. Suddenly, a cold snort snapped Damon out of his reverie. Vicky shot him a strange look, her voice flowered as Fifi disappeared into the kitchen. You have a mischievous look on your face. It's obvious that you're not thinking about anything innocent, she remarked. Damon nearly choked on his own breath, his face turning a shade of crimson. What nonsense are you talking about? Vicky leaned in closer, her eyes searching his face. Damon, let me ask you something. 
Do you want me to help you? His heart skipped a beat, his mind racing to comprehend her words. Help me with what? Vicky's eyes darted around, her cheeks flushing with embarrassment. You mentioned it a while ago. Did you still desire a threesome with me and Fifi? Maybe I could convince her. That wouldn't be appropriate, would it? Damon stammered. Although he desired it, he at least had to pretend to be a gentleman. Vicky scoffed. I'm offering to help you and this is the thanks I get? If you're willing, I'll find a way to propose a threesome to Fifi. And if she declines, I'll make it seem like it was my idea all along, completely unrelated to you. But if you're not up for it, then forget it. Damon's face flushed crimson in response to Vicky's words. Well, if... if you're being genuine, then I won't object. Vicky's smile turned icy. Look at you. With your perverted face, men are so simple-minded. It was only then that Damon realized he had fallen to Vicky's trap. Vicky, what do you mean? You did this on purpose, didn't you? Vicky crossed her arms defiantly and replied, Yes, I did it on purpose, so what? Are you unhappy about it? If you're not, I could spill the beans to Fifi right now and your dirty thoughts will be exposed. Damon had witnessed Vicky's power firsthand. Please don't. I won't dare do it again, I promise. Seeing Damon's cowardice, Vicky laughed once more. You're so spineless, yet you dare to think you could have all of us at once. Vicky rolled her eyes and headed towards the kitchen to fetch Fifi. He had no idea what the two girls were discussing, but they seemed to be engrossed in some juicy private matters. Vicky was pointing at him and Fifi with flushed cheeks glanced over at him. Damon's phone suddenly rang. It was Pitbull the other end of the line, calling with some news. Young master, we found Fernardo. He's with us. Pitbull informed him. Fantastic. Come to my house and give me all the details. Damon exclaimed, momentarily forgetting about Vicky's games. Yes, sir. Pitbull replied before promptly ending the call. As Damon hung up, he could hear shouts coming from outside the house. Damn it! Who stole my stuff? The voice sounded vaguely familiar, so he turned to Fifi and asked, Who's out there causing a ruckus? Fifi's face turned pale, clearly recognizing the source of the commotion. It's Eleanor and Winston from next door. She replied with a hint of fear. Ever since Damon's passing, the couple had started causing trouble again. They noticed that Fifi had been keeping the house vacant, and upon learning about Damon's supposed death, they began scheming to acquire his property. After all, Damon's house was far superior to theirs, and they saw an opportunity to snatch it up at a bargain price by claiming it was haunted and abandoned. They even dared to present their offer as an act of kindness. Fifi should have been grateful, they thought. However, Fifi firmly rejected their proposal. No matter how desperate she was for money, she would never sell the house. The neighbor saw Fifi as a vulnerable widow, someone they could easily push around and bully. But Fifi endured it all, refusing to let their cruel words and actions break her spirit. The couple, sensing Fifi's perceived weakness, took advantage of her at every opportunity. They played dirty, pouring their garbage into Fifi's property, making her life unbearable. Fifi complained to the property manager, hoping for some relief, but the shameless couple had connections in the court, making it difficult for anyone to stand up against them. The situation escalated when Eleanor's husband, Winston, crossed the line. He proposed a twisted deal, offering to protect Fifi from Eleanor's harassment if she became his lover. Fifi firmly rejected his advances, only to be met with insults and degradation. Fifi called the police, determined to put an end to the torment she and her child were enduring. However, peace was still elusive for Fifi and her child. Whenever Eleanor was away, Winston would stumble over to Fifi's house, fueled by alcohol and rage, smashing her windows and causing chaos. The constant fear and disruption became a haunting presence in their lives. It wasn't until the Walker family moved into the nearby house that Fifi made her daring escape. Winston and his wife shamelessly dumped piles of rubbish into the yard and the garage, hoping to take over. Fifi declared, I'll go and take a look. Damon chimed in, I'll go too. However, Fifi quickly stopped him in his tracks. No, you can come out later. Let me reason with them first. Fifi knew all too well about Damon's fiery temper. She feared that if he went out, Eleanor and her husband would suffer the consequences of his rage. Damon wanted to protest, but he had no choice but to nod and reluctantly agree. I'll go too, Vicky added, following Fifi outside. Oh, so you're finally willing to come out. I thought you were stuck inside forever. Eleanor taunted, placing her hands on her hips and smirking. And look, you even brought a helper. Eleanor's husband couldn't help but stare at Fifi, his mouth watering at the sight of her. When he saw Vicky, who was just as alluring, he had to stop himself from drooling. 
Eleanor noticed her husband's shameful expression and promptly stomped on his foot. Get a hold of yourself. She scolded. She stared at Fifi. What happened to all the things our family piled up here? Did you secretly sell them off for some quick cash? Fifi responded coldly. What things? You mean that trash? Eleanor was seething. That stuff wasn't trash. We put the boxes in your yard and garage for safekeeping. That was priceless jewelry in there. Fifi laughed. If it was that important, then why didn't you just keep it in your own house? Eleanor was caught in a bluff. She had been trying to frame Fifi for stealing. Fifi knew that arguing is pointless. She was well aware that this couple was just looking for trouble. Fifi's sudden change in attitude left with Eleanor and Winston dumbfounded. They couldn't believe that the same Fifi who used to cower in fear at the slightest hint of discord was now acting so self-righteous. Eleanor placed her hands on her hips. What else can we do? We deserve compensation. Vicky sneered. Compensation? Just because you lost a few boxes? Who do you think you are? Where's the evidence? Eleanor was undeterred. So you were afraid that I would find out, and that's why you got rid of the evidence, right? You're the thief here. Fifi's face was the picture of fury. She wasn't about to let anyone wrong her without a fight. You're trying to frame me, she spat, and I've never seen your stupid jewelry. You can yell however much you want, but don't blame me. Now get out of my way before I call the police. Elnor's smile was frosty. So you're saying you don't have them? You, a thief, have the nerve to call the police? I'll deny everything. My husband and I are lawyers. Who do you think they'll believe? It's your word against ours. Fifi's expression quickly changed as she realized the gravity of the situation. Elnor is threatening to ruin her and her family's lives, all for their own gain. Fifi tried to reason with them to find a peaceful solution, but Elnor wouldn't hear it. She was determined to destroy Fifi, to take everything she had worked for. It was then that Vicky, unable to stand by and watch any longer, stepped in and delivered a powerful slap to Elnor's face. Elnor recoiled from the blow. Vicky's eyes blazed with anger. As Elnor stumbled back, her face red with rage and humiliation, Vicky spoke up once more. You think you're so powerful, so untouchable, but you're nothing but cowards, hiding behind your family's name and your position in the court. Well, let me tell you something. We may not have your wealth or connections, but we have something far more valuable. We have each other, and we won't let you tear us apart. Elnor and Winston stood frozen for a moment, unable to react. But then, Elnor snapped to attention. You dare to lay a hand on me? I'll make sure you pay for this. I'll sue you. I'll throw you in jail. I'll ruin your entire family. She bellowed. In her fury, Elnor turned to Winston. What are you waiting for? Can't you see that your wife just got attacked? Get revenge for me now, she demanded. Winston was startled into action as he was about to launch himself at Vicky, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. She was very beautiful. He would sooner slap his own wife than lay a finger on Vicky. Elnor, witnessing Winston's lustful gaze, became even more infuriated. You can't change your nature, can you? Can't resist a seductive woman, huh? Have you forgotten why we came here? Why aren't you teaching her a lesson? Fearful of his wife's wrath, Winston was jolted out of his daze. Rolling up his sleeves, he prepared to strike Vicky. Damon couldn't sit idly by any longer. He ran out of the house and swiftly intervened. Before Winston could step closer to Vicky, Damon's foot connected with his body, sending him crashing to the ground. Winston let out a scream of pain. Clapping his hands, Damon remarked, I've been waiting for you to make a move. Is that all you've got? Fifi was getting anxious. Sweetheart, they are well-known lawyers in Meyerson. We need to tread carefully here. She didn't want her husband to get entangled in a lawsuit, but she couldn't deny the satisfaction she felt from seeing Winston get kicked. Damon's words dripped with arrogance as he dismissed the idea of being intimidated by a mere lawyer, even if he happened to be a judge. His confidence was unwavering. How dare he bully my wife today? Elner and Winston gaped at Damon. You, 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 aren't you the founder of Everbright Corporation? Elnor finally managed to stutter. Winston, equally flustered, added, You found an Astamar later on. But, but didn't the newspapers say that you were dead? Elnor and Winston had always bullied people they thought were beneath them. In a city like Meyerson, they felt invincible and repeatedly stomped on the underdogs. However, Damon's unexpected appearance had sent shivers down their spines, stirring up a sense of unease within them. They wanted to take him down, but they knew they'd have to bring their A-game. But Elnor quickly regained her composure. Don't think I'm afraid of you just because you used to be powerful. You're no longer the founder of Astramar of the past. Your company was already closed down for a long time. You abandoned your wife, your child, and your house. You're nothing but gutter trash now. 
You can't just stroll back in here like you own the place and pretend like you didn't leave for five years. Damon had reached his limit with Eleanor's constant chatter. He slapped her across the face so hard she stumbled to the ground. As she lay there, Damon asked her if she was done venting her anger, and if she wasn't, he was ready to hit her again until she was. Eleanor started crying and wailing. She called out to her husband, Winston, for help. Winston wasn't going to take this lying down. He mustered all of his strength and punched Damon in the forehead. However, to his horror and surprise, it was just like hitting a brick wall. Damon barely flinched. He then returned the punch, and the poor guy went flying like a cannonball. Eleanor had had enough of Winston's uselessness and decided to take matters into her own hands by going after Damon herself. But just as she was about to make her move, Vicky slightly stuck her foot out and tripped her. Eleanor toppled onto the mud and Fifi took the opportunity to kick her while she was down. The pain was unbearable and Eleanor let out a blood-curdling scream as she rolled around in agony. Winston, seeing his wife being beaten up, wanted to help but the menacing glare from Damon made him think twice. It was clear that he was no match for this brute. He shrank back like a violet. Eleanor started screeching. She threw a tantrum and started to berate the hooligans who had invaded their home. She called out the property manager for their lack of action and demanded that someone come and save them before their entire neighborhood was ruined. As she ranted and raved, the other residents of the neighborhood began to gather around. These were the elite people of wealth and status, and they were not going to stand this kind of behavior in their community. They watched as Damon and Fifi continued to attack the couple, and it was clear that something had to be done. Everyone's eyes widened in shock as they took in the sight of Eleanor and Winston, their bodies bruised and battered. Outrage filled the air as someone began scalding, their voice dripping with anger. Who could do such a wicked thing? Look at their faces, they're black and blue! Another voice chimed in, filled with disbelief. Did the property owners turn a blind eye to all this fighting? Did they let the culprit get away with it? The crowd murmured in agreement, their determination growing. We can't let the attacker go unpunished. We need to call the police and make sure justice is served. Fifi desperately tried to explain, but her words fell on deaf ears. In this exclusive neighborhood, only the wealthy were granted entry. But Fifi shattered their preconceived notions. She was an outsider, an enigma. When Damon met his supposed demise, no one bothered to investigate her background. All they knew was that she relied on others to build a small business and drove a fancy car to mask her true financial status. But what truly infuriated the women of the neighborhood was that upon learning Fifi was a widow, all the men in the area flocked to her, vying for her attention. And then there were Eleanor and Winston, renowned lawyers in Meyerson. Their parents were esteemed leaders who had retired from high-ranking positions. They held swaying connections within the community. It was such an environment, it was clear which side people would lean towards. Fifi's face turned pale. What could it be that Eleanor and her husband were causing all the trouble? Yet somehow Fifi had become the villain. It just didn't make sense. Fear was a foreign concept to Damon. He knew that these insignificant individuals were no match for him. With a mere flick of his finger, he could crush them like insignificant insects. But he bided his time. He wanted to witness the extent of the torment Fifi had endured. The pain etched in her face only confirmed suspicions. Fifi had been subjected to years of relentless bullying. Today was the perfect opportunity to settle the score. Elnor addressed the neighbors. This simple-minded country bumpkin has been out of work lately, so we kindly offered her some things she couldn't afford. But instead of showing her gratitude, she dared to mock me, accusing me of looking down on her. Elnor continued her tirade, weaving a web of lies to manipulate the truth. She claimed that Fifi had stolen her precious belongings, conveniently timed when her jewelry was inside Fifi's garage. Eleanor's best friend, Bethany Hinkle, spoke up. If we allow this kind of trash to remain in our neighborhood, what kind of community are we? Another resident, Mary Ann Pike, chimed in. Absolutely right. We cannot let a thief live amongst us in this high-class community. If we don't chase them out, we will collectively refuse to pay the property fees. Fifi was at a loss for what to do. She was being bullied to the point of tears, and the situation was spiraling out of control. The property management even brought in security guards. But Eleanor wasn't going to let this go. She grabbed the property manager's hand and declared, They stole my family's jewelry! Call the police and have them arrested! Mary Ann even threatened, You know my family has connections with the courts. If you don't take care of this today, you'll regret it. The property manager knew that he couldn't afford to face the collective resistance of the owners. As far as the residents were concerned, Fifi wasn't qualified to live there. 
The story they believed was that once upon a time, her husband had been hailed as an extraordinary individual, but he died. Now, Fifi could barely make ends meet and was raising her son as a single mother. The property manager with a stern expression accused Fifi, Every resident in this community is held to a high standard. Even if you're not wealthy, how could you stoop so low as to steal from others? Fifi vehemently denied the accusations. You're slandering me. I would never steal from anyone. I will take the necessary steps to clear my name. And that witch, Eleanor White, who wanted to buy my house last year, I refused to sell, so she resorted to dumping garbage here. And now she's pointing fingers at me. She's framing me without evidence. The property manager sighed. Miss Eleanor White is an esteemed lawyer. I find her to be a credible source. Fifi pursed her lips. This is ridiculous. My husband is home, so I had to clear out the yard in the garage so our family could live here again. Anyway, we don't need your silver or jewelry. We're doing just fine ourselves. When Eleanor heard this, she burst out laughing. Did she just say her family is rich? You're just a poor person trying to sneak into the upper class. Also, what do you mean that your husband is home? We all know he drowned six years ago. Mary Ann giggled and said sarcastically, Hey, that's unfair. She's allowed to find another husband. Who knows how many men she's cheated on her deceased husband with. Damon had had enough of their insults. He finally stepped forward. Shut your mouth or I'll shut them for you. Bethany's husband, Travis, was ready to fight back. Who do you think you are? Everyone, let's chase these thieves out together. Off to the side, Winston cowered in fear, still traumatized for when Damon beat him up before the neighbors had arrived. When Eleanor witnessed her husband's cowardly behavior, a wave of embarrassment washed over her. Mary Ann's husband, Logan, couldn't resist mocking Winston. Aren't you usually quite the fighter? What's with this sudden display of cowardice? Winston shook his head, his eyes wide. His fist is like a bullet. Try it if you have the guts. Travis, never one to back down from a challenge, beckoned Damon closer, waggling his index finger. Come here, my friend. I'm known for my lightning fast speed. Let me give you a taste of what I'm made of. Damon, with a confident stride, approached Travis and delivered a powerful kick that landed square on his face, leaving a visible footprint. Furious, Travis slashed out. How dare you launch a sneak attack on me? Damon was amused. All right, I'll give you fair warning. Here it is. Brace yourself. I'm going to hit your left cheek. Travis winced in pain as the blow landed, followed by another strike to his right cheek. Damn you! Are you just going to keep slapping my face? Damon, with a sly grin, changed tactics. All right, then, get ready for a kick to the stomach. Damon sent Travis flying in the air like a cannonball. Travis's legs were practically glued together with fright. Bethany rushed over. Hubby, are you all right? Summoning all of his courage, Travis managed to pull himself up from the ground and glanced over at Damon. The once arrogant demeanor that Travis had worn so proudly had vanished. Damon's piercing gaze locked onto Logan, Mary Ann's husband with a sinister smile as he declared. Now it's your turn. Logan swallowed hard, his mouth suddenly dry with apprehension. What's the point of fighting? You're just a thief from way out in the boonies. In terms of social status, who wouldn't trample all over you? Damon smirked. Are you trying to intimidate me? That's right. What about it? Logan retorted. Bethany, unable to stay silent any longer, rose to her feet. You're nothing more than a useless dog, she spat, her voice dripping with disdain. My husband Travis is the general manager of the core competency company. And Logan here is the vice president of a major international corporation. Let's not forget that Eleanor and her husband are both successful lawyers. Every person here holds a higher status than you could ever dream of. Damon nodded, a wicked grin spreading across his face as he reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. Very well then. Core competency company, you say. I'll make sure your husband's precious company goes bankrupt in no time. Damon dialed Pitbull's number. Hey man, do you know core competency company? Gather all your manpower and funds and let's put a stop to their share prices immediately. Bethany couldn't contain her amusement. Did you all hear that? Damon wants to take down Core Competency Company. But Damon didn't hang up the phone. And while you're at it, find out all the major international corporations associated with the name Logan Pike. Let's hit them hard too. Bring them to a complete stop. Less than two minutes later, Logan's phone rang. The voice on the other end sounded terrified. Mr. Pike, something terrible has happened. Our stock is plummeting. Logan couldn't believe his ears. What did you say? In a panic, Logan opened the stock exchange software app. As he stared at the screen, his legs gave way and he collapsed to the ground. How is this possible? His once thriving international company 
had been brought to its knees in an instant. Everyone crowded around, their faces filled with shock and despair. Little did they know, Travis's phone was about to ring too, and when it did, the voice in the other end is filled with fear. Mr. Hinkle, you won't believe it! Our stock price just dipped by 40%! The group of people turned their gaze toward Damon, their expressions a mix of shock and fear, and disbelief. At the same time, they realized the power he held, and it terrified them to the core. One person couldn't contain their curiosity and turned to Eleanor, asking, Who is this person? How on earth did he manage to halt the selling of shares of two major companies? Eleanor replied through gritted teeth, He used to be the boss of Astrobar, but don't worry. Astrobar has long since closed down. I suppose he has some money left, but he's no one important. The mention of Damon's background brought a sense of relief to those around them. As long as Damon wasn't some all-powerful figure, they could handle the situation. They still had a chance to back out of this mess, or so they thought. Travis fumed as he hurled his phone to the ground. Damn it! You may have some money left after selling your company, but that's all you got. Logan was equally furious. You can't scare me, you backwoods hick. Damon solely clapped. Very good, you're not afraid to fight in the arena with me. Elnor scowled. Security guards, what are you waiting for? Catch these two thieves before they steal anything else from underneath you. She was starting to feel uneasy about Damon's cunning tactics. She knew she had to arrest him and send him to the police station. Even if he was eventually released, they needed to get him out of their hair by any means necessary. As the property manager watched Damon's fierce demeanor, he couldn't help but feel a twinge of fear. But he was also afraid of the residents, so he had to tread carefully. Listen up, folks. Let's send them to the police station and let them decide if they're guilty. Suddenly, a fleet of sleek sports cars skidded to a halt in front of the house. It was Pitbull, accompanied by his gang of tough-looking men. They weren't about to let anyone lay a finger on their young master. Pitbull sprang into action, taking down the security guards with ease. The other guards tried to fight back, but they were no match for Pitbull's crew. They quickly subdued and pinned to the ground. Pitbull stood protectively by Damon's side, daring anyone to come close. Tuh! Elnor barked out loud. They think they're so tough, but they can't even fight their own battles. They had to hire someone to help them. Pitbull didn't take kindly to her words and slapped her across the face. Elnor stumbled backward, her voice pierced the air. Winston, you useless idiot! Your wife was beaten humiliated! And you didn't do anything! Winston's face turned red with shame. He had seen Pitbull at the banquet before. Back then, Pitbull had been the center of attention. But now he was working for Damon. Winston did not know much about Damon, but he knew enough about Pitbull to not want to offend him. Faced with the choice between his survival and his dignity, Winston chose the former. Bethany shouted for him to call the police, while Mary Ann demanded action for the property manager and the security team. Travis and Logan hesitated, recognizing Pitbull as someone ruthless, but unable to remember where they had seen him before. Travis's phone rang again. It was his subordinate on the line, and his voice was filled with panic. Mr. Hinkle, it's not good. I don't know who leaked the information about our company's fake accounts. The suppliers want refunds. Also, the bank is calling us to collect the debt. Several of our warehouses are being destroyed as we speak. Clients are canceling orders left and right. What nonsense are you talking about? Travis asked incredulously. But his employee was insistent. Sir, I'm not talking nonsense. If you don't believe me, search for it yourself. Our company is about to become today's headlines. Travis's doubts about Damon's identity were quickly fading. Even Pitbull had stood up for him. It was clear that Damon was someone to be reckoned with. As Travis turned pale, Bethany noticed his distress. Hubby, what's wrong with you? You don't look well. Travis's face fell. It's over. Our company is finished. The core competency company was truly in dire straits. Travis had indulged in a life of luxury while waiting for the stock prices to store, so he could sell his shares and pay off his mounting debts. But now his dreams were dashed. The scandal became an inevitable reality, tarnishing the company's reputation beyond repair. Travis felt as if the world was crumbling around him. Meanwhile, Logan was facing his own impending doom. Just as Travis's phone rang with the news of their downfall, Logan's phone echoed with the distant cries of his secretary. Mr. Pike, I don't know what's happening. The authorities have launched an investigation into our company. They've seized countless pieces of incriminating evidence from your office. We couldn't stop them. And just moments ago, a group of masked criminals stormed into our company, wrecking havoc and reducing everything to ruins. Our partners, as we feared, have abandoned us and refused to cooperate. Logan and Travis were locked in a heated stare down with Damon. Their emotions were running high. They were furious, confused, shocked, and downright terrified. Damon's cold, calculating voice cut through the tension like a knife. Who else wants to try me? He asked, his eyes flashing with a dangerous glint. The onlookers cowered in fear, their heads lowered in submission. 
Was this man's revenge really so swift and decisive? He'd made one phone call and taken down some of the biggest power players in Meyerson. His voice dropped to a menacing growl. I'm saying it here and now. If anyone dares to offend my wife again, they'll have to deal with me. And trust me, you don't want to do that. Damon's words hung heavy in the air, a warning to anyone who dared to cross him. Anyone who dared to touch Fifi would face the full force of his wrath. In the past, Fifi had suffered a lot of grievances when Damon wasn't around. But now, Damon was back, and he was ready to get revenge on the neighbors who'd messed with his wife. Travis and Logan knew just how powerful Damon was, and they were terrified. They apologized for their mistakes and begged for mercy, but Marianne and Bethany didn't dare to say anything. They knew their husbands were useless. Damon's face was frosty as he looked at the two men. Do you think you deserve me to spare you? He asked, his voice cold and menacing. Fifi liked to see Damon take revenge for her, but she couldn't bear to see the desperate expressions on Travis and Logan's face. Cupcake, I think they truly regret their actions. How about you let them go? Travis and Logan were filled with despair. They had messed up by helping Eleanor and their wives stir up trouble. And now they were paying the price. Travis dropped to his knees. I was wrong. Please, I beg you, forgive me. I'll give you half of my family's property. Logan hesitated for a moment before finally succumbing to the pressure and joining Travis on his knees. Damon looked at the two men as if they were a joke. Having faced countless storms and life-threatening situations, Damon knew that showing mercy to his enemies would only be cruel to himself. Witnessing Damon's indifference, Travis grabbed Bethany, who stood up beside him. Hurry up, kneel and beg with me! Logan also turned to his wife Marianne and urged her, You too! Bethany and Mary Ann exchanged glances, their expressions turning ugly. They were vain women who cared deeply about their reputations. They had always looked down on others, but now their husbands expected them to kneel down before Damon in front of all their neighbors. They could see the terror on Logan and Travis's faces. Their husbands' companies had been pushed to the brink of collapse due to Damon's swift and powerful actions in such a short period. No, I'm not a wimp like my husband. Bethany's voice rang out. The word struck Travis like a lightning bolt, igniting a fire within him that he couldn't control. In a fit of rage, he leapt to his feet and delivered a sharp slap across Bethany's face. Bethany stood there, stunned and speechless, her mind raced trying to comprehend the betrayal she had just experienced. You... you promised me love, care, and a life of luxury! She stammered, her voice trembling with hurt. How could you raise a hand against me? Elnor, unable to contain her anger, piped up from the side. You're nothing but an abuser! How dare you treat your wife this way? Travis turned to Eleanor, his eyes burning with resentment. Damn you! It's because of your incompetence that our family business went bankrupt. He then turned back to Bethany. I'm sorry I hit you, but I'm so stressed, Bethany. Our company is under investigation. We breached contracts, and the debt is piling up. Suppliers and banks are knocking on our door, demanding payment. If you don't apologize to Mr. Walker, our family will be ruined. Our marriage will crumble, and everything we've built will be lost. The cars, the mansion, our children's education, all gone. The choice is yours. Meanwhile, Logan directed his anger toward Marianne. Do you want to live a life of dignity or sink into poverty? Our son's future hangs in the balance and your parents won't be able to support him. I need you to stand with me. The sight of their husband's desperate faces and the news of a life of poverty was enough to make their hearts sink. Bethany couldn't bear it and fell to her knees with a thud. Marianne, on the other hand, felt like she was backed into a corner. She couldn't kneel at easily. Travis and his wife apologized profusely. Damon agreed to forgive them, but he didn't show the same benevolence to Logan and Marianne. Logan glared at Marianne. Witch! He spat, his voice dripping with venom. It was you who ruined my life and my career. I don't know why I ever married you. If you don't apologize to Damon and Fifi, I'll divorce you tomorrow. Marianne's heart pounded in her chest as she tried to comprehend the magnitude of Logan's anger. The news of Logan's intention to divorce her hit Mary Ann like a tidal wave. Panic surged through her veins. She couldn't bear the thought of losing him, of losing their life together. You can't divorce me, she cried, her voice cracking. We have children. We can't let our family fall apart. Before he could respond, Logan's phone rang. He hesitated for a split second before answering, only to be met with a frantic voice on the other end. Mr. Pike, our company has been officially shut down. The tax department and the health department swooped in one after another like vultures ready to feast on our demise. Logan's heart sank as he processed the devastating news. How could this be happening? He had worked tirelessly to build his empire, only to have it crumble before his very eyes. 
Meanwhile, Travis's phone erupted with a sudden burst of noise, causing him to jump in surprise. He fumbled to answer, his heart pounding in his chest. The voice in the other end is filled with excitement and disbelief. Mr. Hinkle, you won't believe what just happened. It's a miracle, a true miracle. Someone, I don't know who, just placed a massive order with us. Our stock has skyrocketed once again. Those merchants who abandoned us before are now begging to work with us. Travis's grip on his phone tightened, his body trembling with a mix of shock and relief. He couldn't believe his luck. Just when he thought all hope was lost, a glimmer of light appeared in the darkness. He knew it was all Damon's doing. He'd made the right decision by apologizing and forcing his wife to do the same. Travis knew that if Damon wanted to crush him, he would be as defenseless as an ant. Mary Ann turned to plead with Damon. I was wrong. I regret it. I'll do anything you want me to do. Please, can you fix the situation with my husband's company? Fifi couldn't bear it and spoke up. Damon, you should go easy on them. Damon shook his head. Don't say that. Have you forgotten how they bullied you when I wasn't around? They deserve everything that's coming to them. Stop! Pitbull suddenly shouted. Elnor and Winston tried to sneak away while Damon was dealing with the couple, but they were discovered and blocked by Pitbull. What's wrong? Damon asked with a smirk. Are you trying to hide from me? Elnor stood there, her mouth agape, unable to find the right words to express her shock. It was as if the ground had been pulled up from beneath her feet. As the news of the accusation spread like wildfire, discussions erupted all around. Travis shouted, Damn it! Eleanor and Winston are falsely accusing Damon and Fifi! Bethany nodded in agreement. She didn't care about her friendship with Eleanor anymore. I know the whole story. Eleanor had her eyes on Fifi's house. She wanted it for herself, but only at half the price. However, Fifi had no intention of selling. So what did Eleanor do? She concocted a plan, accusing Fifi of stealing, all in an attempt to force her out. As Bethany finished her revelation, she turned to Damon, her voice filled with remorse. Mr. Walker, Eleanor deceived me. That's why I treated Fifi so poorly. I sincerely apologize for my actions. From this moment on, I will make it clear that I stand against Eleanor. And let me warn you all, anyone who dares to go against Fifi again will have me as their enemy. Everyone had witnessed Damon's incredible abilities firsthand. No one wanted to suffer the same miserable fate as Mary Ann and Logan. Even the property manager, who had been eager to attack Damon just moments ago, now felt a wave of panic wash over him. He quickly expressed his support, acknowledging that their security guards had almost been fooled. If it hadn't been for Damon and the Hinkles telling the truth, they would have uh, wrongly accused innocent people. I swear I'm telling the truth. I never intended to target Mr. Walker. The property manager stammered, trying to defend himself. What did you just say? You wanted to drive us out of the neighborhood and have us arrested. You orchestrated all this, didn't you? Damon growled at the manager. Mr. Walker, I'm sorry. Please spare me this time. I promise I won't do it again. The property manager pleaded, his voice trembling. Damon replied, Begging for mercy won't do you any good. Call your real estate company's boss. Unless they want to witness the downfall of their company, they better come running. The manager's face drained of color. Being a property manager in such an upscale community was a prestigious position. Losing his job would not only be a personal blow, but it would also inflict irreparable damage to the company, and he would be left with no means to support himself. With a heavy heart, the manager reluctantly dialed the number, knowing that his fate hung in the balance. Damon's gaze shifted towards Eleanor and Winston, his eyes filled with dark intensity. Do you have anything else to say? Eleanor lifted her chin defiantly. You can't do this to me. I have powerful connections and... Damon interrupted her. Bring all your so-called backers here. Today I'll deal with every one of them. Eleanor glared at Winston, hoping for some support, but instead she was met with disappointment. Winston cowered behind her, refusing to take a stand. Eleanor's heart sank, and she made a silent vow to divorce him as soon as this whole ordeal was over. But before she could voice her thoughts, Winston shocked her by speaking up. You know what? You've pushed me around for too long. Eleanor, I don't want to play your stupid games anymore. Winston turned to address Damon. Mr. Walker, I must make it clear that I am completely innocent in this whole mess with Eleanor. It was her audacious plan to purchase your house and torment your wife. Damon frowned. But why would she target my wife? Winston's eyes burned through resentment as he replied. Eleanor claimed that your wife, being a widow, was vulnerable and powerless. Eleanor thought it would be easy. Over the past two years, she cunningly used her connections with her parents to establish a law firm. Through deceitful means, she amassed a fortune by creating fake accounts and engaging in fraudulent lawsuits. And now she has grown tired of me. Her ultimate plan is to monopolize my assets. 
patiently waiting for the right moment to divorce me. Elnor scoffed. Winston, you imbecile. You're spewing nonsense here. What kind of deadbeat have you become? Your income doesn't even amount to a fraction of mine. Do you still have the audacity to confront me? Winston knew exactly how to hit her where it hurt. Do you still claim you earned all that money on your own? Or was it just because of your parents' connections in the court? And let's not forget about the forged evidence you used to file that lawsuit. Oh, and once you got involved with the scumbag Fernando, you took orders from him left and right. Don't think I'm oblivious. Damon's ears perked up at the mention of Fernando's name. There was more to this story than met the eye. Elnor scowled. You don't know what you're talking about. Winston rolled his eyes. Don't think for a second that I don't know about your affair with that dog Fernando. It's bad enough that you look down on me, but now you expect me to defend you after getting in trouble. Tuh, <laughs> yeah, right. I found the empty condom wrappers, Eleanor. You've been sleeping with him for years, and poor me, I pretended not to know. Winston had reached his breaking point. He was done caring about what others thought of him. He knew Eleanor could ruin his reputation, so he took matters into his own hands and flipped her world upside down. Eleanor, who had been exposed, decided to come clean. Yes, I had an affair with Fernando. So what? What kind of person is he? And what kind of person are you? You don't compare to him in any arena, including the bedroom. Winston lost his cool. He charged at Eleanor like a crazed animal. You witch, I'll kill you! Eleanor laughed bitterly. Go ahead and hit me. I'm Fernando's woman now. Have you thought about how he'll seek revenge on you? Your career and family will suffer too. The moment those words escaped Eleanor's lips, Winston's body convulsed violently, his eyes now filled with pure hatred directed at her. He slapped her hard across the face, but Eleanor was unfazed, wiping the blood from her mouth with grace and poise before turning to face Damon with a calm demeanor. I hope you understand that I belong to Fernando, she said, her voice steady and unwavering. Do you still dare to mess with me? Shock and fear were etched on every face as they looked at Eleanor in disbelief. Even those who had previously stood by Damon's side and pointed fingers at Eleanor now cowered in fear, distancing themselves from him as if he were a contagious disease. Some people were already regretting trying to flatter Damon earlier. If Eleanor was Fernando's ally, they were in big trouble. With Fernando's personality, he would surely seek revenge, and they would all be finished. Damon's piercing gaze locked on Eleanor. So, you claim to be Fernando's woman, huh? And you've supposedly aided him in countless dirty business dealings? Eleanor, undeterred by Damon's doubt, lifted her head with an air of pride. Her response was laced with a hint of challenge. Absolutely. Scared yet? There's still a chance for you to kneel and beg for your forgiveness. Everyone expected Damon to display at least a flicker of fear in his high-stakes encounter, but to their astonishment, Damon's confidence remained unshaken. He burst into a boisterous, evil laughter. Don't waste my precious time. I was ready to set you free, but now I've discovered you're involved with Fernando. It seems unnecessary. He gestured with the flourish and Pitbull obediently approached Eleanor, scooping her up effortlessly. Consider her a hostage. I'll use her as leverage in my negotiations with Fernando. Aren't you afraid of Fernando? Eleanor cried. Damon chuckled. Afraid? You'll find out soon enough, won't you? With a flick of his wrist, he commanded Pitbull to take Eleanor away. At Damon's command, Pitbull lifted Eleanor and began to drag her away. Eleanor's screams echoed through the air as she fought against the grip of the man holding her. Let go of me! I'm Fernando's woman! You can't! But before she could finish her sentence, Pitbull slapped her across the face, silencing her. The bystanders were horrified, watching as Damon took Eleanor hostage and used her as a bargaining chip to deal with Fernando. They had thought that he would have some scruples after learning her identity, but it seemed that he wasn't afraid of Fernando in the slightest. Just then, the boss of the real estate company arrived at the scene, having been informed of the situation by the property manager. He was quick to apologize, offering to fire the manager and waive Damon's HOA fees for two years. Damon was pleased with the boss's attitude and let him off the hook for this time, but he warned him that if there was a next time, he wouldn't be so forgiving. After successfully resolving the issue, Damon ushered Fifi and Vicky into the house, with Pitbull trailing behind them. Although Fifi initially disapproved of Damon's actions, she couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction when she saw her once arrogant neighbors standing before her, now trembling and submissive, afraid to even make a sound. Finally, Fifi's vindication washed over her, as she had endured their harassment for far too long. With Damon's intimidating presence, no one would dare to bully her again. 
In the kitchen, Fifi and Vicky continued their animated conversation, while Damon led Pitbull into the living room. Damon inquired about Fernando, eager to gather any information they could aid their mission. Pitbull began his report to Damon. We've managed to track down Fernando's whereabouts. He's almost made a full recovery since your last encounter. We have eyes and ears on him, monitoring his every move. It seems that he's a regular at the notorious Oscuro nightclub. He might even own the place. Whenever you give the word, I could strike him down without hesitation. Damon nodded, not at all surprised. The Oscuro nightclub was infamous for its dealings with shady characters. So it made perfect sense that Fernando would be drawn to such a seedy bar. In the dimly lit, opulent confines of the Oscuro nightclub's highest floor, a woman sipped a glass of wine. It was Isabel Branto. Once, she had shared a passionate night with Damon, and she'd never forgotten it. However, they had severed all ties after the incident at the Martinelli's mansion, when she insulted Damon and cunningly ensnared him into the Martinelli's treacherous trap. For Isabel, that night ended in tragedy. Damon had defeated her fiancé, Lorenzo. Now Isabel was stuck clinging to Lorenzo's brother, Fernando. With each passing day, Fernando's power grew. Isabel found herself with no choice but to rely on him. However, she soon discovered that she was just one of many women in Fernando's life. Among the bevy of beauties that surrounded him, Isabel struggled to stand out. Her thoughts quickly turned to the man who had dared to challenge the organization and killed her fiancé. If only Lorenzo were still alive, Isabel would have had the support of the Martinelli family, and her position in the organization would have been much higher. Sometimes, she used to question where her allegiances should lie, but there was no going back now. It was clear that between Damon and Fernando, no matter what the criteria were, the Martinellis would always come out on top. Her hatred toward Damon intensified as she thought about this. Suddenly, there was a commotion at the entrance of the club. Everyone stood up and turned their attention to the door with a mix of respect, admiration, reverence, and fear. The owner of the club, Fernando, had arrived. Fernando was a towering figure with piercing eyes and naturally commanding presence. As soon as he entered the room, his eyes swept across the entire scene. Women threw flirtatious glances at him, hoping to catch his attention. Even a single night with Fernando was enough for them to brag about for the rest of their lives. The men in the crowd couldn't help but lower their heads in deference and look at him with fawning expression. Isabel's eyes, however, emitted a murderous aura. She knew that her position in the organization was now dependent on Fernando's help, and she felt hostile toward any woman who got too close to him. As Fernando settled into his seat, a group of women eagerly crowded around him, hoping to win his favor. It was a scene straight out of a power fantasy, and Fernando accepted the attention with relish. But amidst all the adulation, Isabel approached Fernando with a serious matter at hand. She informed him of the recent downfall of Quinn's company, Rothschild Limited, following his demise. The market was now dominated by SeaTac, and Isabel wondered if Fernando needed to intervene. Furthermore, Isabel revealed that they had discovered a spy within Rothschild Limited, who had provided valuable information to their competitor, SeaTac. This betrayal had played a significant role in SeaTac's victory over Rothschild Limited. But as Fernando thought of Veronica, the director of SeaTac, his anger flared up. Rumors had it that Veronica had established SeaTech to protect Astamar's legacy. Fernando had fallen for her hard, and she seemed to have eyes only for his enemy, Damon. Just then, a young man walked into the room. Mr. Martinelli, I have news for you. Damon Walker is still alive. Fernando crushed the glass in his hand. You can't be serious. I sent my men to deal with him. Isabel was taken aback by what she had heard. She had heard whispers and rumors about Damon's survival, but she never expected them to be true. Fernando's words confirmed it. Fernando whirled around to face Isabel. Did you catch the spy? Isabel nodded, her expression grave. Yes, we caught them. Isabel motioned to her assistant, who promptly left the room. Moments later, she returned with the woman in tow. Despite the bruises and tattered clothes, the woman's natural beauty still shone through. It was Jillian. Although Jillian had promised Damon that she would leave Quinn's side, she continued to spy, and her information had proved invaluable to SeaTech's takeover of Rothschild Limited. But now that information had fallen into Isabel's hands, and she had brought Jillian straight to Fernando, Fernando's eyes roamed over Jillian's body, a wicked grin spreading across his face. Well, 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 are you a sight for sore eyes? Tell me, my dear, how did you manage to spy on Rothschild Limited? Jillian met his gaze with a cold stare her voice dripping with pride. That's none of your damn business. If you want to kill me, go ahead, but I won't give you the satisfaction of knowing how I did it. Fernando's grin only widened. Oh, I'm not going to kill you just yet. Isabel interjected. 
She posed as Quinn's secretary and slowly leaked information about Rothschild Limited over time. Fernando nodded. I didn't expect you to be able to fool that idiot Quinn. I must say I'm impressed. But Jillian's fate was already sealed. Fernando ordered his men to take her away and let his brothers have their way with her. Jillian's eyes filled with despair as she realized what was about to happen. He won't get away with this, you monster! She spat, but Fernando only laughed. Oh my dear, I already have. Enjoy your last night on Earth. Jillian's world came crashing down as Fernando's chilling words pierced through her heart. Her once radiant face turned ashen, and her entire body quivered with fear. She felt like she was living her own worst nightmare. You can't do this to me! You'll all be the gruesome end! Jillian's voice trembled as she desperately pleaded with Fernando. A cold smile swept across Fernando's face, his eyes glinting with a sinister light. He stepped forward, his hand gently gripping Jillian's chin, forcing her to meet his gaze. Do you have any idea the magnitude of danger you've caused Rothschild Limited by leaking information? Jillian shook her head, her eyes wide with terror. How... how much? Fernando's voice grew colder. It's a loss that even selling your soul couldn't repay. Rothschild Limited is my empire, my lifeblood. All that wealth, all that power, gone because of you. Jillian's voice quivered weakly. But... but killing me won't solve anything. It's against the law. Laws? Who needs them? I am the law! Fernando closed in on Jillian, his presence suffocating her. Scared? Good. Fernando's voice dripped with sadistic pleasure. I've changed my mind. I want everyone to witness your demise. I want them to see the price you pay for daring to challenge me. Please, please spare me, Jillian whimpered. With a wicked smile, Fernando retrieved a small, transparent box from his pocket. I've heard whispers of your close relationship with Veronica. If you're willing to do as I say, all you need to do is slip this substance to her coffee. Leave the rest to me. What is it? Jillian asked. It's a powerful aphrodisiac in my controlling medicine. Fernando replied, If she drinks it, she'll be consumed with desire for me. Jillian couldn't believe what she was hearing. She shook her head in disbelief. No, this, this can't be happening. She muttered, her voice cracking with fear. But Fernando, filled by his malevolence, was not about to let Jillian go. He sneered as he brandished a knife. If you don't cooperate with me, I'll slice you open. Just as Fernando was about to strike, a sudden commotion erupted outside. The door shuttered off its hinges to reveal Damon and his loyal men. These men may not have been famous, except for the renowned Pitbull, but they were all deadly assassins hired by Damon's father and grandfather. They had always kept a low profile, but their explosive power was unmatched. Damon let out a hearty laugh, his voice echoing through the room. Fernando, my old friend, it's been a minute. How you've been holding up since I attacked your family? Fernando's face was like ice, his emotions hidden beneath a stoic facade. Isabel's expression, on the other hand, was a whirlwind of conflicting emotions, her face a canvas of complexity. Jillian's desperation soared to new heights she clung to any semblance of hope, tears streaming down her face. Damon! She cried. Had her savior finally come for her? One of Fernando's guards threw a punch at Damon. Damon swiftly sidestepped the punch. In one quick motion, Pitbull grabbed the security guard and delivered a powerful blow to his chest. Meanwhile, two other security guards rushed forward, but before they could reach their destination, the thug lurking behind Damon struck, his knife finding its mark. Blood spilled onto the floor. No one could fathom the audacity of this troublemaker, daring to cause chaos in Fernando's prestigious club, and to go as far as killing Fernando's men. This was a direct challenge to Fernando himself, a feud that could only end in death. Whispers filled the air as those who relied on Fernando's protection exchanged animated discussions. Who was this mysterious figure? How could he dare to provoke Mr. Martinelli? Would Mr. Martinelli himself step in to teach this troublemaker a lesson? Would he reveal his true strength and force the as intruder to kneel and beg for mercy? Damon locked eyes with Fernando and declared, Today, let's settle our old scores once and for all. Fernando smirked. It's almost endearing how cocky you still are. I could crush you in a heartbeat. Damon opened his mouth to retort, but then he noticed Jillian injured and pale, standing not far away. He frowned. Jillian, why are you here? What happened to you? Jillian, touched by Damon's worry, felt a surge of strength in her heart. I can't go into detail right now. You don't need to worry about me. I'll, I'll be fine. Fernando looked back and forth between Damon and Jillian. A sly smile crept onto his face. Ah, so she's your lover. How convenient. You can have her back, but there's a price to pay. Damon's eyes narrowed. His gaze was as sharp as knives. He chuckled, a hint of defiance in his words. 
Funny you should mention that, because I happen to have your woman too. I hope you're willing to make a trade. Pitbull signaled his men to bring Eleanor forward. Eleanor, once arrogant and untouchable, now bore battle scars, her face black and blue. Struggling to speak, Eleanor pleaded to Fernando, her voice filled with desperation. Fernando, please save me! Fernando's face twisted to a scowl. What the hell's going on here? He demanded, eyeing Damon suspiciously. Damon rolled his eyes. Relax, man. This is your girl, right? I'm just proposing a little trade. My friend for your lady. Seems fair to me. But Fernando wasn't having it. Who is she anyway? Do I even know her? Eleanor's heart sank. Had Fernando forgotten about her? It's me, Fernando. Eleanor, your lover! She cried out. Fernando sneered. You? Ta! <laughs> You're a joke! I wouldn't touch you with a ten-foot pole! Isabel chimed in, adding insult to injury. Seriously, did you think Fernando Martinelli has no taste? Elnor is humiliated, but she refused to back down. You lying bastard, you said you loved me! You promised me the world! My husband is divorcing me because of our affair! I could expose all of your heinous business dealings if you don't cooperate with me! Fernando's face twisted with a mix of emotions. He knew that Eleanor was a lawyer and had insider information about all the illegal things he had done over the years. If she spilled the beans, it would be game over for him. He ignored Eleanor and turned to Damon, demanding that he kneel before him. Damon refused. Fernando shifted his attention to Jillian. He grabbed her by the hair and held a knife to her throat. Before he could make good on his threat, something unexpected happened. Damon unleashed a powerful force that sent Fernando reeling. When he regained his footing, he saw that Jillian was safe in Damon's arms. Jillian was overwhelmed with emotion as she realized that Damon had saved her. Her fear dissipated, replaced by a sense of relief. Damon ordered his men to give the best doctor to tend to her wounds, vowing to protect her from any further harm. Fernando was stunned by Damon's sudden display of strength, but he remained undeterred. He knew that this was the end game between him and Damon, and he was willing to pay with blood to settle the score. The stage was set for a showdown, and only one of them would emerge victorious. The atmosphere in the club was electric, crackling with tension. A few years ago, Fernando had hatched a sinister plan to kidnap Damon's girlfriend and use her as bait to lure Damon into a deadly trap. The scheme had almost succeeded, with Damon narrowly escaping death at Fernando's hands. But this time, Fernando's evil knew no bounds. He had even dared to raise a knife against Jillian, a woman who had done nothing to deserve such cruelty. Fernando sneered at Damon. Prepare to be trampled under my feet! As his words hung in the air, a terrifying storm began to swirl around Fernando. A green light erupted from his eyes, casting an eerie glow upon his face. At that moment, Fernando transformed into a conqueror from the depths of hell. Damon, your death is imminent! Fernando was no ordinary man. He possessed a power that surpassed the capabilities of mere mortals. I challenge this bastard to fight one-on-one! -on -one. Fernando declared with a thunderous voice. Pitbull, sensing danger, attempted to warn Damon, but was met with an even greater force emanating from Damon's very being. Fernando's explosive power was so formidable that it seemed invincible. It struck Damon with a force that should have been devastating. However, Damon remained completely unaffected, as if Fernando's attack was nothing more than a gentle scratch. Damon's iron fist collided with Fernando's chest, sending him hurtling in the air like a missile. His entire body was overcome with pain as he spewed out a mouthful of blood. This is impossible! How can this be? Fernando gasped. Driven by fury, Fernando lunged at Damon once more. But before he could reach his target, Damon swiftly raised his hand and delivered a resounding slap across Fernando's face. The sound reverberated through the air, leaving five distinct finger marks on Fernando's chest. I'll tear you into a thousand pieces! Fernando seethed with rage. Fernando desperately searched for an escape route, but Damon had cunningly cornered him leaving no room for evasion. It was a trap, and Fernando was caught in its clutches. One side of Fernando's face was swollen and discolored. His teeth lay scattered on the ground. His nose was crooked and distorted. Even his ears had temporarily lost ability to hear. The imprint of Damon's hand on his face served as a painful reminder of his defeat. In that moment, Fernando appeared utterly pitiful. The anger within him burned so fiercely that it threatened to consume him. How could he, a man of stature, suffer such humiliation? and to endure it in front of esteemed officials and admirers. His once glorious image had been shattered, reduced to a broken shell. The crowd who witnessed the spectacle were left dumbfounded. 
their jaws dropping to the ground in disbelief. Even the beautiful women who had idolized Fernando as an invincible hero were left in shock. Never in their wildest dreams had they imagined that he could not only lose, but lose in so miserably. Fernando was the epitome of strength, and he had been rendered defenseless. The whispers of disbelief filled the air as if the onlookers were desperately trying to convince themselves that what they were seeing was a mere illusion. Surely Fernando, with his wisdom and bravery, could not have suffered such a fate. But the truth is undeniable. Was this truly the same Fernando who had once commanded respect? The same Fernando who had stood tall and proud, his every move exuding confidence and power? It was a cruel reality that even the most optimistic onlookers could not deny. Fernando had fallen, and he had fallen hard. Suddenly, Fernando burst out with an incredible force, breaking free from Damon's grip and giving him an evil glare. I only wanted to use 10% of my strength to play with you, Fernando snarled. But you had to go and use all of your strength. Now I'm going to show you what I'm capable of. The crowd had no idea that Fernando had been holding back his true power, but now they were eager to see him unleash his divine might and slaughter all of his enemies. Damon, however, remained calm and composed. Is that so? Then use half of your strength. Let's see how powerful you are. Fernando charged at Damon like a fierce tiger, ready to pounce and take him down. But Damon easily grabbed Fernando's hair and began to deliver a series of powerful and brutal blows to his face. But just when it seemed like all hope was lost, Fernando let out a roar and vowed to use all of his strength to defeat Damon. Suddenly, everyone realized that Fernando had been hiding his true strength all along. They were shocked and impressed, and many began to flatter him once again. Fernando is a true warrior! He's going to turn the tables and emerge victorious! They exclaimed. Come on, give it all you've got! Damon taunted. Fernando fought against Damon's overpowering strength, using every ounce of his own. But no matter how hard he tried, it felt as though a colossal mountain was weighing down on his body, crushing him inch by inch. Confusion and frustration filled Fernando's mind. Just six years ago, he had been able to plot against Damon and overpower him. Back then, he had thought he was invincible. But now, after years of organizations, investments, and funds and technology, Fernando had only grown stronger. He should have been able to easily defeat Damon. Despite the excruciating pain coursing through his body, Fernando shouted, If you lay another finger on me, my family will seek revenge! Aren't you afraid of their wrath? Damon responded sarcastically, Oh, I'm terrified. Without warning, Damon launched another attack, shattering both of Fernando's legs. As a hidden force surged through Fernando's body, the extent of his internal injuries remained a mystery. But deep within, Fernando's spirit began to wither and decay. The reason Damon didn't kill Fernando outright was due to the influence of public opinion and the information he still wanted to extract from him. However, even with this small mercy, Fernando was still engulfed in unbearable agony. Fernando, though powerful in his own right, paled in comparison to Damon's strength and dominance. As he struggled to catch his breath, he weakly pleaded, My, my father Mario will be here soon. If you let me go now, you still have time. Otherwise, you'll never be able to escape. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. Damon had been waiting for this moment, planning to exact revenge on the father and son together. But fate had other plans. Mario, bound by an unspoken connection with Fernando, sensed his son's distress. Determined to protect his family's legacy, he had managed to secure an early release from prison. Racing against time, Mario rushed toward the club his family owned. However, as he hurried through a dimly lit alley, his path was unexpectedly blocked by a young woman. It was Susanna, the assistant to Damon's grandfather, who had played a crucial role in Damon's rescue in the cave. After Damon and Susanna bid each other farewell in South Rivertown, little did Susanna know that her quest would lead her to this very moment in Meyerson. Meanwhile, Mario was a stranger to Susanna, and couldn't help but be captivated by her enchanting beauty. His eyes gleamed with a mischievous glint as he approached her, Ah, my dear, you are truly a sight to behold. Are you here alone? With a cold and determined tone, she responded, Your son has committed heinous acts, and you too have a long list of sins to answer for. Today, I will make you pay for your crimes. Mario was amused. What the hell are you talking about? Are you drunk? Come on, I'll let's get you sobered up. Susanna had no time for his arrogance. Without wasting another breath, she swiftly drew a gleaming dagger its icy blade reflecting the light into Mario's face. The sudden realization of Susanna's seriousness sent a shiver down his spine. You're trying to fight. Very well, I'll humor you. I'll give you five chances to defeat me. And if you fail, you can accompany me tonight to my hotel room. Mario's laughter filled the air, his doubt evident in his mocking words. Susanna shrugged, 
she knew she could defeat him. In a split second, Susanna moved with lightning speed, her dagger slicing through the air towards Mario. Cut off guard, Mario relied on his pure instinct to dodge, but it was too late. A searing pain shot through his ears and mercilessly was severed by Susanna's blade. Mario clutched his bleeding ear, a mixture of shock and anger filling his eyes. You, you cut off my ear! Ignoring his outburst, Susanna raised her knife, a wicked smile playing on her lips. That was just the first move. The second strike was even more ferocious. A blood-curdling scream echoed through the air as Susanna swiftly plunged her knife into Mario's lower abdomen. The pain was unbearable as Mario's body trembled. He was mercilessly hacked into pieces. Through the agony, Mario managed to roar. I'll never let you get away with this! But the pain overwhelmed him, his strength fading away as blood poured from his wounds. Mario was left powerless, unable to fight back with his full might. Susanna's knife sliced through the air like a whirlwind, relentlessly attacking Mario. Didn't you promise to let me attack five times before fighting back? You broke your word after just two moves. Mario was left speechless, completely overwhelmed by Susanna's ferocious assault. As Mario's blood loss increased, his consciousness began to fade, and he regretted his carelessness. He tried to flee, but Susanna was faster. She swiftly thrust her dagger into his chest, causing him to collapse to the ground. Meanwhile, at the club, Damon stood triumphantly over Fernando. Why hasn't your father shown up yet? It's been quite a while. Fernando clenched his teeth, seething with anger. Tch! My father's here! I can feel his presence! Without warning, the door burst open, propelled by an immense force. Fernando couldn't contain his excitement as he shouted, Dad, you're finally here! But to everyone's astonishment, it wasn't Mario who stood before them. It was a beautiful woman, Susanna. The room fell into a stunned silence as Susanna lifted her head and cast a contemptuous glance at Fernando. In an instant, Fernando's expression transformed from joy to confusion. Who? Who are you? Where's my father? Susanna's lips curled into a smirk. Who's your dad? She asked, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Fernando's voice grew stern as he replied, Mario Martinelli! Susanna's smirk widened, a chilling glint in her eyes. I took care of him. He won't be taking another breath. Damon couldn't believe it. It had been nearly a year since he last laid eyes on Susanna, and he had resigned himself to the fact that he would never see her again after their parting in South Rivertown. Seems like your father couldn't even protect himself, let alone save you, Damon said, relishing the despair that flickered in Fernando's eyes. Desperation consumed Fernando as he pleaded. What do you want from me? You've already crippled me, just, just let me go! Fernando's pitiful state was a result of his actions. Over the years, he had committed countless crimes, including illegally developing biochemical warriors. Damon looked down at him with a disdain. You know what? I think we'll toss you into the alley alongside your father's lifeless body. Killing you today won't satisfy me. I want to toy with you further in the future. Having exacted his revenge, Damon signaled to Pitbull to dispose of Fernando in the alley. He then confidently strode out of the club, Susanna and his men following suit. No one dared to stand their way. Turning to Susanna, Damon expressed his gratitude. Thanks for helping me eliminate Mario. Susanna shook her head. No need for thanks, but letting the enemy go so easily, showing mercy to your enemy is only cruel to yourself. Why did you do that? Damon smirked, his confidence unwavering. Don't worry, I planted something within his organs. He will meet his demise, but not just yet. I still need him to lead me to the true enemy. There's more information to glean from him. There were still more secrets of the Martinelli family's organization to uncover. And then there was Silas Brokerton, who had conspired with this organization to steal the Brokerton group's wealth. The puzzle pieces were slowly coming together, and Damon was determined to solve the mystery. After settling all those grudges, what remained was the relationship issue that was giving Damon a major headache. Fifi, Vicky, and Emily, and even Wendy, they were all part of the problem. On top of that, Damon hadn't heard a single word from Avery since she disappeared. The uncertainty of whether she was alive or dead weighed heavily in his mind, but now Damon had managed to gather himself and turn his attention to Susanna. As he looked at her, he couldn't help but be captivated by her presence. There was something in her enchanting eyes that took him by surprise. Have you ever been to South Rivertown? He asked. Have there been more developments with our search? Susanna bit her lip. Oh, I found some things. What did you find? Damon pressed. But to his surprise, Susanna refused to reveal anything. Damon sighed. What are your plans now? If you need money and resources, just say the word. Unexpectedly, Susanna shook her head once again. I thought I'd stay with you for a while. You know, in case you need help for protection. Your grandfather taught me everything I know. 
Damon's jaw dropped, thinking he must have misheard her. Susanna noticed Damon's disbelief and blushed. Why are you looking at me like that? Can't I? I live with my wife. You can't live with both of us, right? Damon muttered, feeling like he was in a tight spot. Susanna's eyes widened in shock. You have a wife? Who is she? Fifi Harper. You don't know her. Damon replied. Susanna stared at him resolutely. My master tasked me with protecting you, and that's exactly what I intended to do. Damon protested that he didn't need her protection, but Susanna was adamant. I can't go against my master's orders. She said firmly, I want to be by your side no matter what. Damon was at a loss for words. He couldn't send Susanna home, but he couldn't have her living with him and his wife either, so he made a compromise. How about I buy you a house? He suggested, you can live there for now. But for Susanna didn't even bother to reply. She gave Damon a long and hard look, then turned and walked away, leaving him to ponder the strange turn of events. After Susanna's departure, Damon found himself standing alone in a dimly lit alley. Concern for Jillian's safety nodded at his mind, prompting him to reach out to Pitbull for answers. The news he received was a relief. Jillian had sought medical attention for her wounds and had already returned home. Without wasting another moment, Damon made his way to Jillian's house. As he approached the door, anticipation mingled with curiosity. Being Veronica's assistant had brought Jillian financial success, allowing her to purchase a spacious house in a prestigious neighborhood of Meyerson. When Jillian swung open the door and saw Damon, her face lit up with a radiant smile. Damon, you're here? Come inside quickly! She beckoned. Damon stepped into the house. The interior was tastefully adorned, reflecting Jillian's impeccable sense of style. The air was infused with the delightful fragrance, one that Damon instantly recognized as Jillian's signature scent. It was the same perfume she'd been wearing since college. What brought you here, Damon? Jillian inquired. Damon's response was immediate. You were injured, Jillian. I had to come and see you. How's the wound? Does it still hurt? Jillian felt warmth in her heart as Damon cared for her, but she had to roll her eyes at his comment about the pain. Of course it's painful, she replied. I was stabbed. Damon wanted to know how Jillian had ended up in Fernando's hands, and she explained that she had helped Veronica obtain information about Rothschild Limited, which led to Fernando accusing her of being the informant. Damon reassured her that he would protect her and even arrange for bodyguards, knowing that anyone he cared about was in danger. He didn't want the Martinellis to take any more of his loved ones a hostage. After making sure Jillian was okay, Damon asked about C-Tech's progress. He was genuinely interested in how the development was going. Jillian saw right through his indirect concern for Veronica. With a playful eye roll, she said, Damon, if you want to know about Veronica, you should ask her directly. Jillian's voice softened as she continued, subtly urging Damon to lend a helping hand to Veronica during this difficult time. She reminded him that C-Tech, despite its triumph over Rothschild Limited, was also facing challenges. Damon fell silent, his mind drifting back to the time when Veronica was attacked by Fernando's lackeys. He remembered being there for her, wearing a mask to conceal his identity. Even though Veronica didn't know who had come to her rescue that day, there was an undeniable sense of familiarity between them. Veronica was the one who had got away, and Damon still kept her old diary locked up in his nightstand. He often found himself lost in thought, wondering what could have been if he had just been brave enough to pursue her. As he sat there lost in thought, Jillian interrupted his reverie. She could tell that Damon was thinking about Veronica again, and she felt a twinge of jealousy. Damon, why do you always chase after other girls? What about me? Am I not attractive enough for you? Jillian asked. Damon was silent for a moment, unsure of how to respond. His head throbbed with the weight of his emotions, as if the world around him was spinning out of control. He desperately needed a distraction. Trying to change the subject, Damon asked Jillian if she was hungry. Jillian, understanding his need to escape, simply nodded in response. As Damon hurried to the kitchen, hoping to find something to snack on, his phone suddenly rang. He had left it on the table, forgotten in the chaos of the moment. Jillian picked up the phone and saw that it was Emily calling. Without thinking, she pressed the answer button. Hi Damon, I miss you, and so does the baby in my belly. Emily said, Damon, hearing the ringtone from the kitchen, rushed out to answer the call. Give me that. He barked at Jillian. He grabbed the phone. Emily, is that you? Can I go and see you tomorrow? Emily signed. Why not today? I swear this baby's doing acrobatics in my stomach. Damon's forehead creased with concern. I can't right now, but tomorrow I'm free. All right, then. Emily reluctantly agreed, not wanting to push Damon too hard. After exchanging a flurry of sweet nothing, she hung up the phone with a satisfied smile. 
When Damon slipped his phone into his pocket, he noticed Jillian staring at him. Feeling a bit self-conscious, Damon asked, Why are you looking at me like that? Jillian bit her lip. Damon, is it true that you have a child with someone else? Are you being so reckless? What about Fifi? Jillian's ears had perked up to catch every word when Damon was on the phone. She knew Fifi and Veronica, and this voice didn't belong to either of them. It meant that Damon had surely been involved with another woman. Damon decided to come clean and share the whole story of his relationship with Emily. He knew it was his fault, but he didn't want Jillian to think he was a complete scoundrel, even though he had made yet another mistake. Jillian listened quietly, absorbing every word. When Damon finished, she stood up and embraced him tightly. Her voice trembled as she whispered, Damon, why? Why do you keep ignoring me? Damon looked at Jillian. What are you doing? Let go. Don't be like this. Jillian shook her head, wildly, tears streaming down her face like rain. I can't let go, she cried. I want you to hug me. I'm jealous. Why can they have you, but I can't? What part of me can't compare to them? I've given up so much for you over the years. I would even choose to lose my life for you. Why do you have to treat me so differently? Jillian exploded with emotion, revealing all the years of bitter longing she had kept hidden inside. She had risked everything to help Damon take revenge, and even putting herself in danger by going deep into the lion's den. But she had never regretted it. She felt like everything she had done was worth it. But now she was hurt and confused. Damon knew how Jillian felt, but he couldn't change the terrible fate that had brought them to this moment. Jillian, please let go of my hand. Damon said, trying to reason with her. If you have nothing else to say, let's talk it out. But Jillian held on tight, refusing to let go. Damon tried to pry her fingers open, but she clung to him with all of her strength. When he finally managed to break free, Jillian cried out in pain. You hurt me, she sobbed. Before Damon knew what was happening, Jillian leaned in and kissed him with her tender red lips. Damon was lost in the moment, a pure bliss as he felt Jillian's warm lips on his. It was no secret that Jillian was drop-dead gorgeous, and she had almost been Damon's girlfriend back in the day, but life had taken them on different paths and they had gone their separate ways. Despite their past, Jillian had been working tirelessly to make amends for her mistakes. She had joined Sea Tech to bring back the magic of Astromar, and even risked her life to spy on Rothschild Limited to avenge Damon. That's how much she cared about him. As they kissed, Damon was transported back to all the memories he shared with Jillian. The fire in his heart was reignited, and he couldn't resist the passion that was building between them. Jillian was happy to disarm herself and enjoy the gentleness that Damon brought her. When they finally parted, Jillian's eyes were misty and her face was flushed. She couldn't help but ask Damon if he had kissed a lot of women before. As he seemed so skillful, Damon denied it, but Jillian knew he was lying. Let me ask you something, Damon. Does Fifi know that Emily is pregnant? You and Fifi already have a child together. What exactly do you plan to do after the baby is born? It was the same old question he had asked himself constantly. The kind of question that left him speechless and with a pounding headache. If only he had an answer, maybe then he could stop living in constant uncertainty. Jillian laughed darkly. I see now. You want to have your cake and eat it too, don't you, Damon? I never knew you had such a mischievous side. He smirked, replying. Well, I do enjoy a little mischief. Jillian's face turned a shade redder. Tell me honestly, how many lovers do you have? I refuse to believe that you only have this one. Damon silently counted in his head, even going so far as to secretly tally on his fingers, but he wouldn't dare say it out loud. Jillian's smile grew wider. You know, I don't mind if you have more than one. I know your type. I'm not a prude. Damon's heart raced as he gazed at Jillian's sly smile. Something wasn't right. He could feel it in his bones. Jillian, what are you saying? You deserve someone who loves you, not someone like me. He said, his voice laced with concern. Jillian let out a heavy sigh. I don't want this either, Damon, but I can't help it. Every time I close my eyes, I see you. I can't shake you off. She confessed, her grip on his neck tightening. Suddenly, she leaned in close to his ear and whispered, I know your secret, Damon, and I don't care. I want to be your lover. Damon was taken aback. Jillian had done so much for him, but he couldn't let her throw her life away for him. He needed time to think. But Jillian was no fool. She knew he was stalling. Tears streamed down her face as she clung to him, refusing to let go. She deserved to fight for what she wanted, and she wasn't going to back down now. Just as Damon found himself caught in a perplexing situation, his phone suddenly sprang to life once again. With a mix of anticipation and relief, Damon fished out his phone and saw that it was Vicky calling. Without wasting a second, he eagerly answered the phone, hoping she would have good news for him. Hello, 
Damon exclaimed. However, his excitement was met with an unfriendly tone from Vicky. Where did you go? Fifi and I have been waiting for you at home. I have something important to discuss with you. Damon frowned. What is it? Vicky sneered, her words dripping with sarcasm. You'll find out more when you come back. Another stunning beauty has come looking for you. Are you surprised? Damon's gut instinct told him that this wasn't going to be the good news he had anticipated. All right, I'll be right back. After hanging up the phone, Damon turned to Jillian and explained, I have some urgent matters to attend to at home, so I need to leave. Jillian grabbed Damon's hand and pleaded, Damon, promise me that no matter how many women come into your life, you won't forget about me, okay? Damon pondered her request, realizing the complexity of the situation. Jillian was a wonderful woman, but their paths were destined to diverge. In a tender moment, Jillian stood on her tiptoes and planted a gentle kiss on Damon's cheek. She delicately wiped away the mark with the tissue, a bittersweet jester before letting him go. As Damon approached his house, he noticed that the property management had gone above and beyond to make sure everything was in tip-top shape. The front garden was immaculate, and the workers had even weeded and landscaped the area. But as he stepped inside, he heard laughter coming from the other room. It sounded like more than just two women. And sure enough, when he peeked in, he saw three women chatting and laughing away. Fifi was there, of course, but so was Vicky. And to Damon's surprise, Susanna was there too. What was she doing in his house? This had to be some sort of joke. At first, the atmosphere was light and cheerful, as the three women engaged in lively conversation. But as soon as Damon entered the room, everything changed. The laughter abruptly ceased, and the three pairs of captivating eyes fixated on him. Damon felt a bit uneasy under the intense scrutiny of these three women. He stammered, Uh, did I interrupt something? Fifi with a cold tone replied, No, you arrived just in time. Damon hurriedly stepped aside, but the anger in Vicky's eyes was impossible to ignore. Damon, you're unbelievable. Vicky commented, her voice filled with disappointment. I once saved your life, and now I see that you have no conscience. If it weren't for Susanna, I would have never known the kind of person you truly are. Damon glanced at Susanna, who confirmed, I've already told them everything. Fifi chimed in, her voice laced with accusation. So, instead of being stranded on a desert island for five years, you were hiding and healing yourself. Why the hell weren't you honest with me from the get-go? Damon could only helplessly shrug his shoulders, realizing Susanna had spilled the story to Fifi and Vicky. It seemed that there was no escaping the truth now. Fifi turned to Susanna. If it truly is the case that you're lost your memory and can't find your family, you can live with me from now on. Susanna cast a fleeting glance at Damon before nodding. Thank you, Fifi. She said appreciatively. The three girls had completely disregarded Damon, leaving him to his thoughts. Feeling dejected, he made his way back to his room and collapsed onto the bed. Suddenly, Vicky burst into the room, her face filled with curiosity. Damon, what's the deal between you and Susanna? Vicky questioned, her doubt evident in her voice. Damon was determined to set things straight. It's not what you think, we're just friends. She helped me and my grandfather in the past. Is that so? Vicky stared at Damon intently, searching for any signs of deception. Not satisfied, Vicky pressed on. You've been busy these past few days. Where have you been? I had some matters to attend to. Damon replied vaguely, but Vicky's expression turned serious as she brought up a disturbing rumor. I heard that Fernando was left crippled and his father was killed. Did you have something to do with it? Damon nodded almost imperceptibly, confirming her suspicions. Concern etched in her face. Vicky warned him. Fernando is known to have a powerful network. What kind of organization is he involved with? You need to be careful. After all, you've managed to offend the Martinelli family. Watch your back. She spun around and closed the door behind her. Susanna bounded up the stairs to tell Damon to come to dinner. As she entered the room, she noticed Damon thumbing through a treasure trove of old memories. Graduation photos from junior high and high school, a snapshot of him beaming alongside Avery and others, and yet, what Damon was truly fixated on was Veronica's diary. Damon flipped through the pages, marveling at Veronica's exquisite penmanship and the heartfelt words of love that adorned the paper. Lost in the words, Damon suddenly snapped back to reality, only to find Susanna still lingering, her gaze fixed upon the photos he had unearthed. What's up? Damon asked. She averted her eyes from the photos. Dinner's ready. Let's head downstairs and eat. Following Susanna's lead, Damon descended the stairs and was greeted by a feast fit for kings. The three women engaged in animated discussions. Susanna's knowledge and insights were impressive, hinting at a privileged upbringing before her memory lapse. 
Damon found himself unable to interject amidst the girl's lively banter, opting instead to devour his meal with gusto. Once the plates were cleared, the women stood up. Damon, we're going shopping, said Fifi, and it's your turn to do the dishes. After the women left, Damon quickly washed the dishes and then strolled to his parents' house to check in on Junior. Initially, Fifi had intended to bring the child to live with them. However, the little one was accustomed to the presence of his doting grandparents, and Mrs. Walker herself was reluctant to let him go. Thus, the responsibility of caring for the baby fell upon the two elders for the time being. As Damon approached, Andrew and Mrs. Walker hurriedly emerged from the house. Have you had dinner yet? I can whip something up for you. Mrs. Walker exclaimed. Damon smiled at her thoughtfulness. Mom, I've already eaten. He replied. Mrs. Walker's eyes scanned Damon from head to toe, and she nodded approvingly, a warm smile gracing her lips. Oh, it seems like you've put on some weight, she remarked. Andrew chimed in. Damon, I heard from our neighbors that you disagreed with some other homeowners a few days ago. Damon nodded, recounting the entire incident to Andrew. In response, Andrew mused. Well, they are our neighbors after all. We'll inevitably cross paths with them. We must strive to foster good relationships. Mrs. Walker rolled her eyes. What on earth are you babbling about? Look at the lawyer couple over there. They're so full of themselves, it's nauseating. You know, when Damon wasn't around, that despicable couple used to bully poor Fifi relentlessly. But this time, Damon came back just in the nick of time. They used to think our family was weak and powerless. They would mock Fifi for driving a second-hand car, and even our little one was targeted at school. Mrs. Walker grinned at her son. But now, whenever your dad and I stroll through the neighborhood, that security guard tips his hat in respect. Junior ran over to Andrew. Grandpa, I want to ride the horse. Andrew knew what the child meant. He squatted down so Junior could climb on his back. Come on up here, kiddo. Grandpa will be your trusty steed. Junior giggled and wrapped his arms around his grandfather's neck. Giddy up, horse. Let's go on an adventure. Andrew took off his old bones protesting with each step. He may have been slower and in pain, but his love for his grandson pushed him forward. Damon's eyes narrowed with disapproval as he witnessed the scene. In one swift motion, he pulled Junior off Andrew's back. Who taught you to ride Grandpa like a horse? Get down this instant. The joy that had filled Junior's face was now replaced with shock and confusion. His little mouth tightened and his eyes welled up into tears, threatening to spill over at any moment. Your dad is happy when the baby enjoys himself. Why must you be so harsh? Mrs. Walker questioned. Andrew turned to Junior with a gentle smile. Baby, don't mind your dad. You didn't do anything wrong. Damon's face grew serious as he addressed his parents. Mom, Dad, this is not how you should be raising my child. If we allow him to do whatever he wants, he'll never learn right from wrong. Fear gripped Junior's heart as he saw the intensity in his father's eyes. Mrs. Walker, now consumed by anger, could no longer contain her emotions. This is my grandson. Why must you interfere and make him cry? You have been around for five years. We have. Stop pretending to be his father now. She picked Junior up and consoled him. Damon, this isn't a good night to visit. We'll call you later, okay? Damon trudged back home, his spirits dampened. He resigned himself to the idea of retreating to his room for some much-needed shut-eye. As he settled into his bed, his phone buzzed with an incoming call from Vicky. He answered, only to be bombarded with questions. What's wrong? Why can't I reach you for the past hour? Are you too busy for me now? Damon sighed. Vicky, what do you need? Vicky asked him to come to the mall to pick them up. They had gone on a shopping spree and were now burdened with an overwhelming number of bags. As he arrived at the bustling shopping center, his eyes widened at the sight of before him. Three women laden with bags of all shapes and sizes struggled to make their way towards his car. It was as if they had single-handedly conquered the entire mall with their shopping prowess. During the ride back, Vicky couldn't resist teasing Fifi about her recent lingerie purchase. Fifi, who are you planning to show all those saucy little things to? Fifi blushed, her face turning a shade of crimson. She shot a glance at Damon before retorting. I think that's obvious. What about you, Vicky? Why were you buying those things too? Going back to the city in two days, huh? I bet you're planning to flaunt them for your lover. Introduce him to me. I want to see if he's as handsome as you claim. Vicky smiled slyly. Oh, you'll think he's handsome. He's just your type. Fifi and Vicky kept talking to each other. Vicky's words were hinting at something that made Damon's heart jump. He was afraid that he would be exposed if he was not careful. That would be the end of him. As the clock struck midnight, the three women stumbled into their beds, exhausted from a long day of shopping. They decided to sleep in the same room, so Damon retired to the guest bedroom. Suddenly, he heard footsteps approaching his bedroom door. Are you a thief? Damon said with a scowl. Always sneaking in at night. 
Vicky's eyes narrowed in anger. What, so you want me to sneak in during the day? Didn't you hear me in the car that I wanted to show my love for my new lingerie? Damon knew he shouldn't be sneaking around with Vicky, especially with Fifi and Susanna sleeping in the next room. What if they found out? He asked. Vicky scoffed. Please, they're out like a light. Susanna may be a powerhouse, but even she needs her beauty sleep. Damon wasn't convinced. I don't know, Susanna never seems to tire. Vicky waved her hand dismissively. So, Damon, I'm curious. Who are you sleeping with now, other than your wife? Damon protested, trying to defend himself against Vicky's accusations. He didn't want to be labeled as a playboy, but the truth was hard to deny. Vicky couldn't help but tease him. If you're not a pervert, then I'll put on my sexy pajamas later. But you're not allowed to drool. Damon barked out a laugh. Vicky pursed her lips. What are you laughing at? Damon shook his head. You just reminded me of the time when you put condoms in your bag to trick me into caring about your love life. As Damon's words echoed in her mind, Vicky was instantly transported back into the past. It was a tumultuous time, filled with emotions and unexpected twists. And now, as she stood before Damon, she couldn't shake off the feeling of being wronged once again. With a surge of anger, Vicky clenched her fist and struck Damon's chest. Her voice filled with accusation. You scoundrel, you didn't care about me at all. You even broke our agreement and said you didn't want me anymore. You owe me an apology for what you did back then. Damon, worried about waking up the other women around them, quickly apologized. A smile crept on Vicky's face. She leaned in closer. I'm wearing the lingerie I bought at the mall today. Would you like to take a peek? Damon's heart raced to the thought. Vicky, this is too risky. We're bound to be discovered sooner or later. But Vicky brushed off his concerns, her desire for attention growing stronger. I'm leaving the day after tomorrow. It's now or never. Damon was taken aback. Why are you leaving so soon? You've only just arrived in Meyerson. Damon's disappointment was palpable, evident in the slight downturn of his expression. Vicky was satisfied with his reaction. Ah, so now he realizes what he's been missing, she thought to herself. What's waiting for you back home? Damon asked. Um, Vicky hesitated, her words stumbling out as if she was grappling with a difficult confession. Damon pressed on. Tell me, Vicky, what is it? Vicky finally revealed the truth behind her sudden change of plans. My father is sick, she admitted. He wants me to return to take over the family business. It's a huge responsibility, you know. And how can I possibly find time to explore and enjoy myself when I have to take care of my family's legacy? Damon fell silent, understanding the weight of Vicky's predicament. He realized that further questioning would only add to her burden. At that moment, Vicky gazed at Damon with a mischievous glint in her eyes. Without warning, she playfully threw him onto the bed and whispered, Let's not talk about that anymore. The night is young, babe. What do you think of the lingerie I bought today? Damon's eyes nearly popped out of his head, completely taken aback by Vicky's sudden seduction. The next morning, after the three women left, Damon made his way to Emily's house. Little did he know he was in for a surprise. As he entered the house, he was taken aback to find Emily's entire family there. Her father, Bob, sat comfortably in the living room, engrossed in the morning newspaper. Meanwhile, her mother was diligently cleaning, and her brother Frank was lazily lounging on the sofa, absorbed in his video game. Damon's heart skipped a beat, sensing that something was amiss. Emily's mother frowned upon seeing Damon, her disapproval evident. Bob, noticing Damon's arrival, put down his newspaper and moved his glasses. Ah, Damon is here. Damon took a note of the subtle change in Bob's expression, realizing that he wasn't exactly thrilled to see him. Emily shot Damon a look of warning as if silently urging him to tread carefully. Come on, Damon, have a seat. Bob invited him, gesturing toward the empty spot beside him. Damon obliged but couldn't shake off the feeling of being scrutinized by Bob's piercing gaze. We're well aware of everything that's been going on between you and Emily. Bob said, and we also know about the child she's carrying. Damon was unsure of how to respond. Before he could gather his thoughts, Emily interjected, her voice filled with apprehension. Dad, please don't pressure Damon. He won't leave Fifi to be with me, I already asked, and I can live with that answer. Emily feared that her father would corner Damon into a difficult situation, so she rushed to his defense. Sensing the tension, Emily's mother swiftly intervened, pulling Emily aside. Emily, your father's only looking out for your happiness. She explained urgently. Can't you see the good intentions behind his words? Emily's tears cascaded down her cheeks, a torrent of emotions pouring out. Mother, you've pushed me to my limits. Are you still going to force Damon into this? I've already told both of you and Dad that this is an unsolvable problem. Why do you still throw it at Damon? She never expected that just a few sentences would be enough to reduce her to tears, 
but before she arrived, her parents had already engaged in a lengthy conversation with her. Bob let out a heavy sigh and turned to Damon once again. Damon, we've been friends for so many years. My heart aches for my daughter. I can't bear to see her being abandoned, can I? Damon felt the weight of his actions. He had been a fool, causing harm to Emily and bringing such grief to Bob and his wife. Damon spoke slowly, his voice filled with remorse. Bob, this is indeed my fault, but apologizing now won't change anything. I... Emily interrupted Damon, her voice filled with determination. I said it was my fault. Moreover, I'm willing to take responsibility and have the baby. Dad, Mom, you can't blame Damon. If anyone deserves to be scalded, it's me. Emily's parents were left speechless. Frank, always quick with his words, chimed in, breaking the silence. Come on, Dad, Mom, cut the guy some slack. The couple let out a simultaneous sigh. Bob, being the open-minded person he was, didn't hold any grudges against Damon. After all, Damon had once come to their family's rescue when Bob's brother was stranded abroad. It was Damon who had lent a helping hand, ensuring his safe return. Not only that, but Damon possessed an undeniable charm and talent. It was only natural for Emily to be smitten with him. I suppose there's nothing more I can say. But Damon, I have to ask you this. Can you promise me that you'll bring happiness to my daughter's life? Can you give her the love and joy she deserves, considering the circumstances? Damon's response was solemn and unwavering. Bob, you have my word. I'll do everything in my power to ensure that Emily and our future child experience the utmost happiness. Emily's mother frowned. What are you doing now? If your career isn't progressing as it should, Bob can help you. We don't want our daughter and future grandchild to be in dire straits. Indeed, Damon had once been the illustrious founder of Astromar, but now the company had been divided, and his shares had been diluted. In the eyes of Emily's parents, he was practically a pauper. Thankfully, Damon was no fool. Emily's mother had faith that with the backing of the influential Francis family, and Damon's unwavering determination, he would surely make a triumphant comeback. Damon did his best to reassure Emily's family. Don't worry, I've been doing better lately. Even though Astromar is gone, I still have a few billion to my name. Damon's conservative estimate was already more than enough to impress the couple, causing Emily's mother to gasp in disbelief. Damon, you're not joking with me, are you? Emily quickly interjected. Mom, I already told you that Damon is doing great now. Damon continued. Bob, you remember the fall of the Martinelli family, right? Well, I was the one who convinced their butler to testify against them. All of Bob and Mrs. Francis's doubts about him vanished in an instant. Frank, Emily's brother, approached Damon. You have to share your legendary story with us over dinner. Mrs. Francis rose to her feet. You guys go ahead and chat. I'll head to the kitchen and whip up something delicious for all of you. Bob also stood up. I'll help you. Frank nudged Damon playfully. Do you have any idea how much effort it took for me to convince my parents to accept you? And do you know how much I covered for you? I think I deserve a little treat. Although Frank's words were meant to Jess, Damon took them seriously. He was a person who believed in repaying favors and he wasted no time in reaching for his checkbook. Here, Damon said, presenting Frank with a blank check. Write whatever amount you want, and I'll sign it. Frank chuckled. Forget it. Thank you for your kind intentions, but if I were to accept your money, my dad would have my head. Instead, why don't we give it to my sister? She'll have a lot of expenses once the baby's born. Damon smiled. Please take the check. I've got more money than I know what to do with. Damon pulled out another blank check and held it out to Emily. Take it, he said firmly. I'll give you millions. I want the best for you and our baby, even if I can't be there with you every step of the way. Despite her initial hesitance, Emily couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over her. She knew that Damon's financial support would be crucial in ensuring a bright future for their child. Thank you, she whispered, taking the check from his outstretched hand. Damon smiled. He knew that he couldn't always physically be present in their lives, but he was determined to make up for it in any way he could. And if that meant showering them with wealth and resources, then so be it. He knew that he was doing the right thing and that their child would have every advantage. After all, what parent wouldn't want their child to have the best possible start in life? When Damon returned home, Susanna was the only other person at the house. Do you have any plans for the afternoon? Susanna asked. Damon replied, nothing in particular. Why? What's going on? Susanna bit her lip. I've stumbled upon some clues about my lost memories. Would you mind accompanying me to investigate? Damon nodded in agreement. Of course. Just let me know where we need to go. Susanna sighed. I'll trust my fragmented memory to guide us. Wherever they lead, that's where we'll go. Susanna had been struggling with amnesia for a while now, always yearning to uncover her past. 
Naturally, Damon agreed to support her in this quest. Without any specific destination in mind, he aimlessly drove around Meyerson. Damon leaned back in his seat as he drove. You know, Susanna, you're quite the mystery. I can't help but to wonder who you were before you lost your memory. Susanna furrowed her brow, her mind racing to make sense of it all. I wish I knew, Damon. All I have to guide me are my instincts. A small smile tugged at the corner of Damon's lips. Well, let's see where those instincts take us, shall we? Susanna nodded, her gaze fixed on the road ahead. Now that you mention it, there are some places that feel strangely familiar to me. I feel like I know this road. Damon arched an eyebrow. Believe it or not, Susanna, this road leads straight to Meyerson University. Perhaps you were a student there. Meyerson University. Susanna repeated, her voice filled with a sense of wonder. That name sounds so familiar. It's like I have a deep connection to that place. Damon parked the car outside of the main entrance to the school. Making her way towards the magnificent College of Music building, Susanna's heart skipped a beat. The sound of a piano being played resonated through the walls, captivating her attention. Without a second thought, Susanna found herself opening her mouth and singing along. You must have been a music major, Damon exclaimed. If that's the case, maybe someone here has a clue about your identity. He dialed Levi's number. Levi answered immediately. Damon, I thought you forgot about me. Damon smiled at the sound of a friend's voice. The phone works both ways, you know. He teased. Yeah, right, Levi chuckled. <laughs> You're a busy guy. You don't have time in your schedule for your old pals. Damon sighed good-naturedly. How about we grab lunch next week? Sure, Levi agreed. But why are you really calling? I'm looking for contact information for the Dean of the College of Music. Damon replied. Luckily, Levi kept in touch with his old mentors. After getting the Dean's phone number from Levi, Damon wasted no time in calling her. The phone rang for what felt like an eternity before Dean Bonnie Castillo answered, her voice filled with annoyance. Who is it? Did you call the wrong number? Damon did not let her unfriendly tone deter him. Dean Costello, I'm sorry to interrupt your busy schedule. My name is Damon Walker. I used to study at Myerson University. Levi gave me your phone number, and I wanted to ask you for your help. Dean Costello was having a rough day, and it showed in her stiff tone. But as soon as she realized who was on the other end of the line, she perked up. Wait, Damon Walker? The Damon Walker? Dean Costello couldn't contain her excitement. Oh my god, this is perfect timing. I'm tutoring some students in practice room 305 right now. You should come by and see me. Damon hung up the phone and headed straight to classroom 305 with Susanna in tow. She was a little nervous, but also hopeful. She had a feeling that today was the day she would finally discover who she truly was. As they entered the classroom, they were greeted by the sight of Dean Castillo engrossed in conversation with a group of students. A young woman named Monique lifted her chin confidently. Dean Castillo, don't worry. I'll emerge victorious in the intercollegiate singing contest. Dean Castillo, ever the realist, responded. Remember, there is always someone out there who surpasses us. You must practice that new song diligently. We cannot afford any mishaps. Monique was unfazed by the Dean's remark. Dean Castillo, with all due respect, my confidence knows no bounds. Levi's the only one who can outshine me. However, he's a rare prodigy, a once-in-a-millennium talent. No one can hold a candle to him. Just then, Damon knocked on the door and called out, Dean Costillo. Damon is here? Dean Costillo's eyes lit up at the sight of Damon and Susanna. A sudden idea sparked in her mind, and she turned to Monique. Right before you stands a singer who rivals Levi. Here's a proposition for you. If you truly believe in your abilities, why not have a competition with him? We shall all be your judges, and if you win, I'll exempt you from learning the new song. How does that sound? Monique retorted, Dean Costello, there is no need to bring in some random nobody to compete against me just so I can prove my worth. I'm more than capable. Dean Costello leaned in and whispered to Damon, Hey, how would you like to blow my students' minds with your incredible skills? Without hesitation, Damon nodded and replied, No problem at all. Damon positioned himself in front of the piano. The song he was about to play, Time Flies, was originally written for the guitar, but Damon was about to unleash a whole new version, one that had never been heard before. As his fingers danced across the keys, his voice filled the room. A hush fell over the crowd. All eyes were fixed on Damon, captivated by his flawless performance. Damon finished the last note and turned to Dean Costello, a confident smile on his face. Not bad, right? Not bad? That was incredible! She exclaimed. I've never heard a piano version of this song before. Is this your first time playing it? Yeah, it was a bit of an improv, he admitted. 
I've never played the piano before, but I couldn't resist the challenge. Dean Castillo's eyes widened in amazement. Truly impressive. When Levi mentioned you were his guiding light, I had my doubts. But now I'm certain. Your talent surpasses anything I've ever seen. Your musical prowess is beyond compare. Monique's brow furrowed. Wait a minute, Dean Castillo, who exactly is this guy? Dean Castillo grinned. My dear Monique, didn't you hear what I was telling you earlier? There's always someone out there who surpasses even the strongest of us. Let me introduce you to the one who holds that title. His name is Damon Walker, a brilliant graduate from our school's financial college. He's the one who helped Levi rise to stardom. Monique was skeptical. Dean Costello, while I do believe Damon is talented, you can't place him on such a high pedestal. Are you saying he's better than Levi? And besides, who is he? He doesn't seem to have much fame in the entertainment industry. I've never even heard of Damon Walker. His stage name is Ryan Gold, Dean Castillo announced. Monique furrowed her brow, feeling like she heard that name before. The whispers around her confirmed her suspicions. Ryan Gold was the name that rang a bell for many of them. Suddenly it clicked. He wrote Time Flies! Someone exclaimed. The room erupted in excited chatter. As students talked amongst themselves, Dean Costello motioned for Damon and Susanna to follow her back to her office. Dean, this is my friend Susanna. Do you recognize her? The dean looked at Susanna and then slowly shook her head. I'm sorry, but I don't know you. Despite her impeccable memory for her students, Dean Costillo couldn't quite play Susanna. Susanna's eyes were filled with disappointment as she didn't get the answer she was hoping for. Damon, who was feeling down, thanked Dean Costillo and left with Susanna. As they walked out of the office, they were met with a commotion from classroom 305. Heads poked out. It's him, Ryan Gold, proclaimed one of the students. He was my idol in middle school. Wow, he's so handsome in person, gushed another. Damon was worried that the students would chase after him as he had experienced this before. He quickly pulled Susanna to the main road, letting out a sigh of relief. I liked the piece you played just now. I recall it from somewhere, but I don't know where. Susanna remarked, It was clear that coming to Myers University had allowed Susanna's broken memories to become clearer and clearer. As they strolled down the bustling pedestrian street outside the university, Susanna couldn't shake the feeling of familiarity. She stood in the middle of the street, racking her brain to figure out why this place felt so familiar. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it feels like I've been here before. Damon cocked his head to the side. Is it possible that you studied in this city, but not at Myerson University? Susanna considered the possibility, tapping her finger on her chin. You might be onto something. Maybe it was another college of music? Damon quickly calculated. There are eight universities in the vicinity, including the community college but only four of them have a College of Music. Based on your beautiful singing, I'd say the College of Music you attended was pretty prestigious. That leaves only Meyerson University and Lupin College. Susanna was taken aback by Damon's dedication. It made perfect sense. As they strolled close to the bridge, Susanna suddenly came to a halt, her eyes fixed on the horizon, as if she was trying to recall something from the depths of her memory. Oh my god, Damon, I remember this place, she said. She looked at him, her mouth agape and I feel like you're with me the last time I was here. Damon was shocked. He had only met Susanna a year ago in the cave, and they had never spent time together in Meyerson. How could she have a memory of him at the bridge near the university? As he pondered this, he wondered if Susanna had been studying here at the same time as him, or perhaps they had crossed paths by chance. But then again, how could he have left such a deep impression on her if they had only briefly met? And to make matters more confusing, she had lost her memory. The mystery only deepened. Tell me, do you have any special memories here? She asked. Maybe I could piece it together. Damon's mind raced as he tried to recall any significant moments, and then it hit him like a lightning bolt. The memory of him and Avery, drunk, making out near the bridge, flooded his mind. They'd spent a few magical nights together at the bridge. But everything changed when Lorenzo entered their lives. Avery was disfigured and vanished without a trace. The memory sent shivers down Damon's spine. He clapped a hand over his mouth. Susanna had gone to South Rivertown to search for clues about her past. She had mentioned living in Meyerson and even had a talent for singing. She seemed to know Meyerson University like the back of her hand, and she had hummed along when Damon sang Time Flies. She was the first person he saw when he woke up in the cave. Suddenly it all clicked. His grandfather had saved her and brought her back into their lives. He was her mentor and rescued her from the depths of hell. A rush of excitement coursed through Damon's veins. He couldn't help but gaze at Susanna taking in every detail. Though her face bore no resemblance to the Avery he once knew, 
there was something about her gaze and her actions that seemed to overlap with his memories of Avery. Could it be? Was the Avery he had been desperately searching for right there beside him all along? I'll take you to some places to see if you remember some things. I have a feeling about who you might be, but I can't be sure. Damon said to Susanna, trying to keep his excitement in check. He led her toward the dormitory where Avery had once lived. Susanna stopped and looked up at the building with a glimmer in her eyes. I know this place, she said softly. Damon's heart raced as he realized they were getting closer to the truth. But what if his guess was wrong? Who could Susanna be if she wasn't Avery? The suspense was almost unbearable, but Damon knew they had to keep going. The answers were just within reach. I want to go upstairs and look around, Susanna declared. Damon nodded in agreement, eager to see what was up there too. But their plans were thwarted when a resident assistant stopped them in their tracks. Young man, this is the girl's dormitory. You can't go in. The RA scolded, leaving Damon feeling helpless as he watched Susanna disappear from his sight. As he waited outside, he thought about when he risked it all and declared his love for Avery at their high school graduation. After being rejected, Damon thought they weren't meant to be together. But fate had other plans. And they eventually became lovers. Damon checked his watch and realized Susanna had been gone for a half an hour. What could be keeping her up there for so long? Just as he was about to call her, Susanna emerged from the building. She gave Damon a nod and marched forward with purpose. Damon trailed behind her. His body trembled with anticipation as he waited for her to reveal what she had discovered. Susanna grabbed Damon's hand and led him to an artificial lake. Do you still remember this place? She asked. Susanna's cheeks flushed a deep shade of scarlet as Damon's intense gaze locked onto her. Her eyes shimmered with a mix of affection and vulnerability as she began to speak. Can you believe it? It feels just like yesterday when I attended the star-studded opening ceremony for that television series. And there you were, standing in the corridor, looking as dashing as ever. Little did I know that apart from being Ryan Gold, you were also the mastermind behind Everbright. It was a pleasant surprise to say the least. Her voice quivered slightly as she continued, her words carrying the weight of past regrets. But you know what? That night I had a hidden agenda. I wanted to redeem myself for the mistakes of my past and finally confess my true feelings for you. Unfortunately, it seems like you were oblivious to the concept of love, and everything fell apart. Taking a deep breath, Susanna forged ahead. And then there was that one time when you took me to see the house you had bought. You told me it was for Fifi. Can you even begin to fathom the sourness that filled my heart in that moment? Oh, and how could I forget about that trip to Europe? A sudden storm struck, and Veronica and I were thrown into a treacherous waters. I genuinely believe that that was the end for me, but you, Damon, saved me. I woke up the next morning, still in a daze from the events of the previous night, and then I felt your lips on mine. I knew then that you still held a special place for me in your heart. Damon couldn't believe his ears. After all these years, the two hearts that had deeply missed each other had finally met again. Tears streamed down Avery's face as she looked at Damon with love and longing. Damon had always thought the worst had happened for Avery after she'd been disfigured. He thought she had been tortured to death. But now, as he looked at her, he realized that she was still the same beautiful girl he had fallen in love with all those years ago. Why couldn't I find you? Damon asked. Avery's voice shook. I was under Lorenzo's control. He knew about our relationship, and to manipulate me, he ensnared me in the clutches of addiction. I disfigured my face and fled. As I stumbled through the streets, the horrified gazes of passerby pierced my soul. I was a monster in their eyes, and I couldn't bear to face anyone. My only refuge was the deep, haunting embrace of the mountains and forest. But even there, terror lurked in every shadow. The chilling wind whispered eerie secrets. The night echoed with mournful cries and haunting howls. And as if that wasn't enough, my addiction raged within me. Beside a somber riverbank, I contemplated ending it all. But just as I was about to succumb to the darkness, a figure with flowing white hair appeared before me. In that moment, everything changed. He spoke of unfinished missions, of responsibilities that still lay ahead, including taking care of you. He made it clear that it was not my time to die. And then, he revealed a glimmer of hope. He promised to rid my body of the poison that held me captive, to restore my beauty, even if it meant looking different than before. I was lost, my memories wiped clean, but now they are all flooding back to me piece by piece. Damon couldn't help but admire his grandfather's strength. Not only had he saved Damon's life, but he also gave Avery a chance at a fresh start. But even someone as godlike as his grandfather had to be cautious of the powerful organization behind the biochemical beings. In a sudden burst of emotion, Damon pulled Avery into his arms and kissed her passionately. 
Avery didn't care about the curious gazes of the students passing by. Their love was too consuming to be bothered by the outside world. Eventually, they reluctantly broke apart, and Damon could see a hint of sadness in Avery's eyes. Damon, when did you and Fifi get married? Avery's question brought them back to reality. They couldn't ignore this problem any longer, and so Damon opened up to Avery, revealing the truth about his hasty and confused marriage to Fifi. She felt the urge to blame Damon for everything, but deep down she knew that it wasn't entirely his fault. Fifi had managed to pressure Damon into a relationship and even tricked him into a marriage. Now that Avery had returned, she felt compelled to seek an explanation from Fifi. However, this was not a matter that could be resolved overnight. Damon and Fifi were not only married, but also had started a family together. Avery knew she had to carefully consider the next steps. But one thing was certain. Avery can never accept Fifi as Damon's real wife. Setting aside these thoughts for a moment, Avery turned to Damon and said, Can you come with me to see my parents? I need to know how they're doing. It had been six years since she last saw them, and she wondered how their lives had unfolded. Had they been happy? Had they missed her as much as she missed them? The thought of her parents worrying about her all this time weighed heavily on her heart. Did they go to great lengths to find her? Impatience coursed through Avery's veins like an arrow, urging her to fly to her parents' side without a delay. As Damon and Avery approached the Wilson family home, they were met with a sight that struck them both. The once vibrant home now appeared worn and dilapidated, and there, struggling to move a heavy box, was Avery's father, Harold. It was a stark contrast to the strong and capable man she remembered. His head was now adorned with a crown of white hair, a visible sign of the burdens he had carried in her absence. As she stood there, her heart heavy with unspoken words, tears threatened to spill from the corners of her eyes. Deep down, she had always suspected that her parents were struggling, but she never could have imagined the magnitude of their hardship. Just as Avery was about to step forward, two figures emerged from the distance, it was her aunt, Cordelia, and her cousin, Gretchen. Cordelia taunted her brother-in-law. Gretchen couldn't help but taunt her uncle. Well, 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 look who we have here. How did you manage to fall from grace so spectacularly? I heard you sold your house, so where do you live now? Are you reduced to begging for money? Struggling to lift a heavy sofa onto a truck, Harold, Avery's father, replied with a weary voice, Your sister is sick. She needs medical treatment. When you refused to lend us money, selling the house was the only option left. Cordelia's eyes narrowed. Oh, so now you need money. Well, let me remind you that we wouldn't even give a penny to a beggar, let alone lend it to you. Remember when Gretchen wanted to buy a car and you refused to lend her any money? Well, this is karma coming back to bite you. Harold indignantly defended himself. Back then, I didn't have a single cent to spare when you asked for money. Let's not forget I've helped your family countless times. Your husband couldn't even afford to gamble or eat, and we always provided you with the timely month allowance. Your sister even offered to pay for Gretchen's college education. My wife lent her over a million dollars. Did you conveniently forget about all these favors and hold a grudge against me? Cordelia's expression shifted. Over a million! Who witnessed that? Stop bragging, you poor man! With a fiery rage burning in her eyes, Cordelia unleashed a powerful kick onto the sofa Harold was trying to put into the moving truck. The force was so strong that it slipped right out from his grasp and crushed down into his foot. Despite the agony, Harold remained silent, his determination unwavering, as he mustered every ounce of strength to lift the sofa back onto the truck. First, we want to see who on earth would buy your tacky house. Cordelia sneered. And second, we want to rub it in your face. Our Gretchen has snagged herself a wealthy boyfriend. Oh, the life of luxury awaits me. I can't help but pity you, though. Your daughter is dead and your family is destitute. But hey, if you're interested, why don't you come over and let me show you what a real luxurious house looks like? With a smug satisfaction, Cordelia and Gretchen strutted away, reveling in their display of superiority. Harold bowed his head as he wiped away his tears. Insults about his financial status and his personal worth rolled off his back, but the mention of Avery's death struck him like a sledgehammer to the chest. Avery's heart was pounding as she watched the scene unfold before her. She wondered how many times he had suffered this kind of blow over the years. It was a testament to his strength that he could endure such pain, both in public and in private, without breaking down completely. Father, she called out, but her voice was too soft, too choked the motion. Harold didn't hear her. Even if he had, he wouldn't have recognized her. It had been so long since they had seen each other, and Avery had changed so much. But Harold recognized Damon. As Avery's childhood friend, he had watched Damon grow up. Damon, what brings you here? 
Damon's face lit up with a warm smile as he replied, We've come to see you, Mr. Wilson. Harold's attention then shifted to Avery. He gazed at her, his brows furrowed in confusion, and he asked, Miss, why are you staring at me like that? Have we met before? Avery slowly opened her hand to reveal a delicate locket. The sight of it sent a jolt of shock through Harold's body, causing him to cry out as if he had lost his sanity. Isn't that my daughter Avery's locket? How, how did you come to possess it? Please, tell me where Avery is, I beg of you. If you know anything about my daughter's whereabouts, I'll forever be in your debt. Ever since Avery had vanished into thin air, her parents embarked on a relentless quest to find their beloved daughter. However, the cruel whispers that circulated were nothing short of horrifying. Some claimed that Avery had suffered unspeakable violations and met a tragic end. Others whispered that she had crossed paths with a powerful figure in the entertainment industry, resulting in a merciless beating that claimed her life. Yet, in the face of such despair, Harold and Avery's mother refused to succumb to the darkness. For six long years, they tirelessly scowled every corner of the earth, their unwavering determination mirroring Nancy's legendary quest for Damon. Their relentless pursuit came at a great cost. Harold's once thriving business suffered a setback. As his focus shifted entirely to the search for his daughter, Avery's mother found herself in and out of hospitals, her health deteriorating with each passing day. Harold, desperate to save his wife, exhausted every last penny he had saved over the years. When even that proved insufficient, he turned to his relatives pleading for a loan. But the same relatives who had once sought his favor now shied away. Some even dared to mock Avery's father, adding salt to his already gaping wound. With no other recourse, Harold made the heart-wrenching decision to sell their cherished home in Meyerson. The well-being of his wife took precedence over everything else, and he would stop at nothing to ensure her recovery. His daughter was gone. The mere thought of losing his wife as well was too much for him to bear. How could he go on living without them? But deep down, Harold knew he had to be strong for his family, even if it meant facing the unimaginable. He had already braced himself for the worst, knowing that his daughter Avery had made enemies in the cutthroat industry she worked in. Her beauty only made her a target for those who would do anything for a quick buck. The constant worry and fear had taken a toll on Harold's soul, leaving him a shell of his former self. But just when he had given up all hope, this strange woman appeared, holding Avery's necklace. Harold's hands were shaking as he dug through his pockets. He pulled out a crumpled note and held it out to the person in front of him. I can pay you. I can give you anything you want. Please, just tell me where my daughter is. Harold dropped to his knees, ready to do whatever it took to find his daughter. He knew that he had to keep trying, no matter what it cost him. Harold's body shook as he struggled to comprehend what he had just heard. What did you say? This young woman is Avery. He asked in disbelief. Avery regained her composure and wiped away her tears. Dad, it's me. But you look so... different. Harold trilled off. Damon anticipated Harold's reaction and quickly came up with an explanation. Mr. Wilson, Avery was disfigured in an accident and had to leave the entertainment industry. She underwent plastic surgery and has now recovered. He explained, So the person standing in front of you now is the brand new Avery. Harold was overcome with emotion and tears streamed down his face. And it all seemed too good to be true. He let out a howl of joy as he embraced her. Daughter, you're alive! Where have you been all these years? Have you suffered? Avery reassured him. Dad, I'm okay. I promise. Then why didn't you come back to us? Harold whimpered. Avery's voice trembled with worry. Father, what happened to grandfather? Harold's eyes were sorrowful, and he struggled to find the right words to convey the devastating truth. Your grandfather, he passed away, Avery. Harold said, his voice barely above a whisper. The news hit Avery like a punch to the gut, and her heart sank. Tears welled up in her eyes once again, threatening to spill over. She couldn't believe that she had been absent during such a painful time for her family. Dad, I'm so sorry. Avery choked out. Harold's eyes softened as he reached out to comfort his daughter. Avery, it's not your fault. We thought we had lost you forever. We had no idea what you had been through, or what you had to sacrifice. All we wanted was for you to be safe. Why didn't you come see us before? Avery nodded, her tears now mingling with a bittersweet sense of relief. She had finally found her way back to her family, but the cost had been high. The guilt weighed heavily on her, but she knew that she had to be strong for her mother, who was fighting her own battle in the hospital. Dad, I promise I'll make it right, Avery vowed. I'll be there for mom, for you, for our family. We'll get through this together. Damon chimed in, Mr. Wilson. Avery lost her memory for years and only just remembered everything an hour ago. 
Without hesitation, she rushed to find you. Suddenly, a middle-aged man approached him with a strange request. It was the man who'd agreed to buy their house. He had heard that someone had died in Harold's house and was now refusing to buy it unless he received a 20% discount. In his eyes, Harold's house was cursed. After all, his father had died there, his daughter had gone missing, and his wife had fallen ill. According to two women who he had met on the street, the house was nothing but bad luck. Cordelia and Gretchen were on a rampage to destroy Harold and Marilyn's life, even stooping so low as to scare off potential buyers. Harold couldn't believe what he was hearing. His father had passed away peacefully in his sleep, and his daughter's disappearance had nothing to do with the house. As for his wife's illness, it was just coincidence. But try as he might, he couldn't convince the buyer otherwise. How can you break your promise? We signed a contract! Harold pleaded. The buyer was confident that Harold would cave. Whether you like it or not, the contract is null and void, and you better return my deposit or I'll sue you. Harold gritted his teeth. Fine, but you have to pay in cash today. He said, feeling defeated. Under the weight of his wife's impending surgery, Harold had no choice but to sell the house. He couldn't bear the thought of not having enough money to pay for her medical bills. The buyer regretted not pushing for a lower price. He had seen how desperate Harold was to sell, and knew that he could have gotten an even better deal. But he didn't care about the contract or any sense of decency. He was willing to take advantage of Harold's misfortune to line his pockets. Harold's house was already a steal at 20% below market value. But the buyer wanted more. He tore up the old contract and proposed a new one, hoping to squeeze even more out of Harold. Harold was just about to agree with the buyer's offer when Damon suddenly interrupted. You're taking advantage of this man's situation. Harold sighed. Damon, please don't get involved. My wife needs surgery. If we don't sell this house, we won't have the money for it. Damon patted Harold on the shoulder. Don't worry about it. I'll give you whatever you need. With those words... Damon stuffed a wad of money into Harold's hands. How could he possibly accept this money? Harold pondered, his sense of pride and dignity warring with the desperate need for funds to cover his wife's medical expenses. In a world where a man's reputation still held weight, he couldn't simply cave in. But the stakes were high now. If he refused Damon's generous offer and asked him to take the money back, Harold risked losing everything. Avery smiled. Dad, please take this money. Consider it a small token of Damon's appreciation. There's no shame in accepting help when we truly need it. As Harold hesitated, torn between his principles and the dire circumstances, the buyer grew impatient. Hey, are you serious about selling this house or not? If you're not, I'll have to walk away. Before Harold could utter a word, Damon raised his hand. We clearly said this house is not for sale. Now get lost. And if you don't leave, I won't hesitate to give you a good slap. The buyer's anxiety transformed into frustration and anger. You lowlife. How dare you treat me like this? Fine, I won't ask for a 20% discount anymore. Just give me a 10% discount and I'll buy it. I'm a reasonable person, you know, so let's sign a new contract right now. Damon's face twisted into a scowl. I've said it three times already, and I'll say it again. This house is not for sale. The buyer crossed his arms. Can't you keep your word? Where's your moral integrity? Your sense of honor? Fine, I'll take the loss. But can't you at least give me a discount? I'll even throw in some extra cash for your medical bills. Just hurry up and clear out the furniture. I'll buy it at the same price, but you better clean up this place for me. The buyer was enamored with Harold's house. The location was unbeatable, with a top-notch hospital and a renowned school and a plethora of shopping and entertainment options nearby. It was a dream come true, a thousand times more satisfying than any other property he had seen. If you keep spewing nonsense, I swear I'll break your legs. Damon growled. Just moments ago, Damon had managed to maintain a polite demeanor while speaking to the buyer. But now, faced with the buyer's shamelessness, Damon had no intention of being courteous. The buyer pursed his lips. Don't forget, we signed a contract. If you break it, we could take you to court. Damon chuckled at the buyer's attempt to salvage the situation. <laughs> Why don't you show me the contract then? He challenged. To his dismay, the buyer realized that in his eagerness to negotiate with Harold, he had accidentally torn up the old contract. Undeterred, the buyer made one final plea. Sell me your house, I can pay the full amount. Besides, is it your wife in need of surgery? Harold, firm and resolute, shook his head. I'm not selling the house anymore. You can leave. And as for your breach of contract, I won't be refunding a single penny. Harold was a man of principles, and the buyer's repulsive demeanor only fueled his determination to teach him a lesson. The buyer stormed off in a fit of rage, cursing under his breath. 
Despite Damon's offer to lend him the money, Harold remained hesitant. Thank you for the offer to give me money, but consider it a loan. When my company is back on track, I'll return the money to you with interest. Damon shook his head. The money's yours. You don't need to return it. Avery's heart swelled with love for Damon. He didn't want her father to feel indebted to him. If it weren't for her father's presence, she would have given Damon a wet kiss right then and there. But Harold was stubborn. How could this be? This is not a few thousand or tens of thousands. This is several hundred million. Besides, you're not rich yourself. Harold was torn between his desire to help his wife and his pride. Wasn't this Damon's entire life savings? Avery squeezed her father's arm. If Damon asked you to take it, then take it. He's stronger now, stronger than ever before. Harold beamed with delight. Damon, my boy, I'm truly grateful. Your filial piety is commendable. However, I cannot accept such a large sum of money from you. You still have your own dreams and aspirations to pursue. Here's what I propose. I won't be unreasonable anymore. You just need to cover the medical expenses. The rest of the money you can keep for yourself. The two men shook hands, and then Harold turned to face his daughter. I don't have anything edible in the house, but I can go get some groceries. Avery held up a plastic bag. Don't worry about it. I bought some ingredients. We'll whip something up in the kitchen. Harold's eyes widened. You know how to cook? Avery had never shown any interest in domestic chores. Avery nodded confidently. I do, and I promise you guys you will love my cooking, she declared. Avery didn't really enjoy cooking, but for Damon, she was willing to step out of her comfort zone. After a satisfying meal, Avery was concerned for her mother. She couldn't bear the thought of her mother lying in the hospital alone. However, her mother was in the ICU waiting her impending surgery, making it impossible for Avery to visit her. Harold had a plan in mind. He suggested that Avery and Damon take a trip to the cemetery to visit her grandfather's grave. It was a bittersweet idea, as they had been paying their respects to their late grandfather while their mother fought for their life. Eager to honor their grandfather's memory, Avery and Damon embarked on a journey to his final resting place. Harold had shared the location with Avery, and together they made their way to the sacred spot. The air was crisp and the surroundings serene as they approached the grave. Avery lovingly placed fresh flowers on the tombstone, pouring her heart out to her grandfather. She shared stories and memories, apologizing for abandoning the family, but finding solace in the connection she felt with him. As the night fell, Harold had news that would bring a glimmer of hope to Avery's anxious mind. He informed her that her mother had a successful surgery and was now stable enough to receive visitors. Avery's eyes lit up with joy and relief. She could finally see her mother. Without wasting a moment, she rushed to the hospital, anticipation coursing through her veins. When Avery arrived at the hospital, she found her mother, Marilyn, peacefully sleeping. The sight of her mother's serene face with an oxygen tube gently providing support brought a mix of emotions to Avery's heart. She was grateful for the chance to be by her mother's side, even in this fragile state. Avery quietly sat beside her mother, holding her hand, and whispered words of love and encouragement. Then she glumly went to buy a coffee from the vending machine, hoping her mother would wake up soon. In the bustling corridor of the hospital, Avery eavesdropped in the doctor's conversations. A gathering of medical experts were discussing the case. Just a while ago, Marilyn Wilson had been burdened with an overwhelming medical expense, and her condition had seemed bleak. The doctors had almost given up hope, but then something extraordinary happened. Damon, a man with connections and influence, made a few phone calls and that set the medical world on fire. Suddenly, doctors from all over Meyerson and even renowned cardiovascular experts from around the world were rushing to help. While Avery was out of the room, Marilyn's eyes fluttered open. Harold was ecstatic. He gripped her hand. Marilyn! Someone special is coming to see you soon. Harold said, his voice filled with emotion. Try not to get too excited, my love. This is a moment of joy. Do you understand? Confused, Marilyn nodded and replied. Is it someone who has agreed to lend us some money? Our relatives have already done so much for us. We shouldn't trouble them any further. Anyway, I don't think my sister Cordelia wants to be involved anymore. Harold wiped away his tears and reassured her. No, Marilyn, you don't have to worry about medical expenses anymore. Our family business is going to improve, and the person you've been longing for day and night, she's here to see you. Marilyn's eyes lit up. Someone I've been thinking about constantly? She asked, but who could it be? Harold motioned toward the door, and Avery and Damon entered the room. Marilyn recognized Damon, but Avery was a stranger to her. Harold gestured to Damon. 
Marilyn, my dear, let me introduce you to Damon. Remember him? He's the son of the Walker family, the one who has always been there for us. We've known him since he was a teenager. Well, guess what? He's taking care of all your medical expenses. Can you believe it? Not only that, but when the time comes, he'll arrange for the most professional, advanced, and top-notch medical treatment for you. You're going to be saved, Marilyn. After Harold finished speaking, Marilyn turned to Damon with a grateful smile. Thank you, Damon. I've heard that hiring foreign experts can be quite expensive. Considering my financial situation, I didn't want to burden myself with such hefty expenses. Besides, I'm not sure if I'll be able to repay it in the future. Harold shook his head, his eyes filled with compassion. Money's not an issue for Damon. He has the means to provide you with the best medical treatment in the world. Marilyn, you don't have to worry about paying him back. This is Damon's gift to you. Marilyn's eyes widened in surprise. A gift? That's incredibly kind of him, but why? I don't understand the reason behind Damon's generosity. Her confusion was evident as she tried to make sense of Harold's words. In the hospital room, Avery strode purposely to her mother's side, her heart pounding with anticipation. With a determined grip, she reached out and clasped her mother's hand, a small smile playing across her lips. Mother, it's me, Avery. I've come to see you. She announced, her voice filled with a mix of excitement and nervousness. Marilyn, her eyes filled with doubt, studied Avery's unfamiliar face. But as she squinted her eyes, a flicker of recognition danced in her gaze. Could it be? Could this truly be her daughter? You, you're Avery? Marilyn questioned her thoughts racing with uncertainty. Her mind was always more meticulous than her husband's and thought Avery's appearance had changed. Her motherly intuition remained steadfast. Avery nodded vigorously. Yes, mother, it's me. I underwent plastic surgery, but I'm back to see you, she explained. Reassured by Avery's words, Marilyn couldn't contain her emotions any longer. She pulled her daughter into a tight embrace, tears streaming down both their faces. For six long years, Marilyn had yearned for this day, her longing almost too bitter to bear. Her cries echoed through the hospital, a testament to the depth of her suffering. Damon, understanding the significance of this reunion, discreetly excused himself under the pretense of needing a smoke. With Harold's business in decline, Damon had made it his mission to provide the couple with a comfortable home where they could live out their days in peace. Lighting a cigarette and taking out his cell phone, Damon began his search for the perfect place. He wanted a subdivision that would not only suit their needs, but also aid in Maryland's recovery. After careful consideration, he settled on a subdivision called Peach Creek, convinced it was the ideal choice. As he made his way back to the ward, the door swung open, revealing a flushed and radiant Avery. She approached Damon with a shy smile, her voice filled with gratitude. Damon, my mom wants you to come in, she said. As Damon stepped into the room, his eyes were drawn to Marilyn, who was sitting up with Harold's help. She greeted him with a warm smile. Thank you, Damon, for bringing Avery to me. Marilyn said gratefully, Even if I were to pass away now, I would be able to rest in peace knowing that I got to see my daughter again. Damon returned her smile, his eyes filled with compassion. Mrs. Wilson, you need to focus on recuperating. He reassured her, Don't worry about the money. By the way, when Avery and I arrived earlier, we overheard that your relatives, Cordelia and Gretchen, were interested in purchasing some properties in Peach Creek Subdivision. I've heard that the environment there is perfect for patients like you to rest and recover. Tomorrow, I'll take Avery to look for a house there, so you and your husband can enjoy your golden years together. Marilyn's eyes sparkled with hope, but she quickly shook her head. Forget it, she said, her voice tinged with sadness. The price is just too expensive. We've already spent so much on my treatment, I can't bear to let you spend more money on buying a house. Avery interjected. It's okay, Mom, she said firmly. We'll figure something out. Marilyn recalled that her sister, Cordelia, excitedly announced her plans to buy a house in the same subdivision. Cordelia had always been envious of Marilyn's success and had made no secret of her desire to buy up all the houses in the area for herself and her daughter now that Gretchen had a wealthy boyfriend. But Marilyn wasn't about to let Cordelia's jealousy get in the way of her daughter's happiness. While Avery had suffered a terrible accident that left her disfigured and missing for years, she was back now, and that's all Marilyn cared about. All right, it's settled then, Damon said. Once your surgery goes smoothly tomorrow, we're heading straight to Peach Creek to talk to the realtors. Since Marilyn was still in the ICU and feeling under the weather, they needed to let her get some rest. As the young nurse gently reminded them, the family reluctantly bid their farewells and left. 
Thankfully, Marilyn's condition, although serious, wasn't life-threatening. It was a chronic illness that required long-term medication, but things were looking up. With Damon's influential connections and a generous influx of funds, they were able to provide Marilyn with a top-notch medical care and the best available medicine. After thorough discussions among the experts, they came to the unanimous decision. Marilyn's illness could be treated through an additional surgery, combined with a special medicine from overseas. With this comprehensive approach, she had a real chance of fully recovering and living a normal, healthy life. To ensure the utmost success, they invited the most renowned cardiovascular expert in the entire country to perform the surgery. This was a critical step towards Marilyn's journey to recovery, and everyone was hopeful for a positive outcome. The next day, Damon took Avery and Harold to check out some properties in the beautiful Peach Creek area, just outside of Myerson City. Not only was the scenery breathtaking, but the facilities were top-notch. It was the perfect place to enjoy a quiet life while simultaneously taking advantage of city conveniences. As Damon strolled into the real estate office with Avery and Harold, he never expected to run into Avery's Aunt Cordelia and her cousin Gretchen. It was a surprise encounter that left him feeling a little bewildered. Avery was a woman of great strength and wisdom, having experienced the ups and downs of life. She was not one to show off, but when she thought about how Gretchen and Cordelia had humiliated her father the day before, a fire ignited within her. With a sly smile, Avery pulled Harold and Damon over to the unsuspecting duo. Cordelia and Gretchen were shocked to see Harold, but they didn't know Damon and Avery. Ha! Huh, Gretchen laughed. <laughs> Uncle Harold, what are you doing here with these two random people? Why aren't you at the hospital with your ailing wife? Cordelia looked down her nose at her brother-in-law. I'd love to show you around our new fancy digs. You'll finally get to see what it means to be truly upper class and part of a wealthy family. Harold shrugged, letting their insults roll off his back. Avery, come say hello to your aunt and cousin. Avery stepped forward. Hello, Aunt Cordelia. Hello, Gretchen. Gretchen was taken aback. Who are you? Do I know you? Avery grinned. I'm Avery, your cousin. Don't you recognize me? Cordelia and Gretchen were both shocked. You're Avery? Avery nodded. I had some work done after an accident, but I'm back now. Gretchen's sour expression didn't go unnoticed by Avery, who smiled. Do you want me to remind you of all the terrible things you've done and the money you owe me? How else would I know all this if we weren't related? Despite the disfigurement she had heard about, Avery was gorgeous after her plastic surgery. Cordelia couldn't believe her eyes. Gretchen caught sight of Damon and asked, And who is this person? Avery beamed with pride as she introduced Damon, but Damon didn't even acknowledge the mother and daughter duo. He had dealt with enough snobbish relatives in his life to know that the best way to handle them was to ignore them completely. Gretchen's eyes scanned Damon from head to toe, searching for any signs of wealth or status. When she found none, her expression turned to one of disdain. Cordelia scowled at Damon with a stern face. Look at you! Avery used to be a superstar, and now she's dating trash from the street? Gretchen chimed in. Cousin, did you get plastic surgery and become an idiot? Has your brain been fried in the last 60 years? You're making the family look bad. As Damon stood there, his eyes met with curious gaze of a man standing beside him. But there was a mischievous smirk on the man's face as if he found Damon's presence amusing. But Damon couldn't be bothered by such trivialities. Not when he had Avery by his side. With a nonchalant nod, Damon responded. You all better watch your words, he warned, or else you might not like the consequences. Cordelia felt a surge of anger at Damon's rude remark. That's no way to speak to your girlfriend's family, she exclaimed, her voice filled with indignation. Gretchen chimed in with a disapproving tone. Cousin, your taste in men is as terrible as ever. A man should know his limitations. Go back and take care of your dying mother. We want nothing to do with you. Damon remained silent, his attention shifting to the man beside Gretchen. He appeared to be in his 20s, dressed sharply in a suit. Damon noticed the way his eyes occasionally wandered toward Avery's legs. This man was practically drooling. A slight frown formed on Damon's face as he positioned himself in front of Avery, shielding her from the man's lingering gaze. Couldn't stand the thought of anyone disrespecting her in such a manner. Just then, Cordelia said proudly, This is my future son-in-law, Linus. Damon sized Linus up and down. He looks like he belongs in the mafia or something. He remarked, his words laced with a hint of amusement. Cordelia's expression instantly changed, feeling as if Damon's comment was directed at her. You jerk! What do you mean by that? Are you insinuating that Linus is involved with the mob? Damon simply shrugged, a smile playing on his lips. I didn't say that, just implied it. He replied, Mom, why are you arguing with such a loser? 
Gretchen spat out. He couldn't know the wealth or status from a hole in the ground. Seriously, what's the point? It's just a waste of time. Gretchen's hostility towards Damon was evident. She couldn't stand the fact that he was trying to compete with her fiancé, who came from a prestigious family. In her eyes, Damon was nothing but a lowlife who didn't deserve to be in their company. With a smirk on her face, Gretchen turned to Avery. Listen, cousin, we all know you can't afford to live in this area, so why bother pretending? You might have a new face, but your personality and upbringing are still the same. Damon couldn't hold a candle to Linus, and you certainly can't compare to me. You'll never fit here, and everyone will just laugh at you. You should leave. Avery was startled when she heard what Gretchen said. Gretchen, this is a public real estate office. You buy your house, we'll buy ours. We have the same rights as you do. We don't have to hang out and be neighborly. We don't even need to wave at each other on the street. Gretchen never expected Avery to come back with such fire. It was almost amusing how Avery's presence seemed to fuel her desire for revenge. For far too long, Gretchen had lived in Avery's shadow, always feeling inadequate and overshadowed. She had always compared herself to her perfect cousin, but today she saw an opportunity to turn the tables. Sure, Avery had always been the golden child, excelling in everything she did, but Gretchen knew that success wasn't solely determined by grades or family background. No, there were other paths to triumph, and Gretchen was determined to find hers. She believed that as long as she married well and secured a beautiful home, she could finally rise above Avery's shadow. In Gretchen's mind, a vivid fantasy took shape. She envisioned herself living in a grand mansion, basking in the glory of her achievements. Meanwhile, Avery would be relegated to a small, dilapidated house in their old hometown. Oh, how sweet it would be to see Avery's dreams crumble while Gretchen soared to new heights. And it didn't stop there. Gretchen's ambition extended to her future children. She imagined her offspring having every advantage, receiving the best education, and forging connections that would guarantee success. Meanwhile, Avery's child would struggle, failing in school and lacking any meaningful friendships. Gretchen's child would climb the corporate ladder, becoming a top executive or a famous politician, while Avery's kid would be stuck in a dead-end job. Gretchen's mind had been wandering for a while, lost in her thoughts, but suddenly she snapped back to reality, and what she saw was enough to make her heart sink. Her fiancé, Linus, was staring at her cousin Avery with a look of pure desire in his eyes. Gretchen couldn't believe it. How could he be lusting after her own family member? She tried to keep her cool, but her anger was bubbling just beneath the surface. She shot Avery a fierce look, silently daring her to make a move. Who do you think you are? Gretchen hissed. You're nothing compared to the celebrity you used to be. Look at you now, unrecognizable. Cordelia added her two cents. Stop acting like you have enough money to buy a house here. Get out of our sight. Linus was looking back and forth between Gretchen and Avery. At first, when he met Gretchen, he thought she was beautiful. But compared to the stunning Avery, she looked like a pig with lipstick on. Before Avery could even utter a word, Damon confidently interjected, But we can definitely afford it. Gretchen let out a contemptuous snort. You're really going to such great lengths to show off and lie, aren't you? As she spoke, she made sure to steal a quick glance at Avery. And when she saw the embarrassment in Avery's face, a sense of satisfaction washed over her. Cordelia chimed in once again. If they can't afford it, they resort to bragging to make themselves feel better. She said sarcastically, Let's hurry up and choose a house. We still have to go through all the formalities later and sign the paperwork. Having already unleashed her anger by ruthlessly insulting Avery's family earlier, Cordelia now turned her attention to the brochures in front of her. There were countless houses to choose from. After buying a house, the three of us will celebrate by dining at the finest restaurant in Peach Creek. It's a place filled with high society individuals so it wouldn't be appropriate for you to join us. After this, we'll be going our separate ways. Linus plastered on a fake smile, eager to impress Avery. He confidently handed Gretchen a glossy brochure showcasing an array of luxurious houses. Choose whichever one catches your eye, he said. Gretchen's eyes sparkled as she flipped through the pages, her finger finally landing on a stunning lakeside property. I want this house, she declared. Not only will my mom be able to breathe in fresh air every day, but the transportation will also be incredibly convenient. Linus waved his hand dismissively, trying to hide his growing anxiety. All right, I want this house too, he said, his voice betraying a hint of nervousness. Turning to the sales officer, he asked, so how much is it? The real estate agent scribbled a number on a piece of paper, sliding it across the table to Linus. As his eyes scanned the digits, his face instantly paled. The price was astronomical, far beyond what he had anticipated. 
How much? Linus stammered, his voice trembling with disbelief. Panic began to creep into his thoughts. His family may have been wealthy, but with so many siblings, his funds were limited. He cursed under his breath, feeling as though he was about to flip the car. But Gretchen, ever the spoiled one, acted nonchalant. For your family, it's just a drop in the ocean, she said, her tone oozing with entitlement. I want this house no matter the cost. Gretchen had her sights set on the house, and she wasn't going to let anything stand in her way. She had a plan to trap Linus and trick him into marrying her, and this house was the key to making it happen. So she spun a web of lies, telling Linus that her father was a wealthy businessman in connections to the real estate company that developed Peach Creek. But that wasn't enough. Gretchen needed to sweeten the deal. So she told Linus that if he bought the house and put her name on the deed, she could introduce him to the boss of Peach Creek Properties. It was a bald move, but Gretchen was confident in her ability to manipulate and deceive. Linus expressed some concerns about the location and the potential for muddy conditions near the lake. Gretchen knew what he meant. He wanted a cheaper house, but the sales lady was quick to shut down the idea, telling Linus that this was the most reasonably priced house in the subdivision. If you can't afford it, then you can't afford it. Damon mocked Linus. Damon, what do you mean? Gretchen's voice was sharp and her eyes cold as she glared at him. Linus can afford this house. You, on the other hand, are a poor man who can't even put up a decent show. Your clothes are all for the thrift store, and I bet you drive a piece of junk. Cordelia rolled her eyes in agreement. Seriously, don't brag about your money. Haven't you heard of the principal of speaking lightly? This isn't the time or place for your interruptions. Linus clenched his jaw. He wasn't going to let Damon get the best of him. With a determined look, he pulled out his bank card and slammed it down the counter. Sales clerk, I'll buy the house. The full amount, no mortgage, no loans. It was all of his life savings, every last penny. His liquid funds were gone and he didn't know how long it would take to recover. But he didn't care. He wanted this house for Gretchen to prove to everyone how powerful he was. The sales agent nodded respectfully. Okay, sir, I'll swipe the card now, then drop the paperwork for you and your fiancé. Gretchen hugged him tightly. Linus, thank you. I love you. As he pondered the possibilities of his impending marriage to Gretchen, his mind raced with visions of success and power. He could already see himself rising through the ranks, his status within the family soaring to new heights. Perhaps, just perhaps, he could even become the boss of the company after Gretchen introduced him to the big shots. With these thoughts swirling in his head, Linus couldn't help but steal a glance at Avery, hoping to catch a glimpse of admiration or awe. However, to his dismay, her expression remained unchanged. Not a single raised eye or impressed smile. It was as if his boastful display of wealth was nothing more than background noise. The feeling of defeat washed over him, leaving him deflated and disheartened. Turning his attention to Damon, Linus let out a snore of disdain. You're so arrogant, he sneered contemptuously. If you're truly wealthy, why don't you buy a house for your precious Avery? I bet you can barely afford a measly duplex. From that moment on, Linus's hatred for Damon grew exponentially. He saw him as nothing more than an obstacle, someone he needed to step on and humiliate to prove his worth. And as Gretchen looked down at the contract with a sense of superiority, she made her stance clear. He's lucky to even have a place to stay, even if it's old and shabby. We don't need the likes of him in Peach Creek. Gretchen's spirits were soaring high. The excitement bubbling within her was so intense that her hand, clutching the contract, trembled ever so slightly. It felt as though she had been waiting her entire life for this day, a day where she could hold her head up high with pride. But then, Damon flashed a mischievous smile and pulled out a key from his pocket. Avery, my dear, I took the liberty of selecting a house for you and your family. And let me tell you, it's the most exquisite house in the entire subdivision. Damon had always been one step ahead. The moment he learned about Peach Creek, he knew he had to dig deeper. To his astonishment, he discovered that Peach Creek was his very own property, hidden under the vast umbrella of assets controlled by his father and grandfather. Without wasting a moment, Damon contacted Lucian Shepard, the boss of Peach Creek Properties. Late at night, Lucian personally delivered the key to the most prestigious property in Peach Creek. And now, Damon was presenting it to Avery, wanting to surprise her beyond measure. This is for you. You can begin moving your parents into their new home. Gretchen couldn't believe her eyes. She pinched her arm, hoping that she would wake up from this surreal moment. But it wasn't a dream. Avery's boyfriend, who she considered to be a lowly beggar, had just bought an incredibly expensive house. Jealousy filled Gretchen's eyes as she looked at Avery, wondering how this could have been possible. Even Avery herself was stunned by the turn of events. She held the key to the house in her hand, her mind racing with questions. When did you do it? 
she muttered to herself, unable to comprehend the sudden change in their lives. How did you even find the time? Harold, who had been observing the scene with wide eyes, glanced at Damon in utter shock. He couldn't believe that Damon had managed to pull off such a feat. Meanwhile, the news of Damon's extravagant purchase had spread like wildfire among the sales representatives. They gathered around from different departments, whispering to each other in hushed tones, their eyes sparkling with curiosity and admiration. Damon had become the center of attention. Gretchen, unable to contain her envy any longer, squeezed out a wicked smile. <laughs> Avery, I bet Damon is involved in some shady dealings. There's no way he could afford a house like this for someone else's parents. He must have used a random key to trick you. She exclaimed, her voice dripping with malice. Just as the tension in the air reached its peak, a tall woman dressed in black approached the group. She exuded an air of authority and professionalism as she nodded at Damon and the others with a polite smile. Excuse me, sir, miss, I'm the sales manager here. She announced, her voice commanding attention. All eyes turned to the tall woman, curious to see what she had to say. She focused her gaze on Avery's hand, where the key to the house was still clutched tightly. Can I take a closer look at that key? Of course, here you go. Avery said, her voice tinged with uncertainty as she handed over the key. The tall woman carefully examined the key, her experienced eyes scanning it multiple times. She then took a small machine and scanned it a few more times, her expression growing more serious with each scan. Finally, she nodded heavily, confirming that the key was indeed real. The manager's eyes narrowed as she brandished the key before the astonished crowd. Well, well, well. It seems we have a little mystery in our hands, doesn't it? Did you steal this key or pick it up off the ground? Because I can tell you right now, we didn't sell this property. The room erupted into chaos. All eyes turned on Damon. Damon's voice turned icy. You better watch your words, lady. You can't just throw around baseless accusations like that. It's not a good look. Unfazed by Damon's retort, the manager motioned for two burly security guards to join her. Ladies and gentlemen, let me set the record straight. This house is not up for sale. It belongs to our esteemed chairman, Lucian Shepard, and it's his vacation home. And yet this man here dares to claim that he purchased it. Can you believe it? He must have stolen the key. Damon's protest fell on deaf ears as the manager continued her tirade. Enlighten us. If you didn't steal it, then where did you get it? Did you just happen to stumble upon it, thinking that Mr. Shepard would be so careless as to drop something as valuable as this? With a steely resolve, Damon declared, I didn't steal a damn thing and I won't stand here and let you tarnish my name with your baseless accusations. So unless you have some concrete evidence, I suggest you keep your mouth shut. Can you believe Damon? What a shameless sneak thief. How can he even look Avery in the eyes after this? He's brought disgrace upon the entire Wilson family, Cordelia shouted. Harold interjected desperately. Hold on, everyone. Let's not jump to conclusions. Damon couldn't have stolen it. We shouldn't be so quick to slander others. I'm sure there's a logical explanation. The manager's tone was threatening. Listen up. You better come clean right now. If you don't, I'll have security escort you straight to the police station. Not only will your reputation be ruined, but you might even end up behind bars. Just admit it, you thief. Gretchen turned to her cousin. Avery, we know the truth. There's no need to let your conniving boyfriend play these tricks on us. You may not feel ashamed, but I certainly do. Don't even consider us family when you step out into the world. Don't ever say we're related. I can't afford to lose face because of you. Damon scowled. Everyone stop. This key was given to me by Lucius. His words ignited a burst of laughter that echoed through the room. What a joke. Is our chairman associating with someone like you? Handing over his vacation home? Who do you think you are? The manager's face contorted with disgust. You're insulting our intelligence. Cordelia shook her head. Damon, it's gone too far. Why are you still being stubborn? She anxiously awaited the sales department staff to swiftly call the police and have Damon arrested. She couldn't wait to see him in handcuffs. Suddenly, a dignified voice cut through the tension. What's going on here? At that moment, a group of figures materialized before the crowd. Damon looked up, his eyes widening in surprise. Leading the group was Lucian Shepard, the very man who had handed him the key the night before. At his side stood his wife, Bertie Shepard. The manager dashed over to the couple. A thief stole the key to your mansion. Mr. and Mrs. Shepard, we've caught him in the act. She was bursting with excitement. Maybe she'd even get a promotion for her expert sleuthing. Mrs. Shepard's usual radiant face darkened with concern. Who would dare steal from Mr. Shepard's belongings? She demanded. Lucian's expression mirrored Mrs. Shepard's, his features contorted with a mix of anger and shock. Wait, 
Someone dare to steal from me? He questioned, his voice laced with disbelief. Damon, however, remained calm and composed, a faint smile playing on his lips. Hello, Lucian. He greeted softly. Lucian was taken aback by the unexpected voice, his eyes widening behind his thick glasses. He whirled around. Mr. Walker, what in the world is happening here? He stammered, his voice filled with confusion. When Bertie noticed Damon, she beamed. Good morning, Mr. Walker. What brings you here? Why didn't you inform us of your arrival? The manager's face drained of color as she stammered. Mrs. Shepard, do you know him? He's the thief. Cordelia and Gretchen were equally taken aback, but Cordelia managed to blurt out, Are you sure you've got the right guy? Look at his shabby clothing. Harold's expression mirrored the shock of the others, but Avery remained cool as a cucumber. Meanwhile, Damon calmly asked, Can you show me the house Lucian gave me? Your manager here seems to think I stole the key. What's the deal? But before anyone could say another word, Mrs. Shepard's hand shot out and connected with the manager's cheek with a resounding slap. Damon Walker is our most esteemed guest, she thundered. How dare you accuse him of theft? You're fired! I won't tolerate employees who can't tell right from wrong. Mrs. Shepard was livid. Few people knew just how important Damon was to the Shepard family. Despite their success in the real estate industry, only they knew the true source of their power, Damon and the elders behind him. If Damon gave the word, their entire empire could crumble in an instant. Bertie's hand came crashing down on the manager's cheek again. Get lost! Haven't you heard me? Or do you need me to say it a third time? Her voice dripped with venom, her eyes burning with determination. The manager, trembling with fear, knew better than to challenge Bertie's wrath. She understood the consequences of crossing paths with Mrs. Shepard. With her tail between her legs, she could only muster the strength to crawl away, hoping to escape the impending doom. As the manager slinked away, the room fell into an eerie silence. Gretchen's frustration had reached its boiling point. She couldn't keep it to herself any longer. With a determined look in her eyes, she blurted out, Mrs. Shepard, Damon is nothing but a swindler! Jealousy had consumed Gretchen, fueling her desire to make a final stand. She wanted to sow discord and salvage what little dignity she had left. Bertie's face contorted with anger. Who do you think you are? This is utter nonsense! Gretchen could see that she had successfully provoked Bertie with her words. She glanced at the intimidating bodyguard standing behind Bertie and quickly realized she had pushed her luck too far. Just as the tension in the room reached its peak, Linus intervened. Mrs. Shepard, surely you remember her. This is Gretchen. She's the one who claimed to spend holidays with you and attend all your extravagant dinner parties. And let's not forget about the diamond tennis bracelet you supposedly gifted her on her birthday last year. Gretchen had shamelessly boasted about her close relationship with the Shepard family in front of Linus. She had never imagined that her tall tales would come back to haunt her in such a way. At that moment, Gretchen realized the gravity of her carelessness. She could never have fathomed that she would encounter Lucian, the CEO of the Shepard family, and his wife while house hunting today. Could her luck get any worse? It seemed like fate was determined to expose her lies. What made the situation even worse was that Linus, completely oblivious to the gravity of the situation, took everything seriously, blurted it out right in front of Bertie. He was desperately hoping that Gretchen could use this opportunity to introduce him to Lucian and his wife, thinking it would be a game changer for his business prospects. That was the only reason why he had proposed marriage to Gretchen in the first place. Little did Linus know, Gretchen was mortified and wished she could just disappear into thin air. She couldn't bear the shame of it all, but before she could even process her embarrassment, Mrs. Shepard with a disapproving frown declared, I've never seen this woman before in my life. She's a stranger to me. Linus, now wearing a frown of his own, couldn't believe what he was hearing. That can't be right, he protested. She claims she can help me get in touch with you. She even said your corporation would be interested in doing business with me. She swore up and down that you were thicker than thieves. Bertie, sharp as attack, instantly caught on to the deception. Oh, she's a thief, all right. Stealing my family's name to lie to others and boost her own social status. I simply won't stand for it. She'll drag my family's name through the mud if I don't take care of her. She stepped forward, ready to deliver a well-deserved slap to Gretchen's face. In an instant, the palm of Bertie's hand connected with Gretchen's face, leaving a distinct mark. The fear in Gretchen's eyes was palpable, and she dared not utter a sound. Cordelia, Gretchen's mother, wanted to protest vehemently, but when she saw the imposing bodyguards lining up in a formidable row, she quickly swallowed her words and retreated. Linus stood there, his jaw dropping in disbelief. How could Bertie and Gretchen not know each other? The room suddenly erupted in chaos as Bertie shouted for security to remove Gretchen and her mother from the premises. 
But Gretchen wasn't going down without a fight. She screamed back, insisting that she couldn't be kicked out because she was Damon's wife's cousin. The room fell silent as Lucian and Bertie exchanged stunned glances. Mrs. Shepard's face twisted into an even uglier expression as she stammered, turning to Damon for confirmation. All eyes were on him as he reluctantly nodded his head, confirming Gretchen's claims. Ah, Mr. Walker, I had no idea she was your relative, Bertie said, realizing her grave mistake. If I had known, I would have never dared to lay a finger on her. The room was filled with a collective gasp at Bertie's sudden humility. People couldn't help but wonder about the mysterious person who could make Mrs. Shepard a formidable force cower in fear. But Gretchen wasn't about to let Bertie off the hook that easily. Tough, you think you can look down on people and then beg for mercy? Gretchen retorted, filled with a newfound confidence. It's too late for that. You owe me a serious apology for that slap, and I demand compensation. My head isn't even hurting now because of you. I might have to go to the doctor. Gretchen cunningly used Damon as a shield, knowing that his presence would give her an advantage. Gretchen's eyes lit up with a fiery determination. She was not going to let Mrs. Shepard get away with hitting her. No, she was going to take revenge and make her pay. And why stop there? Gretchen's mind raced to possibilities. She could even extort money from the wealthy Shepard family. After all, they had plenty to spare. But just as Gretchen was lost in thought, Avery's cold words snapped her back to reality. My husband must be mistaken. I don't know this woman. Who is she? Gretchen's heart sank. How could her own cousin not recognize her? She pleaded with Avery. Why are you saying that? I'm your cousin, Gretchen. You've known me your whole life. What about the bond we share? That witch, Bertie Shepard, just hit me. You have to stand up for me. Cordelia chimed in, urging Avery to defend her family. Yeah, Avery, you can't just let an outsider bully Gretchen. You don't have any sense of familial duty. But Avery was not swayed. She spoke with a coldness that sent shivers down Gretchen's spine. Can you stop talking nonsense? I don't have a cousin. You two stop using my name to get out of your mess. It seems like this is your prerogative. First, Gretchen lies about knowing the shepherds, and now she's lying about being my cousin. Cordelia was desperate for help and turned to her brother-in-law, Harold. Are you just going to watch Gretchen and I get bullied like this? Are you going to put pressure on Avery? Ask the shepherds to compensate us as soon as possible. Harold's face twisted into a scowl as he ignored Cordelia and turned to Bertie. Mrs. Shepard, I don't know them. They're nothing but a bunch of thieves who cheat others. He spat out. Cordelia's eyes widened in fury at Harold's words. Harold, you jerk! She yelled, her voice echoing through the room. But before things could escalate any further, Bertie shot a quick glance at the security guards. In a flash, they rushed over and pinned Cordelia to the ground, delivering a few sharp slaps to her to bring her back to her senses. Bertie and Lucian shook hands with Damon. We're honored to have you in our neighborhood, Mr. Walker. We'll drop by and have a coffee with you soon. Thank you, Damon replied. The house is for a family that truly deserves it. He pointed to Harold. This man's wife is in the hospital. That mansion will be a fantastic place for her to recover after surgery. As everyone filed out of the room, Linus grabbed Gretchen by the collar, his face twisted in anger. What the hell is going on? You said you knew Lucian and Bertie, but now you're lying to me. I'm not buying this house anymore. We're done. I want to break up with you. But Gretchen held her ground, clutching her contract tightly. Who's lying to you? What does it matter if you want to build a relationship with Lucian? I deserve this house. Did you sleep with me for nothing? She growled, her voice dripping with venom. Linus was fuming with rage, his chest heaving with every breath. How many times have I slept with you? You're not worth that much money. He spat. Cordelia stepped between them. Linus, you can't just promise my daughter the world and then yank the rug out from under our feet. As the argument escalated, Gretchen joined in, and soon the three of them were embroiled in a heated dispute. It was only a matter of time before someone called the police. When the officers arrived, Linus accused Gretchen and Cordelia of being scammers, and before they knew it, they were being taken to the police station to be detained. Meanwhile, Damon, Avery, and Harold were exploring their beautiful home that Damon had just purchased. The scenery was breathtaking, and Avery was already envisioning how she could transform the kitchen into her dream space. I want to make the kitchen to an open style, she mused, her eyes sparkling with excitement. With a fireplace in the middle, some ovens placed here, it would be a perfect for a cozy breakfast nook with a view of the lake. I could sit here all day reading and enjoying the scenery. At night, I could drink wine with my parents, catching up on all our lost years. As she looked at Damon with gratitude and affection, there was no denying the tenderness in her eyes. This was truly a dream come true. 
As Damon and Avery stood in the room, their eyes scanning the space, a sudden jingle broke the silence. Damon swiftly retrieved his phone, only to find Vicky's number flashing on the screen. With a curious smile, he made his way to the balcony, eager to hear what she had to say. As he answered the call, Vicky's infectious laughter echoed through the line, instantly brightening Damon's mood. Where are you, my dear? Have you found yourself another lover? She playfully teased. Chuckling, Damon replied, <laughs> Oh, you know me too well. Just handling some matters. What's on your mind? Little did he expect the hush in Vicky's voice as she uttered, It's time, Damon. I have to go back today. Damon's heart skipped a beat, his mind racing to comprehend her words. Go back? Back to where? He questioned, his voice laced with concern. With a hint of sadness, Vicky revealed, My family business still calls for me in Los Angeles. Damon's mind raced with questions, desperately seeking answers. When will we be back here? Beefy's gonna miss you. Amidst her gentle giggles, Vicky's response danced through the air, teasing Damon's senses. <laughs> oh my dear, what has happened? I think you're using Vicky as an excuse. You're the one who's going to miss me. Are there moments where you can't bear to be apart from me too? The truth is, I don't know when I'll return. It could be in a few days, or perhaps my career will consume me. And it could be five or ten years before our paths cross again. Heck, maybe I won't see you for the rest of my life. After all, countless lovers are waiting for me. Damon knew she was just joking about the lovers, but the thought of not working with her or seeing her anymore made him feel uneasy. And when she asked if he was willing to part with her, he couldn't bring himself to answer. But then, Vicky went silent on the phone and Damon's concern grew. He wanted to help her with whatever difficulties she was facing, but she hung up before he could offer. He tried calling her back to no avail. As he held the phone, lost in thought, Avery approached him with a curiosity. Damon brushed it off, but his heart was pounding. What was going on with Vicky? She had been acting strange lately and couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Damon's fingers danced across his phone screen as he sent a text message to Vicky, his heart filled with concern for her. If you have any problems, tell me. I'll help you solve it, he typed, hoping his words would bring her some comfort. Minutes turned into an eternity as Damon anxiously awaited Vicky's response. Finally, a message appeared on his screen, but it wasn't the reassurance he had hoped for. Vicky's words struck him like a dagger. Damon, take good care of yourself. You can't help me. If I get through this crisis, I will come to you. But, although you're still as powerful as before, there are always some people that you can't afford to offend. All right, the plane is here. Talk to you later, I guess. Damon's heart sank as he read Vicky's message. He desperately wanted to reach out to her to be by her side during this difficult time, but it seemed that fate had other plans. Determined not to let his worries consume him, Damon sent another message to Vicky, hoping for a reply that never came. Worry nodded Damon's mind, urging him to take action. He knew he had to find a way to Los Angeles. He'd been planning to visit Robert and Nancy anyway. It had been far too long since they last saw each other, and Damon wanted to see how they were doing. Were they still in Los Angeles, or had they moved on to new adventures? Were they in hiding? As Damon pondered his next move, his thoughts were interrupted by the memory of his grandfather's last message. According to Paul, Robert and Nancy should not be in Los Angeles. Confusion mingled with his worry, leaving Damon with more questions than answers. But there was another pressing matter that demanded Damon's attention, Silas. Ever since Damon and his parents disappeared, Silas had taken advantage of the Martinelli family's power to seize control of the Brokerton group. He had transformed it into his personal empire, leaving Damon with no choice but to reclaim what was rightfully his. The time had come for Damon to face his past and take back the Brokerton group. Los Angeles beckoned him, its streets filled with memories and challenges that awaited his return. It had been years since Damon had set foot in Los Angeles. Six long years ago, a mysterious event unfolded when Robert and Nancy vanished without a trace. And in the shadows, Silas quietly orchestrated a takeover of the Brokerton Group, rebranding it as the New Era Corporation. Los Angeles had transformed dramatically since that fateful day. Damon's sources hinted that Silas had aligned himself with an even more influential figure. Vicky arrived in Los Angeles on a commercial flight. Ever since her father, Harris suffered a tragic accident, the Cardiff Corporation, once a formidable force, had crumbled from within. Financial constraints forced Vicky to sell off not only her private jet, but also numerous industries at bargain prices. The once dominant Cardiff Corporation was being threatened with fading into obscurity. After her father's demise, her relatives circled like vultures, eager to seize control of the family business. In their eyes, Vicky was deemed unworthy of inheriting the Cardiff Corporation, 
and they would stop at nothing to undermine her claim. As Vicky made her way to the hotel, her phone rang. It was her mother, Thelma, telling her that before her father passed away, he had entrusted Vicky with the task of protecting the Cardiff Corporation. Could she handle it? The way the situation hit Vicky like a ton of bricks. The Cardiff Corporation was her family's legacy, and now it was up to her to keep it afloat. As she hung up the phone, tears streamed down her face. Feeling a sense of loneliness, Vicky gazed out the window and reached for her phone. She wanted to call Damon, but thought better of it. She wondered what he was doing at that second. It was hard not to feel like Fifi had stolen the life Vicky deserved, but she knew she had to push those thoughts aside and focus on the task at hand. Suddenly, there was a sharp knock at the door. Vicky figured it was room service. As she swung open the door, her eyes widened in disbelief. It was Damon. Was this some sort of hallucination? She blinked repeatedly, hoping to dispel the illusion. But Damon's smile only grew brighter. It was Damon, no doubt about it. You, why are you here? She managed to choke out. Damon stepped forward. I thought you were in trouble, so I thought I'd come to see if I could be of assistance. He pulled Vicky into his strong embrace, holding her tightly as she let out all her pent-up emotions. Her sobs echoed through the room, but Damon didn't let go. Once Vicky's tears subsided, Damon's curiosity got the better of him. He wanted to know what had happened. As she recounted the events that had led to Harris's death and the turmoil within the Cardiff Corporation, Damon's expression grew serious. But Vicky was quick to warn him off. She begged him not to get involved, to leave it to her to handle. Damon reminded her of the time he had recently taken on those two lawyers in Meyerson and emerged victorious. He was confident he could handle anything that came his way. Still, Vicky's eyes were filled with worry. She knew the stakes were high, and that there was more to this than met the eye. Someone was trying to take over the Cardiff Corporation, and they wouldn't stop until they had achieved their goal. She also knew that Damon was going to try to interfere with Silas Brokerton. Vicky furrowed her brow once again. She didn't know who was pulling the strings behind the scenes, but she had a sneaking suspicion that the Brokerton Group and the Cardiff Corporation were facing similar struggles. The Brokerton Group was now in Silas' hands, and Damon's once formidable forces had vanished to thin air. Even at the height of his power, Damon couldn't stand up against the people behind Silas. We need to get out of here. It's not safe. Damon said, taking Vicky's hand and leading her toward the old mansion that had once belonged to Robert and Nancy. As they approached the house, Vicky and Damon were surprised to see that it was brightly lit and filled with noise. What could be going on inside? Damon and Vicky's eyes widened as they peered into the courtyard. The sound of laughter and music filled the air, and they could see countless young people dressed to the nines, having the time of their lives. Two burly security guards approached them. What are you doing here? Casing the property for something to steal? Get out! One of them barked. Damon crossed his arms. I'm Robert Brokerton's son. I have every right to be here. The guards demand to search their bodies, reaching for Vicky first. Damon raised his hand and slapped the guard to the ground. He cursed loudly, threatening Damon with a stick. But in the end, he was no match for Damon's swift footwork and was sent flying. The tall security guard, still wiping blood from his face, accused Damon of trying to steal something and pretending to be a member of the Brokerton family. But Damon was not one to be intimidated. He raised his leg and instantly, a group of security guards fell to the ground. The security chief dodged and managed to avoid Damon's attack. A man came running out from the house. It was none other than William, the butler who had once served Robert and Nancy. A frown creased Damon's forehead as he questioned, William, what are you doing here? In a voice filled with shame, William replied, Young Master Silas instructed me to watch the door. William looked at the security guard. This is Silas's cousin, Damon. Damon, hurry up and come in. But to everyone's surprise, the security captain interjected, his tone dripping with condescension. You're just a watchdog. What right do you have to ask him to go in? There is only one young master at the Brokerton Mansion, and that is young master Silas. Before William could protest, the security guard forcefully shoved him aside. A woman watching the scene rushed over. Her stern voice cut through the tension as she demanded, What's going on here? The security guard hastened to answer, this man is trying to steal from the Brokertons. The woman cast a critical gaze over Damon. And who might you be? Vicky, her tone icy, interjected. His name is Damon, the rightful owner of this grand mansion. And pray tell, who are you? When did you start residing here? The security guard captain snapped back. Have you been living under a rock? This is Blair, the esteemed wife of young Master Silas. Blair sneered. 
So you're the daemon who hails from the countryside. Silas warned me about you. The security card captain signaled the surrounding guards to close in on Damon once again. He barked, Leave this place immediately! Do you understand? Damon casually pulled out his phone, ready to make some important calls. It was time to call for backup. Blair smirked, What's the matter? I would love to see who you think could come to your rescue. Not one to back down from a challenge, Blair swiftly retrieved her own phone and dialed a number. She knew all too well about Damon's true intentions. Being Robert's biological son, he had his eyes set on the family property and was ready to go head-to-head -head with Silas for it. What a ridiculous notion! Blair couldn't fathom allowing the prestigious Brokerton family's vast estate to fall into the hands of such a clown. As if on cue, the sound of sirens filled the air. Police cars swiftly arrived at the scene, their flashing lights adding a sense of urgency to the situation. A seasoned middle-aged police officer approached Blair. Ma'am, we received a report of an attempted burglary at this property. He informed her. Without skipping a beat, Blair pointed her finger directly at Vicky and Damon. Her eyes filled with determination. It's them. In a flash, a swarm of police officers surrounded Damon and Vicky, but they weren't alone. Damon's men, led by the fierce Vito, had also arrived on the scene. Vito's booming voice echoed through the air, demanding to know who had denied Damon access to his own family home. The young men's faces twisted in fear as they recognized Vito, a powerful figure in Los Angeles. Even the arrogant security captain was trembling in his boots. But the real shock came when a fleet of pickup trucks barreled onto the scene, armed to the teeth with countless warriors. And then, out of nowhere, a young man leaped out from one of the trucks. It was Jason Delberg, the same man Damon had once relied on to take down his enemies. Jason's connections to the Brokerton and Francis families had made him a force to be reckoned with in his own right. And now he was a terrifying presence in Los Angeles. The police officers were on edge. The one who had boldly charged onto the scene now cowered back, his voice trembling as he addressed Blair. Ma'am, it seems like a classic domestic disturbance. We, uh, we just received another urgent call. The other policemen quickly followed suit, hastily retreated, peeling out of the parking lot. Blair's face contorted into an expression of anger determination. Let's see if Damon has the guts. I'm calling Silas right now. Go ahead, try entering my house. Jason frowned. Who is this crazy woman? Damn it, did she think she could just waltz into someone else's territory? Blair snapped, her anger boiling over. I'm Silas's wife. If any of you dare to lay a finger on me, he'll have your heads. Jason raised his hand and delivered a resounding slap across Blair's face. Blair let out a piercing scream. You bastard! How dare you hit me! Jason's response was an even fiercer slap. The small group of security guards, overwhelmed by fear, trembled uncontrollably, too terrified to even make a sound. Blair, feeling utterly helpless, resorted to making numerous phone calls in a desperate attempt to find a way out. However, her efforts proved futile, and frustration mingled with tears as she cried out in despair. In her anger, she cursed Silas, convinced that he was indulging in the arms of another woman while ignoring her pleas for help. Damon, Blair seethed, your parents are gone! and soon you'll regret ever crossing paths with me. I'll make you wish you were dead. With those final words, Blair made her escape, scrambling away from the chaotic scene. The young partygoers who had been enjoying their festivities scattered in different directions. The tall security guard stepped forward and addressed Damon. His expression pained. Sir, I, I didn't mean to offend you, he stammered. But Damon's response was cold and unforgiving. He ordered his henchman, Vito, to take care of the guards. Beat them up, and don't let them show their faces here again, he commanded. The guards are dragged away, screaming in terror, and Damon turns to the Brokerton's loyal butler, William. From today onward, you'll become the manager of the Brokerton family mansion. He declared, if anyone dares to disobey you, I'll punish them. William was grateful for the promotion and promised to clean up the house for his master. Under his command, the chaos of the party was quickly swept away, and Damon's old room was tidied up. The domestic staff were overjoyed to have their young master back, and Damon and Vicky slept soundly that night. The next morning, word of Blair's wild party and her encounter with Damon spread like wildfire among the elite of Los Angeles. Everyone was buzzing with excitement. They all remembered Damon from the past, and the news of his survival had everyone up in arms. Have you heard the news? Robert's long-lost son has finally returned! One socialite exclaimed, unable to contain his curiosity. And did you hear? He actually had the audacity to lay his hands on Silas's wife, Blair. Silas is definitely in hot water now. Another whispered, relishing in the scandalous gossip. 
Oh, please. Do you honestly think Damon is the same person he used to be? A skeptical voice chimed in. His father is gone, and the Brokerton group now belongs to Silas. What chance does he have against someone so powerful? He's as good as dead without his father's support. Someone scoffed dismissively. Meanwhile, in his office, Silas Brokerton wore a menacing scowl. That damn country bumpkin! Does he really think his father is still alive? How dare he attack my wife! She was just trying to protect my property! I swear I'll make him pay for this! In the heart of Los Angeles' underworld, at the main branch of the Alliance, a mysterious figure stood by the window, holding a glass of wine. Bernadette Wadsworth, her slender frame exuding an air of cold determination, gazed out into the distance. That bastard who took Will away from us all those years ago has resurfaced. Bernadette whispered urgently into her phone. His parents have vanished without a trace. This is our chance, our moment to finally seek revenge. The morning sun cast a warm glow over Vicky's room as she received an unexpected call from her grandfather, Percival. His voice carried a sense of urgency and importance. Vicky, this afternoon the Cardiff Corporation will be participating in the government bidding for the casino. Percival informed her, If you're unable to make it back in time, your uncle will step in as the representative of the Cardiff Corporation. Vicky's anger flared up instantly, her voice laced with determination. No, Grandfather, you still haven't given up your relentless pursuit of snatching the Cardiff Corporation from me. Even if my father is no longer with us, I will never allow you or my uncle to lay claim to what is rightfully mine. Percival's fury ignited, his voice growing louder. The Cardiff Corporation was originally my property. I have every right to take control of it. Vicky's frustration reached its peak, her words dripping with resentment. You're spouting nonsense, Grandfather. This company was built by my father from the ground up. What right do you have to claim it as your own? When this business started flourishing, he even lent you money. But when you saw how successful my father had become, you shamelessly reneged on the written agreement and demanded more money. My father didn't have the cash at the time, but you didn't care. You forced him to pay up just so you could buy a house for my uncle. Tell me, how much money did you siphon off of the Cardiff Corporation like a greedy rat? How many billions did you take in total? She had meant to tell her grandfather off for ages. Now that she finally got the chance, she let it all out. Vicky's voice echoed through the phone as she unleashed her anger on her grandfather, Percival. How much money did you take for the Cardiff Corporation? When my dad passed away, you didn't even bat an eye. All you cared about was the money. And now, look what you've done. The Cardiff Corporation is falling apart, and it's all because of you. For years, Vicky had endured the hardships caused by her grandfather and uncle, but Percival seemed unfazed by her accusations. I couldn't care less, he retorted. If you can't make it back in time this afternoon, your Uncle Omar represent the Cardiff Corporation at the bidding ceremony, and guess what? You'll be disqualified from being the CEO. You can't afford to miss such an important event. Don't blame the shareholders when they kick you off the board of directors. With those cold words, Percival abruptly ended the call leaving Vicky holding the phone in her trembling hands. She was in a state of panic as she realized they were going to be late. But Damon had a plan. He took Vicky's hand and said, Let's go. Vicky was stunned at first, but then she remembered that Damon had a private plane. Without wasting any time, Damon rushed Vicky to the airport and called the staff on the way. The aviation management arranged for the plane to take off as soon as they had arrived. After a nerve-wracking two-hour flight, they finally landed. Vicky checked the time and saw they had only 20 minutes left before the bidding started. She was about to give up hope when her phone rang. It was Percival, telling her that she was going to miss the bidding. But Damon wasn't going to let that happen. He took the phone from Vicky and confidently said, Don't worry, Vicky will be there soon. Percival was skeptical, but Damon hung up the phone without another word. Vicky had worked tirelessly to secure her position in the Cardiff Corporation, but now it seemed like all of her efforts were about to be in vain. Her uncle Omar was poised to swoop in and take her place. Damon sprang into action. He whipped out his phone and made a call, his brow furrowed in concentration. After a few tense moments, he returned with a grin. They've agreed to postpone the bidding by half an hour. He announced triumphantly. Vicky's eyes widened in disbelief. Really? Damon nodded. Of course, I told you, I've got your back. With the extra time they had been granted, Vicky and Damon rushed to the auction site. When Omar heard the bidding would be delayed, he was livid. He immediately called the person in charge of the auction, demanding to know what was happening. To his surprise, he was told that the delay was due to an important person who was running slightly late. Omar's face twisted in confusion. Who could possibly have that kind of power? 
This time, my friends, we are destined for success. Failure's not an option. And let me make one thing clear. If anyone dares stand in our way, they will face the wrath of my hostility. Omar declared confidently, his voice filled with determination. As Omar stood before his staff, he could sense their submissive nature toward him. They may have been dissatisfied with his leadership, but fear kept their voices silent. But just as Omar thought he had complete control, a cold voice pierced the air, shattering his illusions. Vicky appeared before Omar and the employees, leaving them all in awe and shock. Omar's eyes widened in disbelief. Vicky, how... how did you manage to come back? According to his intelligence reports, Vicky was supposed to be in Los Angeles that morning. She couldn't be here now. A cold smile played across Vicky's lips as she taunted Omar. Surprised, are we? Well, get used to it. The sight of Vicky brought excitement to some of the employees. Director Cardiff, you're back. We've been waiting for you, Director Cardiff. We always knew you would come back to save the company. It was clear that the employees preferred Vicky over Omar. Vicky was known for her fair rewards and punishments, while Omar only knew how to demand and exploit his employees. He would deduct their salaries and shirk responsibilities. The Cardiff Corporation had suffered greatly under his leadership. Omar's jaw dropped. He couldn't wrap his head around what he was hearing. The earliest flight from Los Angeles was scheduled for tomorrow morning. How on earth did you manage to get here? He asked Vicky, his voice filled with astonishment. Vicky replied, can I just hop on my boyfriend's private plane and fly back? Boyfriend? Omar's eyes narrowed, his gaze piercing Damon like a dagger. Who the hell are you? Have you even asked her family for their blessing? I certainly don't agree. Vicky's anger surged through her veins. Who asked you for agreement or blessing? She snapped back, but Omar wasn't finished. He looked at Damon. Do you even realize that Vicky is already engaged to a wealthy man from a prominent financial group overseas? How dare you pursue her? Vicky's eyes blazed with fury. Stop talking nonsense. I despise that man. Do you even know who this man in front of you is? This is Damon, the son of Robert Brokerton. Omar sneered, his voice laced with mockery. Ah, so you're Damon, but newsflash, your parents have mysteriously disappeared, and the Brokerton group is now under Silas's control. Don't get too cocky, Vicky, he spat. If you can't handle this project, just wait and see what I'll do to you at the board of directors. I'll make sure you give up your seat. Damon chimed in. Well, Omar, if Vicky takes over the management rights, shouldn't you also step down from the board of directors? Omar frowned. Fine then, let's make a bet and see who comes out on top. But deep down, Omar's confidence was starting to waver. The directors had just delayed their decision for half an hour, and rumors were swirling that some big shot was the real frontrunner of this project. Ever since Harris died, the influence of the Cardiff Corporation had dwindled to nothing. And now with Vicky in the picture, Omar would use the opportunity to cause chaos with the board of directors and demand Vicky's removal from management. Damon addressed everyone in the room. Think long and hard about where your loyalties lie. Omar scoffed. You think you could swoop in here like you own the place? Just wait, you worthless piece of trash. There will come a time when you'll be the one crying. With that, Omar sauntered away. Damon, do you think this can work? Noticing Vicky's lack of confidence, Damon flashed a reassuring smile and replied, Why are you so afraid? With me by your side, there's nothing to worry about. Don't you believe in my abilities? Vicky pondered his words for a moment and instantly felt a sense of calm wash over her. Oh, I believe in you. Before they knew it, the bidding process had begun. Damon leaned in and whispered, Don't worry, today the Cardiff Corporation will emerge victorious. Vicky assumed Damon was merely trying to comfort her, but when the person in charge of the bidding company announced that the Cardiff Corporation had won the bid, Vicky was left speechless with shock. Really? We did it? She gazed at Damon, her heart brimming with affection and gratitude. He squeezed her shoulder. Meanwhile, outside, Omar refused to budge from the bidding scene. His expression transformed dramatically, a mix of confusion and disbelief etched across his face. What in the world is happening? Weren't they talking about some mysterious person vying for control? The internal staff, taken aback by Omar's reaction, questioned, Who told you about this mysterious person trying to take over the management rights? Omar persisted, If that's not true, then why was today's meeting inexplicably delayed by half an hour? One of the staff members tapped her finger on her chin. Didn't you notice that Vicky was almost late? Perhaps this half-hour delay was orchestrated to align perfectly with her arrival. A sudden realization dawned upon Omar as he absorbed the staff's words. Even though Harris was no longer alive, the Cardiff Corporation still possessed powerful connections from their past. 
Little did he expect Vicky to outmaneuver him in the end. It was a bitter pill to swallow. Unbeknownst to Omar, Vicky had stealthily solidified her position as the chairman. It seemed almost impossible to topple her from the board of directors. The thoughts that had chilled on Omar's spine, and a devious plan began to take shape in his mind. The following day, during the highly anticipated board meeting, Omar and his father Percival shocked everyone by announcing their abrupt withdrawal from the prestigious Cardiff Corporation. Not only that, they demanded to cash out all their shares, effectively draining the company's coffers in one fell swoop. To make matters worse, the meeting was being presided over by none other than Vicky herself. When Omar shamelessly made this audacious request, Vicky stood her ground and firmly refused. You may sell your shares, but only with the unanimous approval of all directors, and you must not utilize any of the company's funds. She declared with unwavering resolve. With the casino now under their control, the Cardiff Corporation needed a substantial amount of capital to invest and generate massive profits. Wasn't Omar's bloodletting akin to severing the very foundation of the company? Omar's eyes rolled dramatically. Do I have to go through you just to get my own money? Besides, I'm the one in charge of finance here, so the funds will be transferred to my private account later. If you have a problem with that, feel free to take me to court. I'll be right there with you till the bitter end. Percival, not one to back down, stood up and added, Vicky, it would be in your best interest to agree to Omar's conditions. If you dare to sue me, I'll make sure you and your mother are completely erased from the family tree. Consider yourselves no longer part of the prestigious Cardiff family. Vicky was stunned. After all, Harris had always been a dutiful and loving family member. He had even selflessly given his shares to his younger brother Omar and their father Percival when he took over the family business. And now, all he received in return was a revenge for his kindness. It was like spitting on his grave. Vicky was seething with anger, unable to find the words to express her frustration. As Omar and Percival made their exit, the junior directors began whispering amongst themselves, casting strange glances in Vicky's direction. The real crisis hit in the afternoon. Omar and Percival had already expressed their desire to withdraw all shares from the Cardiff Corporation in the morning. But things took a turn for the worse when the small shareholders also announced their intention to sell all their shares and extract all the cash flow from the company. It was clear that they had lost faith in Vicky's ability to turn things around. Rumors were swirling that the Cardiff Corporation had offended a big shot and that Harris's death was shrouded in mystery. And now, with the news of Vicky's supposed poor management causing internal strife, it seemed that the company was on the brink of collapse once more. Omar, however, welcomed this chaos. He had control of the finances as well as willing to do whatever it took to bring down the Cardiff Corporation and make Vicky scram. It felt as though there was an invisible force, a giant hand, orchestrating everything around Vicky, leaving her feeling powerless, stripped of control over the entire Cardiff Corporation. Both Omar and Grandfather Percival, who were supposed to be her kin, proved to be utterly useless and incapable. There had been someone pulling the strings behind them, someone she couldn't see. Vicky sat in her office, exhaustion was washed over her face, her weariness evident in her drooping shoulders. Glancing at her watch, she realized how late it had become. Dinner plans with Damon flashed through her mind, bringing a smile to her face. Lost in thoughts, Vicky was startled when one of the Cardiff Corporation secretaries, Claudia, interrupted her reverie. Curiosity danced in Claudia's eyes, she wondered who or what had brought such warmth to Vicky's expression. Was it perhaps a new love interest? Caught off guard, Vicky's cheeks flushed crimson. Claudia, you know better than to tease me like that, she retorted. With a quick grab of her bag, Vicky ran out of the office and headed toward Damon's hotel. As Vicky stepped into Damon's hotel room, she noticed that Damon was simultaneously listening to music and reading the news, including the stock page. However, what caught Vicky's attention was the alarming sight of the Cardiff Corporation shares plummeting drastically. You're finally here. Looks like your company is going through a rough patch. Damon remarked. Vicky felt a pang of dissatisfaction in his callousness. Why are you acting so casual about this? Vicky asked. Why can't I laugh? It's a minor setback. We can handle it. Damon nonchalantly replied. Vicky scowled. Oh, please. This isn't Meyerson in Los Angeles. I don't need your help. I have my ways of dealing with things. Damon arched an eyebrow. So, you don't need me to come to the rescue? Vicky shook her head defiantly. Absolutely not. I built Season Capital from scratch with my own two hands. This little hiccup is nothing compared to what I've overcome before. As Damon recalled the fierce rivalry between Vicky's Season Capital and the Everbright company in the past, he realized that she was more than capable of handling her matters. Vicky, sensing the change in atmosphere, spoke up once more. 
Can you come over to my house tonight? I may have mentioned to my mother that there's a chance we might rekindle our relationship. Damon's face contorted into a frown. How could you do that? You know the circumstances I'm in. Vicky pursed her lips. Oh, you mean your precious Fifi? Are you afraid of disappointing her? Damon gave her a pitiful look. I just don't want you to get the wrong idea, Vicky. Vicky's frustration boiled over. You heartless jerk. Who asked you to feel sorry for me? I care about you and I'm willing to stand by your side. No amount of gold can buy the happiness I'd find with you. Damon's eyes softened as he spoke. You're a beautiful, intelligent woman. You deserve someone better than me. Vicky's anger surged. Her desire to jump up and scream was overwhelming. You are my haven, my sanctuary. Without your love, my beauty and excellence mean nothing to me. Vicky leaned in closer to Damon, her red lips brushing against his ear. With a mischievous glint in her eyes, she whispered, You know, big bad guy, I can sense your worry. You're afraid that you won't be able to get past Fifi and lose everything, aren't you? Damon, who had been deep in thought, responded quickly, trying to brush off her words. No, I just think you deserve someone better than me. Rolling her eyes playfully, Vicky scoffed at his response. Oh, please, I've already told you before. Is there anyone better than you? But don't worry, I've already had a little chat with Fifi when I was in Meyerson. It seems like she's not against the idea of you hooking up with me. Damon couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all. Interesting. Who would be willing to share a man with another woman? A sweet smile spread across Vicky's face as she confidently replied, Fifi and I have a strong friendship, and she mentioned that your energy is just too much for her to handle alone, so she has no problem sharing you with me. Damon chuckled, not fully convinced. Yeah, right. You and I won't be sleeping together again, Vicky. It wouldn't be fair to Fifi. If she wanted to open up our relationship, she would have told me. Vicky narrowed her eyes. She knew exactly how to play her cards. Seduction was her specialty, after all. She would win Damon over sooner rather than later. Vicky led Damon through the front door of her house, a sense of excitement and anticipation filling the air. As they stepped inside, however, Damon quickly noticed the intense hostility emanating from Wolfie, Vicky's imposing bodyguard. Curiosity getting the better of him, Wolfie had to voice his concerns. Miss, who is this guy? Why haven't I seen him before? He questioned, his tone laced with suspicion. With a warm smile, Vicky introduced Damon as her fiancé, causing Wolfie's expression to change dramatically. His hostility grew even stronger, as he unabashedly voiced his disapproval. Fiancé! He exclaimed, clearly taken aback. Does your mother know about this? I don't like the idea of a random man in the house. Now that your father's passed away. Damon shot Vicky a weary glance. Why did she insist on introducing him as her fiancé? Undeterred by Wolfie's skepticism, Vicky gazed at Damon with tender affection in her eyes. She reassured Wolfie, Don't worry, Damon treats me well. Besides, this is not the first time Damon and I have met. We've known each other since we were young. He has always been the person I love the most in my heart. Wolfie's anger burned brightly. What is your intention to getting closer to Mrs. Cardiff? You appeared as soon as Mr. Cardiff died. Do you have an ulterior motive? Vicky, not wanting to see Damon unfairly judged, quickly came to his defense. Wolfie, Damon is good to me. Don't say that to him. Wolfie's annoyance was palpable as he confronted Vicky. His voice trembled with concern as he pleaded. Miss, it, that's not what I meant. I'm only looking out for your well-being. Just think about the risk of bringing in such a mysterious person. We can't be sure if he has any malicious intentions toward you. I have to be cautious, especially with the recent surge of thieves infiltrating your family's home. Vicky's face turned pale as she tried to explain herself. Wolfie, please understand that I never intended to concern you. Damon would never harm me, I promise. Ever since Vicky's father passed away, tensions had risen between Percival, Omar, and the rest of the family. Without a strong figure to rely on, the family became vulnerable to schemes and manipulations of those who sought to take advantage of Vicky and her mother, Thelma. The Cardiff family home had even fallen victim to break-ins. Damon empathized with Vicky and her mother's struggles. He genuinely believed that employing bodyguards would provide the necessary protection for the vulnerable mother and daughter, which is why he didn't want to argue with Wolfie. Wolfie crossed his arms. Miss, who's to say he doesn't have his eyes set on your property? I strongly advise you to exercise caution. Since Wolfie didn't drop the matter, Damon decided to step in. Perhaps it's time for you to reassess your position, Wolfie. If you're unhappy with the situation, you're more than welcome to resign. Vicky sighed. Damon, please don't blame Wolfie. Ever since my father passed away, he's been our protector. 
He can't resign at a time like this. Many people wish harm to befall me and my mother. I believe that Wolfie and the rest of the security team are crucial members of the household. Damon's brow furrowed, a nagging feeling of unease settling in his gut. Something just didn't add up about Wolfie. Why was he so irked by Damon's presence? Determined to get to the bottom of it, he excused himself and made his way to a corner to make a discreet phone call. He needed to investigate Wolfie further. He knew just the person to call. Meanwhile, Vicky headed inside to have a conversation with her mother Thelma. The news of Damon's presence brought a smile to Thelma's face. She was pleased to see him there, knowing how much her late husband, Harris, had admired him. Before Harris passed away, his greatest regret was that Vicky hadn't found a good husband yet, and that he didn't become a grandfather. Harris and Thelma had always held Damon in high regard, but after he and Vicky publicly called off the engagement, they had given up hope. They believed that their daughter and Damon were simply not meant to be. Little did Thelma know that Vicky and Damon would find themselves entangled once again. However, Thelma was oblivious to the fact that it was all a charade, as Damon was already married to someone else. As Vicky drifted off to sleep, the night was quiet and peaceful, but suddenly, she was jolted awake by the sound of footsteps outside her window. Then, the unmistakable sound of glass shattering and angry roars filled the air. Damon, who was holding her, jumped in alarm. She clung to him, her heart racing with fear. What happened? She asked, her voice trembling. I think a thief snuck in. Damon replied. Vicky's face turned red with fear, but Damon held her close and reassured her. I'll go out and take a look, he said firmly. Despite her reluctance, Vicky got up with him. She hastily threw on some clothes. She heard heavy and hurried knocks on the door. She opened it to reveal a group of security guards led by Wolfie. Miss, are you all right? Wolfie asked urgently. We caught a thief just now. I was worried that something might have happened to you, so I quickly came to take a look. Vicky breathed a sigh of relief and hugged Damon tightly. Thank you, Wolfie. We are fine, she said gratefully. Wolfie frowned. I'm glad to hear that, but this is a serious problem. The thief managed to exploit the weak points of our supposedly impenetrable house. One of the other bodyguards sporting a buzz cut chimed in, emphasizing the importance of Wolfie's keen observation skills. Miss, we owe a debt of gratitude to Wolfie, he declared. If it weren't for his sharp eyes, this thief would have succeeded in his nefarious plans. We were able to catch him. The attempted burglar stood behind the guards. His arms and legs were bound with rope. Wolfie noticed that Vicky's gaze was fixed on Damon, her eyes brimming with affection. It was as if the world around her had faded into the background. This sight infuriated Wolfie. He had always had feelings for Vicky. He vented his frustrations at the thief. He delivered a swift kick and scolded him, demanding answers. Tell me, why are you so familiar with this house? Is there an insider aiding you? The thief's gaze shifted toward Damon and he pointed an accusing finger. It's him, he shouted. He told me how to get in. Vicky and Damon were both shocked by this revelation. They did not know this thief or any connection to him whatsoever. Confusion clouded their faces as they tried to make sense of the situation. Wolfie turned his piercing gaze toward Damon. What's the meaning of this? Do you know this thief? You better start explaining because it seems this thief knows you all too well. How is he so familiar with the land out of the house? Damon's mind was racing. Was this imbecile trying to set him up? The audacity! Vicky, however, was quick to defend him, refuting the accusations made by the bodyguards. You've got it all wrong, she asserted confidently. My fiancé wouldn't have any knowledge of the thieves or their activities. Wolfie, with a serious expression on his face, responded, We can't take any chances. We need to thoroughly investigate this matter. Our guard must remain up at all times. He then turned his attention to Damon, demanding an immediate answer. Tell me, did you recruit this little thief? Vicky, not one to tolerate any slander against her husband-to-be, interjected, I won't stand for you tarnishing my husband's reputation. This is his first time visiting our home. How could he possibly know anything about the layout or this alleged thief? In a sudden burst of action, Wolfie's hand shot up and landed a resounding slap on the thief's face. Speak up, you scoundrel! Who sent you? Wolfie demanded. The thief, whose cheek was stinging from the blow, hesitated a moment before confessing. It was Damon, sir. He told me about the Carter family's riches and how to break into the house. He gave me all the information I needed. A sinister smile crept across Wolfie's face, his eyes gleaming with a mixture of satisfaction and malice. Ah, so the thief knows your name. Care to explain yourself? The other guards, sensing the gravity of the situation, closed in around Damon, their eyes filled with suspicion. But Vicky, her face flushed with anger, stepped forward to defend him. Wolfie, what on earth are you insinuating? 
I trust David with my life, and I won't stand for these baseless accusations. Wolfie, frustrated by Vicky's unwavering loyalty, had underestimated the depths of her feelings for Damon. His expression twisted into an even uglier scowl, his mind racing to find a way to prove his point. Miss, I assure you, I'm merely carrying out my duty. If Damon and this little thief have no connection, then how's the thief know his name? Damon patted Vicky on the shoulder. He wasn't afraid of these lowly security guards. Ah, uh, loyalty, such a noble trait, he said, his voice oozing with sarcasm. But I can't help but wonder, are you loyal to your bosses, or are you just trying to frame me? He leaned in closer. I have a feeling that you're the ones who know the thief. It's all just a little too convenient, isn't it? How did I show up and all of a sudden a thief is trying to pin his crimes on me? Are you trying to mess with me? Wolfie's expression shifted, confusion replacing his previous confidence. What do you mean? How could I possibly have framed you? He stammered. I'm the captain of the security team, and an honest man! Damon clapped his hands, a signal for someone to emerge from the shadows. And there he was, Axel, the bodyguard that Robert had assigned to Damon. Damon called him as soon as he heard the window shattering earlier. Damon turned to the others, a mischievous smile playing on his lips. My bodyguard has something to say. Let's hear his opinion, shall we? Axel pulled out his phone and played a video for everyone to see. The footage captured the events of that fateful night. Wolfie, surrounded by a group of bodyguards, was plotting against Damon. They spoke in hushed tones in an alley behind the house, but Axel had caught them. And then, the shocking twist, Wolfie had conspired with a thief to pose as Damon's accomplice. He wanted to set Damon up. Vicky's face turned scarlet, her anger directed at Wolfie and his cronies. You bunch of jerks are too despicable! She exclaimed, her voice filled with a righteous indignation. Damon held his phone, a triumphant smile on his face. Thanks for that, Axel. What else do you have to say, Wolfie? You can't argue with the video footage. Wolfie and his crew were caught red-handed, and they knew it. They exchanged nervous glances, wondering how they could have been so careless. But what made their stomachs churn was that they had been caught on camera. Who knew what kind of trouble that could bring? Wolfie's eyes narrowed as he turned to Axel, a special forces soldier who had somehow managed to sneak up on them without being detected. How would he manage to take the video without anyone noticing? It was a mystery. That video proves nothing. It was all just an elaborate prank. Axel spoke up. Yeah, right. What a flimsy excuse. What self-respecting guard who wants to keep his job plays a prank on his bosses? Don't you know what kind of trash you are? He pointed an accusing finger at Wolfie. He felt his face grow hot with shame. Vicky, who had trusted Wolfie to protect her family, was equally outraged. How can you be so shameless? She demanded. I'll never forgive you. Wolfie felt a cold sweat break out on his forehead as he knelt before her. Miss, I was wrong, he pleaded. Please, for the sake of my loyalty to the Cardiff family and for protecting your family for so many years, I beg you, will you spare me this time? It was undeniable that Wolfie had proven himself to be an exceptional security guard. Without his unwavering dedication, the house would have been vulnerable to even worse crimes since Harris had died. Vicky didn't want to make the choice herself. Vicky's gaze shifted toward Damon. If Damon expressed his desire to have Wolfie fired, Vicky would have remained silent, respecting his decision. Wolfie, too, understood the dynamics at play. He knew that Damon held the power to make the final call. With a swift motion, he turned towards Damon, his eyes filled with remorse. I apologize, Wolfie pleaded, his voice tinged with regret. I was blinded by my shortcomings. You, Damon, are a truly magnanimous man. Recognizing my unwavering loyalty to the Cardiff family, I humbly request that you grant me my freedom. The room fell silent the way of the decision hanging in the air. Wolfie awaited Damon's response. His fate and his job intertwined to this pivotal moment. Hans stared down his old butler. Carlton, you probably didn't know this, but I am now the new CEO of the Schimmel Company, so I'm going to have to ask you to pack up your things and get the hell out of here. With a boisterous laugh, Carlton couldn't contain his amusement. Are you lost in a daydream? Did you just say that you've become the new CEO of the Schimmel Company? Hans challenged him. You don't believe me? Call your old boss Gunther. Carlton's anger flared. I don't need to ask for proof. A woman emerged from the house, clearly annoyed. What's with all the racket? Hans's face contorted into an ugly expression as he laid eyes on the woman. His fist clenched tightly, revealing a deep-seated resentment. Her name was Ingrid. Once upon a time, Hans was a notorious playboy, and Ingrid had been one of his many conquests. But she was more than just a fling. She was the woman he had loved the most. 
He had even planned to make her his wife. However, fate had other plans when Hans swooped in and stole her away. After Hans fell from grace, she wasted no time in dumping him and running straight into the arms of Gunther. What brings you here, Hans? Looking for a handout from Gunther? Ingrid eyed Philomeno and Darcy with disdain. Carlton, give this little beggar the stale cookies we bought last year and tell him to scram. Ingrid may have fallen out of love with Hans, but she certainly had lost her sharp tongue. Hans said, Ingrid, are you still cheap as before? Ingrid smiled proudly. What's wrong? You don't like cookies? She laughed wildly. Forget it. You don't deserve the cookies or anything else. Looking at your daughter, she must have grown up in the slums, right? I bet she's never had imported cookies before. Even moldy cookies are a luxury to her. Gunther is working late today. He won't take kindly to you darkening our doorstep. If he comes back and sees you, you'll regret it. You don't have to wait any longer. Hans said, Gunther won't come back. He's already been arrested. Inger's jaw dropped. Who are you trying to fool? Who wants to capture him? You? Do you have that ability? Hans remained calm. If you don't believe me, you can call him and see if he will answer or not. Ingrid's curiosity got the better of her. She reached down into her pocket and pulled out her phone, her fingers quivering slightly as she dialed Gunther's number. One ring, two rings, ten rings, but there was no answer. Panic began to creep into Ingrid's voice as she questioned. What's wrong with Gunther? Why didn't he answer his phone? Carlton also took out his phone and made a call, but just like Ingrid, he was met with silence on the other end. Hans wore a smug smile as he watched their futile attempts. Do you want to know why? Gunther was exposed and has been detained. Hans revealed, I'm the boss now. All the properties and shares under Gunther's name have been given to me, including this house. As Ingrid absorbed the shocking revelation, she couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Hans's confident gaze told her that his words were most likely true. Ingrid frantically dialed the number of the Schimmel Company's board members, but the response she received left her feeling utterly disappointed. The once submissive and respectful higher-ups were now cold and unresponsive. It was as if they were afraid to even speak to her. Hans now was in control of the company. Ingrid felt that she had fallen into an icy cave. Hans just smiled and asked, Do you still want to continue? No! Gunther must be with another woman! That's why he doesn't answer his phone! She kept trying to persuade herself, desperate to numb the pain of her disappointment. In Ingrid's heart, a battle was raging. She found herself grappling with the unthinkable. Everyone in their social circle knew about Gunther's infidelities. He had a reputation for having mistresses and treating the female employees of their company like trash. Ingrid had confronted him about it in the past, but her efforts were in vain. Gunther seemed immune to her pleas and continued to his reckless behavior. Eventually, Ingrid reached a point of resignation. She allowed Gunther to do as he pleased. She was willing to bear the burden of his indiscretions, as long as she could maintain her comfortable lifestyle. But now, with Gunther's capture and the possibility of Hans taking over the Schimmel Company, Ingrid's world was on the brink of collapse. I don't care what you do, now get the hell out of here! This house is now mine! Hans said menacingly. No! You can't go in before Gunther comes back! If you beggars dare to take another step into the yard, I will call the bodyguards to beat you to death! She shouted, trying to intimidate Hans. Hans stared at Ingrid, his eyes piercing through her. Suddenly, the sound of screeching tires filled the air as more than a dozen cars rushed over. A group of strong men jumped out of the cars and said fiercely, I heard that someone dares to steal from your house, and they are squatting here. We're not late, right? Hans nodded, relieved that his plan had worked. He had already sent a message to Bernadette on the way there, hoping that she would send reinforcements. At this time, Carlton also shouted, Someone come and stop them! Whoever dares to make a move, shoot! A swarm of bodyguards burst onto the scene. With their sheer numbers totaling between 20 to 30 men, they formed an impenetrable shield around Ingrid, ensuring her safety. But it just wasn't their sheer force that gave them an advantage. It was their firepower. Ingrid's men were armed to the teeth, ready to defend their leader at any cost. Ingrid's men were no pushovers. If a battle were to erupt, there was a real possibility that they could hold their own against Hans and his forces. And even if Hans emerged victorious, it wouldn't come without a heavy toll. Philomeno and Darcy were gripped with fright. The sight of loaded guns poised to unleash their deadly firepower was enough to send shivers down their spines. Philomeno, always timid by nature, couldn't bear the thought of Darcy getting caught in the crossfire. Hans, maybe we should leave, she suggested. But Hans, driven by an unwavering determination, shook his head. 
He couldn't back down now. Today was the day he would reclaim everything that rightfully belonged to him, no matter the cost. Just as Hans was on the verge of calling for more reinforcements, a sudden rush of dozens of cars came barreling toward them. The sight was both awe-inspiring and intimidating, as each person in the cars brandished weapons in their hands and had additional weapons strapped to their waist. It was clear that they meant business. As the leader of the group stepped out of one of the cars, he approached Hans with a warm greeting. It turned out that Bernadette, the mastermind behind this operation, had foreseen the need for additional support and had called for backup. Hans felt a surge of confidence as he realized that not only did he now have significant advantage in numbers, but also possessed superior firepower compared to Ingrid. Carlton nudged one of his men and whispered, We still have the advantage of knowing the area better than they do. No matter what, we must prioritize our safety and Ingrid's above all else. The head of the bodyguards nodded in agreement. Despite the overwhelming power and numbers of Hans and his men, they believed that their knowledge of the terrain and other advantages would be enough to withstand any attacks. But their confidence was short-lived, as more cars soon arrived. The situation was rapidly escalating, and this confrontation was far from over. In a mere 30 minutes, a crowd of over 100 people had gathered outside the Schimmel Mansion, creating an inescapable net that seemed to stretch in all directions. The once confident face of the head bodyguard had transformed into one of sheer panic. The other bodyguards, armed with guns, were trembling uncontrollably. They were even contemplating running away as soon as they opened fire. Ingrid's face had turned ghostly pale, her teeth audibly chattering as she turned to Carlton for guidance. What? What should we do? She stammered. Carlton himself was no stranger to fear, and at this moment, he was truly terrified. Hans's power far exceeded his expectations, leaving him shaken to his core. However, the one thing that managed to calm Carlton down was the imminent arrival of the police. The sound of sirens filled the air. To his surprise, the person leading the police force was none other than the deputy chief of the police department, a figure only second to the chief himself. The deputy happened to have a close relationship with Carlton. As Carlton's eyes landed on the deputy chief leading the team, a wave of relief washed over him, causing a smile to bloom on his face. Thank goodness you're here! He exclaimed, Los Angeles has turned into a lawless place. I fear these gangsters will barge in and rob the mansion. Ingrid nodded fervently, her eyes filled with desperation. Please, we need your help to catch these gangsters, especially him. She pointed accusingly at Hans. He's the ringleader, believe it or not. He used to be a beggar, but now he's joined forces with the gangs to steal our property. If you help me catch him, I promise you'll receive a generous reward. The deputy chief turned to face Hans, a knowing smile playing on his lips. Mr. Schimmel, you were the one who called our police department to report a theft at your house, weren't you? Hans could only guess that Bernadette had assisted him in making the call. The deputy chief of police gave a reassuring nod to Hans and spoke with conviction. Private property is sacred and invaluable. We, the police, will enforce the law impartially. Then he turned to Ingrid and asked, Just now we heard that a group of robbers snuck into his house. Was that you? Ingrid scowled. He was accusing her of being a robber. Quickly, Carlton came to her defense and clarified that they were the victims and had called the police for help. He even pointed out that they were in Gunther's house and that Ingrid was Gunther's wife. However, the officer was not swayed by their explanation. He shook his head and said, I don't care about who's buried to whom. The problem is, is that this is indeed Mr. Hans Schimmel's house. You are the ones who occupied Hans's house. You need to get off his property. Ingrid's eyes welled up with tears. Her heart heavy with despair. She knew she had to clear the air and set things right. There's been a misunderstanding. My husband is Gunther. He's the boss of the Schimmel Company, and this house belongs to him. She looked at the officer, hoping he would understand. As for this guy, he's a thief. You should drive him away instead of chasing us away. So, you're saying you're not leaving? The officer asked, his tone accusatory. Ingrid and Carlton exchanged worried glances. They knew they were in trouble. The situation was getting worse by the minute. Ingrid! Do you still have a fantasy that Gunther will come back and save you? Hans taunted. Ingrid didn't say anything, but her expression told Hans that she still had hope. How could Gunther, who was backed by Silas, fall so easily? Hans handed his phone to Ingrid, showing her a video. Ingrid's heart sank as she watched Gunther confessing to his crimes. Her last hope was shattered. She wiped away her tears and stood tall, her eyes blazing with defiance. I'm not leaving, she said firmly. This is my house and I won't let anyone take it away from me. With a swift push, Hans sent Ingrid stumbling backward. He marched into his house with his head held high, exuding an air of superiority. 
Ingrid is left speechless, but Carlton wasn't about to let Hans get away with his rude behavior. You can't go in, he said firmly, blocking Hans's path. Hans rolled his eyes and delivered a fierce slap to Carlton's face. Stop him, Carlton shouted, hoping the group of bodyguards had come to his aid. However, the bodyguards hesitated. They looked at each other, then at the menacing group of thugs that surrounded the mansion. They lowered their heads, unwilling to confront the danger that lay ahead. Meanwhile, Ingrid was frozen in place. She knew she couldn't run, even if she wanted to. She had no money in her pocket, and Gunther, the man she had followed for years, was as stingy as they come. Ingrid's pockets were effectively empty. Ingrid's eyes widened as she watched Hans pull Philomena and her daughter Darcy, who was covered in dirt, into the Grand Mansion. Hans had resolved the matter and now was feeling generous. He instructed his subordinates to go to the Schimmel Company's luxurious hotel and open a table, with all expenses paid for the day. The lackeys left with smiles on their faces. Hans turned to Philomino and said, From now on, this will be our home. Philomino was speechless, holding onto Darcy's hand tightly as she looked around in disbelief. The mansion was huge and magnificent, with exquisite furniture and spotless marble. The opulence of the place was breathtaking. The maids dressed in uniforms bowed slightly as they saw Philomino, their faces fawning with smiles. They were afraid of her, as if she had the power to fire them at any moment. Darcy ran around the house, her eyes wide with wonder. She had never seen such exquisite things before. Unfortunately, she stumbled and fell, much to the surprise of Philomino and Hans. Before they could even react, the household staff sprang into action, rushing toward Darcy like a constellation of stars surrounding the moon. They showered her with attention, eagerly helping her up and tending to her every need. One concerned individual even took time to rub Darcy's knee, worried that she may have broken a bone. They treated Darcy like the new spoiled child of the house, going above and beyond to ensure her well-being. Philomino stood there, mouth agape, unable to believe her eyes. She had never imagined that her daughter would be treated like royalty. In the past, Philomino had lived in a run-down public house, scraping by the lowest rung of society. Now here she was, witnessing the extraordinary care and attention bestowed upon her daughter. After a while, Damon slowly opened his eyes. Your father's brain has been seriously damaged, and after such a long time, his blood vessels are blocked. Bernadette's voice trembled. Can you... can you save my father? To save her father, she would throw away all of her dignity. I think so. Damon replied seriously. He placed one hand on Benedict's head and the other on Benedict's chest. After a moment, Damon's palm turned red. A hot stream of warmth flowed through Damon's palm into Benedict's body. Although Bernadette didn't know what Damon was doing, she was still shocked by the magic. That's enough. I've cured the blood clots in your father's body, and I've opened up the nervous system in his brain. I believe your dad will wake up in less than half an hour. Bernadette couldn't believe her ears. You mean... My father is better? Damon sighed. I suppose we'll see in 30 minutes whether or not that's the case. Bernadette refused to leave the room. She wanted to stay by her father's side until he woke up. She wanted her father to see her as soon as possible. Damon sat outside smoking a cigarette while listening to a report from Bernadette's former lackeys. They had always been more loyal to Benedict, so they had been gathering intel for months, hoping to find the real reason Benedict was comatose. Hudson explained to Damon that at first, Bernadette also did her best to investigate the truth of her father's coma. Later on, Silas and Bernadette had met. No one knew how Silas had bewitched her, but her temperament had changed drastically after she returned. Not only did she listen to Silas saying that Benedict had an accident that caused him to fall unconscious, but she also listened to Silas's every word from that time onward. After Damon listened quietly, he said, it seems like your Bernadette also needs to be treated. I saw something wrong with her expression just now, but the details are not clear yet. We'll only know after checking. At this moment, in the room where Benedict was sleeping, Bernadette was staring at her father's haggard face. Every second felt like an eternity. She hoped that her father would wake up and that he would still love her as much as he did before. Bernadette lost her mother when she was very young. From then on, her father took her to travel the world, she watched how her father raised her with great difficulty, all while building his empire. She couldn't imagine losing him. Ten minutes. Bernadette looked at her father. There was no response. Twenty-five minutes. Bernadette looked at her father again. Bernadette's heart jumped to her throat. Could Damon have lied to her? The last five minutes felt like torture. Finally, 
Half an hour passed. There was still no reaction. Bernadette felt like she was really stupid. Once upon a time, she had made a promise to him that whoever awakened Benedict would be the one who she would marry. It was a grand gesture. But at that time, the world's top doctors had gathered to try and cure him, and they had all failed. So how could she have ever thought that Damon, of all people, could succeed where they had not? It seemed impossible that he could become a miracle worker, capable of curing diseases and saving lives. Bernadette felt like she had been duped by Damon, and there was nothing she could do about it. To make matters worse, her own life was now in his hands, with no security forces to protect her. If Damon wanted to, he could end her life at any moment. It was a bitter disappointment, especially considering how much hope she had placed in him. Bernadette held her father's hand and spoke to him softly. The doctor had said this would help awaken him, but Bernadette knew it was all for naught. Bernadette's heart was heavy with the weight of the cruel reality she had accepted. She stood up to leave. Suddenly, she heard a call. Bernadette! She turned around, her eyes widening disbelief as she saw Benedict with his hand outstretched toward her. Bernadette, help me sit up, he pleaded. Bernadette thought she must have been trapped in a dream. She pinched herself, but as soon as she realized that this was indeed reality, tears of joy streamed down her face. Without a moment's hesitation, Bernadette rushed toward Benedict, enveloping him in a tight embrace. My daughter, I have wronged you. He confessed, his words heavy with regret. All these years, Benedict had not been completely lost in slumber. His mind had often been clear, aware of his surroundings and the efforts Bernadette had made to wake him up. The scene was filled with raw emotion as the father and daughter clung to each other. Then, the door swung open, revealing Damon and the group of people. Benedict's eyes lit up at the sight of his old friend, a genuine smile spreading across his face. Damon greeted him warmly. How do you feel now? He asked. Benedict grinned. Much better. Thank you, Damon. Damon nodded in acknowledgement before turning back to Bernadette. Now you can ask your father what happened. Investigating the events that led to Benedict's condition was the utmost importance. With a sense of urgency, Bernadette turned to her father. Dad, could it be that someone did this to you on purpose? Benedict's cloudy eyes suddenly sharpened. Who told you it was an accident? He demanded. Bernadette hesitated for a moment before answering. Silas told me. Silas. Just the mention of his name sent a surge of intensity through Benedict's veins. It was as if a fierce fire had been ignited within him. The company leader, that conniving snake, had invited me to his lavish mansion to celebrate his birthday. Benedict began, his voice tinged with bitterness. Little did I know, he had set up a trap for me that night. He lured me into a dimly lit room where Silas lay in wait, ready to pounce. But I managed to escape to a window, narrowly avoiding their clutches. Benedict let out a heavy sigh, the weight of the memory still lingering in his mind. Those lunatics were out of their minds. I found myself surrounded by a sea of cars, their headlights blinding me, and then one of them crashed into me with such force. I can't recall what happened next. Bernadette's face was drained of color. She couldn't bring herself to accept the truth. The fact that someone had worked alongside for years could be capable of such treachery. Damon wore a knowing smile on his face as he posed the question to Bernadette. Now, do you finally believe me? Bernadette could only nod silently, her voice stolen by the weight of the revelation. The truth had finally come to light, and it was more sinister than she could have ever imagined. Good. Now you need to take action to kill them. He spoke with conviction, urging Bernadette to take matters into her own hands. But Bernadette remained silent, her mind clouded with conflicting emotions. As Damon continued to press her, Bernadette felt an unexpected pang of pain. His words had struck a nerve deep within her, awakening a sense of protectiveness she couldn't quite understand. Sensing her hesitation, Damon could see the turmoil in Bernadette's eyes. He probed further, demanding to know the cause of her reluctance. Benedict joined in, his gaze fixed on his daughter with concern etched on across his face. Struggling to find the right words, Bernadette bit her lip. Dad, I... I don't know why, but I can't bring myself to kill them. Without warning, Damon reached out and grasped Bernadette's hand, causing her to shriek in surprise. Stay still, he commanded. He placed a finger on her wrist. There's a problem. The room fell into an uneasy silence as everyone waited for Damon to explain. 
Bernadette's heart pounded in her chest, her mind racing with questions. What had Damon discovered? And how would it change everything they thought they knew? Bernadette felt an overwhelming sense of weakness, as if all of her strength had been drained from her. Even speaking seemed like an impossible task in her current state. As Damon's expression grew more serious, Bernadette's fear intensified. Suddenly, without warning, he fiercely slapped her head, causing her to cry out in pain. A trace of black blood trickled from Bernadette's nose. Damon spoke with a grave tone. She's been poisoned with a powerful love potion. Everyone gasped. They had heard tales of love potions, but had never witnessed their effects firsthand. People who fell under the spell of such potions were said to be controlled like lifeless puppets, but they had never imagined they would see it happen to Bernadette of all people. I can't help but wonder if Silas himself who poisoned you, or if there was someone else pulling the strings behind him. David poised. This potion you see, it's no ordinary toxin. It has a wicked power to make the victim fall helplessly in love with their poisoner. And not just any love, mind you, but a love so consuming that it turns them more obedient than the most devoted slave. She's so deep into it, she never thought to question her devotion to Silas. With a gentle touch, Damon placed her hand on Bernadette's forehead. Beads of sweat formed on his forehead, his connection unwavering. Then with the final touch, Damon ceased his efforts. Damon's voice softened. Just moments ago, you were hesitant to take such drastic measures. Silas had infected you with his twisted love potion, clouding your judgment and manipulating your emotions. Bernadette's face contorted with confusion and suspicion. Was Damon trying to scare her? Was he playing mind games? But as she glanced around the room, taking in the serious expressions etched on the faces of her father and everyone else present, she couldn't help but believe him. Silas had truly poisoned her, not just physically, but emotionally as well. And now, it was time to break free from his clutches and seek the justice her father deserved. As the realization hit her, a wave of disgust watched over Bernadette, causing her goosebumps to rise in her skin. She furrowed her brow, desperately trying to unravel the mystery of what had attracted her to Silas in the first place. Was it their partnership? Or perhaps it was the way she had hung on to his every word? Could Damon's words hold any truth? Damon nodded solemnly, his gaze piercing into her soul. Xylus, that vile creature, attacked your father and likely poisoned you too. Now, what do you plan to do? Will you seek revenge and end his wretched existence? Or will you let him go, allowing him to continue his reign of terror? A sharp glint flashed across Bernadette's eyes. I have never expected Silas to stoop so low. For years I was blind, but now I want nothing more to take matters into my own hands and avenge my father's suffering. Alvin is representing the company in a meeting with Silas today. Ever since Benedict had fallen unconscious, Alvin had seized control of the company's internal power, and to make matters worse, he seemed to have a close relationship with Silas. The buzz about Damon's arrival in Los Angeles had been circulating for quite some time, reaching every nook and cranny of the city. It seemed like Silas and Alvin were gearing up to make their move on him, and they met every day to discuss their plans. Dad, don't you worry. Bernadette assured him, I'll fix this. No one else knows you've awakened from the coma. The time to strike is now. Bernadette rushed to the top floor of the downtown building. As she entered the meeting room, she could feel the tension in the air. A middle-aged man slammed his hand on the table, causing her to jump. Bernadette, why haven't you found Damon yet? He barked. Do you know he's already snuck into the Los Angeles and met with Hans? Bernadette remained silent, unsure of how to respond. Suddenly, one of Benedict's assistants, Hudson, spoke up. Alvin, is it really necessary to speak to Bernadette in such a tone? He asked. It's a little inappropriate, don't you think? Alvin slammed his hand on the table again, causing everyone to flinch. Hudson, you need to take this matter seriously, he growled. If you're not careful, Silas will get involved. Hudson was furious. Alvin, who do you think you are? He retorted. You're offending your superior and showing her great disrespect. Silas has no right to command Bernadette, let alone punish her. Alvin was taken aback for a moment, but quickly regained his composure and spoke in a deep, commanding voice. Hudson, are you suggesting that you want to rebel against Silas? He asked, his eyes fixed on the bold assistant. Then, turning his attention to Bernadette, he added, I don't mean to offend you, but if Hudson is the best you've got, you need to think more carefully about the kind of people you want working for you. In the past, Bernadette would have taught Hudson a lesson. She was known for her fiery spirit and no-nonsense attitude. But this time, something was different. Instead of unleashing her wrath, Bernadette simply smiled. Alvin, don't worry, 
She said confidently, We're also on the hunt for Damon, and when we find him, we'll make sure Silas gets his hands on him. Alvin, however, wasn't convinced. He knew the consequences of failing to catch Damon. Silas's anger would be directed straight at him. He couldn't afford to take any chances. I must say, Bernadette, Alvin continued, Your work efficiency is rather lacking. If you don't have the energy to give it your all, perhaps it's time for me to take over the search team. Hudson interjected, Alvin, are you trying to seize power? Alvin's anger boiled over. Without warning, he stormed towards Hudson and delivered a slap across his face. You think you deserve to question me? Alvin spat. If you dare to challenge me again, I promise you'll regret it. But Bernadette had seen enough. She couldn't stand by and watch her team members be treated with such disrespect. Alvin, you've crossed a line. Hudson is one of my people, and I won't tolerate anyone laying a hand on him. Alvin looked sheepish. Hey, Bernadette, please don't get me wrong here. This is just my style. You know how I roll. Sure, I may have given him a little tap, but trust me, it had nothing to do with you. I did it all for the sake of our company. After all, a little hierarchy never hurt anyone, right? People should know their place. In the conference room, Bernadette's face twisted into a frown, her eyes narrowing in disbelief. She couldn't believe what she was hearing from Alvin. Are you seriously suggesting that I can't leave my team and complete Silas's task, and that you should take over the company on my behalf? Alvin, seemingly unfazed by her reaction, spread his hands in a gesture of innocence. No, Bernadette, that's not what I meant. But let's face it, over the years, we've relied on the hard work and sacrifices of our employees to maintain your luxurious lifestyle. You can't just sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor forever, can you? Maybe it's time we take turns in your position and share the responsibility. His words hung in the air, and to Bernadette's astonishment, the room erupted in agreement. The voices of her colleagues blended in a chorus of support. That's right, Alvin makes a lot of sense. We need democracy in our company. Silas would approve. Alvin has proven himself time and time again. He's more than qualified to be the boss. Bernadette's blood boiled with anger. She knew deep down that Alvin had been scheming to take her position all along. His words were just a thinly veiled attempt to undermine her authority and seize control. Bernadette was seething, her eyes blazing with fury. Alvin, you need to understand something. My father holds absolute control over this company. Whether it's through nepotism or the law, I am the rightful boss. I will not tolerate your atrocious behavior. Alvin responded with a sly smile. That's true. But don't you also want the company to thrive and grow rapidly? And you have to provide us with incentives and benefits. Otherwise, who would want to work for you? Bernadette sneered. Alvin, you keep claiming to be loyal to my father, but I don't believe you for a second. She continued, her voice filled with contempt. The company was built by my father, and you owe him a debt. He saved you when you were being hunted by your enemies, and not only spent a fortune to cure you, but also made you his right-hand man back in the day. And now this is how you repay him? Alvin's face contorted with frustration. That's exactly what I'm saying. I've dedicated years of hard work to this company, haven't I? Besides, your father is currently in a coma. The decision is not yours to make. I'm more than worthy of this position. Bernadette's smile widened. Do you swear to God that you are truly worthy? Alvin's expression darkened, sensing the unyielding implication in Bernadette's sharp gaze. Alvin's heart skipped a beat as a wave of unease washed over him, but he took a deep breath, determined to stay composed. So what if the secrets of the past were on the verge of being exposed? With Silas by his side, even if Bernadette knew the truth, she would be powerless to do anything about it. Alvin lifted his chin proudly. That's right! I've long since repaid my debts to Benedict over the years. Bernadette's eyes locked into Alvin, her gaze piercing through him like a bolt of lightning. Alvin, I need to know, did you try to kill my father? Are you the reason he's in a coma? The room fell into a stunned silence. Everyone held their breath, waiting for Alvin's response. His expression shifted dramatically, a mix of surprise and fear. Bernadette, I have no idea what you're talking about. He replied, his voice slightly shaking. Bernadette stepped forward, her eyes never leaving Alvin's face. Slowly, deliberately, she continued. That year, you lured my father to your house under pretenses, only to ambush and target him. Her voice grew stronger as she recounted the events. And when my father managed to escape, you orchestrated a dozen cars to chase after him. In the end, he was left in a vegetative state. She paused, her gaze unwavering, and then asked accusingly, Isn't that right? 
Alvid's forehead glistened with sweat as panic filled his eyes. He couldn't believe what Bernadette was saying. You're talking nonsense, Bernadette. I have no idea what you're talking about. He exclaimed, his voice trembling. If you dare to slander me again, don't blame me for turning against you. Alvin, desperate for support, shot a pleading look at his colleagues, silently begging for assistance. And just like that, a thin man stood up, his voice filled conviction. Bernadette, you're being shameless by slandering Alvin like this. How could he possibly attempt to murder his former boss? The rest of Alvin's loyal lackeys chimed in, their voices booming with determination. We believe in his character, they declared in unison. Bernadette, if you don't want to give up your position, just say it. But you shouldn't make these worthless accusations. Bernadette was taken aback. She never expected so many people to speak up for Alvin, let alone openly question her. It felt like a rebellion, a direct challenge to her authority. In the past, she would have panicked, feeling outnumbered and losing control of the situation. But in this moment, she surprised herself by finding a sense of calm. With a sweet smile, Bernadette leaned in closer to Alvin. Oh, Alvin, you know me too well. I do love a good challenge. And yes, I may need a little evidence to convince you that I know what I'm talking about. Luckily, that won't be difficult to find. Alvin's frown deepened as he pondered the situation. He and Silas had always been so careful, so meticulous. What evidence could Bernadette possibly possess? Alvin had confidence in his ability to control any situation, especially when Benedict wasn't around to interfere. After all, Silas had always been his biggest supporter and wouldn't let anything happen to him. With a hint of arrogance in his voice, Alvin retorted, Bernadette, unless you have some strong evidence up your sleeve, I suggest you think twice before accusing me. I won't be so polite if you can't back up your claims. Bernadette's eyes gleamed. Oh, Alvin, you underestimate me. I have a witness. Alvin's fury ignited instantly. Witness? Who dares to be a witness against me? Show yourself! He scanned the room, his anger palpable, daring anyone to challenge him. But despite the discontent that may have been brewing among the onlookers, Alvin's commanding presence was simply too intimidating. No one dared to stand up against him. It seemed that, for now, Alvin's control over the situation remained unchallenged. I'll be the witness. Do you think that's okay? A hushed voice echoed through the room, catching everyone off guard. The door swung open and there stood Benedict, his presence commanding attention from all. Was this some sort of illusion? A trick of the light? But no, it was Benedict, unmistakably him. The shock rippled through the room. Benedict? Is that you? Someone finally managed to utter, their voice trembling with uncertainty. Others joined in, their words a chorus of disbelief and awe. Benedict, you've awakened from your coma? Oh my god, I can't believe it! The room buzzed with a mixture of emotions. Some were generally surprised, unable to fathom the miracle that stood before them. Others, however, felt a pang of fear. Benedict's return meant the end of their carefully laid plans, the unraveling of their deceit. These were the very people who had aligned themselves with Alvin, drawn in by his promises of power and wealth. They had eagerly anticipated the downfall of Bernadette and Benedict, relishing in the spoils that would come their way. But now, faced with Benedict's resurrection, their confidence wavered. Benedict's return would expose Alvin for the fraud he truly was. The once loyal supporters quietly distanced themselves, their faces drained of color as they realized the consequences of their actions. Alvin's face twisted into an ugly expression as he struggled to come to terms with the unbelievable truth before him. Benedict, who had been in a coma for what seemed like an eternity, was now standing before him, alive and well. Who are you? Alvin stammered, his voice trembling in disbelief. You can't be Benedict Wadsworth! It's impossible! Benedict looked at Alvin with a mixture of amusement and disdain. You are a clown, Alvin, he said, shaking his head. You thought I was good as dead, didn't you? Well, you miscalculated. Alvin quickly changed his tune. So it is you, Benedict, he said. He plastered on a fake smile and tried to sound sincere. Well, I guess I won't be competing with Benedict for the top spot anymore. You know me, Benedict. I'm all about the group. I have no selfish motives. Benedict let out a dark chuckle. How much longer are you going to keep lying to me, Alvin? Alvin's face contorted with anger and defiance. Benedict continued. Oh, come on, Alvin. You think I forgot what you did? You teamed up with Silas to try to kill me, and then you left me in a coma. His voice shook with raw bitterness. The room fell silent as Benedict, who had been listening intently, couldn't hold back her anger any longer. Alvin, do you even have an ounce of morality left in your heart? You're worse than a beast. Alvin's fists clenched tightly, 
and his anger boiled over. Suddenly, he burst into laughter. A chilling sound echoed through the room. Fine. If that's how it is, then I won't pretend anymore. His words dripped venomously as he continued. Benedict, you old dog. You don't think so great just because you woke up from a coma. Your time has come and gone, old man. So what if I try to eliminate you? Under your rule, loyalty was nothing but a joke. It's no secret that many of us have been unhappy with you for a long time. I was trying to help my colleagues vent their anger and get revenge. Benedict turned around to face his former employees. Who else wants to kill me besides Alvin? The room seemed to shrink as those who had supported Alvin lowered their heads, distancing themselves from him. The battle lines had been drawn. Benedict stood tall, unyielding, while Alvin's anger simmered beneath the surface. Alvin glared at Benedict. Listen up, Benedict. If you even think about disrespecting me, Silas will make sure you regret it. He'll tear you apart limb by limb. Benedict simply shook his head, unfazed by Alvin's threats. You're still being stubborn, Alvin. Alvin's panic was palpable. He knew all too well that Benedict had a reputation for mercilessly killing anyone who betrayed him. Alvin couldn't afford to be seen as unfaithful. He needed the support of his friends. Turning to his colleagues, Alvin pleaded with them to join him. You're all in this with me. If you don't stand by me, Benedict will come after you too. You're all implicated already. That sentence worked on them. More than a dozen people rallied behind Alvin, guns at the ready, aimed at Benedict. With confidence restored, Alvin's voice boomed. Surrender now, Benedict, and I might just spare your life. The deafening sound reverberated through the air, causing everyone to snap their heads in its direction. Bernadette braced herself, thinking that her former assistants had fired their guns at her father. But it wasn't a gunshot. Just like that, Axel materialized out of thin air. Damon had told him to get ready to protect Wadsworth, and Axel was nothing if not dutiful. Before Alvin could fully comprehend the situation, Benedict and the rest of the group sprang into action. Gunshots finally erupted, shattering the silence. But they were coming from Axel. Alvin's men, unfortunate victims of the sudden onslaught, were mercilessly torn apart by the hail of bullets. It was a gruesome sight. A gut-riching cry escaped Alvin's lips. His life was abruptly cut short in a violent manner. Everything went quiet for a few minutes after Alvin died. Benedict's voice filled with a chilling determination broke the silence. What transpired today must remain a secret, locked away from prying eyes. Anyone who dares to utter a word about it will meet the same fate without an ounce of mercy. The weight of his words left everyone speechless. Fear and obedience gripped their hearts, rendering them incapable of uttering even a single syllable. With Alvin out of the picture, Bernadette and Benedict wasted no time in returning to the house to hatch the following step of their plan. Damon met them there. As they prepared to discuss their next move, Damon turned to Bernadette to give her instructions. I've done some digging, and it seems you were the one who helped Gunther take over the Schimmel Company. Am I right? He asked. Bernadette nodded, her eyes flashing with anger. Yes, that's right, but what do you want me to do about it? With the love poison no longer clouding her judgment, Bernadette was filled with a fierce hatred for Silas and his cronies, including Gunther. They had plotted to kill her father, and she was determined to make them pay. Damon's eyes shone with excitement and anticipation. Tomorrow, we'll gather some people and take down the Schimmel Company. We'll seize control and make sure Gunther pays for what he's done. Your assistance will be invaluable. Bernadette nodded. She had participated in the competition for the position of boss at the Schimmel Company, and she had plenty of evidence against Gunther. The sun rose on a new day, and Bernadette wasted no time in gathering all the crucial evidence. With determination in her eyes, she entrusted it to Damon, who would ensure it reached the right hands. As the afternoon break arrived, the relevant parties, like secret agents on a covert mission, discreetly made their way to Gunther's office. Inside Gunther's office, the man himself was lost in a moment of self-indulgence, gazing out the window and relishing in his power. Little did he know a storm was about to disrupt his tranquility. Suddenly, the door swung open with a forceful kick. Gunther's eyes widened in shock as he demanded to know who had dared to disturb him. It was his brother Hans, with the mischief of a smile playing on his lips. Gunther couldn't believe his eyes. Hans, how on earth did a beggar like you manage to get in here? Who allowed you entry? Get out this instant! Hans simply chuckled, undeterred by Gunther's outburst. Oh, Gunther, it's been far too long. You always did underestimate me, didn't you? His words oozed with a hint of satisfaction, as if he had been waiting for this moment. Gunther, still reeling from the shock, called for security, hoping they would swiftly remove his unwelcome intruder. Security! Security! Kick this beggar out of my office! 
Han said with a smile. I'm here to take back everything that belongs to me. Gunther shouted. What belongs to you? All of this belongs to me. I'm the boss of the Schimmel Company. You're just a beggar. Get out of here. Hans crossed his arms. Gunther, you destroyed me back then. Don't blame me for returning the favor. Gunther had nothing to fear. You talk big. But if you have the guts, go and find trouble with Silas and Bernadette. Or find evidence against me. Bernadette, Damon, and a group of lackeys rushed into the room. Gunther's face lit up with relief at the sight of Bernadette, believing his savior had finally arrived. However, his joy quickly turned to fear as he noticed Damon's presence. Bernadette, quickly, call for help and get rid of the scum! Gunther pleaded, hoping Bernadette would come to his rescue. But to his surprise, Bernadette shook her head. Gunther was shocked. Bernadette, what is the meaning of this? We're supposed to be working together! And didn't Silas want you to find and eliminate Damon? He's right here! Why aren't you attacking him? With a calm demeanor, Bernadette responded, It's quite simple. I have gathered all the evidence you used for your tax fraud. Now, I am taking you back to the government for a thorough investigation. As for the matters concerning the Schimmel Company, I trust Hans to handle it with the utmost care. Gunther was furious. Bernadette, who do you think you are to dismiss me? And what about Silas? You know damn well the connection we have. Are you turning your back on him? Do you even comprehend the consequences? Well, I'll make sure Silas knows everything you've done. Just watch me. True to his words, Gunther swiftly pulled out his phone. But before he could dial the number, Bernadette's subordinate stormed toward Gunther and delivered a powerful punch that sent him crashing to the ground. Hans crossed his arms. Gunther, you better start behaving yourself now. Suddenly, something caught Bernadette's attention. Huh? What's that under your table? She exclaimed. It was then the crowd noticed a female employee who had been shoved beneath the table. She had been subjected to Gunther's unwanted advances earlier, and the consequences were severe. Beaten mercilessly, she was now on the brink of death. Gunther, this woman's life is hanging by a thread! Bernadette cried out. Quick, someone call the police! Damon assessed the situation with a keen eye. We need to document this crime scene. Find a camera, and search the documents on Gunther's computer. Gunther's forehead glistened with a sheen of cold sweat. Don't you dare touch my office! He shouted. But deep down, he knew he was powerless to intervene. This time, there was no escape for Gunther. Damon approached Gunther. Gunther, what else do you have to deny now? Fear gripped Gunther so intensely that his legs gave way. I'll confess! This is all done by Silas! I beg you to let me go! Damon's smile widened. No matter what you say, Gunther, the evidence is conclusive. You are attacking innocent people in the office. What do you think we should do? Gunther's soldier slumped. What can be done? Damon grinned. Let's start by giving up your job. Do you have any objections? Gunther shook his head frantically. Damon nodded curtly. Very good. I'll call the board members and carry out the handover of power. The board members arrived ten minutes later. The room was buzzing with anticipation as Gunther took center stage and made a shocking announcement. Due to personal reasons, he was passing the torch to his brother Hans, who would take over as CEO. Two old-timers who had played a role in Hans's previous downfall spoke out against the decision. They argued that Gunther had done an excellent job managing the company and that Hans was not fit to lead. These two cunning individuals had gone as far as to sabotage Hans behind his back, making his life even more miserable. But now with Hans potentially making a comeback, their worst nightmare was about to become a reality. Desperate to avoid the catastrophe, they pinned their hopes on Gunther, praying that he would have a change of heart. But without uttering a single word, Gunther swiftly made his way toward one of the board members. In one swift motion, he raised his hand and delivered a resounding slap, leaving the poor soul with a swollen face and bleeding nose. Another board member attempted to intervene. Gunther, we were just trying to talk things out. How could you possibly... Before he could finish his sentence, Gunther's hand struck again, silencing any further objections. Outside the conference room, Bernadette and her crew were already prepared. They burst through the door, forcibly dragging the two executives out. And then, they unleashed a merciless beating upon them. As the screams of their colleagues echoed through the room, the other executives are paralyzed with fear. Any objections? Gunther asked. The room remained silent. No? Good. Now, Hans will take control of the company's affairs and preside over the first board meeting. With that, Gunther left the room. Damon, I've done everything you asked. Gunther pleaded. I've handed over my power and shares to Hans. Please, let me go. 
I'll send you to the relevant department for investigation now. He said, his tone menacing. What? You can't do this! Gunther protested. I followed your instructions! You can't add insult to injury! Damon's eyes narrowed. You think you have any room to bargain? You don't want to end up like your unfortunate colleagues. I'm handing you over to the law, but for now, I'll only ask them to investigate your financial problems. If you dare protest further, I'll start an investigation in your attempted murder. Gunther sighed, knowing that Damon held all the cards. His life was in Damon's hands, and Bernadette had all the evidence to put him away for good. Gunther was taken away by the authorities, making all kinds of promises to save his skin. Damon watched him go with a look of disdain on his face. He still thought that Gunther had gotten off too easy. In the conference room, Han stood tall and commanding. From the lowest employee to the esteemed board members, no one escaped his scrutiny. The majority were Gunther's trusted aides, individuals who had once played a part in the operation against Hans. Little did they know that the very man they had reduced to a mere beggar, stripped of all power, would rise again like a phoenix from the ashes. An employee dropped to his knees and humbly kowtowed before Hans. Mr. Schimmel, I must confess that my actions were driven by foolish blindness. Please, I have been loyal to this company for years. The others who had also set their sights on Hans followed suit, falling to their knees and joining in desperate plea for mercy. Please don't fire us. Hans's thoughts drifted. It was hard to believe that he was back in this position of power, but Hans had never truly given up hope. And during his time at the bottom of society, he had honed his character and learned some hard lessons about life. Now with Damon's help, Hans had regained control and he relished the feeling of being able to decide the fate of others. Don't worry, I have no intention of firing anyone. I'm here to work with you, not against you. As long as you're sincere in your commitment to the company, I'll be your biggest supporter. But if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, I won't hesitate to take action. Hans paused for a moment, letting his words sink in. He knew that some of these executives had once been his friends, but he also knew the business was business. Let's put the past behind us and focus on the future, he continued. Together, we can make this company great again, and I promise to reward those who work hard and show their dedication. Hans pointed his finger at the young man who had just been on his knees. Morton, get up. Morton slowly rose to his feet, but to Morton's surprise, Hans didn't hold him accountable. Instead, he announced a promotion for Morton. The young man couldn't believe his ears. He was overjoyed and thanked Hans profusely. I won't let you down, sir. I'll work even harder for the company from now on. Hans nodded, his expression serious. Tomorrow, your appointment will be announced on the official website. The other employees in the meeting room were stunned. Hans had let bygones be bygones. Even Morton, who had charged to the front during Gunther's takeover, was pardoned and promoted because his contribution to the company. The atmosphere in the room relaxed, and the senior executives realized they had nothing to worry about. If Hans could forgive and forget, then they could too. As Hans glanced around the room, a sense of satisfaction washed over him. The relaxed smiles on the faces of his employees were a clear indication that his efforts had paid off. This was exactly the effect he had been striving for all these years. Gone were the days of his arrogance and self-importance. Through years of training and self-reflection, Hans had transformed into a leader who knew how to bring out the best in his team. He had learned the art of maximizing benefits and boosting morale. But that didn't mean he had forgotten what had happened in the past. No, he was determined to right the wrongs and seek justice. However, he knew that stability was crucial before he could delve into the secrets that had plagued the company. So for now, he would let the Schimmel company operate normally. He would conduct a thorough investigation in secret, leaving no stone unturned. Those who had harmed him in the past would not escape his grasp. He would hold him accountable for their actions. On the other hand, those who had shown him kindness and support would be rewarded. Hans was grateful for the opportunities that had been given to him by Damon, and he was determined to repay him in kind. He would go above and beyond to ensure that Damon received double the amount of support and loyalty he had shown. As Hans emerged from the meeting room, Damon and Bernadette were waiting for him with bated breath. Hans spoke up, his voice filled with urgency. Damon, I need to see my wife and daughter. Damon remembered that Philomena, Hans's wife, was still in hiding. Scar's threats had left her traumatized and she had no idea what had happened to her husband. Without hesitation, Damon said, Go Hans, we'll take care of things here. After Hans left, Bernadette and Damon continued their conversation. We need to find the Martinelli family shell company. Damon said, You have the evidence of their crimes, right? Bernadette shook her head. We need the Van Heck family's help to take down the Martinelli Corporation. 
But Lara Van Hack has a grudge against you, Damon. It won't be easy. Damon's jaw tightened as he considered the challenge ahead. But he was determined to see justice served no matter what it took. As Bernadette looked at Damon's confident face, she felt a wave of gratitude and confidence wash over her. Working with Damon had initially made her afraid of Silas and his cronies, but now she felt fearless. She realized that Damon had never failed. Even when Silas's power seemed overwhelming, it was only after Damon disappeared that he got what he wanted. Suddenly, Damon changed the subject. By the way, Bernadette, do you want to see Will? Bernadette was taken aback. Will represented a part of her past, and she couldn't help but feel a little nostalgic. Were you telling the truth earlier? He's alive? Damon nodded. If you want to see him, I can help you contact him. But Bernadette shook her head. Forget it. He and I are destined to be separated by fate. Hans zoomed down the road in a sleek, luxurious car. Today was the day he would show his wife, Philomena, just how much he could provide for their family. Philomena was hardworking and thrifty, fully aware of the challenges Hans faced in finding construction jobs each day. She even went to extreme lengths like selling her plasma to ensure their child could afford tuition fees. Sure, Philomino had her flaws. She tended to remind Hans of his financial struggles, constantly reminding him of his inability to give her the life she desired. But despite all that, Hans loved her. He saw beyond her shortcomings and recognized the countless advantages she brought to their relationship. As Hans neared his mother-in-law's house, his excitement reached new heights. He was about to unveil his true self to show Philomino the progress he had made. The anticipation of her reaction was almost unbearable. The Rolls Royce glided into the quaint neighborhood where Philomino's mother resided, instantly turning heads. But as the car rolled down the narrow streets, it became apparent that driving through was an impossible feat without scratching it. As Hans found a suitable spot far away to park, he settled into the plush leather seats of the Rolls Royce and indulged in a cigarette. Passerby stole glances at Hans's car, their eyes lingering a little longer than usual. The gilded Rolls Royce was a spectacle that demanded attention. Although it had been taken away from him by Gunther at one point, fate had brought it back into Hans's possession. Even the most oblivious person would instantly recognize that the owner of such a vehicle was no ordinary individual. Philos Mino's childhood home was a sight to behold, and not in a good way. The walls were peeling and revealing the bricks underneath and the yard was cluttered with all sorts of odds and ends. A few chickens strutted around. Philomino's mother, Gladys, was in a sour mood. You only know how to eat. When you come home, you don't even bring gifts. You're so ungrateful. Philomino felt embarrassed and small under her mother's harsh words. Her daughter Darcy had spotted some apples that Grandma had bought and was reaching out to grab one. Gladys slapped her hand away. Eating like a pig. You have the same moral character as your mother. Ask first. Darcy was so frightened that she ran to Philomino, tears streaming down her face. Philomino comforted her daughter and wiped away her tears. She didn't dare speak up to her mother. After all, times were tough, and sometimes even your own family doesn't treat you with kindness. But Philomino didn't blame her mother for their situation. If she had to blame anyone, it would be her husband for not giving them the life they deserved. Gladys was irritated that her daughter and granddaughter had decided to stay with her. She couldn't understand why they couldn't just be more helpful around the house. Come on, Philomino. Can't you at least wash the vegetables and sweep the floor? Ah, you're so lazy. Philomino quietly went to work. Gladys stood at the door, engaging in casual chat with the neighbors, trying to distract herself from her annoyance with her daughter. Meanwhile, Philomino's father, Felix, arrived home on his bicycle. Whose family's friends and relatives are driving a Rolls Royce through here? It's stunning. He exclaimed, a hint of envy in his voice. The neighbors joined in on the conversation. That's not just any ordinary Rolls Royce. One of them chimed in. It's a gold-plated Rolls Royce, specially made. I heard there's only one like it in the entire world. Another neighbor added, I remember my son-in-law mentioning this car before. It belongs to the boss of the Schimmel Company. But why would they come here? Felix's face lit up with curiosity as he heard the mention of the Schimmel Company. His neighbor's disdainful tone only fueled his interest further. Which Schimmel Company? He asked eagerly, wanting to know more. The neighbor looked down on Felix as if he were a naive country bumpkin. You don't know anything, do you? It's a multinational company that my son-in-law works for. Speaking of which, your son-in-law is a piece of trash. The difference between them is staggering. Felix and his wife were taken aback by the neighbor's words, their conversation coming to an abrupt halt. The neighbor was undoubtedly wealthy, his daughter having married a high-ranking executive. They lived in a magnificent mansion, driving around in luxurious cars. 
How could Gladys and Felix's daughter even begin to compare to someone like that? And to make matters worse, she had chosen to marry someone like Hans, whom the neighbor had deemed a lowlife. The contrast between their lives was stark. Gladys spun around to face Philomeno. All you know how to do is toil and sweat, day and out. But what future do you and your husband have? Look at you, a married couple destined to live a life of poverty. You can't even afford your necessities. Philomeno shook her head. Mom, Hans is a good person. Gladys scoffed. If he's so good, then why do you keep coming back to our house begging for food? Do you know what the neighbors say every time you show up? They say you've returned to your mother-in-law's house, with your hands outstretched for a meal. Doesn't that shame you? Philomena let out a heavy sigh, feeling the weight of her mother's constant criticism. But then her attention shifted to Darcy, who reached out for an apple. Fear gripped Philomena, angry that Gladys would have another outburst. She gently took the fruit from Darcy's hand. Darcy, sensing the tension, began to cry. Mom, why won't Grandma and Grandpa let me have an apple? Gladys interjected sharply, her voice laced with frustration. You little troublemaker! How many times do I have to tell you to ask before taking something? Now go and do your chores! I don't want to see you again, you little brat! Feeling overwhelmed and hurt, Darcy sought solace in the comforting embrace of Philomino's arms, tears streaming down her face. Philomino, holding Darcy's head close, couldn't help but voice her frustration. Mom, Darcy is still so young, she didn't do it on purpose. Gladys's eyes narrowed, her anger intensifying. You've been living off our food, staying under our roof, and you dare to talk back to me? Philomena retorted. Didn't I give you money for living expenses just yesterday? And let's not forget, we work tirelessly for you every single day when we come home. Gladys couldn't contain her rage any longer. Get out of here, leave, and take your bratty daughter with you. With a forceful shove, Gladys propelled Philomeno out the door, followed by a swift kick that sent her and Darcy tumbling onto the front yard. She stormed back inside, and moments later, she flung all of Philomeno's belongings out into the lawn. Philomeno seethed with anger, but she knew better than to challenge her mother's authority any further. She just wanted to protect her daughter and get out of there. She still had Scar to think about and the debt she owed him. She couldn't bear to imagine what would happen if he got his hands on her. Suddenly, Hans appeared in the front yard, catching everyone off guard. Darcy wasted no time and launched herself at him, seeking solace in her father's arms. Daddy, Grandma's being so mean to me, she cried out. Philomino clutched her luggage tightly, tears streaming down her face. Though she was deeply hurt, she remained silent, refusing to voice the injustice she had suffered at the hands of her mother. But Hans, being perceptive as ever, could see through the facade. How could he not know the true nature of Philomino's parents? He gently touched Darcy's swollen finger. What happened here? Gladys stood off to the side, arms crossed defiantly. I still stand by my belief that they got what they deserved. During all the commotion, the noisy neighbor chimed in to cast judgment. Oh, look at this. A beggar's family, is it? So you've come to your mother-in-law's house to freeload, huh? The wards hung in the air, but Hans refused to let them get to him. With a calm demeanor, he addressed his mother-in-law. Gladys, please, let's not treat Darcy like this. She's your own flesh and blood, your granddaughter. Gladys placed her hands defiantly on her hips. And where did you steal that fancy car from, Hans? What's with the new clothes? You can't afford something like that. You've always claimed to be a poor man with nothing. Why the charade? Hans felt a pang of hurt at Gladys' harsh words, so he turned his attention to Felix, his father-in-law, hoping for some support. But Felix, ever the silent type, simply puffed on his cigarette refusing to utter a single word. It was clear that he too agreed with his wife's cutting remarks. Tears streamed down Philomino's face as she mustered the courage to confront her mother. Mom, how can you say those wretched things? Philomino asked in a trembling voice, but Gladys remained stubborn, refusing to acknowledge Philomino as her daughter. Don't call me mom, she spat out, her words dripping with disdain. I don't have a daughter like you. You don't even have two pennies to rub together. Are you still human? Look at the person you married. Compared to our neighbor's family, it's so embarrassing. Philomeno's heart sank even further. She felt the weight of her mother's disappointment crushing her spirit. She silently wiped away her tears, trying to hide her pain. Hans couldn't believe the hurtful words that were coming out of her mouth. How could she say such things? Philomena was heartbroken over and over. She couldn't understand why her mother would speak so harshly about her. Hans, however, knew that deep down, money was the root of this conflict. As long as he had money, everything seemed to be fine. 
It was a sad reality, but one he couldn't ignore. With a heavy sigh, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a check. Take this money, he said. If it's not enough, ask me again. But Gladys rejected his offer. What are you giving me a worthless piece of paper for? She snapped, her voice oozing with sarcasm. Who do you think you are? A money printing machine? The neighbor stuck his head over the fence, a mischievous grin in his face. <laughs> even beggars are playing with checks now. My son-in-law doesn't even know what a check looks like. Can you believe it? Beggars thinking they're so high and mighty. He turned to Gladys with a smug expression. Your son-in-law went all out to impress you, huh? Giving you a fake check just to win your favor? Hans couldn't believe the audacity of his neighbor. Watch your mouth, buddy. Just because your family has money doesn't mean you can look down on others. The neighbor raised his eyebrows. You can't talk to me like that. My son-in-law is way better than you, Hans. He's a senior executive at the prestigious Schimmel Company. Hans smiled. This was the perfect opportunity to put his neighbor in his place. Oh, really? Your son-in-law is a big shot at Schimmel Company? What's his name? The neighbor, feeling a bit defensive now, replied. His name is Keegan. Why are you jealous? Want him to find you a job or something? Hans chuckled, enjoying the turn of events. It seemed like his neighbor's arrogance was about to come crashing down. All right, but brace yourself for some juicy news. Your son-in-law, Keegan, has just been expelled from the Schimmel Company. He'll be out on his butt in no time flat. He announced, relishing in the power of his words. Without wasting a second, Hans whipped out his phone and dialed a number. Hello? Is there anyone by the name Keegan holding a senior executive position in the company? Well, fire him immediately. He commanded. And if he dares to question why, tell him that his dear old father-in-law has deeply offended me. Oh, and if he still has any doubts, kindly ask him to come and find me. That should settle things. With a satisfied smirk, Hans hung up the phone and turned to his neighbor. Okay, your son-in-law has officially been given the boot. But hey, if you're interested, I can arrange for you to clean the toilets at Schimmel Company. He offered, unable to resist a playful jab. The neighbor, clearly unimpressed, rolled his eyes. Are you kidding me? Who do you think you are, the boss of Schimmel Company? His disbelief was evident. Han simply nodded, his eyes gleaming. That's right, my friend. I am now the boss of Schimmel Company. So if you have any desire to avoid trouble, I suggest you keep your mouth shut. He warned. Han spun around as he beckoned to Philomino. Come on, let's go. We'll take Darcy home and head to our brand new place. Philomino's jaw dropped in astonishment. A brand new home? She exclaimed, her eyes wide. How on earth could they afford a brand new home? Something about Hans seemed different at that moment, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. He exuded an air of confidence and radiated positivity like never before. Gone was the slight hunch of his back, a result of years of backbreaking labor. Instead, he stood tall and proud, his eyes shining with determination. And his clothes. Oh, his clothes were a sight to behold. No longer were they stained and worn out. Now, they were impeccably tailored and stylish. Philomino couldn't quite place the brand, but they looked even better than any designer clothing she had ever seen. It was as if they were made just for him. Gladys held the check with a blank expression while Felix lounged in a chair, puffing his cigarette. They silently agreed that Hans was lying. It was downright embarrassing, and they couldn't even fathom how Hans' family had managed to leave the situation unscathed. Hey, where are we headed now? Philomino trailed behind Hans, her curiosity peaked. Hans replied with a sly grin. I promised to show you our big new house. But Philomino wasn't convinced. She knew Hans tended to stretch the truth. She prodded him about Scar. How's Scar doing? Were you able to find him and return the money? She couldn't rest easy until the matter with Scar was resolved. Hans' smile grew wider as he replied. It's settled. Philomino's face lit up with surprise, assuming that Hans had simply paid off the debt. Little did she know, Hans had gone above and beyond by beating Scar to a pulp. It was clear that the two of them were not on the same page at all. Darcy's excitement was palpable as she hopped around, bouncing with joy and anticipation. She couldn't contain her curiosity any longer and blurted out, Dad, just how enormous is our new house? Hans, her loving father, enveloped her in a warm embrace, his eyes twinkling with delight. Oh my dear, it's beyond your wildest dreams. We have a sparkling swimming pool, a magnificent basketball court, a cozy library, and a sprawling yard where you can run and play to your heart's content. Darcy beamed with a radiant smile. But Daddy, is there a special room just for my toys? Hans nodded, his love for his daughter evident in his eyes. Sweetheart, you can have as many toys as your heart desires. It will be your very own wonderland. 
Beside them, Philomena pursed her lips into a smile. She thought that Hans was exaggerating, and she didn't want him to get Darcy's hopes up. Darcy was just a child after all. It seemed too good to be true. Almost like a fairy tale, the lavish house she described was exactly what she had always yearned for, but reality had a way of reminding her of its limitations. After all, the property prices in Los Angeles were exorbitant, far beyond their reach. Even if they were to stumble upon a massive windfall, it would still be a distant dream to afford such a luxurious house. But it didn't matter anymore. Filomino had learned the art of contentment, of finding joy in the simple pleasures of life. She knew that true happiness didn't lie in material possessions or grandeur. It resided in the love of her small family, in the laughter that echoed through their humble abode. As Hans led Filomino and Darcy toward the magnificent Rolls Royce, they saw a curious crowd of neighbors. Among them, a few individuals seemed to possess an uncanny knowledge about the car. Look at this beauty! This is undoubtedly the car of the esteemed Schimmel Company's boss! One person confidently proclaimed, And did you know this Rolls Royce isn't just gold-plated, it's also bulletproof? Another person chimed in. However, not everyone seemed convinced. A skeptic among the crowd questioned, I've never heard of a car so extravagantly expensive. Is the boss of the Schimmel Company truly that wealthy? With a hint of disdain, the commenter retorted, Oh, my dear friend, you have no idea about the market value of the Schimmel Company. To them, the price of this car is merely a drop in the bucket. Just then, a daring individual reached out and touched the car's surface. The commentator sneered, I strongly advise you to retract your hand. A mere rub of this gold could devalue the entire car. None of them noticed Hans approaching from behind. Hans, with a slight frown, commanded the crowd. Please make way, I want to get into my Rolls Royce. A familiar voice chimed in. Hey, isn't that Felix's son-in-law? The crowd erupted in laughter. You think this car is yours? Hans sneered. That's right, it's mine. Don't believe me? He propped his foot up on the car and tied his shoelaces. The neighbor's expressions changed from amusement to shock. Are you crazy? You stepped on the car? The real owner is going to be furious. If, if he scuffs it, he'll devalue it. Quick, take pictures and keep the evidence. You're dead for sure. You can't afford to pay the damages. Philomena was in disbelief. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. Her husband Hans was standing in front of a Rolls Royce, claiming it was theirs. She couldn't comprehend his motives. Hans, what are you doing? How could he be like this? This is a Rolls Royce, she exclaimed. But Hans was resolute. Honey, I said this car is ours. He reminded her. Philomino couldn't understand why Hans was lying to her. What had happened in the few days he'd been away? She cradled her head in her hands, trying to make sense of it all. Suddenly, their daughter Darcy tugged on Hans's sleeve. Daddy, is this car ours? Can I sit on top of it? She asked excitedly. Hans smiled and lifted his daughter. Sure thing, kiddo. Just don't fall, he warned. Darcy cheered and climbed on top of the car. But in her excitement, she left a deep footprint on the pristine surface. The neighbors couldn't believe what they were seeing. They thought the man standing before them was insane. But Hans didn't seem to care. He pressed a button on the key fob and opened the car door. He gently carried Darcy and placed her in the back seat. Come on, I want to show you our new house. Let's get a move on, he exclaimed. Philomino's jaw dropped as she gazed at the opulent, leather-clad interior of the car. It was so extravagant. Was this a dream? A mirage? It seemed too good to be true. Just as she was lost in her disbelief, a burst of laughter erupted from the crowd. Oh, come on! Philomino, your husband must have borrowed this car, right? It's probably just a rental. You're just trying to show off in front of us, your humble neighbors. Someone jeered, their voice dripping with skepticism. But before the doubt could settle in, another voice chimed in, refuting the claims. No way! This car is one of a kind, my friends. We already established this earlier. As the speculation continued, another neighbor couldn't help but let it, her imagination run wild. Maybe he stole it. We have a thief in our midst. She shouted, narrowing her eyes with suspicion. Suddenly, the sound of a roaring engine filled the air, and a sleek Mercedes-Benz pulled up. Out of the car emerged a man in his early 30s, full of energy and purpose. It was none other than Keegan, the son-in-law of one of the neighbors. A wistful sigh escaped a woman's lips as she watched Keegan with longing. Oh, how I wish my daughter could have found someone like him. Someone successful, ambitious, and driven. Unlike poor Philomito, my daughter still has time to find her special someone. In this neighborhood, where dreams and aspirations intertwined, they yearned for a life full of success and prosperity. Keegan was the most successful person who'd ever lived there. 
Keegan stepped forward, a look of despair in his eyes as he frantically shouted, Where's Hans? Hans was already inside the Rolls Royce and slowly driving down the road. Keegan whirled around to face his father-in-law. What gives? Did you offend the CEO of the Schimmel Company? I was just informed that I was fired. They said that my father-in-law was talking trash to my boss. His father-in-law was stunned. He never dreamed that Hans had been telling the truth. To be able to get his son-in-law fired with just a single sentence, how much energy would that require? That would ruin their whole family's reputation, not to mention decrease their status and income. Only now did the neighbors panic. They had poked a hornet's nest. Fortunately, it was not too late. Hans wasn't too far down the street. He had pulled over to help Darcy with her seatbelt. Keegan was well aware of Hans's identity. Since Hans regained his position as the boss of the Schimmel Company, the news had spread like wildfire within the office. Keegan, who was always seen as superior by the neighbors, straightened up when he saw Hans. He approached Hans' car and knocked on the window. Hans rolled it down and Keegan began to plead his case. Sir, it was my father-in-law who acted insensibly and offended you earlier. I beg of you, please be merciful. I've worked tirelessly for the company for so many years. Can you let me go, even if it means a salary reduction? The neighbors were stunned. Keegan, who they saw as high and mighty figure, was kneeling and begging for forgiveness from someone they considered a lowlife. It was a complete reversal of their perception. Hans remained silent but looked at the neighbors with contempt. Keegan understood that the person who needed to apologize was the one who had offended Hans, his father-in-law. Keegan's voice was venomous as he turned to his father-in-law and demanded, What's the holdup? Apologize to Hans already. You old jerk. Do you want me to lose my job? Let me tell you, if I lose my job, your daughter and your entire family will be left starving. The neighbor's face contorted into an ugly expression as he fell to his knees in front of Hans's car door. Please, can you spare my family? I had no idea who you were. If you want to fight or blame someone, blame me. If you want to hit someone, hit me. But I beg you, please don't let my son-in-law lose his job. The crowd that had just been mocking Hans stood there, mouths agape. It was clear as day that Hans came from an impressive background. Even a fool could see that. But what really blew their minds was when he confidently declared he was the owner of the Rolls Royce. And to top it all off, his last name was Schemmel. They thought he might be related to someone at the company, but they didn't think he would be the boss. Keegan's arrival added fuel to the fire of speculation. The shockwaves rippled through the crowd. The Schimmel Company, with a market value in the billion, was a name that resonated throughout Los Angeles. It was a force to be reckoned with, a titan at the top of the pyramid. Usually, the company was only seen in the evening news programs or society columns, a distant dream for most. But now here it was, right in front of their eyes. The mere presence of the Schimmel name sent waves of excitement and curiosity through the onlookers. Just as the commotion reached its peak, Hans's mother-in-law Gladys and father-in-law Felix arrived on the scene. Drawn by the buzz they witnessed from their front porch, they had no choice but to come and see what all the fuss was about. The atmosphere was already electric, and now it involved their son-in-law, the beggar-turned-enigma. How could they resist being part of this captivating spectacle? They noticed their neighbors with desperation in their eyes kneeling before Hans. It was a sight that seemed straight out of a dramatic movie. Curiosity peaked, Felix couldn't tear his eyes away from the unfolding drama. Hans, sitting comfortably in his luxurious Rolls Royce, seemed to hold all the power in the situation. The neighbors, realizing Felix's presence, turned to him with pleading eyes, desperately seeking his assistance. Please, Felix, you have to help us beg your son-in-law, one of them pleaded. Felix, taken aback by the sudden change in his neighbor's attitude, experienced a feeling of surprise and bewilderment. These were the same people who would usually sneer at him, but now they looked to him with envy and jealousy. It was a complete role reversal. Felix recalled a phone call he had overheard earlier between Hans and someone, where the words fired and son-in-law were mentioned. Could it be that Hans had truly fired his neighbor's son-in-law? The thought left Felix speechless. Finally finding his voice, Felix stammered, trying to make sense of the situation. You... you really fired him? You were telling the truth the whole time? He managed to ask. Hans, glancing at his father-in-law, nodded with a hint of satisfaction. I rehired him today out of respect for you. But let this be a warning. If he dares to cross me again, he'll face the consequences. In fact, that goes for all of you. With those words, Hans turned his attention to Keegan. Keegan, you will return to work tomorrow. I'll personally inform the relevant departments. Hans declared authoritatively. Keegan, feeling as if he had just been given a second chance, breathed a sigh of relief. It was as if he had been granted amnesty, escaping a fate that seemed inevitable just moments ago. Thank you. So much for your generosity, sir. 
I promise to do my best for the company in the future. Hans nodded curtly, then he stepped on the accelerator and left. In the car, the ones who were truly taken aback were Philomino and Darcy. Philomino couldn't resist running her fingers over the buttery leather seats. So, this car is really yours? Hans, with a mischievous glint in his eyes, replied, Not just mine. This car belongs to all of us. Darcy, her eyes widening in amazement, chimed in, Daddy, this is the coolest car I've ever seen. Our family has never owned a car before. Hans smiled at his daughter's excitement. He had always wanted to give her the life she deserved. He caught her gaze in the rearview mirror. When you grow up, my dear, this car will be yours. He chuckled. Of course, there's a long time until that happens. Philomino, trying to process everything, asked once more, her voice filled with curiosity. Then, just a moment ago, when Keegan called you boss, what, what does that mean? Hans's smile grew wider, a hint of pride shining through. It means that I'm the boss of the Schimmel Company. I've been trying to tell you all day, my love. Philomino just couldn't wrap her head around the idea. They'd been poor for so long. How had Hans left a few days and come back as one of the richest men in the city? She suddenly had some questions about his past, but she thought it would be better if she waited until they were alone to ask him about it. In a matter of moments, Hans found himself driving toward the magnificent mansion that he once called home. It had been under the possession of Gunther for some time, but now it was back in Hans's hands. There were many mansions in the neighborhood. However, there was no denying that the mansion belonging to the boss of the prestigious Schimmel Company was the grandest and most opulent. The car came to a halt at the entrance, and Hans gazed up at the enormous bronze door that stood before him. It was tightly locked, giving an air of exclusivity to the mansion that lay beyond. The sight of it was enough to make anyone feel as if they were standing before a palace. Hans turned to his family and declared, Well, my dear family, this will be our new home from now on. Darcy couldn't contain her excitement and let out a joyful laugh. Dad, I want to go inside and see the toy room in the swimming pool you talked about. She exclaimed eagerly. They got out of the car and locked the doors behind them. Darcy raised her small hand and confidently knocked on the bronze door. However, before she could even process what was happening, a child suddenly appeared from the backyard. With a scowl on his face, he pointed accusingly at Darcy and unleashed a barrage of insults. Where did you come from, you stinky beggar? Your whole body is dirty. Get the hell out of here. You're going to ruin our door. Darcy was surprised by the child's outburst, her fear evident in her eyes as she looked to her father for guidance. Confusion filled her mind. Wasn't this supposed to be their house? Who was this other child and why was he being so cruel? The encounter was a bit peculiar. Hans inquired, Excuse me, may I know who you are? The child stood tall and replied with pride, My father is Carlton, the chief steward of the Schimmel family. This is the Schimmel family's mansion. If you dare to knock again, I'll have the bodyguards arrest you. Hans spoke in a deep voice. Young man, I need to enter. I am Hans Schimmel. The child laughed evilly. Hans, I've heard of you. I thought Gunther kicked you out. Are you here to beg for money? You guys are disgusting. Darcy interjected. You're the gross one. Our last name is Schimmel. This house belongs to my father more than it belongs to you. The child's tiny fist flew through the air and connected with Darcy's face. Stinky loser, get lost, he shouted. But Darcy was no pushover. She had grown up in a rough neighborhood and knew how to handle herself in a fight. In no time at all, she had the child on the ground crying and defeated. But the chaos didn't end there. A middle-aged man appeared at the group of bodyguards. Hans recognized him immediately as Carlton, his family's old butler. Carlton had been a loyal supporter of Gunther and Bernadette. When they seized the throne, and he had put in a lot of effort to show his support. His expression changed dramatically when he saw Hans. Hans, what are you doing here? Are you here to steal something? Bodyguards, get rid of this family! Carlton blinked. Hans didn't flinch. A cold smile appeared in his face as he stared down his old butler. Carlton, you probably don't know this, but I am now the new CEO of the Schimmel Company, so I'm going to have to ask you to pack up your things and get the hell out of here. Hans stared down his old butler. Carlton, you probably didn't know this, but I am now the new CEO of the Schimmel Company, so I'm going to have to ask you to pack up your things and get the hell out of here. With a boisterous laugh, Carlton couldn't contain his amusement. Are you lost in a daydream? Did you just say that you've become the new CEO of the Schimmel Company? Hans challenged him. You don't believe me? Call your old boss Gunther. Carlton's anger flared. I don't need to ask for proof. A woman emerged from the house, clearly annoyed. What's with all the racket? 
Hans's face contorted into an ugly expression as he laid eyes on the woman. His fist clenched tightly, revealing a deep-seated resentment. Her name was Ingrid. Once upon a time, Hans was a notorious playboy, and Ingrid had been one of his many conquests. But she was more than just a fling. She was the woman he had loved the most. He had even planned to make her his wife. However, fate had other plans when Hans swooped in and stole her away. After Hans fell from grace, she wasted no time in dumping him and running straight into the arms of Gunther. What brings you here, Hans? Looking for a handout from Gunther? Ingrid eyed Philomeno and Darcy with disdain. Carlton, give this little beggar the stale cookies we bought last year and tell him to scram. Ingrid may have fallen out of love with Hans, but she certainly had lost her sharp tongue. Hans said, Ingrid, are you still cheap as before? Ingrid smiled proudly. What's wrong? You don't like cookies? She laughed wildly. Forget it. You don't deserve the cookies or anything else. Looking at your daughter, she must have grown up in the slums, right? I bet she's never had imported cookies before. Even moldy cookies are a luxury to her. Gunther is working late today. He won't take kindly to you darkening our doorstep. If he comes back and sees you, you'll regret it. You don't have to wait any longer, Hans said. Gunther won't come back. He's already been arrested. Inger's jaw dropped. Who are you trying to fool? Who wants to capture him? You? Do you have that ability? Hans remained calm. If you don't believe me, you can call him and see if he will answer or not. Ingrid's curiosity got the better of her. She reached down into her pocket and pulled out her phone, her fingers quivering slightly as she dialed Gunther's number. One ring. Two rings. Ten rings. But there was no answer. Panic began to creep into Ingrid's voice as she questioned. What's wrong with Gunther? Why didn't he answer his phone? Carlton also took out his phone and made a call. But just like Ingrid, he was met with silence on the other end. Hans wore a smug smile as he watched their futile attempts. Do you want to know why? Gunther was exposed and has been detained. Hans revealed, I'm the boss now. All the properties and shares under Gunther's name have been given to me, including this house. As Ingrid absorbed the shocking revelation, she couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Hans's confident gaze told her that his words were most likely true. Ingrid frantically dialed the number of the Schimmel Company's board members, but the response she received left her feeling utterly disappointed. The once submissive and respectful higher-ups were now cold and unresponsive. It was as if they were afraid to even speak to her. Hans now was in control of the company. Ingrid felt that she had fallen into an icy cave. Hans just smiled and asked, Do you still want to continue? No! Gunther must be with another woman! That's why he doesn't answer his phone! She kept trying to persuade herself, desperate to numb the pain of her disappointment. In Ingrid's heart, a battle was raging. She found herself grappling with the unthinkable. Everyone in their social circle knew about Gunther's infidelities. He had a reputation for having mistresses and treating the female employees of their company like trash. Ingrid had confronted him about it in the past, but her efforts were in vain. Gunther seemed immune to her pleas and continued to his reckless behavior. Eventually, Ingrid reached a point of resignation. She allowed Gunther to do as he pleased. She was willing to bear the burden of his indiscretions, as long as she could maintain her comfortable lifestyle. But now, with Gunther's capture and the possibility of Hans taking over the Schimmel Company, Ingrid's world was on the brink of collapse. I don't care what you do, now get the hell out of here. This house is now mine, Hans said menacingly. No, you can't go in before Gunther comes back. If you beggars dare to take another step into the yard, I will call the bodyguards to beat you to death. She shouted, trying to intimidate Hans. Hans stared at Ingrid, his eyes piercing through her. Suddenly, the sound of screeching tires filled the air as more than a dozen cars rushed over. A group of strong men jumped out of the cars and said fiercely, I heard that someone dares to steal from your house, and they are squatting here. We're not late, right? Hans nodded, relieved that his plan had worked. He had already sent a message to Bernadette on the way there, hoping that she would send reinforcements. At this time, Carlton also shouted, Someone come and stop them! Whoever dares to make a move, shoot! A swarm of bodyguards burst onto the scene. With their sheer numbers totaling between 20 to 30 men, they formed an impenetrable shield around Ingrid, ensuring her safety. But it just wasn't their sheer force that gave them an advantage. It was their firepower. Ingrid's men were armed to the teeth, ready to defend their leader at any cost. Ingrid's men were no pushovers. If a battle were to erupt, there was a real possibility that they could hold their own against Hans and his forces. And even if Hans emerged victorious, it wouldn't come without a heavy toll. 
Philomino and Darcy were gripped with fright. The sight of loaded guns poised to unleash their deadly firepower was enough to send shivers down their spines. Philomino, always timid by nature, couldn't bear the thought of Darcy getting caught in the crossfire. Hans, maybe we should leave, she suggested. But Hans, driven by an unwavering determination, shook his head. He couldn't back down now. Today was the day he would reclaim everything that rightfully belonged to him, no matter the cost. Just as Hans was on the verge of calling for more reinforcements, a sudden rush of dozens of cars came barreling toward them. The sight was both awe-inspiring and intimidating. As each person in the cars brandished weapons in their hands and had additional weapons strapped to their waist, it was clear that they meant business. As the leader of the group stepped out of one of the cars, he approached Hans with a warm greeting. It turned out that Bernadette, the mastermind behind this operation, had foreseen the need for additional support and had called for backup. Hans felt a surge of confidence as he realized that not only did he now have significant advantage in numbers, but also possessed superior firepower compared to Ingrid. Carlton nudged one of his men and whispered, We still have the advantage of knowing the area better than they do. No matter what, we must prioritize our safety and Ingrid's above all else. The head of the bodyguards nodded in agreement. Despite the overwhelming power and numbers of Hans and his men, they believed that their knowledge of the terrain and other advantages would be enough to withstand any attacks. But their confidence was short-lived, as more cars soon arrived. The situation was rapidly escalating, and this confrontation was far from over. In a mere 30 minutes, a crowd of over 100 people had gathered outside the Schimmel Mansion, creating an inescapable net that seemed to stretch in all directions. The once confident face of the head bodyguard had transformed into one of sheer panic. The other bodyguards, armed with guns, were trembling uncontrollably. They were even contemplating running away as soon as they opened fire. Ingrid's face had turned ghostly pale, her teeth audibly chattering as she turned to Carlton for guidance. What? What should we do? She stammered. Carlton himself was no stranger to fear, and at this moment, he was truly terrified. Hans's power far exceeded his expectations, leaving him shaken to his core. However, the one thing that managed to calm Carlton down was the imminent arrival of the police. The sound of sirens filled the air. To his surprise, the person leading the police force was none other than the deputy chief of the police department, a figure only second to the chief himself. The deputy happened to have a close relationship with Carlton. As Carlton's eyes landed on the deputy chief leading the team, a wave of relief washed over him, causing a smile to bloom on his face. Thank goodness you're here, he exclaimed. Los Angeles has turned into a lawless place. I fear these gangsters will barge in and rob the mansion. Ingrid nodded fervently, her eyes filled with desperation. Please, we need your help to catch these gangsters, especially him. She pointed accusingly at Hans. He's the ringleader, believe it or not. He used to be a beggar, but now he's joined forces with the gangs to steal our property. If you help me catch him, I promise you'll receive a generous reward. The deputy chief turned to face Hans, a knowing smile playing on his lips. Mr. Schimmel. You were the one who called our police department to report a theft at your house, weren't you? Hans could only guess that Bernadette had assisted him in making the call. The deputy chief of police gave a reassuring nod to Hans and spoke with conviction. Private property is sacred and invaluable. We, the police, will enforce the law impartially. Then he turned to Ingrid and asked, Just now we heard that a group of robbers snuck into his house. Was that you? Ingrid scowled. He was accusing her of being a robber. Quickly, Carlton came to her defense and clarified that they were the victims and had called the police for help. He even pointed out that they were in Gunther's house and that Ingrid was Gunther's wife. However, the officer was not swayed by their explanation. He shook his head and said, I don't care about who's buried to whom. The problem is, is that this is indeed Mr. Hans Schimmel's house. You are the ones who occupied Hans's house. You need to get off his property. Ingrid's eyes welled up with tears, her heart heavy with despair. She knew she had to clear the air and set things right. There's been a misunderstanding. My husband is Gunther. He's the boss of the Schimmel Company, and this house belongs to him. She looked at the officer, hoping he would understand. As for this guy, he's a thief. You should drive him away instead of chasing us away. So, you're saying you're not leaving? The officer asked, his tone accusatory. Ingrid and Carlton exchanged worried glances. They knew they were in trouble. The situation was getting worse by the minute. Ingrid! Do you still have a fantasy that Gunther will come back and save you? Hans taunted. Ingrid didn't say anything, but her expression told Hans that she still had hope. How could Gunther, who was backed by Silas, fall so easily? Hans handed his phone to Ingrid, showing her a video. Ingrid's heart sank as she watched Gunther confessing to his crimes. 
Her last hope was shattered. She wiped away her tears and stood tall, her eyes blazing with defiance. I'm not leaving, she said firmly. This is my house and I won't let anyone take it away from me. With a swift push, Han sent Ingrid stumbling backward. He marched into his house with his head held high, exuding an air of superiority. Ingrid was left speechless, but Carlton wasn't about to let Hans get away with his rude behavior. You can't go in, he said firmly, blocking Hans' path. Hans rolled his eyes and delivered a fierce slap to Carlton's face. Stop him, Carlton shouted, hoping the group of bodyguards had come to his aid. However, the bodyguards hesitated. They looked at each other, then at the menacing group of thugs that surrounded the mansion. They lowered their heads, unwilling to confront the danger that lay ahead. Meanwhile, Ingrid was frozen in place. She knew she couldn't run, even if she wanted to. She had no money in her pocket, and Gunther, the man she had followed for years, was as stingy as they come. Ingrid's pockets were effectively empty. Ingrid's eyes widened as she watched Hans pull Philomena and her daughter Darcy, who was covered in dirt, into the Grand Mansion. Hans had resolved the matter and now was feeling generous. He instructed his subordinates to go to the Schimmel Company's luxurious hotel and open a table, with all expenses paid for the day. The lackeys left with smiles on their faces. Hans turned to Philomino and said, From now on, this will be our home. Philomino was speechless, holding onto Darcy's hand tightly as she looked around in disbelief. The mansion was huge and magnificent, with exquisite furniture and spotless marble. The opulence of the place was breathtaking. The maids' dress and uniforms bowed slightly as they saw Philomino their faces fawning with smiles. They were afraid of her, as if she had the power to fire them at any moment. Darcy ran around the house, her eyes wide with wonder. She had never seen such exquisite things before. Unfortunately, she stumbled and fell, much to the surprise of Philomino and Hans. Before they could even react, the household staff sprang into action, rushing toward Darcy like a constellation of stars surrounding the moon. They showered her with attention, eagerly helping her up and tending to her every need. One concerned individual even took time to rub Darcy's knee, worried that she may have broken a bone. They treated Darcy like the new spoiled child of the house, going above and beyond to ensure her well-being. Philomino stood there, mouth agape, unable to believe her eyes. She had never imagined that her daughter would be treated like royalty. In the past, Philomino had lived in a run-down public house, scraping by the lowest rung of society. Now here she was, witnessing the extraordinary care and attention bestowed upon her daughter. Once upon a time, Philomino resided in a dilapidated house, surrounded by individuals who considered the lowest rung of society. Merely becoming a servant seemed like an extravagant aspiration for her. Yet, in a sudden twist of fate, she found herself elevated to the position of mistress among these very people. And to add to the astonishment, Darcy, who was once a little girl playing in the mud, now had her school fees covered. All this miraculous transformation was thanks to Philomino's husband, Hans. Hans beamed at his wife, Downstairs, there's a park waiting for us to explore. Just a 10-minute walk away, and we can feast our eyes upon the majestic sea. And right here in the city, we have the finest private school where Darcy can enroll. Plus, with our car, it'll be a breeze for you to pick her up. He continued, his smile growing wider. We can even invite the private tutors to our home, ensuring Darcy receives the best education. And if you ever fall ill, the best doctors will be just a phone call away, ready to provide their expertise. Oh, and let's not forget the breathtaking view of Los Angeles from our balcony. Philomino stood there, her mind racing to comprehend the magnitude of her newfound reality. Even in her wildest dreams, she could never have imagined a fraction of what was unfolding before her eyes. Countless surprises are waiting for you in this magnificent place. I'm also happy to call an interior designer if you don't like the decor, Hans said. Philomino, holding Darcy's hand, set out to explore the house. Just as Hans was about to join them, his attention was abruptly diverted by a sharp tug in his sleeve. He turned around to find Ingrid. Uh, Ans, I have something important to say to you. Ingrid stammered, her voice quivering slightly. Hans calmly retrieved a cigarette from his pocket and lit it, his eyes fixed on Ingrid. He knew this conversation would be anything but ordinary. Ingrid glanced at Philomino's back. Is this country woman your wife now? And that sovereignly child your daughter? Ingrid continued, oblivious to the brewing storm. I was forced into a loveless marriage with Gunther. I despise him. Hans, you know how difficult it is for a woman without anyone to rely on, to protect herself, and and I love you with all my heart. I was wrong, Hans. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? If you wish, I could still be yours. Hans looked at Ingrid's innocent and longing expression. 
do you still think I need you? He asked, crossing his arms. Ingrid nodded vigorously. Of course, you need me more than ever. Look at your wife now. She's so plain and unremarkable. What can compare to me? I have the looks, the talent, the ability to give you many beautiful children. Our offspring will be a hundred times better looking and smarter than your first child. Hans raised an eyebrow. Ingrid, you can't talk about my family like that. And besides, you're mistaken. I don't need you to make me happy. Ingrid's face fell, realizing she had said the wrong thing. Hans, I didn't mean it like that. I just want to show you that we could have an amazing future together. Hans shook his head. You must be joking. Why on earth would I leave the people who stood by me all these years for a woman who dumped me for my brother as soon as I lost my money? You're just a gold digger. Ingrid's tears cascaded down her cheeks. Hans, please, can't you remember how we used to be? The love we shared was so intense, so passionate. You cried and begged me not to leave, and now I've returned. I've blossomed into a woman who is even more captivating, more alluring than your current wife. I promise to do anything and everything to make you happy. But before she could finish her flea, Hans's hand came crashing down in her face, the force knocking her to the ground. Meanwhile, Philomino and Darcy were enjoying their tour of the magnificent estate until the sound of a slap echoed through the air. Concerned, they rushed out. Philomino frowned when she took in the scene. Hans, what's going on out here? Hans waved his hand. Oh, don't worry, my dear. Ingrid and I were just having a little chat. Now, let's focus on more important matters. Are you satisfied with the house? Do you still love it? Darcy's eyes lit up with excitement as she jumped up and down. Dad, I adore it! This is the biggest and most beautiful house I've ever seen! Finally, we can fill it all with the toys I've dreamed of having! Philomena was at a loss for words. A sense of unease began to crep over her, as if the ground beneath her was shifting. She thought she knew her husband inside and out. But this revelation was simply too shocking to process. Who was he? Philomena had never paid much attention to financial news, nor did she have any idea about the value of the company or the extent of her husband's wealth. But as she glanced around her mansion and considered the exorbitant housing prices in Los Angeles, it became clear that her husband's worth was nothing short of extraordinary. She studied Hans, her eyes tracing his every movement. Gone were the days of toiling away at construction sites, his back hunched over and his spirit crushed. Now he exuded an air of nobility, his head held high with confidence. And then there was Philomino herself. She couldn't ignore that she was dressed in clothes from a thrift store, her socks riddled with holes. When she caught a glimpse of her reflection in the mirror, she felt a pang of insecurity. A nagging doubt crept in. How could she ensure that her husband wouldn't be tempted by others in the future? The thought consumed her, leaving her even more worried and unhappy than before. Hans noticed that something was off with Philomino. What's on your mind? Is there something bothering you? Please tell me. Philomino shook her head and replied, No, it's nothing. Suddenly, Ingrid burst out and spoke in a stern tone, you ugly monster! I know what's going on in your head. You're scared of losing Hans. But you know deep down that he'll leave you eventually, don't you? Let me be honest. You and Hans will never work. He even wanted to marry me before. Everything should be mine. If you have any self-respect, you should leave now. Philomena looked at Hans, her worst fears confirmed. Hans, is this true? Hans didn't say a word. Instead, he slapped Ingrid so hard that she almost flew off her feet. You despicable woman! If I ever hear you insult my wife and daughter again, I won't hesitate to have you killed. Hans, how can you be so heartless? Ingrid's voice quivered, but Hans couldn't be bothered to listen to Ingrid's pleas any longer. With a dismissive wave of his hand, he signaled to his two henchmen, who promptly grabbed Ingrid and forcibly threw her out. Hans's gaze shifted to Carlton. He remembered when he was humiliated and chased away by Gunther and his cronies. Carlton had been one of those accomplices, adding insult to injury by ordering his expulsion from the mansion. But now the tables had turned. He stared at Carlton. No words were necessary to convey the message of retribution. Caught in the grip of Hans's icy gaze, beads of sweat formed on Carlton's back, a physical manifestation of his mounting anxiety. I was wrong back then. Please spare me. Hans, enjoying the power he held over Carlton, responded, Slap yourself first. Carlton hesitated for a second before raising his hand and delivering a slap to his own face. Hans, satisfied with the display of submission, declared, Let's proceed to the next step. Hans placed his foot on Carlton's face, a wicked smile playing on his lips. You betrayed me in the past, and you owe me a debt of blood. Do you honestly think I would let you escape so easily? I've spent years at the bottom of society, and it has taught me a valuable lesson. I can't afford to be soft-hearted. 
and when it comes to my enemies, I must repay them tenfold. Hans forcefully stomped on Carlton's leg, causing a series of bone-cracking noises to echo through the air. No one dared to utter a word, not even Philomeno. She had witnessed far too much suffering and cruelty, and had grown all too familiar with the dark side of human nature. She understood that unless one had experienced the pain and torment that others endured, it was not her place to preach about kindness. Carlton mustered the courage to speak. Hans, have you let go of your anger now? Hans, with a cold and callous tone, responded. Are your ears malfunctioning, Carlton? Didn't you hear what I just said? As I mentioned before, I will repay our enemy tenfold. A cry of anguish escaped Carlton's lips as Hans proceeded to break his finger. The pain was unbearable, yet Hans showed no signs of stopping. With even more force, he shattered Carlton's other finger. In a feeble attempt to appeal to Hans' humanity, Carlton invoked the well-being of his family, particularly his young son who stood nearby, witnessing the unfolding horror. The child ran over and clung tightly to his father, tears streaming down his face as he implored Hans to release his beloved dad. Just as Hans contemplated his next move, Darcy unexpectedly rushed to the scene. With a voice filled with innocence and sincerity, she pleaded with her father to let Carlton and his son go. Please, Dad, he shared his toys with me earlier. The battle between Hans' bloodlust and his love for his daughter raged within him. And against all odds, love emerged victorious. Hans' heart softened and his anger dissipating like a passing storm. Seizing this unexpected opportunity, Carlton saw a chance at redemption. I can still be of use to you. Was it worth it? Hans asked. Carlton bit his lip. I hold the keys to the Von Heck family secrets. I can help you if you want to take them down. Hans was pleased with this development. Well, consider yourself spared. But for now, get out of my sight. As the maids busied themselves with preparing dinner, Carlton hurried off to the hospital to tend to his injured finger. Curiosity gained the better of her, Philomino turned to Hans and inquired about the unfolding situation. And so, Hans proceeded to recount every detail of what had transpired. Their dinner was interrupted by a phone call. Philomena's father, Felix, was on the other end of the line, his voice filled with panic and confusion. Daughter, where are you? I've been knocking on your door for ages, but there's no one there. It turned out that Felix had gone to their old house. Philomena replied, I'm... I'm at our new house. Felix's tone held a hint of annoyance. Where's your new house? How on earth did you manage to keep it a secret from your mother and me? Why didn't you buy a house without even informing me? Philomino's eyes shifted toward Hans. Everything in this space belonged to him, and only with his approval would she dare to bring her parents here. Sensing her hesitation, Hans took Philomino's phone and spoke with determination. If you want to come, then come. You wait there. Philomino and I will come to pick you up. As they drove, Philomino bit her lip. Hans, are you still holding a grudge against my parents for how they treated you in the past? If you don't want them to come, I can tell them to stay away. Hans shook his head gently. I still have to thank your parents. Philomino's eyes widened in surprise. Why would you thank them? Hans smiled warmly and said, Because they brought the most incredible woman into this world. A blush spread across Philomino's face. She thought this was the most heartfelt declaration of love she had ever heard in her life. Hans cruised through the streets in an inconspicuous car, leaving behind the austatious Rolls Royce that could attract unwanted attention. When Gladys's eyes fell upon Hans' modest vehicle, she let out a disdainful snort. Well, 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 it doesn't seem to be as luxurious as you made it out to be. Felix had previously boasted to Gladys about Hans' gold-plated Rolls Royce, and she had greedily anticipated the chance to experience it for herself. As Gladys reluctantly climbed into the car, she launched into a barrage of questions and comments. When did you buy a house? Why didn't you bother telling your parents? How many square feet is your house? Why won't you let your brother live with you? Philomena's face scrunched in frustration. Mom, the house isn't mine, she said exasperated. It belongs to Hans. No matter how big this house is, it has nothing to do with me. Also, Hans risked his life for this house. Why would I share it with my brother Pierre? Don't you have a heart? Gladys retorted. Gladys, if you want me to give the house to Pierre, it won't be a problem. Hans said with a smile. But all the daily household expenses have to be borne by him. The water, electricity, labor cost, everything. Gladys was overjoyed at the prospect of her son inheriting such a grand estate. Okay, then that's it, she exclaimed. Pierre now earns close to 50 grand a year. That'll be enough, won't it? Philomino knew better. She knew that the upkeep of such a mansion was no small feat. With dozens of bodyguards and maids on staff, the yearly expenses would far exceed her brother's income. But Philomino kept her thoughts to herself. 
she knew that once her mother saw the house, she would eat her words. The car pulled up to the Schimmel mansion. The moment they stepped out of the car, a uniformed maid rushed over to open up the door, addressing Hans as master with utmost respect. Gladys gawked at the grandeur of the mansion. As they walked through the courtyard, Gladys frowned. Philomena, where are we? Is this a palace? Where's the house you bought? Is it an apartment hidden in here? This isn't just a house. Look at this courtyard. It's all a cluster of houses. Gladys' excitement soared to new heights. How could any mother-in-law resist bursting into laughter upon discovering that her son-in-law was bona fide millionaire? It was like winning the lottery, but better. Suddenly, all their worries about necessities like food, clothing, and money vanished into thin air. Suddenly, Hans's phone rang. Damon was calling. Hans's phone rang. He took out his phone and saw that it was Damon. Have you settled all the family matters? Damon asked. Hans confirmed. Yes, I've dealt with what needed to be dealt with. Damon nodded. Okay, are you free tomorrow morning? If so, come with me to find Von Heck family. Bring your butler, Carlton. Hans agreed, and they set a plan. The next morning, Damon brought Hans to the Von Heck family's residence. But just as they were driving down the street near the park, a symphony of rustling leaves and deafening sounds of gunfire shattered the peace. There's an ambush! Hans exclaimed. Damon remained cool and collected. Don't worry, I expected this. And just like a scene from an action movie, a fleet of cars emerged from every direction. Encircling the woods, Axel took charge while Brindedead, the backbone of the team, fiercely charged into the woods armed with heavy firepower. The air was thick with tension as the sound of concentrated gunshots echoed through the trees. But soon, silence fell upon the scene, and the once life-threatening ambush was swiftly subdued by Axel and his skilled men. Bernadette ran back to the car and got in, still visibly shaking. Hans turned to Damon and asked, Where did all these people come from? Damon replied, Of course it was Silas. From the moment, Damon helped Bernadette and Hans seize power. He knew that his whereabouts and plans were exposed. It was only a matter of time before Silas would try to take him out. But Damon wasn't afraid. He was ready to face his cousin. He was determined to make Silas pay for everything he'd done, including betraying Robert and Nancy. They suddenly felt a violent shake. The car was hit with a force so strong that it lifted the entire vehicle off the ground. Damon's expression turned serious as he soon realized that the external force was too great. The roof of the car was torn apart and a man dressed in black appeared, holding the roof in his hand. Hans and Bernadette were stunned. The car was a bulletproof Rolls Royce, yet it had been damaged so severely. They couldn't believe the amount of power that was needed to cause such destruction. Damon whispered, Nobody moves. He's the one who tried to kill me. Those people who just emerged from the woods were merely a distraction to lure out security forces away, so they could deal with us. Hans whispered back, What do we do now? How are we going to deal with him? Damon's face broke into a mischievous smile, his eyes gleaming with determination. Let's go find Kyle. There's someone here who's ready to take on the man in black. Bernadette frowned. Who could it be? Suddenly, a breathtaking figure materialized before them. It was Avery. Damon, you guys go. I've got this. Avery declared confidently. Bernadette's jaw dropped in awe at the sight of the stunning Avery. She couldn't help but blurt out in disbelief. Her? What could she possibly do? Bernadette thought Damon was playing a prank on them, but Damon nodded earnestly. That's right. Let's not waste any time. She's more than capable of handling everything. Hans chimed in, a hint of concern in his voice. Should we call for backup just in case? He found it slightly comical that Avery, despite her undeniable beauty, would be facing off against such a formidable opponent. The difference in size and strength was simply too vast. But little did they know, Avery possessed a hidden power. The devil they had feared, the one they believed would triumph, was easily defeated by Avery with just one blow. The sight of fresh blood flowing along the road onto the ground left Hans and Bernadette in awe. They couldn't believe it. A single hit and it was over. But amidst their shock, Bernadette couldn't shake off the chill running down her spine. She suddenly remembered how she had provoked Damon in the past. Now it seemed like she had been tempting fate, flirting with death. Damon led Hans and Bernadette to meet the Von Heck family. This wasn't their first encounter. Damon had visited them years ago to confront Will, but that meeting had been far from smooth. As Damon made his entrance into the Von Heck family home, Lara's face twisted into an expression of pure disdain. There was no beating around the bush for Damon when it came to confronting Kyle and Lara. 
He didn't waste any time and got straight to the point. So, what do you say? Well, the Von Heck family joined forces with me to take down Silas. I've done my research, and I know your family has been through some tough times lately. Before Kyle could even utter a word, Lara interjected with a sharp retort. Why on earth would I join forces with you to deal with Silas? Damon, your time has come and gone. Your parents' fate is a mystery, and Silas is the one calling the shots at the Brokerton group. What can you possibly offer the Van Heck family when you have nothing? What did you bring to the table? Then she shifted her accusatory gaze towards Bernadette. And you, Bernadette, you have no shame. Silas has treated you well all of these years. When your father was incapacitated, it was Silas who helped you manage the internal affairs. Without him, would you have been able to hold onto your power? Bernadette's voice shook with anger. Silas was the one who tried to kill my father. If it wasn't for Damon, I would have never known the truth. Lara's face twisted into a disbelieving smile. Bernadette, have you lost your mind? Are you willing to believe this nonsense over trusting Silas? Just because Damon said so, you really don't know what's best for you. Damon, unfazed by Lara's attempt to provoke him, turned his attention to Kyle. Kyle, do you still want to join forces with Silas, or would you rather work with me? Kyle furrowed his brows, clearly skeptical. He questioned Damon. If I choose to work with you, what's in it for me? Damon's smile grew wider as he responded. It may not seem like much, but I can guarantee that your company will be returned to your control. No longer will you be a mere puppet, like you are now. Kyle's expression shifted, curiosity mingling with caution. What do you mean by that? Damon's voice took on a darker tone, a hint of menace creeping in. You know exactly what I mean. And let me tell you, I can be a gentleman. But when I become a villain, I am far more ruthless than Silas. If you choose not to work with me, your company will crumble before your eyes. Kyle crossed his arms. Are you trying to threaten me? Damon nodded. Absolutely. Consider it a warning. If you refuse to cooperate, I guarantee that you and your precious family will be utterly destroyed. Kyle's intense gaze locked onto Damon, his silence pregnant with anticipation. It was as if he was weighing the gravity of Damon's words, trying to decipher their true meaning. But amidst this tense exchange, Lara's discontent simmered, threatening to boil over. No, she was not just unhappy, she was furious. Who did Damon think he was? A mere nobody, with no family or connections to speak of. And who was her brother, Kyle? He now held the reins of the Von Heck family's vast fortune. How dare Damon have the audacity to threaten Lara's big brother in their own house? Did he truly believe that the Von Heck family would be so easily pushed around? Lara's anger surged within her, fueling her words. Damon, who do you think you are? How dare you presume to give orders to the Von Heck family? Get lost! Damon ignored Lara's outburst. I've done my research, Kyle. Despite being the face of the Von Heck family's corporation, you hold no real power. The profits slip through your fingers, and your lack of authority to make any significant decisions. The true puppeteer behind the scenes is Silas. However, if you choose to cooperate with me, I promise you the chance to reclaim control of the group. No longer will you be held back by Silas or even your sister, who seems to be aiding Silas from within. His little sister a traitor. This was the revelation that had haunted Kyle for years. The Von Heck family had kept this dark secret hidden from the world, and only a select few were aware of it. So how did Damon, of all people, know about it so clearly? It was a testament to his intelligence work, proving that he was far from useless, as Laura had claimed. Could it be that Damon had a spy within the Von Heck family's company? Laura erupted in a fit of rage. She lunged toward Damon, ready to unleash her fury upon him. But before she could reach him, Bernadette swiftly intervened, standing in her way. With a swift motion, Bernadette's hand connected with Lara's cheek, the sound of the slap echoing through the room. Lara, overwhelmed by the humiliation she had never experienced before, burst into tears. You witch! Bernadette, how dare you strike me! I'll fight you to the death! Someone help me! Two imposing bodyguards burst into the room. Hans swiftly rose from his seat and brandished his gun, his eyes locked into the intruders. Not to be outdone, the two bodyguards confidently placed their hands on their waist, ready to strike at any given moment. But before the situation could escalate any further, Kyle intervened. Enough, he exclaimed. Lara, feeling unjustly treated, spoke up, her voice filled with hurt. Brother, can't you see how Bernadette attacked me? Aren't you going to defend your own flesh and blood? Shut up! Kyle's stern command silenced Lara. 
her discontent evident in her reluctant return to her seat. Damon, observing the exchange, nodded approvingly at Hans, signaling him to holster his weapon. The room breathed a collective sigh of relief. Kyle addressed Damon. If you want me to consider joining your cause, this is not the way to go about it. We must have a complete transparency and trust among ourselves. Furthermore, you lack the necessary leverage to convince me to align with you. In my eyes, you are not on the same level as Silas. Damon made eye contact with Hans. Sensing the need for assistance, Hans made a phone call. Within moments, Carlton arrived at the scene, ready to lend his support. As Kyle laid eyes on Carlton, his face contorted into an ugly expression. Carlton held a treasure trove of secrets about the prestigious Von Heck family. But what Carlton didn't anticipate was being captured by Hans. And now with his release, it meant that Damon and Hans had full control over the Von Heck family's secrets. This revelation would undoubtedly deal a devastating blow to the family's reputation. Kyle's mind raced, desperately searching for a way to counter this unexpected turn of events. Lara gritted her teeth and defiantly declared, Don't think that some lowlife like you can threaten us! Damon responded, Oh, is that so? Well, it seems I still have some news to share with you all. With those words, Damon pulled out his phone and dialed a number. Let the games begin! Not long after, Kyle's phone rang. He quickly picked it up, only to be met with the urgent voice of his secretary in the other end. The words spilled out in a rush, each one more alarming than the last. It's not good, Mr. Van Heck. I don't know why, but our clients are pulling out and our company's share price instantly plummeted. It's over, it's over, it's over! She exclaimed, her voice filled with panic. We just received news that several influential media outlets are reporting on our group's negative news. There are no signs at all. It must be someone trying to sabotage our company. You better investigate what's going on. Kyle's heart raced as he tried to process the devastating news. How could everything have gone so wrong in such a short amount of time? The future of their company hung in the balance, and it seemed like someone was determined to bring them down. Unable to bear listening to any more of the staff members' words, Kyle hung up the phone. He stared intently at Damon. Do you believe me now, Kyle? Damon taunted. Of course, if you need more convincing. We can keep playing, but I guarantee you I can completely destroy your company. Kyle had anticipated Damon's visit today, but he never expected him to be so well prepared. If Kyle didn't agree to Damon's demands, the share price would continue to plummet. The pressure was mounting and Kyle could feel the cold sweat trickling down his back. But what truly shook Kyle to his core was the realization that Damon's strength had only grown stronger over the past six years. What kind of opponent was he dealing with? Kyle bowed his head, but not out of submission to Damon. He had his own burdens weighing on him. To Kyle's surprise, Damon seemed to have already unraveled Kyle's deepest concerns. I understand your struggles, Kyle. Your parents, are they afflicted by a mysterious illness? Do they require Silas' treatment regularly? I can offer you a solution to all of this. Kyle's expression shifted, his emotions fluctuating with each word that escaped Damon's lips. It was as if Damon had a direct line to the Von Heck family's secrets. With a hesitant nod, Kyle said, Yes, it's true. My parents are suffering from a strange disease. Without Silas's help, their lives would be in grave danger. He is the one who saved our family from certain doom. He's the one who can help us. When Silas came into his life, everything changed. Silas had saved Kyle's parents' lives, and Kyle felt indebted to him. So when Silas asked him to betray the Von Heck family's interest, Kyle couldn't say no. But little did Kyle know, Silas had a bigger plan in mind. He was going to take down all the tycoons, and he was using Kyle as a pawn in his game. Damon smirked. Have you ever stopped to wonder why he's the only one who can give your family medical treatment? He saved your life just to poison you, and then control you. Kyle was shocked. He had no idea that Silas had such a sinister plan. But it was too late now. He was already in too deep. Damon chuckled. You still don't understand what I mean. You still don't get it, do you? Damon said to Kyle. Kyle's expression shifted. Are you seriously suggesting that Silas is behind all of this? He asked. Lara's voice rose. Damon, you're spouting nonsense. Silas is a gentleman. He would never stoop so low. But you... You've been nothing but trouble for our family, threatening us and manipulating our company's shares. Your true intentions are crystal clear. It's only natural for you to defend Silas. It seems like you've been poisoned too. Damon remarked. Lara scoffed. 
poisoned? What on earth are you talking about? If anyone's been poisoned, it's you. Bernadette furrowed her brow. Could it be that Lara and I have been afflicted by the same poison? She pondered aloud. Damon clapped his hands. Exactly. The symptoms you both are experiencing are identical. Bernadette's eyes widened in realization. Suddenly, everything made sense. She had always found it strange how both she and Lara had developed feelings for Silas, despite their initial dislike for him. It was as if they had been under some sort of spell. At that moment, Bernadette couldn't help but feel a twinge of sympathy for Lara. She had unknowingly become a pawn in Silas's game, just like Bernadette herself. But Lara remained oblivious to the truth. Damon leaned in closer to Kyle. Have you ever stopped to wonder why your sister hangs on Silas's every word? Well, she likes Silas, so it's only natural for her to listen to him. Kyle replied with a shrug. Damon nodded. You're right, my friend. But there has never been a woman so infatuated that she would betray her own family for the sake of simple love. Damon's hand shot out and gripped Lara's arm. Startled, she let out a scream. What are you doing? She cried. With a swift and gentle tap on the back of Lara's neck, Damon rendered her completely limp. Kyle watched in shock as his sister's body went slack. Kyle, if you trust me, then stay silent. I promise I won't harm your sister. Damon assured him. For some inexplicable reason, Kyle found himself believing in Damon's words. It was as if there was an unspoken understanding between them, and if he were to resist, he knew deep down that it would be futile. Damon nodded approvingly, satisfied with Kyle's compliance. He proceeded to use the same method he had used on Bernadette, applying it to Lara without hesitation. In an instant, squirming worms wriggled their way out of her nose. What on earth is happening? Kyle cried. Bernadette, standing by his side, took a deep breath and began to explain. There is this infamous love potion. Silas used the very same concoction on me, manipulating my every move and controlling my mind. Suddenly, it all clicked for Kyle. He vividly remembered how Bernadette had been under Silas' spell, obediently following his commands. Whether it was what she ate, what she wore, or even attempting to take down Hans and Damon, she had acted against her own will, all because of Silas' twisted influence. No wonder Bernadette and Hans found themselves at the same side urging him to confront Silas together. If Kyle had any lingering doubts about Damon, they were instantly erased. With a forceful slap, Damon struck Lara's chest, causing her to cough up a dark, ominous liquid. But Damon wasn't finished yet. He proceeded to press on Lara's acupuncture points, bringing her body to a state of relaxation and restoring her ability to fight back. In a defiant gesture, Lara raised her hand, ready to strike Damon across the face but Damon swiftly intercepted her attack. Stop, he commanded. I'm saving you, and this is how you repay my kindness? With ingratitude? Lara retorted, I'm not sick. Who asked you for your help in the first place? Damon's finger pointed with intensity at the insect crawling on the ground. Take a good look at this vile creature. This is the poison vector that Silas implanted inside of you. What do you have to say for yourself now? Lara's gaze fixated on the lifeless, repulsive insect before her. Fear danced in her eyes, causing goosebumps to rise all over her body. Kyle, is this... is this what came out of me just now? Kyle's solemn nod only deepened Lara's terror. She shielded her eyes. Damon seized the moment. Now think about it. Do you still believe Silas was right about all the terrible things he wanted you to do? Lara's confusion was evident in her eyes as she processed Damon's words. Her body quivered, a mixture of fear and disgust contorting her features. Though she couldn't recall the exact details of what had happened under Silas's control, her expression spoke volumes about the unpleasantness she had endured. After a few moments, she slowly nodded. That despicable Silas attacked me. I won't let him get away with it. Kyle put a hand on his sister's shoulder. Lara, what on earth did that despicable Silas do to you? Lara's eyes filled with sadness as she shook her head, refusing to answer. Instead, she turned to Damon. Damon, please, can you help my parents? They attended the same banquet a few years ago and ended up being infected too. It was at that very banquet that Lara's perception of Silas began to shift. She found herself unusually drawn to him, her feelings growing stronger with each passing day. Lara could never have fathomed that Silas had played a part in her suffering. Bernadette had also been present at the banquet. It must have all started at that fateful event. Damon, understanding the gravity of the situation, nodded emphatically. Lead the way. 
I will do everything in my power to help your parents. Kyle rose from his seat and declared, If you can cure my parents, I will be forever indebted to your incredible kindness. Kyle and Laura led Damon to their parents. As they strolled along, Kyle animatedly shared his stories about his parents, painting a vivid picture of their lives before the illness struck. In those days, their mental state was vibrant and their spirits were high. However, once sickness took hold, their comfort was replaced by an unbearable discomfort. It was then that Silas, with his odd knack for knowing what was wrong with them, became their lifeline. Initially, Kyle dismissed Silas as someone taking advantage of the situation, but as he watched his parents' lives hang in the balance, and with his sister's unwavering support of Silas, Kyle couldn't help but put his trust in him. Reflecting on it now, Kyle realized that only Silas possessed a bag of tricks that seemed to work wonders when his parents were in pain. It all seemed so suspicious now. Upon reaching their destination, Kyle and Damon were greeted by the sight of his parents in surprisingly good spirits. The elderly couple was busy tending to a beautiful array of flowers and plants in the courtyard. When Kyle and Laura finally arrived, their parents couldn't contain their joy. It was as if a burst of sunshine had entered their lives. Gathering everyone around, they led the way to their bountiful garden, ready to whip up a feast using their freshest produce. After the meal, Damon placed his hand on the old man's pulse, carefully observed, and analyzed the situation. And then, like a detective solving a mystery, Damon deduced, Yes, it's poison, but not the kind of poison that affects the heart, or that manipulates and controls a person's pain. Kyle's family gasped in disbelief. Lara's revelation that she too had fallen victim to the love potion administered by Silas only intensified their worry. The two elders were deeply troubled by this news. Earl, Kyle, and Lara's father let out a heavy sigh, and spoke with a mix of regret and anger. I always had my doubts about Silas. Even back then, he showed his true colors when he betrayed Robert, the very person who had given him everything. There's no limit to what he's capable of. He's worse than a wild beast. Their mother, Betsy, chimed in. Thank goodness we discovered this in time. Kyle, my dear, you, father, and I are already in our twilight years. You don't need to worry about us. Even if we recover, our time left on this earth is limited. Kyle shook his head. Mom, I need you to recover. Please work with us, even if it only extends your life by a few years. Kyle knew that Damon held the key to uncovering the truth about their infiltrated family, and he pleaded with him to help his parents, no matter the cost. In return, Kyle promised to stand by Damon's side, ready to fight against Silas. Damon nodded solemnly. He stepped forward, placing his head on Earl and Betsy's trembling bodies. He could feel the pulse of their pain. It was clear that the battle within them had already begun. He slapped their backs. As if on cue, the insects, resembling Lara's body in shape, but with a kaleidoscope of colors, shot out from their parents' orifices, writhing and twisting. Damon paused, allowing the insects to retreat into their hiding places. Kyle's eyes widened and shocked, unable to comprehend what he had just witnessed. Damon, what on earth is going on? He shouted. Why did you stop? Damon sighed heavily, his expression grave. I can't eliminate the poison in your parents' bodies right now. Kyle's anxiety grew. He couldn't bear the thought of these repulsive creatures posing a threat to his parents' safety, even for a moment. The elders and Lara, sensing the tension, turned their worried gazes toward Damon. Damon's eyes met Kyle's. I underestimated the sheer malevolence of Silas's poison. He admitted, if I were to attack, Silas would sense it and activate the poison. And if the poison cannot be neutralized, your parents will undoubtedly lose their lives. Lara couldn't hold back her tears any longer. But what can we do? We can't just let these monsters linger and continue to threat my parents' safety, can we? Damon frowned. Hold on. I said I couldn't cure it right now. I'm saying that I can create a medicine specifically targeted toward the poison. And the best part is, Silas won't even be able to sense it. But I have a feeling that your parents' condition is about to worsen. The poison in their bodies is ready to flare up. As expected, the two elders' faces contorted in agony, their brows furrowed with pain. Cold sweat dripped down their foreheads, and they cried out. Kyle and Lara exchanged worried glances, their hearts sinking. But then, they watched in amazement as Damon gently patted the elders' backs, their painful expressions gradually easing up. Earl, still catching his breath, managed to speak. I feel so much better now. What just happened? Damon smiled reassuringly. When I attempted to neutralize the poison, I made sure to alert Silas. Lara's eyes widened in surprise. But why would you do that? 
Won't he just activate the poison bugs and make things worse? Damon nodded knowingly. Exactly. By alerting Silas, I ensured that he wouldn't kill off these bugs. We need them alive to find out a way to eradicate them. Just as Damon finished explaining, Kyle's phone began to ring. It was Silas. Damon's smile widened. I have a feeling this call is to confirm whether your parents have discovered his true intentions. Kyle was in a bind. He needed to answer Silas, but he didn't want to give away too much information. What should I say to him? Damon had a solution. Just say that your parents are sick and you want to know what to do. Don't sound suspicious. Kyle picked up the phone and heard Silas laughing on the other end. Despite his hate for Silas, Kyle put on a brave face and engaged in small talk. So, Kyle... I was wondering how your parents are doing. Silas said casually. Kyle inhaled sharply. Funny you should ask. I think their condition is getting worse. Silas chuckled darkly. Yeah, I had a feeling. Do as I say. Inject a small amount of the substance that's in the vial on the shelf. They'll be fine soon. After hanging up the phone, Kyle turned to Damon and asked. Should I be worried? Should I do what Silas said? Damon shook his head. There's no need for that. As long as he makes a move, we have him in our clutches. We'll wait about ten minutes and see if he's bluffing. True to Damon's words, after just ten minutes, Earl and Betsy were back to their normal selves. Kyle and Laura were amazed and completely believed in Damon's ability. Thank you for your help today, Kyle said, feeling indebted to his friend. How can I repay you? Damon nodded. The first step is to help Quincy get through this difficult situation. Kyle's expression changed. Quincy Mont Barker? He repeated, the name sounding familiar yet distant. A long-forgotten memory had resurfaced. In a dilapidated house, a drunk man with a bottle of wine in his hand was singing his heart out. It wasn't fair to call him middle-aged, for he looked much older than his years, but in reality, he was only in his thirties. Who would have guessed that this man, Quincy Mont Barker, was once the king of Los Angeles? He had it all, wealth, power, and fame. But now he was a shadow of his former self, struggling with addiction and depression. As he sang, tears welled up in his eyes. The song was written by his late wife, Emojin. He longed to see her again, but it seemed like an impossible dream. Quincy had made many mistakes, but his biggest regret was losing his wife and child. Now he was alone in a worn-out house, singing his heart out to empty streets. Quincy savored the last drop of wine in his glass, feeling the warmth of the liquid spread through his body. He scanned the room, searching for something to end his misery. His eyes landed on a belt, and without hesitation, he grabbed it and headed towards the beam. He tied the belt around the beam, prepared to take his final breath. As he placed his neck on the belt and kicked the stool away, he felt a sharp pain shoot through his body. He desperately tried to gasp for air, but it was no use. The belt was too tight, and he was slowly losing consciousness. Quincy regretted his decision to end his life. He kicked and thrashed, trying to free himself from the rope. He was about to give up hope when suddenly, the window burst open, followed by a gunshot. He fell to the ground, his body heavy and lifeless. When he opened his eyes, he saw a bright light shining above him. Am... am I dead? As Quincy slowly regained consciousness, he noticed a bright light. It was as if someone had dumped a bucket of snow on him while he was out cold. But that wasn't the only surprise waiting him. As his vision cleared, he found himself face to face with a few familiar faces, and the first person he laid eyes on was none other than Damon. Damon? Damon? Quincy exclaimed. Then he frowned. Wait a second, what are you doing here? It didn't take long for Quincy to put two and two together. If Damon was here, then that can only mean one thing. He was dead. The realization hit him like a ton of bricks, and as he took in the pristine white surroundings, it became clear he had somehow ended up in heaven. Overwhelmed with emotion, Quincy jumped to his feet and embraced Damon with all of his might. Damon, my friend, I can't believe I'm seeing you here. You have no idea how tough it was for me back in the mortal world. Hans and I have missed you every single day. And to think, I never imagined I would make it to heaven with all the sins I committed. He clung tightly to his old friend. Hans, Bernadette, and the others standing nearby were utterly dumbfounded by Quincy's outburst. Hans, in particular, couldn't hide his confusion. Quincy... What are you talking about? Mortal world? Heaven? Are you feeling okay? Quincy looked up at Hans. Hans? You're dead too? Did someone rob you and take your life after I gave you that watch to pawn? This is insane! We're all together again! Quincy chuckled, a hint of bitterness in his voice. Well, if you're here in heaven, I guess I shouldn't question why I made it here too. 
After all, your actions on Earth were far worse than mine. Bernadette smiled at Quincy's reaction. It was almost comical how he thought he had entered heaven, especially considering his belief that Damon was dead too. You guys, go easy on him. He thinks he's dead. Quincy turned to her, his eyes wide of disbelief. Bernadette? You, the she-devil, are also dead? But you worked with that bastard Silas. This is impossible. You've done all kinds of bad things, so how can you enter heaven? Damon finally spoke up. Quincy, calm down. He said in a soothing voice, You're not dead. When you hanged yourself, Bernadette shot through the window and broke the rope, saving you. Quincy's mouth was agape. What did you say? I'm... I'm not dead. And she... she saved me. He stammered. Damon nodded, a small smile playing on his lips. You're not dead, my friend. He said, patting Quincy on the back. Quincy couldn't believe his ears. He pointed a trembling finger at Damon. And what about you? Did I see a ghost in broad daylight? Damon chuckled. No, my dear Quincy. He replied, I'm very much alive, but thanks to Bernadette, now we both have a second chance at life. Quincy frowned and looked at Hans for confirmation. Damon is alive, Hans said with a heavy nod. He saved me and now he saved you too. Quincy's eyes widened as he pointed at Bernadette. Then what's the deal with her? He asked. Bernadette had become Silas's lackey and both Hans and Quincy were deeply affected by her betrayal. In their eyes, she had transformed into an evil woman. But why was she with Damon? Hans took a deep breath before explaining. It's a long story. In short, Bernadette had been under Silas' spell. But now she has awakened and turned over a new leaf. I've regained my control of my company, and now we're here to help you. A spark of realization ignited within Quincy. He wasn't dead, as he had initially believed. Instead, he found himself very much alive, surrounded by people he never thought he'd see again. Overwhelmed with emotion, tears streamed down Quincy's face. Damon, I can't believe it. I never expected you to be alive. Damon grinned and clapped Quincy on the shoulder. Well, surprise, surprise. Hans and I have been waiting for you for what feels like an eternity. Quincy hung his head. But why? I'm just a deadbeat now. I'm practically the scum of the earth. Damon's voice was filled with reassurance. Don't worry, my friend. Everything's gonna be alright. Kyle has pledged his support to us. He's gonna help you reclaim control of the Mont Barker group. Quincy shook his head. But right now, my uncle has the power. He's holding all the cards. Damon shrugged. Yeah, that's true. But remember, back when Silas was in charge, Bernadette fought Hans while Kyle fought you. It was a battle you couldn't win. The internal conflicts and external alliances working against us. Now Bernadette provided enough information to bring down Gunther Schimmel. Kyle would like to do you the same favor. Quincy's eyes widened with hope. Are you saying that with Kyle's evidence against my uncle, we can finally turn the tables? Damon squeezed Quincy's hand, his voice filled with conviction. Exactly. With the proof we have now, we can easily reclaim your power. Quincy's eyes were filled with gratitude. Damon, I can't thank you enough for standing by us all these years. But before I can reclaim my power, I need to find my wife and child. Damon's brow furrowed with concern. Your wife and children? Where are they? Quincy's expression turned pained, his voice heavy with sorrow. There, in the place I dreaded the most. In a seedy nightclub in Los Angeles, the air was thick with the scent of expensive perfume and the sound of clinking glasses. Amidst the crowd of beautiful women, one stood out, smoking a cigarette and tapping away on her phone. Her eyes darted around the room as if she was waiting for someone important to arrive. Suddenly, a woman burst into the room, calling out to her. Emogen, why are you still sitting here? You need to go entertain the guest. Emogen looked up, a hint of annoyance in her eyes. Who's here? She asked. The woman rolled her eyes. Who do you think? That investment banker from last time. He wants to drink with you. Emogen hesitated, remembering how uncomfortable he had made her feel before. I'm not feeling well today. The madam frowned. That man is a big customer of ours, and him asking for you is a sign of respect. Don't be so high and mighty. The madame's eyes narrowed as she spoke with authority. You have to see him today, even if you don't want to. That's an order, Emogen. Emogen remained silent, but tears streamed down her face. She knew she had no choice but to comply. She dressed up in a seductive outfit and made her way to a private room. As she entered, she saw a group of middle-aged men with big bellies and greasy faces. One of them called out to her. Hey everyone, take a look. This is the princess of our nightclub. She only drinks with us, not sleeps with us. If any of you big shots can invite her out for the night, I bet you a million bucks you'd fail. 
The room erupted in laughter as Amogen felt disgusted by the crude behavior. But she had to keep her composure. She took a deep breath and greeted the men. Hello, sirs. Sorry to keep you waiting. Amogen stood at the center of the room, feeling the wave of the men's gazes upon her. Their eyes hidden behind polished spectacles, revealing a darkness that contrasted sharply with their refined appearances. The room was filled with murmurs of approval. Not bad, one man said. Beautiful. Another chimed in. Imogen sighed. She had never expected to find herself in such a position, working in a place like this. And yet here she was, captivating the attention of these influential men. She silently cursed the circumstances that brought her there. The nightclub madame shot Imogen a warning, conveyed through a subtle glance. Imogen understood the unspoken message. Her fate was tied to the satisfaction of these customers. If they were not pleased, she would face severe consequences. With a heavy heart, Imogen pushed aside her fear and approached the bosses to do her job. Herbert beckoned Imogen over with a clap of his hands. Come on, come sit by me! Imogen's body shook with unease. Herbert, I'm not in a good mood today, please forgive me. She replied, trying to keep her distance. But Herbert was not one to give up easily. You're my favorite princess of this nightclub! How can I bear to not play with you tonight? Imogen relented and sat down beside him. Herbert leaned in closer. Imogen, do you know which part of you is the most attractive to me? He asked, his voice low. Imogen forced a smile. What do you think, Herbert? She replied, trying to play along. Herbert leered at her. It's the sweet scent of your perfume. As he spoke, Imogen noticed something that made her skin crawl. When he raised his head, all the hair in his nose was exposed. And then, without warning, he tried to stick his tongue down her throat. Imogen recoiled in disgust and let out a scream, covering her mouth and almost vomiting. What are you doing? Why did you move away? Herbert growled. Imogen, her heart sinking, shook her head. No, Herbert, it's not that. I just, I just feel a little uncomfortable today. I'm not feeling well. She stammered, hoping he would understand. Herbert was unyielding. Damn, do you want to make money tonight or not? God, loosen up a little. Take a shot at tequila. You can at least give me that much. Herbert's hand found its way to Imogen's thigh, his touch lingering shamelessly. Goosebumps erupted across her body, fear coursing through her veins. Yet she had to think of Herbert's ferociousness and the menacing threat from the nightclub madame just moments ago. She knew she had to play along, for her safety and sanity. Imogen was surrounded by a group of boisterous men, their bald heads shining under the dim nightclub lights. One of them, with a mischievous grin, leaned in and said, just one tequila shot? In my opinion, you should at least have two shots of tequila to get the night started. Not to be outdone, another banker chimed in, his voice filled with confidence. Come on now! Which woman can establish a foothold in a place like this? Isn't a seasoned veteran of partying? I say she should down three shots, no less. As the men continued to add more numbers to the equation, and Mogan felt a lump forming in her throat. Tears threatened to spill from her eyes as she struggled to keep her composure. I... I don't feel well today, she managed to say, her voice trembling. My stomach hurts so much. Herbert, who had been observing the conversation from a distance, suddenly stepped forward. What do you mean by that? These people are all my good friends. Today they came here to have a good time, but now you've made them unhappy. Do you believe you can do whatever you want? And Mogan's voice was barely a whisper as she replied, her meekness evident. Uh, uh, how about this? I'll... I'll start with two shots. Herbert sat there, still feeling a little down after Mogan had embarrassed him, but the other men at the table were quick to reassure him, nodding their heads and promising that real fun was yet to come. Since so many of my friends have agreed, you can drink two shots first, he said, gesturing to Mogan. Mogan picked up two tequila shots and downed them like a pro. She had spent enough time in the places like this to know how to hold her liquor, and the men were impressed. What a good alcohol tolerance, they exclaimed, clapping their hands. Even Herbert was proud as he watched Imogen impress his friends. He slipped a few twenties into her pocket, a clear sign that he wanted something in return later on. Imogen's face fell, but she knew better than to protest. She took the money and tried to ignore the sinking feeling in her stomach. One of the bald men burped loudly before turning to Imogen. Excuse me, but your name is Imogen, isn't it? I must say, you are stunning. You remind me of my first girlfriend. Would you do me the honor of singing a song with me? And Mogan didn't make eye contact with the man. I'm sorry, but I don't know how to sing. 
The bald man couldn't hide his disappointment. Come on, it's just singing a song. Surely you can do that. And if you sing well, I promise to tip you generously. Imogen's eyes dimmed momentarily, but the thought of her child waiting at home, in need of food and clothes, gave her the courage to nod and say, All right then, I'll sing a song with you. Taking her place beside the bald man, Imogen began to sing. Her voice, like that of an angel, filled the room with its ethereal beauty. The bald man's voice, on the other hand, was far from pleasant, resembling more of a pig squeal. As the song came to an end, the men in the room erupted in applause, their hands clapped together in admiration, their faces beaming with appreciation. Well sung, they exclaimed, their voices filled with genuine admiration for Imogen's talent. The bald man reached out and grabbed Imogen's waist. Little beauty, you sang like an angel, he said with a hint of malice. Imogen's body stiffened, but before she could react, the bald man leaned in and planted a wet kiss on her cheek with his thick lips. Imogen recoiled in horror, pushing him away with all of her might, but the bald man was not amused. He slapped her across the face, his eyes blazing with anger. Witch! He spat. This is how you repay me for simple compliments? I'll break your hand if you do that again! I... I didn't mean to, she stammered in a whisper. I just... I just reacted without thinking. But one of the bankers was quick to intervene. Don't be angry, everyone. She's just a little scared. Let's just let this matter pass. And Mogan nodded, her eyes downcast. I'm sorry, she said, her voice barely audible. I'll drink more to make up for it. The bald man smirked. Okay, he said. Seeing how obedient you are, I'll punish you with four more shots and let you go. Herbert handed Imogen the bottle, and she took a deep breath, stealing herself for what was to come. She put the bottle to her lips. She was a good drinker, but after six shots, she would be on the verge of collapsing. Imogen put the bottle to her lips with shaking hands. She was a well-practiced drinker after working in the seedy underbelly of society for so long, but after six shots in total, she was on the verge of collapsing. The bald man leered at her. Come to think of it, you look like my wife. You especially reminded me of her when you sang just now. It makes me feel like my wife was singing it. Gorgeous lady, are you willing to be my mistress? I, um... Imogen stammered. Herbert stepped in. Just say yes to my friend. He's so rich that you won't be able to wrap your head around it. He can give you more than you ever thought possible. That is, if you give him a night of rolling around the bed with you. That's not too much to ask, is it? Imogen closed her eyes and confessed what she was forbidden to tell clients. I have a husband. You have a husband? Herbert's expression instantly changed. Why haven't I heard of it before? Imogen nodded. I don't like to talk about him at work. She glanced at the bald man. Why do you want me to be your woman anyway? Didn't you just say that you have a wife? Are you planning to divorce her? The bald man looked at Mogan up and down with a wretched smile. Goosebumps sprouted on Mogan's arms. Herbert laughed. Yeah, yeah, my friend has good taste. I like it. You can only have one wife, but you can have a lot of lovers. So what's wrong with him wanting a sexy side piece? Herbert pushed her into the arms of the bald man. The bald man moved closer to Imogen and wanted to kiss her. Imogen was so scared that her face turned pale. I beg you, please don't do this, okay? I have a husband and a child. Didn't Herbert tell you my ground rules? I sell my company and my time, not my body. The bald man raised his bushy eyebrows. A child, huh? So you must be working here because you're not wealthy. Look, I can pay. He pulled out his wallet and showed her a wad of cash inside. So stop being so high and mighty. Yeah, and why you're pretending to be pure? Herbert chimed in. We all know why you work here. They pinned her down. Just as they were about to unbutton her top, she raised her hand and smacked the bald man across the face. Ah! The bald man screamed and flew into a rage. You witch, you dare to attack me? Do you want to die? You guys catch her! I'm going to kill her today! The men pounced on Imogen. Imogen fought back and kicked them right in the most sensitive area of his body. Herbert screamed and covered his lower part with his hand. Another man rushed toward Imogen. Imogen picked up a beer bottle on the table and smashed it on his head. The man fell to the ground. Seeing that Imogen was about to walk to the door, the bald man rushed over and grabbed onto Imogen's thigh. There was too much noise inside. The doors kicked open and then the nightclub madame brought a group of people in one after another. What's wrong? 
Herbert pointed at the mess. Take a look. This is what your club's princess did. She said she sells her time and not her body. What era do you think this is? Herbert scowled at the madame. Let's settle this now or we won't patronize th this establishment again. The madame, whose name was Mona, was furious. These men were some of their best customers. The club couldn't afford to lose them. She looked at Imogen and said, Imogen, it's rare for Herbert's friends to like you so much. You're offending some powerful people. Apologize to them and offer what they want in exchange. Fear appeared in Imogen's eyes, but she still firmly shook her head. Mona, you know I don't do things like that. Isn't it against the rules? Mona crossed her arms. Rules can change. How many of the other girls would give their left arm for this opportunity? You need to see how good you have it. Please let me go, Imogen begged. Mona was strict. Imogen, if you don't accompany Herbert and our other distinguished guests this evening, I'll punish you so severely that your head will spin. Imogen lowered her voice. Mona, you know I have a husband. I can't let him down. Besides, my child is waiting for me. Mona scoffed. How can you raise a child if you don't have money? Imogen's body shook violently. Mona, I won't do it. Mona raised her hand and gave Imogen a fierce slap on the face. How dare you disobey me? Do you believe that I'll break your legs in minutes? Mona put her hands on her hips and said to the two young ladies beside her, Today, I'll let you know how to deal with disobedient employees. Watch carefully. If anyone dares to disobey me in the future, you'll end up like her. Someone handed Mona a large stick. She thumped it menacingly against the table. Imogen, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you going to obey or not? Even though she was afraid to the point of despair, she swore to never give in. Mona raised the stick in her hand and hit Imogen hard. Bruises blossomed in Imogen's upper arm. The stick hit Imogen's body again. Then Mona kicked her to the ground. Mona grabbed Imogen by the hair and said, Apologize to Herbert at once. Imogen knelt on the ground. She said with tears in her eyes, Herbert, I'm sorry. Please let me go, okay? Herbert looked at the bald man. It's up to you. The bald man smoked, then used a cigarette butt to burn Imogen's forearm. She grimaced at the pain. Then he threw the butt to them on the ground and kicked Imogen in the stomach. Come out with us tonight or else, the man growled. Imogen closed her eyes and saw stars. She shook her head. I have to go home to put my child to bed. Mona was so angry that she laughed inside. Is that so? Looks like you are a good mother. Even at this point, you're still thinking about the child at home. Since that's the case, how about I send someone to your home to bring over your child? I heard that your child's also a daughter. Is she as beautiful as you? Oh my god. Imogen muttered, faced with her worst nightmare. Please don't bring her here, please. Mona arched an eyebrow. Then will you spend time with these men or not? If your choice is the latter, I can't guarantee that your child will be safe and sound. Maybe she'll accidentally fall down the stairs and get run over by a car. Hypothetically. Imogen understood that Mona would do anything to earn money, but she couldn't bear to think about harm befalling her child. She nodded slowly, wincing as she thought about how she was letting Quincy down. Mona said, Why are you crying? Don't pretend I'm coercing you. I'm a magnanimous woman. I gave you options. Now give me that winning smile. Imogen squeezed out a smile and wiped the mascara running down her cheek. Mona, I'll do it. Mona was satisfied. That's more like it. She's a good girl, one whom I trained with my own hands. She looked at Herbert. You will have a great time. If you need anything, just let me know. Herbert stuffed a stack of money into Mona's hand. Mona greedily counted it, then left the room. Emokin couldn't get up. She had overestimated the conscience of the big shots. They didn't let her go, even after she begged. Herbert cursed. Damn it, what bad luck. I was planning to relax and find a good time tonight, but I didn't expect it to turn out like this. The bald man sneered at Imogen, then grabbed her hair. Come over here and serve me. Imogen tried not to weep. Sir, I think Mona broke my hand. I'll be of no use to you. Use your mouth, the bald man retorted. Imogen was kicked to the ground again, and blood flowed from her head. Even if your hand is broken, you must serve me well today. Otherwise, I guarantee that you'll be miserable. There was a hurry knock on the door. Herbert thought Mona was back and said, I didn't call you guys over. What are you doing here? Get lost. The door burst open. Then Quincy rushed in. When he saw Imogen, who was covered in blood, he immediately shouted, Imogen, what happened to you? Who hit you? It turned out that Quincy had come to look for Imogen to tell her that he had changed. 
With Damon's help, he didn't have to worry about food and clothing. He didn't need a Mogan to work in a nightclub to earn money for their family. Quincy could no longer care about anything else. He rushed straight to the private room and saw a Mogan's miserable scene. Seeing that Quincy was hugging a Mogan, Herbert raged. Who the hell are you? How dare you hug the woman we ordered? Go to hell! Quincy glared at Herbert. I'm her husband. Who beat her up like this? Herbert threw back his head and laughed. Some husband! Letting her work in a place like this! You should be thanking us! We're training her well! She's so obedient now, which will earn her more money in the long run! That benefits you, right? Ha! Your wife is willing to sell herself to support a deadbeat like you. You've got the best deal in the world, pal. Emogen looked at Quincy weakly. Quincy, don't listen to their nonsense. I've never slept with anyone. They beat me up because I refused. Herbert rolled his eyes. There you go again, playing the precious princess act again. You're so par that you have to rely on this to make a living, and you even flaunt yourself as a loyal woman. Who do you think you are, some well-bred upper-class woman? You've never seen real money before, have you? You know what? If you promise to have a long, passionate night with me, I'll pay you 20 grand. I'm just afraid that you're not worth that much money. Hearing Herbert say this, Imogen's expression became a little dazed. That's right. She was once the top socialite in the upper class, the center of attention. However, she had fallen from grace. She apologized to Quincy. I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt or disappoint you. Quincy shook his head. No, you didn't. You're my pride and joy. I have so much respect for you. I'm the useless bastard drinking and shooting up our life savings. That's why you have to work here, but I swear I've changed. I'll show you how later. First, we need to get rid of these insatiable rats. They have more money than most people make in their lifetimes. Instead of paying with their porpid and millions, let them pay with their blood. Quincy clenched his hand into a fence. Emogen quickly grabbed it. Wait, Quincy, let's just go. We can't afford to seek trouble with these people. We're not who we used to be. Herbert let out a dark chuckle. What are you blabbering about? Come here, little slut. Tell me about your husband's past identity. How many assets did you have at your peak? Only if it was pushing a billion can he be on equal footing with me. Imogen looked at Herbert contemptuously and said, You will never be able to compare with my husband in any area, financial or otherwise. Herbert gritted his teeth. You and your husband are pathetic. I thought I'd have a little fun tonight. Instead, you came here and insulted me and my friends. Quincy had had enough. He took advantage of the fact that the bald man was silent, smoking and leaning against the wall. He picked up a bottle of liquor and smashed it on the bald man's head. The bald man screamed and fell to the ground. Quincy stepped on the bald man and said in a deep voice, Let me tell you, jerk. My name is Quincy Mont Barker. Otherwise, you won't know who you killed on the road to hell. Herbert was so stunned he forgot to be angry that his friend was beaten up. I think I've heard of that name somewhere before. Wait a second. The bald man breathed. Could it be that you're the former CEO of the Mont Barker Group? The man who had his assets in the tens of billions? Quincy fiercely punched the man instead of responding. After knowing Quincy's identity, fear appeared in the eyes of the once arrogant men. Even though Quincy had been hiding it for many years, the power and influence he had back then still made people shiver. But soon, Herbert cried out, Damn it, so what if you're Quincy Mont Barker? That name has been scourged. Your reign is in the past and you have no power anymore. You're just trash now. You can only survive by relying on your wife to cheat on you. We're now highest level VIPs of the nightclub. If you dare to touch us, I could smash you to death with money. Quincy's eyes flashed with rage. Very good. But before you guys smash me to death with money, I'll let you guys have a taste of me first. In the past, Quincy had lost everything, including his mind, to the point where he was neither human nor a ghost. But now that Quincy had regained his spirit, he never allowed his wife to be bullied again. Quincy grabbed a bottle of wine from the table and shattered it on the bald man's scalp. Blood poured out as the man howled and clutched his legs in a fetal position. Herbert wanted to save his friend, but Quincy swiftly stabbed him in the stomach with the broken bottle, then lifted a chair and threw it at Herbert's head. Quincy was a bloodthirsty devil! More than a dozen security guards in the nightclub rushed in, accompanied by Mona. Seeing that her best clients had been beaten beyond recognition by Quincy, Mona said sternly, What's going on? Emogen's face was ashen. Quincy held her in his arms and said with his head held high, I did it. These useless people dared to insult my wife, so I made them suffer. Mona looked at Quincy with a gloomy expression and said, You are that useless husband of Emogen?
Quincy lifted his chin defiantly at Mona, gripping a Mogan's hand. That's right, and I'm proud of it. Mona, the fearless madame of the nightclub, locked eyes with Quincy and Imogen. Well, 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 I must say, I didn't expect such audacity from the likes of you. From the corner, the bald man piped up. Mona, we were brutally beaten. I'm willing to offer you a handsome sum if you help us rid ourselves of these troublemakers. Dollar signs danced in Mona's eyes. Anyone who dares to challenge the honor of our esteemed guest, regardless of their identity, shall soon regret their very existence in this world. Mona turned her gaze to Quincy. I'll present you with two choices. The first option is a swift death. Otherwise, I'll subject you to such unimaginable torment that you won't be able to even recognize your reflection in the mirror. In addition, you shall compensate us tenfold for our losses. Then we'll let you go. Quincy said sarcastically, Ah, Mona, your offers are truly tempting. However, I'm afraid I must respectfully decline. Amogen tugged her husband's sleeve. Hey... We should just apologize to get out of here. Her husband was no longer the Quincy of the past. He couldn't beat Mona. Mona shook her head. It's too late. Mona gave the order, and a dozen or so thugs holding iron rods behind her instantly pounced toward Quincy. Hubby, be careful! Imogen screamed. However, Quincy had a trick up his sleeve thanks to Damon. It's time! He yelled. Axel ran into the room. Mona's bodyguard spent all day in the gym, but compared to Damon's bodyguards, they were weaklings. In an instant, a dozen security guards were knocked down onto the ground by Axel. Mona opened her mouth wide. She didn't dare to believe that her employee's useless husband could have such powerful men at his side. Mona calmed her mind and laughed. That's right. I wondered why a little slut like you was so cocky today. So you invited a helper? But if you think our nightclub only has three bodyguards, you're underestimating us. The leader of the bodyguards at the side gave out orders, and then they heard a wave of shouts. More and more security guards with weapons surrounded the private room at the club. Now that she had a strong backing, Mona said with a smile, Show me what you've got! Quincy discreetly motioned for the two bodyguards to relay a message, summoning the necessary reinforcements. Mona was uneasy. Quincy's presence seemed to radiate danger, and she couldn't shake the feeling that he posed a threat to her. Tell me, what's your name? She demanded. I'm Quincy Mont Barker. The head security guard leaned in and whispered something into Mona's ear, causing her eyes to widen in shock. The boss of the Mont Barker group, Quincy? She exclaimed. Quincy simply nodded, his expression unreadable. Once upon a time, Quincy was a god among men, ruling over the entire city of Los Angeles with an iron fist. But that was a long time ago. He had fallen from grace, and yet his legend lived on. His name still echoed through the streets, a reminder of the power he once had. It wasn't until Mona learned that Imogen was Quincy's wife that everything clicked into place. Imogen had always had an air of nobility and elegance about her, even when she first entered the nightclub begging for work. And despite not sleeping with the client, she had managed to capture the hearts of many of the important men. Mona had always thought that Imogen was pretending, that she was just a slut trying to act like a queen. But now she realized that Imogen was born with the air of sophistication. Mona couldn't afford to lose face, not in her nightclub. You might have been someone once, but now you're just a wild dog, begging for scraps with your slut of a wife. Quincy scowled. You think you know who I am, yet you still dare to come after me. Aren't you even a little bit afraid? Mona retorted. Are you trying to intimidate me? Your wife has already betrayed you. Why do you insist on putting on a show for me? This is your last chance. Will you surrender, or shall I make the first move?" Her men encircled Quincy, their weapons gleaming in the dim light, eagerly awaiting Mona's command. Quincy continued trying to buy some precious time before his backup arrived. Even if I'm at my lowest point, your strength still pales in comparison. Impatience seeped into Mona's voice as she snapped. Then there's nothing left to discuss. Brothers, attack! The strong men, armed to the teeth, charged toward Quincy and Imogen with a bloodthirsty determination. Imogen, paralyzed with fear, couldn't even bring herself to look up. Quincy held onto Imogen tightly. But just as all hope seemed to be lost, two figures emerged from the shadows. Damon's hired bodyguard, standing tall and fearless, stepped forward. Leave this place to us. We'll take care of you. They assured Quincy and Imogen. Without a moment's hesitation, the two bodyguards lunged toward the oncoming horde of strong men, unafraid of the consequences. 
Their combat prowess is unmatched, a testament to their unwavering loyalty to Axel and Damon. They had proven their mettle by single-handedly taking down a dozen gangsters just moments ago, leaving the nightclub security guards in disarray. Their immense strength and agility ensured that Quincy and his wife remained unharmed amidst the chaos. Mona's expression twisted into a grotesque mask of frustration and disbelief. In a desperate attempt to regain control, she swiftly drew her gun and aimed it at one of the bodyguards, pulling the trigger with a resounding bang. The force of the gunshot sent shockwaves through the air, hitting its mark. The bodyguard's hand was struck, the impact launching him backward. The security guards swung their iron rods and machetes wildly at the bodyguards, who were caught off guard and tried to defend themselves. Despite their efforts, one bodyguard was hit by two iron rods and had his arm cut off by a knife. Seeing his brother in a trouble, the other bodyguard rushed to help, but was also injured in the process. The two of them were gradually losing their strength as the enemy continued to attack. Just then, Vito and his men rushed into the nightclub like a tidal wave, ready to take on the attackers. Quincy couldn't stand by any longer. He grabbed a Mogan with one hand and a metal rod at the other, determined to help. But he was quickly overwhelmed by the strong men and couldn't hold his own. The entrance of the nightclub shook as Vito's powerful kicks broke down the gate. It was a thrilling and intense moment as the odds seemed stacked against them. But with Vito leading the charge, they were ready to fight until the end. Vito's eyes blazed with fury. How dare you touch my people! I'll kill every last one of you! With his indomitable will, he and his brothers tore through the nightclub security guards like a hot knife through butter. Mona tried to intervene, but the tiger-like Vito turned on her with a knife, leaving her screaming and covered in blood. The head of the bodyguards tried to reason with Vito, warning him that he was risking everything by smashing up the nightclub, but Vito was beyond reason. He climbed up on the table and bellowed for his brothers to attack. The sound of machetes and clubs smashing through the nightclub's luxurious furnishings filled the air. In a matter of moments, the once magnificent nightclub was reduced to rubble. As Mona looked at the wreckage of the nightclub, her heart sank. The security guards who were supposed to protect the place were beaten up so badly they couldn't even save themselves. Vito gripped her arm. How dare you shoot at my men! He bellowed. Mona was terrified. Please don't hurt me! She begged. But Vito was not in a forgiving mood. You do evil things more detestable than I've ever done! He spat. I won't hesitate to hit a woman. As the stick came down, Mona's legs were broken again. She writhed in agony as the rest of Vito's gang attacked her mercilessly. Mona turned to Imogen. Imogen, save me! She cried. Imogen was not sympathetic. You've committed heinous crimes, she said coldly. How many women have you harmed? Vito, hit harder! Mona was a monster, a true embodiment of evil. She had abused and kidnapped women and children without a second thought. Vito knew that she deserved no mercy. With a final blow, he shattered her last remaining leg into a thousand pieces. Imogen's eyes locked onto Herbert and the others. They desperately tried to hide under the table. Imogen's finger trembled as she pointed towards them, unable to find the words to express the pain they had caused her. Tears streamed down her face, a silent testament to the horror she had endured. Vito's anger burned like a raging fire. Those despicable pigs! How dare they take advantage of you! Herbert's body shook violently. Please, we didn't mean to. Help us! The bald man joined in. Please spare us. We'll do anything to make it right. But Quincy, seemingly unaffected by the scene unfolding before him, turned a blind eye. Vito, too, fed up with their empty pleas, swung his iron staff down with a forceful blow. The room filled with cries of agony. The sounds grew fainter and fainter, leaving behind an eerie silence. Whether they were dead or alive, their fate remained unknown. As Vito was about to escape with his men, a chilling voice pierced the air. Who dares to smash my nightclub? A crowd had already gathered around the dilapidated building, but it was the appearance of a young man with long hair that sent shivers down everyone's spines. It was Juan, the general manager of the club. Vito had once engaged in a bloody battle with him, but Juan emerged unscathed while Vito's ribs were broken. With a sense of defeat, Vito loaded his head in front of Juan. The latter surveyed the wreckage of the nightclub before fixing his gaze on Vito. I didn't expect you to be so arrogant, he said disdainfully. Vito's body froze. I don't want to destroy your club, but you're exploiting innocent women. It's time to make things right, he said firmly. Juan's eyes narrowed as he stared back at Vito. You're teaching me how to run my business now? 
Vito hesitated, still feeling intimidated by Juan. But then he noticed Quincy covered in blood. If Vito hadn't arrived in time, things could have ended badly for Quincy. He didn't regret showing up. Juan recognized Quincy immediately. Quincy Mont Barker! Quincy nodded. How can I help you? Juan nodded. So it was you who supported Vito and helped to destroy our club, right? Vito stepped forward, trying to take the blame. I did it myself. Quincy had nothing to do with it. Quincy shook his head. It was me. Who said you can act above the law? All right, now we're talking. Juan exclaimed, clapping his hands together. But let me ask you something. Do you honestly think I would be afraid of the likes of you? Without skipping a beat, Juan laid down his terms. I'll give you all a chance to live. Considering the damages to the nightclub today, we're looking at a loss of around seven million. And with the renovations on top of that, we're talking about a total loss of 10 million. Pay me 10 times that amount as compensation, and I'll let you all walk away. Otherwise, well, let's just say today won't end well for any of you. His words were delivered in a calm, matter-of-fact manner, but the weight behind them was undeniable. Unexpectedly, Vito spoke up, defying Juan's proposition. Don't even think about it! In an instant, a blood-curling scream pierced the air. No one could even comprehend how Juan had managed it. All they saw was Vito clutching his hand, blood pouring out from where one of his fingers used to be. But Vito didn't dare to seek revenge. He was too terrified that Juan would swiftly end his life with that cold blade in his hand. Quincy's bottom lip quivered, but he tried to keep his cool. What? What do you want? Juan's eyes narrowed. Are you deaf? My meaning is crystal clear. Either you pay up or face the consequences. Death. Quincy's resolve strengthened. Hold on a second. Bernadette will be here any moment now. You better think twice about making any rash moves. The mention of Bernadette's name caused visible change in Juan's expression. He knew that Bernadette held great influence even over him. Suddenly, caution replaced his aggression. However, it didn't take long for Juan to regain his composure. He sneered. Bernadette and I may not belong to the same faction, but that doesn't change the fact that you owe me. Even if Bernadette comes, you still have to compensate me today. Anyone who dares to vandalize a nightclub must face severe punishment. Just as the tension reached its peak, a woman's voice cut through the air. Juan, what the hell do you think you're doing? Bernadette had finally arrived. Vito and Quincy had wasted no time in contacting her and Damon to fill them in on the situation. Bernadette gathered up a group of men and swiftly made her way to the scene. Damon arrived shortly after. Juan met Bernadette's gaze without flinching. Your people, they destroyed my nightclub! I need an explanation, don't I? Bernadette lifted her chin defiantly. But it was your people who started it all. They detained my people first, attacked them, and even coerced them into committing unspeakable acts. Do you honestly believe you did the right thing? Well, if that's how you see it, then there's nothing to discuss today. The main culprits, Vito, Quincy, and the others, they must stay, said Juan. Bernadette scoffed. And what about me? Juan's gaze hardened. Bernadette, even you can't fix this. As Juan let out a deafening roar, he lunged toward Bernadette with a ferocity that left everyone in the room stunned. But little did he know that Bernadette was no ordinary woman. Trained in combat strength by her father Benedict since she was young, Bernadette's abilities were not just for show. She was comparable to the few experts who had challenged Damon before. Bernadette quickly stretched out her hand to block him, but Juan's speed was too fast, and before she knew it, he had grabbed her hand and delivered a fierce kick that sent her flying. Despite her training, Bernadette didn't have the strength to retaliate. It was no wonder that even Vito, who had seen his fair share of danger, was afraid of Juan. Even when one of his fingers was cut off, he didn't dare to cause trouble. Juan was ruthless. Bernadette's heart raced as she felt the overwhelming urge to flee. But before she could even take a step, Juan's lightning-fast speed caught up to her. His grip tightened around her neck, leaving her no choice but to surrender. The situation seemed hopeless, and Juan seemed completely unfazed by the potential consequences. Meanwhile, Zeke, the nightclub owner and formidable figure in Los Angeles, who held equal power to Silas, was on his way. Bernadette was nothing compared to Zeke's might, and his arrival would surely mean the end for everyone involved. Just as all hope seemed lost, a sudden and powerful whip kick struck Juan's stomach with incredible force. The speed and impact sent him flying, momentarily disorienting him. As he regained his composure, he wiped the blood from his mouth and locked eyes with Axel, who appeared out of nowhere. Who are you? 
Juan demanded, his voice filled with both curiosity and caution. Axel smirked, his confidence radiating from every pore. You don't deserve to know who I am. He replied coolly, his gaze never wavering. Juan carefully assessed Axel, trying to gauge his strength and intentions. Even Vito, who was well aware of Axel's capabilities, was taken aback by the sheer power he displayed. It was almost comical how little regard Axel seemed to have for Juan's presence. Vito's concern for Axel's well-being was evident as he reminded him, Axel, you need to be careful. Juan is ruthless. However, Axel's reaction was far from what Vito expected. A contemptuous smile played on the corner of his mouth, as if he didn't take Vito's warning seriously at all. As Juan stood up, a knife glinted in his hand. Is that so? Well, let's see just how proud you are. He taunted. With lightning speed, Juan released a flurry of strikes, his blade transforming into a blur of silver, aiming straight for Axel. But Axel was no ordinary opponent. In his eyes, Juan was nothing more than an insignificant ant. Without even needing a weapon, Axel swiftly and accurately grabbed Juan's hand amidst the chaos of his blade dance. With sheer strength, he effortlessly snatched the blade from Juan's grasp and followed it up with a powerful kick to Juan's head. Juan let out a scream as he was sent flying through the air. However, to everyone's surprise, he quickly regained his footing and retaliated by delivering a swift kick to Axel's head. This kick was a culmination of all the skills and techniques Juan had acquired throughout his life. Vito could barely keep up with the speed and precision of Juan's footwork, feeling as though Juan's feet were everywhere at once. If it were Vito on the receiving end of this attack, he would have surely been crushed in an instant. But Axel, unfazed by the danger, didn't even attempt to dodge. Vito's voice rang out, filled with urgency. Axel, be careful! Yet despite the warning, Juan's legs savagely connected with Axel's face. The crowd gasped in disbelief as they watched the brutal scene unfold before their eyes. It seemed as though Axel had been kicked to death, but to everyone's astonishment, he remained unharmed. Juan, on the other hand, was left stunned and in excruciating pain. Juan had always prided himself on his whip kick, confident in its power and precision, but as his foot connected with Axel's body, it felt as if he had kicked an impenetrable iron plate. A searing pain shot through his thigh, leaving him bewildered and vulnerable. Who was this person with a body harder than steel? Before Juan could recover from his shock, Axel retaliated with a powerful punch to his thigh. The force was so immense that Juan's thigh bone fractured at a 90 degree angle, a horrifying sight that sent shivers down everyone's spines. But Axel wasn't finished. He launched another attack, this time targeting Juan's hands. With a sickening crack, both of Juan's hands suffered the same fracture. And if that wasn't enough, Axel mercilessly stomped on Juan's broken hands with his foot, causing unimaginable pain. Juan arrived on the ground, completely crippled and helpless. The onlookers stood frozen in fear, their mouths agape at the sheer brutality of the scene. They instinctively tightened their legs, as if trying to protect themselves from the same fate as Juan. Vito's mouth hung open in shock, revealing the vast gap between himself and Axel. Despite his abilities, it was clear that Juan couldn't even withstand a single blow. Juan, Zeke's most trusted subordinate, had been mercilessly beaten to the ground by Axel. As if the situation wasn't dire enough, Bernadette's reinforcements had surrounded them, and the once lively nightclub now lay in ruins. Juan's reinforcements had lost all hope, and their fighting spirit had vanished. Axel looked around. Who else dares to fight? He challenged. But to his disappointment, no one stepped forward. In fact, they even took a step back, their fear palpable. Mona, barely clinging to life, could only let out a feeble whimper. The gravity of the situation was impossible to ignore, and Zeke's presence was inevitable. How could he not intervene? When his reputation was at stake, after all, he needed to prove himself worthy of standing on equal ground with Silas. As the crowd anxiously awaited Zeke's arrival, cries of shock, fear, panic, and despair filled the air. Suddenly, he burst through the door. All eyes are fixed on him, and some secretly sympathize with Bernadette and her comrades. Zeke is here. Bernadette is in trouble. They whispered. Zeke is far stronger than Juan. He's like a god. The murmurs continued. Even if Axel is powerful, he will surely meet his demise in front of Zeke. Confusion arose as someone questioned, Isn't Bernadette the queen of the underground? Why would she be afraid of him? 
but another voice chimed in, revealing a hidden truth. Let me enlighten you. Bernadette may be powerful, but she follows Silas. Zeke is on par with Silas. If it weren't for Silas and an even stronger force holding him back, Bernadette would have been replaced or killed a long time ago. The outcome of this clash would undoubtedly shape the future of the seedy underbelly of Los Angeles. Zeke stepped into the room, his presence commanding attention. He sparked a fear so deep, so primal, that it seemed to surge from every depth of the soul. Unlike Juan and Bernadette, Zeke didn't bring a large group of followers. He only had two, but there was something about them that made Axel believe their strength surpassed even Juan's. Yet Axel wasn't afraid. In fact, he felt a thrill of excitement, as if he stumbled upon a worthy opponent in a thrilling game of chess. But Bernadette's expression told a different story. There was a hint of fear in her eyes. And why wouldn't she be afraid? Brandet knew Zeke all too well. Just like Silas, he was the right-hand man behind their leader. But Zeke was even stronger than Silas, controlling the combat aspect while Silas handled the finances. Despite her high-ranking position on Silas's team and the power she wielded, Brandet couldn't shake off the fear when facing Zeke. Even Silas himself had warned her to stay away from him, describing him as a wild beast. When Zeke lost control, he became a force of mass destruction. Yet Zeke remained elusive, always disappearing on secret missions. But Bernadette had convinced herself that he wouldn't show up today. But as she stood there face to face with him, she wondered if she had underestimated the danger he posed. His captivating gaze swept across the room before finally settling on Bernadette, who shivered involuntarily. He took a step forward, a sneer gracing his lips. Well, 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 if it isn't Bernadette Wadsworth. You're the one responsible for all this, aren't you? Zeke accused. Didn't Silas warn you not to provoke me? What have you done to my nightclub? Bernadette clenched her fist, her determination shining through. It was your nightclub that provoked us first. She retorted, refusing to back down despite the terror she felt. A wicked smile slowly spread across Zeke's face as his attention shifted to Quincy. I've heard from my subordinate your wife was working here, and you showed up to interfere with my business. He said with a vile smirk. Do you still think of yourself as the king of the past? Well, I hate to break it to you, but those days are long gone. Quincy's eyes burned with a deep-rooted hatred as he locked gazes with Zeke. Memories of the past flooded his mind, reminding him of the cruelty he had endured in Zeke's hands. But Zeke's gaze soon shifted to Juan, who was being mercilessly stepped on by Axel. A sigh escaped his lips as he spoke to his general manager with a hint of disappointment. Juan, I've told you time and time again to train hard and diligently for fights. Don't be stubborn. This is exactly what I've warned you would happen if you didn't listen to me. Juan could only raise his tear-stained face, filled with regret. Zeke, I'm sorry, he sobbed. I've embarrassed you. Zeke nodded, his expression softening. It's all right, Juan. Learn from this experience. All you need to do is train harder in the future. If you embarrass me again, then we'll have some real trouble. Juan's voice trembled as he replied. Thank you, Zeke. I understand. Thank you for your mercy. Mona's last breath seemed to be her last hope for revenge. With a sudden burst of energy, she cried out to Zeke. Please, you have to help us. Zeke, with a determined nod, turned his gaze to Axel. The room was filled with the tense silence as everyone watched in fear, except for Axel, who had already proven himself by defeating Juan. Zeke declared that this was a battle of life and death, and the air instantly froze. The two powerhouses mobilized all their strength, ready to engage in a bloody battle. Axel pushed himself to his limits, but to his surprise, Zeke's strength continued to rise at an alarming rate. Axel was left in shock. He had always known that Zeke was a force to be reckoned with, but the sheer power he displayed was beyond anything Axel had ever imagined. Time was running out for Axel, and he knew if he didn't act fast, he would have no chance of winning against Zeke at his peak. Without hesitation, Axel took advantage of Zeke's momentary lapse in concentration and threw a punch at him. Zeke's frown was a clear indication that he had sensed Axel's fear, but he didn't let it show. The two collided with a deafening thud, and Axel flew backward. It was clear that Axel was no match for Zeke. With a swift kick, Zeke sent Axel flying once again, this time with even more force. Despite blocking Zeke's attack with his hand, 
Axel couldn't withstand the sheer power and force of Zeke's blows. Blood was flowing from the corner of Zeke's mouth, but he didn't let that stop him. The crowd of the nightclub was going wild. They were cheering Zeke on, urging him to take revenge for them. Mona lifted herself off the floor and was practically jumping up and down with excitement, while Juan was shouting at the top of his lungs. The rest of the men were raising their arms and chanting, Zeke is invincible! Zeke is invincible! Axel's fighting spirit surged through his veins, igniting a fire within him. With a determined swipe, he wiped away the blood that stained the corner of his mouth, ready to dive back into the battle like a ferocious tiger pouncing on its prey. Zeke couldn't help but be taken aback by Axel's unwavering strength, he muster up the courage to launch another attack, defying the odds. The clash between these two experts was nothing short of terrifying. Their blows were so powerful that they seemed to be capable of tearing the very fabric of reality. Their fists were like unbreakable weapons, striking with the force that could shatter mountains. But despite Axel's relentless determination, the gap in strength between him and Zeke began to take its toll. Slowly but surely, Axel found himself losing his balance, showing signs of retreat. On the flip side, Zeke was growing bolder and more courageous with each passing moment of the fight. It was as if an unyielding wellspring of strength surged through his veins, propelling him forward. Not only was his physical might intensifying, but his agility was also skyrocketing to new heights. He had completely subdued Axel, leaving him no room to retaliate. Axel's body bore the marks of countless wounds, each more severe than the last. Blood trickled not only from the corner of his mouth, but also from his nose and ears. The source of this devastation was none other than Zeke's inner energy, a force that left spectators in awe. Zeke's name was renowned far and wide, for he was truly invincible in this realm. Even though they knew Axel stood no chance against him, the onlookers were astounded by Zeke's unparalleled combat prowess. Good heavens, Zeke simply is terrifying! Juan managed to defeat a hundred opponents, yet Axel was able to defeat him with a single strike. But now Axel finds himself suppressed and pummeled by Zeke. What level of power has Zeke attained? This is beyond comprehension. I dare not even fathom it. Zeke locked eyes with Axel, a hint of surprise flickering in his eyes. I must admit, I'm astonished that you're still standing. Besides myself, few can endure my relentless onslaught and live to tell the tale. So I'm surprised you're still alive, Zeke declared triumphantly to Axel. Axel knew there was a lot at stake, though Zeke was seemingly gaining the upper hand. You seem to be able to defeat me, Axel said panting. Zeke scoffed. What's wrong? Do you think trash like you still has a chance to turn the tables? Axel's expression changed. I'm not your real opponent, but my boss can easily kill you. I'm a tough fighter, but he'll knock you to the floor. Zeke's eyes widened. Your boss? Axel smirked. Damon Walker. You should have heard of him. I think this is the person you want to kill. Zeke snarled. Call your boss over. I want to see his strength. But there was no need to call him over anymore. Unbeknownst to Zeke's, Damon had already arrived, standing beside Bernadette. He took a glass of wine from someone and drank it while approaching the battle, waiting for the right time to step in. Are you calling me? Damon said with a smile on his face. Zeke's eyes locked into Damon. You're Damon, I presume. Damon nodded. Yes, I am. Everyone held their breaths. Zeke stared at Damon. You managed to cheat death. Yet instead of laying low and staying out of trouble, you decided to flaunt your survival, showing your face to anyone who would pay attention. And on top of it, you even dared to offend Silas. You don't seem to value your own life, do you? Damon responded with a question of his own. So, your name is Zeke, huh? I heard from Quincy that you were the one who caused him harm in the past. Zeke nodded proudly. Ah, yeah, that was quite the accomplishment, I must say. But what's this? You want to kill me? Do you honestly believe you have what it takes? Damon calmly finished the last sip of his wine, his gaze unwavering. That's right, Zeke. I'm going to end you. What did you just say? You think you can kill me? Zeke snarled. The room erupted with laughter directed at Damon. They may not have known the extent of Damon's abilities, but they had all witnessed Zeke's strength firsthand. Earlier, Juan had boldly declared that he could take on a hundred people all by himself. While his words may have seemed like an empty boast, there was no denying the sheer strength he possessed. After all, he had proven himself time and time again in the bustling streets of Los Angeles. But then came Axel. 
With just a few swift motions, he absolutely defeated Juan, leaving everyone in awe. Axel possessed a power that surpassed the ordinary, making it nearly impossible for anyone to even touch him. Yet even this mighty Axel found himself powerless in the presence of Zeke. The question on everyone's mind was, what realm had Zeke achieved? It was a thought that dare not be entertained, for it was simply too mind-boggling to comprehend. And then Damon appeared on the scene. Has his brain been fried? They whispered amongst themselves. Did he say he could defeat Zeke? Zeke wore a confident smile as he extended three fingers. Three moves! I'll give you three moves! He declared. But after that, get ready to face a storm that you won't be able to withstand. Good, it's a deal. Damon responded, his face breaking into a sly grin. The stage was set. In a world filled with pretentious criminals seeking death, Damon had encountered his fair share of them. He knew how to handle himself. Is there any merit in this? Zeke will trample him to death later. Someone scoffed. This only fueled Zeke's belief that Damon was weak. He was determined to slap Damon's face until it swelled after just three moves. Make your move, Zeke shouted. Damon charged straight at Zeke. Zeke quickly fought back, swinging a punch at Damon. Damon stood still as a mountain, evading Zeke's attacks effortlessly. However, Zeke was not impressed. This level of speed was child's play for him. But then something unexpected happened. Damon took off his shoes. Zeke wondered why. Before he could even finish his thought, a loud <laughs> echoed through the air, followed by Zeke's agonized cry. Damon had slapped him across the face with his shoe. The onlookers couldn't believe their eyes. It must be some kind of illusion, someone gasped. But one of the onlookers quickly dismissed the idea of an illusion, pointing out the clear shoe print on Zeke's face. It may not have caused much physical pain, but the humiliation was undeniable. Zeke was seething with anger, his eyes blazing with fury. Damn it! You're gonna die a horrible death! He spat at Damon, who simply shrugged and replied, There are still two more moves. You attacked me! Zeke exclaimed, his voice rising. With my speed, I'm not about to let you ambush me. But there won't be a second chance like this. Get ready. Damon smirked. I'll hit your left cheek now. Zeke tensed, his eyes darting back and forth. Before he could react, Damon was upon him, his shoe raised high above his head. Zeke knew that it was too late to turn back now. He thought back to Damon's earlier words, realizing with sickening fear that he had been played. Damon's shoe didn't come from the left side, as he promised. Instead, it came from the right, catching Zeke off guard and sending him reeling. Zeke swiftly sidestepped, but not fast enough to avoid the blow. The impact was so forceful that it triggered a nosebleed and caused his face to swell. Damon chuckled. You claimed to be fast, didn't you? Yet here you are, failing to dodge even a simple strike to your cheek. And not only that, you approached me instead of evading. Damon delivered another blow to Zeke's already battered face. Zeke's body absorbed the relentless beating, leaving him bloodied and bruised. It became painfully clear that dodging was not an option for him in this unequal battle. The onlookers couldn't comprehend why Zeke who was known for his agility, seemed incapable of avoiding the onslaught. Confusion filled the air as whispers spread among the crowd. Look at Zeke's swollen face. How did he let himself get beaten like that? But didn't they agree on three-move agreement? Why is he failing to dodge at all? I could see tears welling up in his eyes. The pain must be unbearable. Zeke desperately wanted to evade Damon's lightning-fast attacks, but Damon's speed was beyond human comprehension. There was nowhere to hide, no escape, from this relentless onslaught. Zeke's loyal subordinates realized the gravity of the situation. They knew that Zeke's life was in imminent danger, and without a second thought, they charged toward Damon from both sides. They believed their combined strength would at least inflict some damage on Damon. But to their astonishment, Damon didn't even bother to turn his head. With a single swift motion, he delivered a powerful slap that sent the two subordinates hurtling through the air their bodies colliding into the wall, rendering them unconscious. Come on, is that all you've got? Damon cheered. Zeke would not let this injustice go unpunished. No one could endure such a beating without seeking retribution. Zeke's teeth went flying, blood filling his mouth as he struggled to speak. He accused Damon of cheating to secure his victory. But deep down, Zeke's heart was heavy. The satisfaction of bragging had quickly faded, leaving him feeling empty and defeated. Damon, towering over Zeke, lifted him with ease, 
His voice was determined as he spoke of avenging Quincy. The shock on Zeke's face was evident as he tried to comprehend what was happening. Fear crept into Zeke's voice as he warned Damon of the consequences. He believed that his superior would protect him and that Damon wouldn't dare lay a finger on him. But Damon's smile revealed a cool and merciless side. Zeke's confidence wavered as he felt Damon's killing intent. The realization of his vulnerability struck him, leaving him trembling in fear. He desperately tried to assert his power. Damon's gaze remained steady as he looked at Zeke, his expression unreadable. Zeke, mistaking Damon's calmness for fear, continued to shout and make demands. Damon interrupted Zeke's tirade. Are you done yet? Zeke's face contorted in shock. What do you mean? Did you even listen to me? He demanded. Suddenly, a sharp crack echoed through the air. Zeke's eyes widened in terror as he realized what was happening. His last thought before he died was the realization that he had underestimated his opponent. Who would have thought that Damon would have the audacity to kill him so swiftly and so cleanly? Zeke had been a powerful force in the world for so long, yet he had met his end in such a cowardly manner. The bystanders were equally stunned. They had never imagined that Damon would be capable of such ruthless acts. Damon didn't even flinch as he took Zeke's life. In a panic, the people scattered in all directions, crying out for everyone to run from the devil himself. Damon was fed up with these people and their games. He turned to Quincy and declared, Tomorrow morning, we take down the corporation. The battle starts in the afternoon. The death of Zeke marked the beginning of their final showdown. With Zeke gone, it was time to deal with Silas once and for all. Killing Zeke was more than just eliminating a target. It was Damon's way of announcing that he was stepping out of the shadows and into the spotlight. He was ready to take on Silas with all of his might and crush him completely. After handing over the nightclub to Brenadette, Damon headed home. As he pulled up to the Brokerton mansion, he noticed the lights were on. Avery was waiting for him, and she had been busy. The higher-ups had ordered Silas and Zeke to take Damon out, but Avery had taken care of them but one by one when they tried to infiltrate the mansion. Her current strength was on par with Axel's. She never felt less afraid in her life. Damon noticed the faint traces of blood in the corner of the wall. Where did this blood come from? Avery playfully rolled her eyes at Damon. Well, who do you think cleaned up that little problem for you? Damon's heart skipped a beat as he felt a surge of gratitude toward Avery. Unable to contain his emotions, he wrapped his arms around her waist and whispered, Thank you. With desire and temptation gleaming in her eyes, she teasingly remarked, Is that all I get? Just a word of thanks? After freshening up, Avery slipped into her comfortable pajamas and poured herself a glass of wine. She stood on the balcony, awaiting Damon's return after his shower. As she caught sight of his strong, muscular chest, she was unable to resist reaching out and touching his shoulder. I heard you took care of someone named Zeke today? Damon nodded, his expression serious. Yes, we will be facing Silas tomorrow. He's the one who is behind the financial crisis. Avery nodded. She had become accustomed to taking lives, but when it came to financial matters, she was still in the dark. Avery changed the subject. When do you plan to lay your cards at the table? Damon was confused, but Avery wasn't done yet. Just now, when you were bathing, Fifi called you. She watched as Damon's nerves began to fray. You didn't pick it up, did you? Damon asked in a panic. Avery shook her head. Of course not, Damon, but do you remember what I said last time? I plan to tell Fifi my identity and fight for your heart. Damon's face twisted in discomfort, knowing that what was coming couldn't be avoided. Avery looked down shyly, her cheeks flushing as she spoke again. We had so many beautiful things in the past, especially when my first time. She said, her voice low and sultry. Before Damon could answer, Avery softly graced his neck with a kiss. As Damon rubbed the sleep from his eyes, he realized Avery was gone. A note from her lay on the table saying that she had already gone back to Meyerson. Meanwhile, Quincy had rallied an impressive group of allies, including Kyle, Hans, and Bernadette, to reclaim his power from the Mont Barker group. They hoped the transfer of power would be as smooth as a hot knife slicing through butter. That afternoon, Silas made his move. Almost all the upper class's wealth and power had fallen under Silas's control or influence. He launched a relentless attack on the three prominent families in Bernadette's properties leaving destruction in his wake. The chaos of this war was evident in the stock market, where the shares of the Mont Barker Group and the Schimmel Company and Bernadette's companies all plummeted. However, the three families in Bernadette were not to be underestimated. 
Silas transferred resources was also suffered a heavy blow. Both sides experienced significant fluctuations in their share prices. While the fall of the three major families was more pronounced, Silas's control capital wasn't faring much better. As the market closed, signaling the end of today's battle, Silas knew that an even greater storm was on the horizon. This was just the beginning. In the headquarters of the Brokerton Group, Silas sat on a magnificent golden chair, his gaze fixed on the lights outside the window. His mind was consumed with thoughts, contemplating the next play in his high six game. After Robert and Nancy disappeared without a trace, Silas took matters into his own hands. With his cunning and strategic mind, he orchestrated a series of operations that ultimately led to the Brokerton Group falling under his control. There was no way he was going to let Damon take over. Silas had his sights set on becoming the true king of the city. As the stock market closed, Silas's secretary stood by, ready to report the latest developments. Under your wise and heroic leadership, we have won a great victory this time, she said, praising Silas for his success in defeating the three great families in Bernadette. But Silas knew better than to let his guard down. Their failure is natural, he said, but we can't afford to make mistakes. That little jerk Damon still has some tricks up his sleeve. Just then, the secretary dropped a bombshell. Zeke was dead, killed at a nightclub. Silas was shocked at first, but Silas was confident in his safety, thanks to the protection of Mysterious Superior. Silas wondered why Bernadette and Lara would turn on him. Was it possible that the love potion he had slipped them didn't work, or was it all Damon's doing? Silas knew he had to act fast and put an end to this battle once and for all. He planned to take care of Damon. He knew that even Damon was cunning and had many connections. He would still meet his demise. Silas had a plan and it was a good one. He had a massive international investment waiting in the wings, ready to pounce on the financial market like a hungry lion. And when it did, Damon wouldn't stand a chance. Silas would swallow up all of his money in one fell swoop. The next morning, everyone could sense that something big was about to happen. Financial managers were on high alert. And then it happened. The market had opened, and the two opposing consortiums went head to head in a fierce battle. The entire financial market was thrown into disarray. But Silas was in control. He had been watching the market closely since the beginning of the auction, and he knew exactly what to do. Silas had prepared for this moment, and with his backup plan firmly in place, there was no sign of stopping him. As the battle raged on, Silas couldn't help but revel in Damon's struggle. A wicked smile crept across his face as he watched the stock market relishing in the sight of his opponent losing the upper hand. A stunning woman materialized behind Silas, capturing his attention. It was none other than Blair, his fiery girlfriend. With a fierce determination in her eyes, Blair spoke with a venomous tone, urging Silas to emerge victorious in the match and crush Damon beneath his feet. Silas, we have to do whatever it takes. She vowed to rally her forces and evict Damon and his woman from the prestigious Brokerton Mansion leaving them to beg on the streets of Los Angeles like lowly dogs. The memory of being chased out by Damon in that very mansion burned within Blair, igniting a deep desire for revenge. Silas, sensing Blair's anger, pulled her into his arms, promising to tear Damon into pieces and avenge her. But just as they were lost in their own world, their secretary burst into the room, delivering unsettling news. An unknown source of capital had infiltrated their company, reaping massive profits at their expense. Silas furrowed his brow, examining the stock market with a mix of concern and determination. Blair, standing by his side, experienced a surge of anxiety. She questioned Silas, her voice trembling with worry, fearing that their plans were in jeopardy. But Silas chuckled, a sinister glint in his eyes. Our little fish has taken the bait, he declared. He's foolishly mobilizing capital to support his friends. God, he's so arrogant. Believing that he could go up against me, I'll show him the true meaning of despair and misery. Are you sure? Blair asked. Silas nodded. I'll make sure he trembles in fear whenever he thinks of me, for the rest of his pathetic existence. Silas swiftly dialed a number on his phone, setting his plan into motion. As the first wave of capital flooded the market, Silas's colossal funds surged in, encircling the initial group's capital and Damon's forces. The clash between these two financial powerhouses sent shockwaves to the market, causing a frenzy in the shares of major companies. The influx of funds triggered a domino effect, 
setting the stock market ablaze. Individual investors and fund managers alike were left dumbfounded, their jaws dropping as they witnessed the unprecedented chaos unfolding before their eyes. What on earth is happening? The market is shaking violently. It's like a roller coaster, up and down without any warning. There's no news or financial reports to explain this madness. But even a lightning strike wouldn't cause such an explosive reaction. As the closing bell drew near, Damon's funds began to gain the upper hands. Not only did they manage to recoup the lost profits of the three family shares, but they also soared an average of five points higher. To add insult to injury, Silas's company found itself suppressed and overshadowed by Damon's triumph. As the market closed, Blair's worried gaze fell upon Silas. Why does it feel like our shares have plummeted even further? She asked, her voice laced with concern. Silas remained calm, his eyes fixed on the numbers flashing across the screen. The outer region funds had no impact. He replied, his tone measured. But could it be that we've lost? Blair pressured, her anxiety mounting. The top brass of the company watched Silas with bated breath, their own worries etched on their faces. And it wasn't just them. Even the big bosses who had entrusted their funds to Silas were calling him, demanding answers. But Silas seemed unfazed. Despite the obvious lack of gains in today's battle, he exuded an air of confidence. As she casually dismissed the investors, he turned to the senior executives and declared, Don't worry, this is just the appetizer. Wait for the main course. He went on. Damon has far more energy than this. The final battle is still to come. Let the bullets fly for a while. I promise you, when the time comes, we won't be able to spend all the money we'll earn in 10 lifetimes. Silas had a voracious appetite for success. He wanted to fight a beautiful battle and earn a fortune from Damon's pocket. Damon would never be able to make a comeback. Damon made his way back to Meyerson. Fifi had summoned him. The phone call had been cryptic, with Fifi merely instructing him to return and to discuss something important. But Damon, sharp and perceptive, knew better than to underestimate the gravity of the situation. Avery had already divulged her plan to him. The two women had undoubtedly laid their cards on the table, leaving Damon with no choice but to confront the impending storm. As he journeyed home, Damon's mind was plagued with a throbbing headache, yet he steeled himself for the challenges that awaited him. Upon his arrival, he was greeted not only by Fifi and Avery, but also Vicky, who exuded an air of satisfaction at his misfortune. The three women stood together, their expressions a kaleidoscope of emotions. Vicky was almost celebratory about his predicament, her eyes gleaming with a malicious delight. Avery, on the other hand, wore a subtle smile, her attentions veiled behind her enigmatic gaze. And Fifi, her eyes brimming with a mix of resentment and sadness, took the initiative to break this tense silence. Cupcake? Fifi began with a hint of bitterness. Why don't we go and have a chat with Avery first? With those words, Fifi gracefully ascended the stairs, leaving Damon alone with Avery. Vicky, ever the observer, feigned nonchalance as she sat on a nearby chair pretending to read the paper, occasionally stealing glances at Damon. Damon approached Avery and lowered his voice. You told her? He inquired, his eyes searching hers for answers. Avery, her eyes rolling in exasperation, responded, you already know the answer to that, don't you? Damon stood there, feeling helpless. He couldn't even begin to guess how Fifi would respond to Avery's bald statement. The anticipation was eating away at him, but he didn't have the courage to take a guess. Avery found the situation amusing. She suggested that Damon go and ask Fifi about the matter himself. Damon walked upstairs to Fifi's room, his heart pounding in his chest. As he entered, he found Fifi standing by the window, lost in her thoughts. It was as if she had been expecting him, but her indifferent glance and turned head suggested otherwise. However, her pouting lips betrayed her true feelings. Damon struggled to find the right words, but before he could speak, Fifi cut him off. She seemed impatient, questioning why he was still there instead of searching for Avery. Damon couldn't resist any longer. He approached her, wrapping his arms around her waist from behind. The moment their bodies touched, Fifi felt a wave of warmth and vulnerability wash over her. She melted into Damon's embrace. Damon held the stunning woman in his arms, caressing her hair with a tenderness that spoke volumes. But as he looked into her eyes, he realized that he didn't know how to say what he needed to say. He already owed Fifi too much, and showing mercy everywhere had led to a betrayal of love. When their child was born, Damon had disappeared 
leaving Fifi to raise the baby alone. Now that Avery had returned, he couldn't handle the complicated relationship, and Vicky was watching from the sidelines. Damon knew he had failed in the relationship department, and he had no excuses. His words felt dry and inadequate as he finally managed to utter a simple, I'm sorry. Fifi's tears flowed down her cheeks, and Damon felt the weight of his sins. Feelings were always selfish, and when Susanna revealed that she was really Avery, Fifi felt like the sky was falling. Avery was Damon's ex-girlfriend, and back then, Fifi had used underhanded tactics to trick Damon into marrying her and pulling him back to her side. She had let Avery down in the first place, which is why she was so afraid of Avery coming back. When Avery confidently declared that she wanted Damon back, Fifi was terrified. She had stolen Damon from Avery in the first place, and now she feared losing him to the woman she had wronged. Damon was caught in the middle, unsure of how to navigate the complicated emotions swirling around him. Damon held Fifi close, his lips gently brushing away her tears. Please don't cry. He whispered, his voice filled with sincerity. I'll do anything you ask of me. Fifi shook her head. What could she possibly ask of Damon? She could make a scene, demand to choose between her and Avery, or even walk away from it all. But deep down, she knew she couldn't bring herself to do it. From a young age, Fifi had yearned for a love that was pure and untainted. She was a romantic. She dreamt of finding someone who cherished her, treating her like a precious gem for the rest of her days. But since meeting Damon, everything had changed. For the first time, Fifi discovered that love had a different kind of beauty. It made her smile, it made her grieve, and it made her give her heart and soul to Damon. She was willing to sacrifice everything, even her own life, for him. She could ask Damon to leave Avery to acknowledge that she was now his true wife. She believed that he would listen to her. After all, she was the mother of his child, but she also knew that Damon's love for Avery ran deep. Fifi found herself torn between her desires and the reality of the situation. She wasn't an innocent player in this game. She knew that love wasn't always straightforward and that it could get messy and complicated. And yet, she hoped that somehow, some way, Damon would choose her in the end. If Fifi forced Damon to leave Avery, it would break his heart. And if Damon was sad, Fifi would be even more devastated. She wondered if a divorce was the answer, or maybe living alone. When she was younger, she had dreamed of being independent and free, but now the thought of not being with Damon made her heart ache. She didn't want to repeat the mistakes of the past and lose him again. Fifi couldn't bear to see him unhappy. So what could she do? Besides compromising, was there another way? As she pondered her options, Damon sensed her inner turmoil. He wrapped his arms around her and whispered, Thank you. Damon was her kryptonite, and she was powerless against him. As their passion ignited, Damon lifted Fifi onto the bed. At that moment, nothing else mattered but their love. After their intense encounter, Fifi was left feeling completely satisfied, and her mood lifted to new heights. She bit her lip and combed her hair with her fingers. All right, cupcake. Go and see your first love. I can handle myself. Damon, not wanting to leave just yet, leaned in for a few more lingering kisses before reluctantly going, Wait! She called out, stopping him in his tracks. Damon turned around. What's wrong? He asked. Fifi approached him, wrapping her arms around him in a tight embrace. Cupcake, no matter what the future holds, I'll always have your heart, right? She whispered. Damon sighed. Yes, you will. He replied, though they both knew that he couldn't promise her that. Damon went to Avery's room. Avery had uncorked a bottle of wine and positioned herself on the balcony, ready to engage in their own private rendezvous. So, what did you say to Fifi? She asked when Damon closed the door behind him. Damon smirked. Of course, we talked about you. He replied. Avery nodded knowingly, her senses heightened as she caught a whiff of Fifi's perfume on Damon's body. She couldn't resist making a sly remark. Fifi must have forgiven you, she stated, her tone both amused and slightly jealous. Damon was taken aback, surprised by Avery's astuteness. How did you know? Avery rolled her eyes. How could I not know the way you operate by now? You're a bad guy, Damon. I can tell you only think of me after you've kissed Fifi. Otherwise, why would you be covered in her perfume? Avery's intuition proved to be spot on as she observed Damon's silence. With a sweet smile, she asked, How are you feeling now? What? Um, what do you mean? He stammered. Avery scoffed. Oh, come on, don't play dumb. 
you big pervert. You're living every man's dream. Multiple women who desire you, all living under the same roof. Damon pretended to be oblivious to Avery's teasing. After all, what else could he do? The situation he found himself in was both a blessing and a curse. It was inevitable to have all these women together, but it also meant he was treading on thin ice. One wrong move and he could find himself spiraling into an abyss of trouble. As if she could read his thoughts, Avery laughed. So, big bad guy, are you feeling a hint of fear now? Let me warn you, if you ever dare to hurt Fifi and me in the future, we'll team up and kick you out of this house. You won't be able to come back home. Damon forced an awkward smile, not daring to take Avery's words lightly. After all, she was known for her unpredictability. Who knew if she would actually follow through with her threat when jealousy reared its ugly head? Avery's eyes sparkled with satisfaction as she nodded. Damon, let me ask you something. She began. Can you handle the two of us? Damon, still lost in thought from Avery's earlier threatening words, took a moment to come back to reality. Handle what? He asked, confusion evident in his voice. Avery pushed his chest flirtingly. Oh, you scoundrel, what do you think? With that, Avery launched a playful attack on Damon, their laughter filling the room. Before long, the symphony of fate played once again, the clouds of uncertainty dispersing as Avery lay on the bed, her face flushed with passion. Her soft eyes overflowed with love, and even her body felt weak and spent. Damn it, she exclaimed breathless. How are you still so powerful? No man could resist the temptation of her words, and Damon was no exception. His confidence soared as he heard her question. Are you still worried now? He asked with a hint of pride in his voice. Avery blushed, too shy to respond. Despite her exhaustion, she was amazed at Damon's seemingly endless energy. It was as if he hadn't broken a sweat at all. Reluctantly, Avery mustered the strength to playfully kick Damon. All right, you bad guy. I'm going to sleep. You go and keep your first wife company. As Damon pushed open the bedroom door, he couldn't help but smile at the sight before him. Fifi was peacefully asleep, her face serene and innocent. It was a touching moment, one that reminded Damon of the selflessness that Fifi possessed. He knew deep down that Fifi had orchestrated this whole situation for his own good. She had deliberately put herself to sleep early, allowing him to stay by Avery's side and figure out where they stood. But as Damon made his way back to Avery's room, he was met with the closed door and the sound of gentle snores. Avery too had fallen asleep. Just as he was lost in thought, Damon turned around, only to find Vicky standing there, her eyes filled with resentment. You really don't know your way around this house, do you? Vicky said, only half-jokingly. Damon sighed, feeling a headache coming on. He had spent so much time with Vicky in the city, helping her through her troubles. He hadn't expected her to show up in Meyerson so soon. It was clear that Vicky's feelings for him were just as strong as Fifi and Avery's. Although Vicky wore a faint smile, Damon could see the jealousy burning in her eyes. The situation had become even more complicated, and Damon wondered how he would navigate the tangled web of emotions that surrounded him. Deep within Vicky's heart, she still thought that she and Damon were destined to be together. It all began when they were mere infants, their parents already envisioning a future where they would one day marry. Now, Avery and Fifi had once again stolen Damon's attention away from her. A heavy sadness weighed upon Vicky's soul, casting a shadow over her every thought. She longed for Damon to look into her eyes with the same intensity she felt for him. Frustration bubbled up within Vicky, threatening to consume her. In a fit of anger, she stomped her foot. What's the matter? Don't you have anything to say to me? Damon felt as if he were traversing a treacherous path, walking on blades that threatened to cut him at every step. He knew that one wrong move could lead to his destruction. Caught between Vicky's outburst and his internal turmoil, Damon found himself at a loss for words. Since you refuse to speak, I'll speak for you. It's clear that you're afraid to confront the truth, especially when it comes to facing me. Vicky's tears cascaded down her cheeks, her heart heavy with the injustice of it all. Why was Avery able to flaunt their relationship while she had to keep hers hidden? It just wasn't fair. Let's not talk about this right now. Damon said awkwardly, do you understand how uncomfortable I am? She cried. I want to talk about my relationship with Fifi too. What should I do? Vicky suddenly perked up. Hey, Fifi and Avery are both asleep. What are you going to do now? Damon knew exactly what she was thinking. 
He walked over to her and wrapped his arms around her waist, pulling her close. Vicky's face lit up with a smile, feeling the warmth of his embrace. The next morning, the sun rose early, and so did the three women. As they sizzled up some bacon and eggs, they chatted away like old friends catching up on lost time. These ladies were no ordinary trio. They were all born into wealth and had their brains to match. Their interests and hobbies were identical, and their values were aligned perfectly. It was as if they were made for each other. After breakfast, the ladies asked Damon to clean up the table while they continued their conversation. This is not what Damon had expected. He had imagined himself as the center of attention, but instead he was left with a pile of dirty dishes. Feeling a little overwhelmed, Damon spoke up. Do you think we should hire a maid? No way, Fifi said. Honestly, after single-handedly raising Junior for all these years, it's such a refreshing change to have some extra hands to help out, even if our situation is a bit unconventional. When Damon was done with the dishes, the three women proposed a shopping spree. Damon hesitated, not particularly keen on the idea, but eventually Sir came to their persuasive powers and found himself being dragged along by the trio into the bustling streets. Their eyes soon caught the sight of dazzling jewelry store adjacent to them, and without a second thought, they dashed inside. Wow, look at all these exquisite pieces! Fifi exclaimed, her eyes winding with awe as she gazed at the jewelry display in the store window. The clerk beamed at them. You won't believe it, but what you see here is just our ordinary jewelry collection. We have something even more extravagant hidden away in the back. Care to take a peek? Fifi's eyes widened with curiosity. Oh, absolutely, show us. With a confident stride, the clerk disappeared into the depths of the store and returned with three breathtaking pink diamond necklaces. These beauties are our most expensive necklaces, the clerk boasted. They were all crafted by the same renowned designer. Trust me, their price tags are sky high. Fifi picked one of the necklaces and turned to Damon, seeking his opinion. Cupcake, do you think it looks good on me? Avery, not one to be left out, also adorned herself with the necklace and chimed in. Oh, I adore it too. Fifi noticed the sparkle in Vicky's eyes as she admired the necklace. With a mischievous grin, Fifi suggested, Well, since there are three necklaces and three of us, why not just buy them all? Although Fifi was known for her diligence and thriftiness, she was more than willing to let Damon foot the bill. And with Avery and Vicky present, it only made sense for each of them to have one. It seemed like the perfect opportunity to splurge and indulge a little luxury. Fifi had a keen sense of reading for people, especially when it came to matters of the heart. And when it came to Vicky's feelings for Damon, Fifi could see right through her. As Fifi observed Vicky's gaze upon Damon, she saw the spark in her eyes. It was as if Vicky's heart was silently screaming its love for him. Meanwhile, Damon seemed lost in thought, his brow furrowed as he examined the three necklaces before them. Just then, a man wearing a flashy gold chain necklace approached the trio. Hey there, if you like these necklaces so much, how about I buy them for you? His vulgar gaze made Fifi's skin crawl. It was rare enough to come across one beautiful woman, but this man had stumbled upon three all at once. However, it was crystal clear that all three of the women were head over heels for Damon. The man narrowed his eyes. He thought he was handsome, but these women looked at him with disgust. His ego was bruised. He always believed he was quite the catch himself, but when he looked at Fifi, she didn't even spare him a glance. So he devised a plan, a plan that involved spending money. He thought with money, he could win over their hearts. He could shower them with lavish gifts and experiences, and surely that would make them see his worth. Vicky piped up. Do you think you're all that just because you have money? Yeah, Avery chimed in. Why are you sticking your nose into our business anyway? Hey, are you looking down on me? He exclaimed, his frustration evident. I could give you a life beyond your wildest dreams. Vicky curled her lips in disdain as she looked at the man with the gold chain necklace. Are you rich? You don't look like much to me. The man's face twisted into an ugly expression as he retorted. What did you say? Do you think I'm poor? It seems like you're the one who's trying to show off here. Fifi quickly interjected. Look, sir, with all due respect, we're just browsing the necklaces. The man laughed arrogantly. Oh, you want this necklace? Well, I hate to break it to you, but this jewelry store is mine. And I happen to be the second largest shareholder of the jewelry company. So no matter how much money you have, you won't be able to buy this necklace. The three women's expressions changed instantly. They had no idea that the man was the owner of the store. 
this was going to be a bit more difficult than he anticipated. Fifi was in a bind and turned to Damon for help. With a furrowed brow, Damon turned on his heel and went outside. As he approached the signboard, he whipped out his phone and dialed Pitbull. The store owner noticed the three women's worried expressions, but Damon's sudden exit to make a call had him grinning ear from ear. What's the matter? Calling the cops? Trying to get me arrested? Tch! Even if you brought the king himself, you wouldn't be able to buy those necklaces without my permission. The owner taunted. But Damon wasn't phased. He returned to the group with a newfound confidence and a glint in his eyes. You're the Golden Stone Jewelry Company, right? And the Watterson Group is the Umbrella Company. He asked, sizing up the man in front of him. The owner puffed out his chest. That's right, what of it? Do you know the boss of the Watterson Group? If not, you have no right to speak to me. But Damon just smiled. He had a trick up his sleeve, and he was about to show this smug owner who the boss was. Well, it turns out that I own the Watterson Group. Damon calmly replied. What? The man's jaw dropped. It can't be. Damon whipped out his phone and showed the man the files Pitbull had just sent there in black and white was Damon's name. I, I apologize, the man stammered. I had no idea. Please forgive my ignorance. Damon relished in the satisfaction of proving the man wrong. He had always enjoyed these moments where his power and influence were undeniable. No need to apologize, Damon replied. It's understandable that you were unaware. After all, my success tends to fly under the radar. He had worked tirelessly to build his empire, and now he was reaping the rewards. As the man scurried to make some phone calls to confirm it, Damon couldn't help but admire the efficiency of his team. They were always one step ahead, ensuring that everything ran smoothly in his world. Within moments, the man returned with a bitter expression on his face. He approached Damon, his head bound in submission. His fear now mixed with a hint of respect. I apologize once again, sir, the man said, his voice trembling. I had no idea who I was speaking to. Please allow me to make it up to you. The group of sales clerks stood there in disbelief, as they witnessed their boss, who had never admitted defeat, bowing his head to Damon. What on earth was happening? And it wasn't just the sales clerks who were taken aback. The three women who had accompanied Damon were equally amazed. No wonder they all liked him. Unable to contain their excitement, the group of sales clerks exchanged knowing winks with Damon. They were in awe of him. And who could blame them? He had effortlessly won over their boss, and now they were witnessing the rewards of his charm and charisma. The store owner stepped forward. Our company's president just declared that having you and these lovely ladies choose our goods is the greatest honor of our shop. He announced, As a gesture of friendship, our boss wants to offer you everything at half price, considered a token of our appreciation. With the jewelry purchase, Damon and the women moved to a boutique next door. Fifi, Avery, and Vicky were giddy and full of adrenaline from Damon's shocking display of power. They excitedly picked out a large pile of clothes for him to try on. As Damon reluctantly transformed into a makeshift model, the three women were completely smitten with him, their love for Damon growing with each passing moment. It was a bittersweet experience for him as he found himself caught in their adoring gazes. It couldn't stay this harmonious forever. Los Angeles was a city on the edge, teetering on the brink of danger. Silas, cunning and strategic, wasted no time, taking advantage of the time difference. He began reaching out to capital consortiums across the globe at the crack of dawn. One by one, he called them, gathering all the strength and resources he could muster. His plan was clear, to swallow up all the capital Damon had invested and make a massive windfall. Silas was meticulous in his calculations, even down to the seconds. He anticipated that the country's capital would detect their movements and transfer resources to counteract the situation. He had thought of everything, leaving no room for error. The third day of the financial war proved to be even more intense and grandiose than the previous two. The battle had already caused the stock market to spiral into chaos on the second day. The ripple effect was felt throughout the related industries, resulting in widespread turmoil. As Silas's call reached more ears, hot money and foreign investments poured into the accounts. Silas didn't even allow himself a moment of rest. He sat through the night eagerly awaiting the opening of the market. He knew this was a make-or-break moment, and he simply couldn't afford to lose against Damon. The stakes were high, and if he failed, he would be left with nothing. But if he emerged victorious, his status within the organization would soar to unprecedented heights. Money, once a symbol of wealth and power, 
was now being reduced to mere scraps of paper, vanishing at an alarming rate. It was as if the very foundations of the financial world were being shaken to their core. By 11 o'clock in the morning, the immense capital of the three powerful families, led by Bernadette, joined forces and transformed into a financial tsunami, ready to engage in an unparalleled showdown with Silas. Nerves coursed through Silas's veins, but before he could even take a sip of his coffee, Blair came rushing toward him. Silas, we're in trouble, Blair exclaimed. Another foreign capital just swooped in, putting us at a major disadvantage. Silas gently stroked Blair's hair, trying to offer reassurance. Don't worry, he whispered. Victory is ours for the taking. But deep down, Silas couldn't deny the flutter of nerves that danced within him. He knew Damon wouldn't sit idly by. Sooner or later, they would have to meet. Despite exerting nearly all of his strength, Damon still managed to gain the upper hand. It was a shocking revelation for Silas, who had always believed Damon to be nothing more than a useless fool. Silas pondered for a moment before posing the question, where did Damon acquire the foreign capital he transferred? Blair's response was swift, from Europe, but it's not a substantial amount. Silas nodded, realizing that Damon was nearing the end of his resources. Silas took a moment to gather his thoughts and reached out to his colleagues for assistance. He was willing to pay any price to secure the win. Over the years, Silas had built a reputation that extended far and wide, thanks to the support of his organization and its extensive network that would prove invaluable in his quest for victory. Silas had already pushed himself to the limit, utilizing every ounce of strength he possessed. The stock market was ablaze with the scent of gunpowder and the sound of money burning. Chaos reigned supreme as investors and financial giants were left reeling from the wild fluctuations. The forces aligned with both Damon and Silas were locked in a fierce struggle for dominance. They were consumed by the fight, forgetting to eat or sleep as they watched the market's every move. Damon's forces were on edge, their nerves frayed by the constant uncertainty, but Silas's followers were electrified. They were convinced that their leader would emerge victorious, and they weren't afraid to make their opinions known. Silas is unstoppable, they declared. Anyone who dares stand in his way will be crushed without mercy. He represents the entire upper class of Los Angeles, and his enemies will pay the ultimate price for their defiance. Meanwhile, Damon found himself caught up in a shopping trip with Avery, Fifi, and Vicky when he received news of Silas's strategic counterattack. Vicky, who had always been aware of the deep-seated grudges between Damon and Silas, felt a sense of duty to stand by Damon's side, even if it meant putting her life on the line. As the minutes ticked by after the market opened, the tension in the air became suffocating. While Fifi and Avery were engrossed in rummaging through their clothing racks, Vicky's eyes were fixated on the stock market. She feared the possibility of Damon's defeat, and the emotional roller coaster she experienced was almost unbearable. When Damon flooded the market with his capital and Silas's forces began to retreat, Vicky's face flushed with excitement and her hands trembled with anticipation. However, her joy was short lived as Silas regrouped his forces and launched a massive counterattack. Vicky's heart tightened once again. But just as despair began to settle in, Damon received an unexpected help from friendly investors in Europe. However, the tides quickly turned once more, and Silas emerged victorious yet again. Vicky glanced at Fifi and Avery, oblivious to the intense battle unfolding before them. She felt a surge of affection for Damon. For just a few seconds, she felt like she was the only woman who understood what he was going through. At the Brokerton Group headquarters, Silas was feeling pretty pleased with himself. He was basking in the glow of praise and adoration from his supporters. But just as he was enjoying the moment, Blair came running over with some bad news. Damon had somehow managed to scrape together enough funds to enter the game again. Silas's face twisted into an ugly scowl. He demanded to know which fund it was, and Blair informed him that it was from Canada. Just as quickly as Silas's frown appeared, it was replaced by a determined smile. What does this mean? It means he's running out of options, desperately searching for any source of funds. His once overflowing honeypot is now running dry. Silas stood up and walked to the window. But remember, Robert and Nancy are no longer in the picture, and my backer has grown even stronger. Silas reached for his phone and dialed a number. Reluctantly, he had to admit that Damon was the most formidable opponent he had ever faced. His abilities alone were no longer enough to secure victory. Silas had faith that the higher-ups would come to his aid. If he were to fail, it would be a devastating blow to those in power. And so he believed with every fiber of his being that they would support him. 
Confidence rushed through Silas's veins as he prepared to make his plea. The superior's surprise was palpable when he received Silas's call. Little did he expect that Silas would have the audacity to ask for a loan from him. After all, it was Silas's operations that brought in the majority of the funds for the op organization. The higher-ups had always believed in Silas's strength, assuming that dealing with Damon would be a walk in the park for him. But now, as the superior listened to Silas's request on the phone, he was skeptical. You have a substantial amount of funds at your disposal, yet you claim it's not enough? The superior questioned. Silas replied with a hint of fear. We're facing something intense. You should know that just a few days ago, Zeke... Before Silas could even finish his sentence, the superior cut him off abruptly. Don't mention his name. He was wrongfully murdered by that jerk, Damon. Zeke's name struck a nerve. Silas sighed. Rest assured, sir. Damon is running out of fuel. To defeat me, he'll have to exhaust every last penny, even those hidden overseas. The leader's tense shoulders relaxed as he heard Silas's words. Very well. I'll gather more capital for you. That little scumbag will never be able to rise again. I will avenge Zeke. I want Damon's entire family and everyone he holds dear to suffer. Silas hung up the phone, a wave of relief washing over him. Damon was as good as dead. As expected, it didn't take long for Silas's powerful allies to reach out to him. After all, with Damon drained of his last drop of blood, Silas's power seemed to wane. But he had anticipated this. Every single cent of these capitalist money was tainted with the sweat and blood of hard work. They couldn't bear the thought of losing it all, and panic began to set in. Silas's colleagues were feeling uncertain, but he knew just how to reassure them. Don't fret! The ultimate attack is on its way, and I guarantee that we'll all be rolling in riches. Silas was always one step ahead. His colleagues had no other choice but to have faith in him. Bernadette, Hans, Quincy, and the rest of the team pulled together all their skills and expertise. As the market closed at noon, Damon seemed to have the upper hand temporarily, but his team was not in the best of moods. The trading hall was bustling with the presence of many influential figures, all eyeing Quincy and the others with cold, smug smiles. Don't think for a second that you can emerge victorious, one of them sneered. Just you wait and see. This afternoon, you'll witness the true strength of Silas Brokerton. Another one hissed, and true to his words, when the market reopened in the afternoon, the higher-ups had already flexed their powerful influence, amassing an unimaginable amount of funds to launch an all-out attack on Damon. Vicky, witnessing this turn of events from her phone, felt her face drain of color. Damon, what's happening? Another massive influx of money just entered the market. It seems like we don't have the means to resist. Damon, however, remained unfazed by the chaos unfolding in the stock market. It's fine. He calmly replied. Fifi and Avery were confused by Damon's unusual behavior. What's going on? Fifi finally asked, tearing herself away from her shopping. That's when Vicky spilled the beans. As Vicky's words sunk in, Fifi's face turned pale and Avery was stunned. Despite their best efforts, Fifi and Avery couldn't do anything to help Damon in the short term. Fifi could only manage the logistics and take care of the family, while Avery could help him plan to assassinate the enemy. All they could do was silently pray for Damon's success. The conflict sent shockwaves to the global economy. The haunting memories of the financial storm that had ravaged the world years ago resurfaced. However, this time, the scale of destruction promised to be even greater and more terrifying than before. What made it all more astonishing was that the masterminds behind this chaos were merely two young individuals in their 30s. Bernadette, Quincy, Hans, and the Von Heck family, all directly involved in the financial war, anxiously monitored the market. Despite Damon's best efforts, it seemed that the current situation was beyond salvation. Foreign investors, upon hearing the global reports, were now fixated on this monumental clash. The outcome of this war would shape the future of the financial landscape. They couldn't predict the future, and even if the country's capital reacted at that moment, it would be too late to make a move. It was a game of cat and mouse, and they had to be careful not to get caught. Damon's team was determined to win, they had a deep-rooted hatred for Silas and the people behind him, and they couldn't live under the same sky anymore. They were willing to walk the dark path, even if that meant there was no turning back. Bernadette couldn't help but feel worried, though. Damon was powerful and had shown himself more than capable time and time again, but this time was different. Could Damon still turn the tides this time? Sawyer Brokerton and his father had physically recovered. In anticipation of this joyous occasion, despite the troubles they still faced, 
the Brokerton family had already sent out heartfelt invitations to their loved ones. Tonight, they would warmly welcome their family members, including the beloved Grandma June, as honored guests in their home. The passing of Grandpa Everett had brought about a profound transformation within the Brokerton family. Arnie had decided to retire from his long-held position, only to be met with ungratefulness from those he had once helped. Their careers were left in ruins, a devastating consequence of their selfless acts. As for Grandma June, she could only bear witness to the heartbreaking collapse of her family. Her mind and body bore the weight of this tragedy, and her health began to deteriorate, along with their fortunes. Grandma June's hair shimmered like freshly fallen snow, but her mental state had taken a turn for the worst. Despite this, tears of joy streamed down her face as she saw her son and grandson recover from their illnesses. Now the Brokerton family's future rested on Damon's shoulders. The weight of their expectations was heavy, but they were determined to rise to the challenge. However, there was a dark cloud looming over Damon. Grandma June felt a pang of regret and how grossly she had miscalculated Damon's character. But that was all in the past. Now Grandma June had no choice but to rely on Damon to support the family. Hey guys, have you heard the latest news about Damon? Miranda cried out once they were all together. The room fell silent as everyone turned their attention to her. He's in the midst of a financial war. I'm sure you've been following the reports. Well, he's behind it. Miranda wasted no time in elaborating. Ever since Damon had come to her rescue, she had been captivated by his every move. And now, after delving deep into the sea of information, she had uncovered the truth. Damon was the mastermind. On the other side of the ring stood Silas, a name that sent shivers down the spines of the Brokerton family. Once upon a time, Silas had been close to the family, and even considered a valued member. But his insatiable greed had led him to devour Robert's fortune, leaving the Brokertons in ruins. While the Brokerton family had fallen from grace, Silas had risen to power. Now, the clash between Damon and Silas had ignited a tempest in the global stock market, threatening to engulf anyone who dared to stand in their way. It was a war that would leave no survivors unscathed. As Miranda finished recounting the tale, a hush fell over the room. The air crackled with anticipation, and the friends exchanged glances, their minds racing with the possibilities. Little did they know that they were about to witness a financial showdown like no other, where fortunes would be made and lost, and the world would hold its breath, waiting to see who would emerge victorious from this high-stakes game. Ever since Silas had cunningly snatched away the Brokerton group, he had become an untouchable force in their lives. But what surprised them, especially Grandma June, was Damon's domineering nature. He had surpassed even Robert, reaching the pinnacle of another dimension. It was a sight to behold, and yet, it left them all wondering what he was capable of. Grandma June silently prayed for her grandson, who had never received the love and care he deserved from the family. She hoped that he would accomplish his mission and seek revenge for all the wrongs done to him. But it wasn't just the family who was invested in Damon's journey. Others were rooting for him. Andrew and Mrs. Walker were cheering him on from afar, and his old friends were closely following the news, including Liam. At that moment, Liam was at a bustling restaurant surrounded by a group of people. They delved into a heated discussion about the current news dominating the headlines. Gone were the days when this battle was merely a clash between two individuals, Damon and Silas. It had now transformed into something much grander, aimed at targeting foreign investors and combating the severe shortage of financial capital. As they sat around the table, sipping on their glasses of wine, Liam listened as his colleagues spoke. One of them, a hedge fund manager with notable achievements in the financial field, leaned in and confidently asked, Do you have any idea of the astronomical sums of money involved in this matter? The sheer number of people participating? How much? Everyone asked, nearly in unison. The hedge fund manager revealed, both sides have unleashed nearly a trillion dollars into this, and mind you, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There was also external funds and bloodthirsty investments at play. This, my friends, is a conservative estimate. Gas filled the room as everyone inhaled a sharp breath of icy air. The news was too shocking to comprehend. Tens of billions, hundreds of billions of capital, had been reduced to dust. How could this be possible? There's one more thing, said the hedge fund manager, leaning closer. The person behind this hails from South Rivertown. One of the colleagues turned to the hedge fund manager. So you claim to be a big shot in South Rivertown. Surely you must know the mastermind behind all this. After a brief moment of contemplation, he responded. Honestly, I've never actually met him. It's not something I can boast about. Let me be real with you. 
while I may be considered a prominent figure in the financial circle of South Rivertown, and even the entire state, I'm still leagues away from someone of this caliber. He's on a whole different level, a global phenomenon. To the rest of the people in the room, this legendary figure was nothing more than a myth, an enigma that they could only dream of encountering. But little did they know, Liam had a connection to this elusive mastermind. Liam casually pulled out a cigarette and lit it up. With a slow, deliberate exhale, he spoke. The person you're referring to, Damon, right? The hedge fund manager's eyes widened in astonishment. You know him? He asked, unable to hide his surprise. Liam took a deep breath, his eyes filled with memories of a long time ago. Oh, Damon, he was my childhood friend. He risked his life for me in the past. As soon as those words escaped their lips, a wave of laughter erupted in the room. A colleague questioned, Are you taking us for fools? Even the hedge fund manager found the situation amusing. If you truly have such a great relationship with him, why don't you give him a call? He challenged. The laughter intensified. Liam couldn't find it in himself to join in. He felt like the punchline of a cruel joke. As the laughter subsided, he forced a hollow chuckle and excused himself. I need to use the restroom. With a heavy heart, he stepped outside into the scorching heat. The sun beat down on him, mirroring the weight of his thoughts. Liam reached for his phone, his fingers trembling with a mixture of anticipation and hesitation. He longed to dial Damon's number, to bridge the growing chasm between them. But as he stared at the screen, he couldn't bring himself to make the call. The reality of the situation hit him like a ton of bricks. The gap between him and Damon was widening with each passing day. Damon had always been the epitome of success, but after the news of his supposed demise, Liam never expected him to soar to such unimaginable heights. In the heart of SeaTech headquarters, a captivating woman sat gracefully in front of the window. As the report of the financial war unfolded, her brows furrowed ever so slightly. The assistant concluded the briefing. With a gentle wave of her arm, she dismissed him. Indeed, this woman possessed a power that could topple empires and drive young geniuses to madness. Countless souls had fallen under her spell, unable to resist her allure. As she glanced at the news, her eyes fixated on a particular name. She remembered when she was targeted by hooligans. Fear and anxiety had consumed her, leaving her believing that she was destined for death. But then, like a guardian angel, a masked figure had appeared, coming to her rescue. In that moment, she had questioned the reality of it all dismissing it as mere illusion. Yet now, she knew the truth. Damon was alive, and not a figment of her imagination. He had survived against all odds. Confusion washed over Veronica as she agonized over why he hadn't sought her out. Questions swirled in her mind, leaving her feeling lost and disoriented. She retreated to a quiet corner of her office, her steps light and weary. There, a grand piano stood, silently beckoning to her. She took a seat and began to play, her fingers dancing across the keys producing a hauntingly beautiful melody. As the enchanting notes of Time Flies filled the room, Veronica's thoughts drifted back to her days as a student. Memories flooded her mind, evoking a bittersweet nostalgia. Tears welled up in her eyes. In that moment, she found solace in the music, allowing it to transport her to a time when life was simpler and the weight of the world had yet to burden her shoulders. Silas sat in his office, his eyes fixed on the massive screen that displayed the stock market. He was deep in thought, strategizing his next move. A proud smile played on his lips as he contemplated the battle ahead. If he emerged victorious, he would become a god in the eyes of his organization. Not only that, but he would also have an endless supply of wealth at his disposal. Silas had already estimated that his forces would start to take control soon. He planned to complete his mission this afternoon and leave the next day unscathed. My dear, Silas said, turning to Blair with a gleam in his eye. Tomorrow, I'll buy you the world's most luxurious yacht and a Gulfstream plane. You can play however you want, and I'll be right there with you." Blair's heart swelled with joy at Silas's words. She knew that he was unstoppable, and she felt lucky to be by his side. However, as they embraced, the harsh reality came crashing down. To his astonishment, the National Supervisory Department had already sprung into action, acting preemptively. They were strategically targeting the funds led by Silas, while simultaneously coordinating with Damon's Capital Consortium. Meanwhile, the country's regulatory body wasted no time in joining the fray. State-owned enterprises united with their force, effectively leaving them with no escape routes. Silas was left in a state of panic, as these unforeseen events unfolded before his eyes. Silas had meticulously calculated every move, believing that even if the country reacted, it would take them a considerable amount of time to respond. Yet, the speed at which they had acted surpassed his control. 
leaving him scrambling to regain the footing. Silas was absolutely petrified. International investors were coming for him. It was obvious that this was no impulse decision. They had planned this attack with precision. The sheer amount of money involved was enough to make anyone's head spin. It was a blatant conspiracy, aimed at taking down Silas and all those who supported him. It had to be Damon. Damon had orchestrated every move in this grand scheme. He had foreseen Silas's unwavering determination to triumph over him, and had calculated the lengths he would go to achieve victory. Damon had also anticipated the escalating consequences of this war, as well as the insatiable thirst for power that would drive bloodthirsty investors to join the fray. They had been manipulated from the very beginning, their strings pulled by Damon's cunning hands. Silas could sense that something was terribly amiss. Simultaneously, seasoned financial giants, who had spent half their lives navigating the treacherous waters of the stock market, felt a similar unease. They knew instinctively that the tides were turning against them. The armies involved in this battle were frozen in place, their movements as chaotic as headless chickens. And it wasn't just the local players who sensed the impending disaster. International financial investors, drawn to the allure of immense profits, also detected the foul play unfolding before their eyes. But alas, it was too late for them to escape the clutches of this nefarious plot. They had placed their trust in Silas, but in the end, they would pay the ultimate price, losing everything they had worked so hard to attain. As the closing bell rang, panic swept through the market, causing investors to scatter like frightened birds. Silas's once prestigious company, which had commanded a high price, now found itself in a state of utter despair. The repercussions of this market crash were not limited to Silas alone. The companies under his control, along with his investors, were left reeling from the heavy losses. It was a grim sight, as if the very essence of Silas's empire had shattered. The Brokerton Group, acting as the epicenter of the Los Angeles upper class, felt the tremors of this financial earthquake. Their capital, once thriving and prosperous, now lay in ruins. Those who had been deeply entangled in this web of wealth also suffered devastating blows. Their hopes of seizing a share of the spoils were dashed, as the market crumbled beneath their feet. To make matters worse, when they attempted to flee, they discovered that the government had already devised and implemented stringent policies overnight. The authorities had swiftly closed any loopholes that could be exploited to hide capital. The sheer speed and precision with which these detailed policies were put into action was mind-boggling. It was hard to fathom how such a comprehensive plan could be devised and executed in such a short span of time. In the aftermath of this financial catastrophe, the once mighty had fallen, and the consequences were far-reaching. The market had spoken, and its verdict was clear. No one was safe from its merciless grip. Damon had been playing the long game, setting up a trap that would leave Silas and his cohorts with no way out. It was a masterful plan, and now as the situation unfolded, it became clear that Damon's strategy was now working. Foreign investors, desperate to be saved, found themselves blocked by domestic financial control. There was no way for them to enter the game, leaving them anxious and uncertain. But then, like a roller coaster ride, the situation took an unexpected turn. In the Brokerton family, all eyes were glued to the television screen as they watched the reversal of fortunes. And when the tide finally turned in Damon's favor, a collective sigh of relief swept through the room. Miranda couldn't contain her excitement and leapt to her feet. Wow, he's gonna win! Damon will win! She exclaimed. Grandma June's face glowed with pride. There was nothing more satisfying to her than witnessing her descendants achieve greatness. Since the passing of Grandpa Everett, the Brokerton family had fallen into a prolonged silence their once glorious legacy fading away. It was high time for a new leader to emerge. Arnie Brokerton, with a cigarette dangling from his lips, spoke slowly. Damon is even more extraordinary than I had ever imagined. Arnie had been keeping tabs on Damon ever since the former financial war. He regretted not supporting Damon in the past. Deep down, he was beginning to realize that his estranged nephew was the true glue holding the family together, and he vowed to support him in the future. Damon had meticulously analyzed Silas's every move and position within the organization. It was as if he had a crystal ball that predicted Silas's every move. He was determined to not only acquire the Brokerton group, but also uncover the real motivations behind Silas's actions. Arnie couldn't help but feel optimistic about the future of the Brokerton family. Meanwhile, everyone reacted differently. Liam was glued to the stock market trying to make sense of the financial warfare that was taking place. He knew that Damon had emerged victorious, but he still kept refreshing the page, unable to believe the news. Fifi, Vicky, and Avery were equally mesmerized by the stock market, and their joy knew no bounds when they saw Damon's share skyrocketing. At the SeaTech offices, Veronica's clenched fist finally relaxed as she made a life-changing decision. 
Silas sank into his chair, furious that he'd been so easily ensnared in Damon's trap. His phone incessantly rang, but he couldn't bring himself to answer. He gulped down a few of the last dredges of coffee, trying to maintain his sanity. Just when Silas thought things couldn't get any worse, the number of one of his superiors flashed on the screen. His expression contorted with an even uglier grimace, torn between answering and avoiding the inevitable confrontation. After what felt like an eternity, Silas mustered the courage to press the answer button. Hello, sir, he greeted, his voice trembling. But before he could utter another word, his superior erupted like a volcano. The words spewed out with a fiery rage, scorching Silas's ears. Silas, you despicable bastard! What in the world is going on? Silas's heart sank even further, the weight of his superior's disappointment crushing him. He had promised that everything was under control, that he had it all figured out. But now he had caused his superior to lose a fortune, a fortune that Silas himself had borrowed. If you can't provide me with a reasonable explanation and help me recover my losses, his superior threatened, I swear I'll make you pay with your life. The superior's anger was palpable, his frustration and exasperation seeping through the phone. Silas knew he had let everyone down, especially himself. He had been so sure of his victory, so confident, that he had even gambled his entire wealth on it. Now, faced with the consequences of his actions, he wondered how he had let it all slip through his fingers. Silas's body was drenched in a cold sweat. The situation had spiraled out of control, leaving him with few options. He wiped his brow and tried to sound confident as he spoke. D don't worry, the situation is still under my control. But he knew he was lying. He had no bargaining chips left, and his life was hanging by a thread. The leader sneered at him. You think I'm a fool? What other tricks do you have up your sleeve? Silas knew he had to think fast. He took a deep breath and said, Please believe me. I'll never let you down, just give me some time. It was a bald move, but he had no other choice. The financial big shot paused for a moment, considering his options. He knew that trusting Silas was a risk, but it was the only way out of this mess. He nodded slowly and said, Okay, I'll trust you, but if you betray me again, you'll regret it. Silas breathed a deep sigh of relief. He had bought himself some time, but it wasn't over yet. He had to stay one step ahead of his enemies if he wanted to survive. Silas hung up the phone and made up his mind to reach out to his colleagues in Los Angeles once more, urging them to unleash their assets and come to his aid. But this battle was not just about money anymore. Silas knew he couldn't outmaneuver Damon in the financial realm. Not when he had already lost everything. No, this was about something far more primal. It was about obliterating Damon's very existence. Silas was determined to reduce him to nothing more than a broken shell. He would shatter Damon's physical being ensuring he can never rise again. Silas knew the odds were stacked against him, but he would gather his forces, regroup, and face Damon head on. The sun had barely risen when Damon found himself elbow deep in breakfast dishes, as he scrubbed away the remnants of scrambled eggs and toast. His phone suddenly buzzed with an incoming call. It was Emily's family urging him to come visit. Without a second thought, Damon concocted a little white lie for the three women and set off toward Emily's house. But as he made his way there, guilt gnawed at damaged conscience. Thoughts of Emily growing belly weighed heavily on his mind. He had been so preoccupied with his responsibilities, both inside and outside of work, that he had only managed to call her sporadically. Determined to make amends, Damon quickened his pace, eager to see Emily and make things right. Upon arriving, Damon is greeted by the sight of Emily's father Bob and her uncle Rex, already waiting for him. But before he could exchange pleasantries, Damon's eyes were drawn to Emily. Her belly had blossomed into a round, beautiful curve. When Emily caught sight of Damon, her eyes lit up. You came? She exclaimed, her voice filled with warmth. Damon's heart sank as he berated himself internally. I haven't been visiting you lately, and I'm sorry for that. Before he could utter another word of apology, Emily gently placed a hand over his mouth, silencing him. Her voice, soft and understanding, washed over him like a soothing balm. Don't blame yourself, she whispered. I know what you've been up to. It's all over the news. My parents think you're a hero, so don't worry about me. Though her words brought some comfort, Damon couldn't shake off the lingering shame he felt. Frank gave him a knowing wink. Damon's best friend always seemed to understand him without needing any words. Meanwhile, Bob chimed in, his voice filled with admiration. Look at Damon! He exclaimed proudly. Now he knows how to fight for our country. Frank, if only you had half his ability, I could die in peace. Frank rolled his eyes, accustomed to his father's constant comparison between him and Damon. The group sat around, laughing and chatting about Damon's victory. 
Bob gave Damon a thumbs up. Damon, my man, you're incredible. You got your revenge. Yeah. Uncle Rex piped up. You showed those bloodthirsty folks who's boss. Give them a fierce slap to the face. Bob added, We've won more than we've lost in the financial war. And this time, we've dealt a blow to their arrogance. They'll have to think twice before messing with you, or us again. As the night wore on, Damon made his excuse to Fifi on the phone and decided to stay at Emily's house. Damon held Emily close. I'm sorry, Emily. I've wronged you. He confessed, his voice heavy with regret. Emily's tears fell, but she remained composed. It's okay, Damon. I understand that you're busy. As long as you make time for me and our child, I'll be content. Damon was taken aback by Emily's selflessness. He couldn't believe that she was willing to overlook his mistakes for the sake of their love. The following day, Damon touched down in Los Angeles, accompanied by his trusted allies, Quincy, Hans, and the Von Heck siblings, and Bernadette. Their mission? To embark on a sweeping investigation of Los Angeles society, unraveling the interconnected web of manipulation Silas had woven. If Bernadette and Lara hadn't been immune to Silas's devious schemes, Damon wondered who else would have fallen victim to his treachery. The companies that had aided Silas in his endeavors were particularly intriguing and deserving of closer scrutiny. Silas had successfully deceived them all. As they ventured into the opulent homes of the wealthy families, the shocking truth began to unfold before their eyes. The poison Silas had employed must have been a rare and valuable commodity, for he had invested heavily in controlling these influential households. It seemed that no family was safe from Silas's clutches. In some instances, Silas went to extreme lengths, poisoning not just one generation of women, but three. It was no wonder Silas had become a master of seduction when it came to women. He had ensnared them all with his love potion, using it as a tool to gain power and expand his network. Silas understood that without his concoction, intelligent women would have questioned his motives and seen through his facade. As Damon delved deeper into the twisted world of Silas, he marveled at his cousin's audacity. Damon was determined to expose Silas's true nature, liberating those who had fallen prey. When Damon and the others attempted to visit Silas's victims and set things straight, they were met with an uncooperative attitude. However, Damon knew he had to help these families. One by one, Damon successfully forced out the poison that had consumed their minds and hearts. As Damon revealed the truth, the women's eyes were open to the reality of their past encounters with Silas. The power dynamics had shifted, and they were forced to confront the consequences of their blind loyalty. It was a bitter pill to swallow, but one that ultimately led to their liberation from his toxic influence. The air was thick with curses as the deceived masses unleashed their anger. Silas, you treacherous scoundrel! I treated you with sincerity, never imagining you would hatch a plot against me! One woman seethed. He even poisoned my beloved wife! Another voice chimed in, filled with despair. Now I've lost everything! Silas, oblivious to the fact that he had become a pariah, ventured into the homes of these former victims. However, these once unsuspecting individuals were now seething with rage, their teeth gnashing at the sight of him. How could Silas show his face at their home? Guns and weapons were pointed at him from all directions, each person eager to end his life as swiftly as possible. Silas, you wretched creature, I'm not finished with you! One man bellowed, How dare you meddle with my wife! I'll make you pay with your life! Another voice joined in, filled with righteous indignation. Are you even human? You didn't even spare the elderly! The woman who had fallen under Silas' spell now thirsted for his blood. Panic gripped Silas as he fled, his mind reeling from the unexpected turn of events. Silas realized that his last bargaining chip had been snatched away. He tried to go back to his home, but just as he approached the front door, his eyes widened in horror. People had broken in and trashed the house. And then, a voice thundered through the air. Where is Silas? Show yourself, you coward! Silas knew he couldn't stay at home any longer. It was a dangerous trap, a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. He concocted a plan to seek refuge in the office building. However, his hopes were dashed when he discovered a group of people protesting outside. His desperation grew. He needed to find another hiding place. Silas thought that he had countless hiding spots at his disposal. Unfortunately for him, as he ventured through the city, he discovered that every nook and cranny was occupied by people lying in wait, ready to pounce on him. Since his malicious poisoning scheme had been exposed, Silas had become the public enemy of the entire world. If Silas was caught, he knew he would meet a gruesome fate, torn apart piece by piece. Silas frantically dialed his wife Blair's number, but there was no answer. He shook. Could it be that Blair had fallen into trouble because of him? He couldn't bear the idea of anything happening to her, especially since she was carrying their child. 
With no other options left, Silas knew he had to apologize and beg for forgiveness. Only the powerful elite had the means to protect his family now. It didn't matter if his own life was ruined. He had to shield his wife and their unborn child. He hailed a taxi and directed the driver to the only place he can think of, the office building where a man named Griffin spent his time. Griffin, a figure even stronger than Silas, had become the true ruler of the city, operating from the shadows. Silas hoped that he would be able to offer him and his family the protection they so desperately needed. Upon Silas' arrival at Griffin's office, an eerie emptiness greeted him. Not a soul could be found in the vicinity. Curiosity peaked. Silas cautiously approached the office door, his senses heightened. Suddenly, a delicate panting sound emanated from within. Silas' intuition kicked in, so it seemed that those in positions of power prefer to conduct their affairs without any interruptions for their underlings, he thought. Silas contemplated leaving, knowing that his higher-ups disliked being disturbed. However, something made him pause. The familiar nature of the breathing caused cold sweat to trickle down his back. Moments later, the sound ceased. Griffin's voice boomed. How do I compare to your husband now? I dare say I surpass him, don't I? Blair's unmistakable voice responded. Oh, Griffin, you're wicked. He's no longer my husband. You're my guy now. And indeed, you surpass him in every way. Griffin's laughter filled the room. And what of the child growing within you? Is it mine or his? Blair replied, Absolutely yours. I've calculated the timing and it's undeniable. You're going to be a father. Griffin snorted. Let your silly husband Silas take care of my future child. I like the way that sounds. Blair's eyes narrowed. But that idiot is being hunted everywhere and I'm living with him. Do you still have any hope? Why can't I just come back with you? Griffin's fury ignited like a wildfire. No, he spat. What if my wife finds out? But she's pregnant with your child just like I am. Blair whispered. Griffin let out a weary sigh, his anger momentarily subsiding. You don't have to worry too much. Silas is loyal to you. After I break his legs, I'll reward him and let him be a small boss in my company. I can guarantee your material expenses. I have another way to deal with him. His words were calculated, a plan forming in his mind as he spoke. Without a word, Silas quietly slipped away, disappearing into the shadows, leaving behind a world that had turned cold and unforgiving. He knew what he had to do next. Silas finally found Damon. Before Damon could attack him, Silas proposed a truce. You want to fight against Griffin with me? Damon asked skeptically. Silas nodded, his eyes burning with determination. That's right. My wife cheated on me with him. I'm giving myself up to you. Damon studied Silas carefully, trying to gauge his sincerity. He knew that Silas was a man who had been wronged. But he also knew that he could be dangerous if he felt betrayed. I believe you. Damon said finally. But in order to ensure your loyalty, you must take this pill. If you have any second thoughts, your entire body will fester and die. But if you pledge your loyalty to me, I can guarantee your life. Silas didn't hesitate. He took the pill from Damon's hand and swallowed it without a second thought. Damon was impressed. He knew that Silas was a man who was willing to do whatever it took to get what he wanted. As Damon made his way back to the Brokerton mansion, he was greeted with a heartwarming surprise. The entire Brokerton clan had gathered to welcome him home in the most grandiose way possible. Even Grandma June who had once been less than kind to Damon, was there to greet him with eyes full of love and respect. As they reminisced about the first time Damon had visited the Brokerton family with his parents, Nancy and Robert, Grandma June felt a pang of regret for how she had treated him. She never could have guessed that Damon would one day become the backbone of the family, supporting them through thick and thin. Grandma, Damon called out to her, using the endearing term he hadn't uttered in years. He had already forgiven her for her past transgressions, after all, Grandma June was getting on in years, and Damon didn't want her to carry any regrets to her grave, just like Grandpa Everett. When Grandma June heard Damon call her Grandma, she couldn't hold back her tears. She had waited for this moment for what felt like an eternity. She wished that her beloved husband Everett, along with Robert and Nancy, were there to witness the prodigal son's return. Silas still couldn't be welcomed with open arms, so Damon left him at a safe house. Damon arrived with the Francis family. Among them was Emily, who was carrying his child. With the Brokerton family's newfound prosperity, the alliance with the Francis family was only going to get stronger. It was as if they were returning to the golden age of Grandpa Everett's era. As for Grandma June, she had finally found a way to make amends for her past mistakes. She held Emily close, afraid that she would disappear like a dream. At the stroke of noon, the Brokerton family gathered at a place that held a sacred significance, the final resting place of Grandpa Everett. The atmosphere was heavy, with solemnity, 
as if the very air held its breath in reverence. Damon, carrying a bouquet of vibrant flowers, approached his grandfather's tomb with the utmost respect. Tenderly, he placed the flowers down and softly called out, Grandpa. After a few heartfelt words, Damon quietly departed. Grandma June, however, lingered a while longer. She wanted her family to have their moment, but she also desired a private conversation with her beloved late husband. With meticulous care, she tidied the surroundings, both inside and out, ensuring that everything was in its rightful place. As she stood before the tomb, Grandpa June poured her heart out to Everett, sharing the recent happenings and assuring him that their family was on the path to recovery. With a touch of pride, she assured Everett that their legacy would continue. There was no need to worry anymore. Over 50 years of laughter, tears, and unwavering support had forged a bond that time can never erase. There were countless untold stories, unspoken words, and unexpressed gratitude that now flooded her mind. And so, in that sacred place, Grandma June found solace in the act of remembering. She spoke to Everett as if he was still there, pouring out her heart and reliving the cherished moments they had shared. As the sun began to set, Grandma June finally bid her farewell, knowing that her words had reached the depths of her late husband's soul. With a heavy heart, she turned away, leaving behind a piece of her soul at the tomb of the man who had been her rock, her confidant, and her true love.